Westerners in general, the United States too, they had a very uh, optimistic view about how human history had been developing. So they were historicists, so they believed that human history like went in stages, just like Marx did with his class struggle. Uh, this one wasn't based on class struggle, it was about on like phases of knowledge or understanding the universe, essentially, or the world and then the universe. Um, can we close the door all the way, please? Thank you. So what was this uh, philosophy or worldview referred to as, generally speaking? Yeah, positivism. And how did they see him in history? Obviously, they're historicists and they saw it in stages, but like what was, how did they see that development of these stages? They thought that um, every, everything was developing like all, with all the new ideas they were developing towards a perfect society. Yeah, okay, cool. So they thought that they were on a path uh, to knowledge and understanding that would lead them to a uh, perfect world, perfect society, utopia, I guess you could say. We're, we're generalizing here, but yeah, utopia, right? Like a perfect world society where there's no suffering or minimal suffering or, or whatever people are happy to have the things they want. Okay, do they have any, uh, I mean, before the stuff we're gonna talk about in, in the 19th century, did they have some reason to possibly believe this? Uh, industrialization and capitalism? Yeah, so they, had, they did have some ideas. What about politically? What about some uh, helpful political ideas that made people more free and happy and successful? Enlightenment. Yeah, so you had things like the uh, Enlightenment, right? So the ideas about individual freedom and, and checks and balances and all that. By the way, off your phones, you're out of here. <laughs> um, it's just like you can't tell if someone's behind a backpack and they're just looking down. It's like, eh. um, so enlightenment uh, ideas about natural rights and freedom that frees people up to, you know, have protections of life and liberty, have their own private property, you know, pursue their own interests and succeed or not succeed and all that stuff, right? So that that helped to uh, create more freedom and affluence. Affluence again meaning like success. Uh, you had, of course, oh, even earlier than that, by the way, scientific revolution, right? They started understanding how the world worked and the universe worked. It wasn't just like, you know, all those old explanations for how things worked. Uh, enlightenment, again, about individual freedom, politics. Which, of course, both of these kind of combine to lead to, uh, uh, or partly develop with, you know, capitalist free market uh, policies and industrialization. And these four things obviously imperfect, but they certainly and clearly made lives much better as far as uh, standards of living. So, you know, reduce the death rate, reduce the amount of people being uh, punished and suffering by governments. They, you know, increase the amount of stuff that's available to people. They reduce the prices of things. They actually gave people more freedom protection. So like all these things were beneficial. They made people's lives easier and safer and they allowed people uh, potentially, of course there was some crooked practices going on too, but they allowed some uh, economic freedom so individuals could uh, thrive if they were motivated and good enough at what they did and all that stuff or fail but uh, so those were much better than the previous systems that they had like whether it was feudalism or mercantilism or, or whatever all right so um, seeing this in these developments uh, a guy uh, one of the guys that, that helped develop this outlook Auguste Comte uh, they sort of saw the uh, world in three primary developmental stages uh, starting with kind of organized religion and the ideas about how, how we figured out the world worked and found a way of living that was better than the sort of Paleolithic, Neolithic free-for-all. So what was the first stage referred to as? Metaphysical? Yeah, it's not the first one, though. Theological. There you go, theological. All right, and this is the, the stage of organized religion. What do I mean by organized religion? Codified beliefs. Yeah, so unified, codified beliefs. So these are the, the, the dominant world religions that we know about. Buddhism, Hinduism, uh, Christianity, Islam, Judaism, all those we've talked about before. Uh, Confucianism, Christianity, etc. All those are um, examples of organized religions. And again, what those did were they tried to explain how the world worked and give you a way of living. And generally speaking, those systems, while not perfect and of course oppressive in their own right, whether it was towards women or uh, well any group, or just people in general or class, uh, they were definitely better than the primitive or non-religions that were that occurred before. So it was like a step up, but it was still 
pretty oppressive, pretty bleak, and had very poor explanations for how the world worked. However, we find a new way of thinking that largely shows us uh, how to acquire knowledge, uh, how to ask questions properly, how to prove things and figure out how they work. Uh, so we start understanding how the world works and how to use these properties to develop technology. Uh, and that is the metaphysical stage, right? And so this is the stage of mastering what type of science? Physical. Yeah, physical science, like how the world actually works, you know, gravity. Uh, thermodynamics, uh, electricity or electromagnetism, all of those properties and laws and how to manipulate them uh, and run them to our advantage, right? So that's the Industrial Revolution essentially. We made our lives much easier by harnessing, uh, you know, fossil fuels and uh, factory system and mechanization, all this stuff to make our lives easier, uh, more productive, safer, all, all of the above, right? So that's good. That's progress. All right. That's physical science, I guess you would say mastery of that. Um, and of course, as if you look at it, it's gaining momentum as it goes. Like the more you discover helps you discover more things and invent more things that make things easier to discover or better, etc. Um, what's that third stage then that he believes that they've started engaging in and should engage in more to reach a uh, higher society, I guess you'd say? Positive state. Yeah. And that was what, focused on what type of science? Social. Social. Yeah, exactly. What, and what does that mean, by the way? Sticking with you. Uh, how uh, humans think and operate. Yeah, uh, so human institutions and how individual humans uh, think and operate. All right, so uh, which one of these then would be an example of uh, a social science? Or uh, it's not even just one, really. Enlightenment. Enlightenment. What else would be a, a, a human institution or system created? Capitalism. Yeah, capitalism, right. So those are examples of social science. So human institutions and... Uh, structures. I don't mean physical structures, by the way. I shouldn't even write structures because I think of physical. Human institutions, um, systems. That's that's a better word. Systems and uh, mind, behavior, etc. So these are the subjects uh, that you learn about that are, I think, the most interesting. But hey, uh, you know, topics like history, uh, psychology, economics, uh, politics. Those are the. Um, Social sciences, those are human institutions. And again, I told you yesterday kind of what separates them from physical sciences. Like, well, they're both sciences and they both find things out the same way, right? Using mathematics and logic and testing and observation, all that. It's exactly the same, which is why we attach the science to it. But the difference is these don't exist without humans, all right? Electricity, gravity, all that stuff, doesn't matter if we're there or not. Those things exist right in the universe. Right? Yeah. Yes, they do. Even if we're dead, doesn't matter. They're around. Right? Our, uh, I mean, if we're going to pretend there's no other life in the universe anyway, uh, which there certainly could be somewhere, if humans didn't exist, would there be economies and governments and psychology and all of this? No. no. You have animal behavior and you have animal hierarchies, but there's no, like, uh, rationally thought about, you know, uh, conjecture and, and, and reform. Uh, sort of systems. These only exist with humans. We, we created them out of nothing, essentially. We're just organi organizing ourselves increasingly more efficiently. All right, so those are, that's what makes it a social science, right? It's, it's a human abstract structure or a study of our behavior, essentially. All right. All right, so, uh, and again, the goal is to use these uh, ideas and discoveries and uh, uh, subjects uh, to eventually get towards a world in which we understand how the entire physical world works, we can manipulate it to the point that no one is suffering and dying and or uncomfortable, and also we understand humans well enough to the point that we know we can provide each other with the most rational and uh, free but also protective society that makes sure everyone is happy and no one's suffering and no one's being oppressed and all that. All right, that was they believe we're going to. Make sense? Yeah. All right, cool. And the only reason we learn about this is because we learn that it's totally wrong, or at least the way that they are imagining it is wrong. What's going to uh, shatter this idea that we can achieve this sort of perfect utopia, mastery of physical and positive or, uh, social sciences? Uh, Albert Einstein's papers in 1905. Okay, cool. So you're going specifically, but uh, what's a broad term? We'll, we'll definitely get there. Relativity. Okay, still very specific. World War One. Well, Still very specific. World War I is, okay, what we're just going to say is new groundbreaking scientific discoveries 
and industrial warfare. Those are the two things that are going to sort of break it. And you guys gave great specific examples. But uh, this idea that all things are getting better and, and, and used primarily or only for good is, is going to be pretty much thrown out the window. Not that these things can't improve lives and make things better, because they do, but there's always that chance that they'll make it worse for some people. And if you give humans a chance, they will do it, even intentionally. All right, so uh, we'll start with the uh, new scientific discoveries that sort of shadow our, shatter our understanding and ability to master the physical uh, world around us. So you mentioned Einstein. In 1905, he said a series of papers. One of them is about relativity. How does relativity uh, break our presuppositions or understandings about what we can do with metaphysical science and knowledge? Who tells time and space isn't continuous, but it's like random and there's a... It's, it's not necessarily random, but, but it's relative. What does relative mean, by the way? We haven't talked about that. It doesn't mean family, by the way. It's dependent on the situation or like something. The perspective. Okay, so it's subjective. It's dependent on the perspective. All right, so here's what, here's what I mean. Uh, if... Um, a four foot person were to be standing up here next to me. I'm six foot. Would I be tall to them? Yes. Yes. I would, right. But what if I have a seven foot six guy in here You'll up next to me? Am I, am I tall to him? No. no, right, I wouldn't be tall. He's definitely tall, probably everybody. But uh, it kind of depends on your, your perspective. So I can't walk around. I mean, I could say, oh, compared to the average person, I'm six foot, therefore I'm tall. But I can't just objectively say, I am tall because I can stand next to people that are taller than me, right? Um, that's sort of what relativity means. So they thought that, because I can't just walk around and always be the tallest person. It's impossible, at least for me, right? There's, of course, there's one tallest person in the world somewhere, but um, for everybody else, they're not always gonna be uh, that tallest person. So what that means is, for them, height is not constant, although their height is constant, but their status as the tallest person is not always constant, it's relative. What is it relative to? What is it subjective to? Perspective. Or the okay. Perspective. The perspective and, and, and presence of other people around them, right. So, in this case, that probably didn't help anybody understand it. Um, how was time not constant? Because we thought it was. We thought time um, passed the same everywhere all the time. But we find out that it actually doesn't. For example, if you're gonna go light speed, you would stop time. Yeah, if you want actual light speed, time would stop, yeah. That's part of that, that time-space continuum uh, trajectory in that. So this was time, and this was space. Or sorry, speed, my bad. Speed. And this is light speed, and this is not moving at all, and this is uh, whatever the fastest amount of time would be. Let's say it's 10,000 times speed. I don't know what exactly would be. But the slower I move, the slower close to zero, how's time moving for me? Faster. It's going faster, right? So there's kind of like an arc here. Uh, so I, I kind of use this as like a point of reference. So I say, oh man, if I'm traveling 100 miles an hour, then my time is going very, very quickly because I'm not going very fast compared to light speed, right? But if I'm going super fast, if I'm going like 99% light, light, speed, light speed, I'm going like, I don't know, 170 miles, 1,000 miles a second or something. What's time gonna be like for me? Very it's going to be very slow, right? It'd fall the spectrum down to being some very slow amount of time speed. But here's the weird part that most people can't comprehend. You, that doesn't mean that if I'm going super fast, time's like to me. What's time like to me if I'm going super fast? You won't notice it. You won't notice it. It'll be just like this. You'll feel like it's just normal. But what would you find out if you went back to an area which was not traveling fast? If you felt someone else, another creature that uh, was in a different speed, and if you encounter with them, and then you notice the uh, difference. In age, right. And depending on how fast I'm going, they might not even exist anymore, right? So um, what's the other factor, by the way, that impacts the passage of time at the speed at which it passes? Uh, gravity. gravity, right. So two things, basically. If I go really fast, like light speed fast, not just like, I went 200 miles an hour, so time went slower, so you're older than me. Or gravity. If either of those are increased, those answers are so annoying, I wish you could just shut that off. If either of those are increased on a large scale, so I'm going super fast, or I'm in an area that has really high gravity, uh, like Jupiter, for example, or the sun, obviously I just died there, I went there. But if I could survive on those planets or stars somehow, temporarily, 
I would like land on the sun and I'd be like, wow, and not die, of course. This is cool. Take a picture, fly on back to Earth. What would I discover when I got back to Earth? Earth might not even exist. It might not even exist, but certainly the people I knew would likely not exist. So even if, even if Earth is still there and there's still humans, like, even though it was just a few seconds for me on the sun, time was tra passing so much slower in the area I was at, because of the gravity, that time on Earth was going like super fast relative to me. So I would come back, even though I'm only like, you know, a day older myself, like I'd go in at, you know, uh, 31 and come back at 31, maybe all my family is now passed and been dead for 200 years, right? Because on Earth, with low gravity, time was going much more quickly. Did the people on Earth notice it? No. Nope, no. they don't. Right. And that's in the other movies, too, that, that you can see. Same thing for light speed. If I were to, like, somehow take a plane and go into space and go light speed and go loop around the moon and come back, uh, you guys would probably all be dead. Uh, and we'd, be, we'd have some other generation of humans, if humans were even still here, just for me going around the uh, moon at light speed really quickly, potentially. All right, well, that's kind of a short distance, but you know what I mean. If I go, a long, if I go a, for a long time um, <coughs> at light speed and I come back, times would have passed a lot differently. All right, I want to like tell you about a movie that really does it well, but we're going to watch that later, so we'll save it for that. Okay, so relativity proves that laws are not uh, consistent in the, uh, in the universe, and, and our hopes of like traveling around the universe very quickly, gone, because if I'm running around the universe traveling at light speed, time on Earth or whatever humans are not traveling at light speed, their lives are going boop, and then I'm going to return to, you know, nothing, essentially. So that's out the window. What else did Einstein discover that really destroyed our worldview of understanding of the universe? Was that it? Just the one thing? He had a bunch. Energy and matter are interchangeable. Yeah, exactly. Uh, energy and matter are interchangeable. In fact, you got that equation, uh, just basically the formula for how much uh, matter and energy uh, convert to for each other. All right, so that again means, just like I told you guys about yesterday, we're all made of atoms, but the funny thing about atoms is they are what percent uh, actual, you know, physical, solid, hard space particles. Zero, 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 zero. Yeah, so we're actually 99.99% uh, uh, nothing because we're made of atoms entirely, and atoms are 99.9% uh, empty space. All right, so how is this electron, or these electrons, how are they making my uh, uh, solid, my atom surface solid then? Because they're moving like really fast around the atom. Yeah, they're actually moving so quickly and popping in and out of existence so quickly uh, around these protons and neutrons, the nucleus, that they take up all the space even though they're not that big. It's like that, like I told you, the plane propeller. If I start a plane propeller and I stick my hand in it, I'll cut my hand off. But it's not because it's going too fast, it's actually because it's not going fast enough. It's going f fast enough to cut my hand off, there's enough energy to, to take my hand off, but if I were to spin it at max speed and took all the air resistance out, and it was going at light speed in a circle, would I get my hand cut off for touching it? No. Why not? Because it would Yeah, there's not even a gap for me to fit my finger. It would just be like hitting a door, essentially. So it's like a propeller spinning so fast that there's no room to fit anything in, it's just going to feel like a solid object. That's essentially what uh, atoms are. And E equals mc squared is the uh, formula you would use to figure out how much energy is in an individual you know, atom or whatever. And uh, so what's a nuclear or atomic bomb then? The splitting of an atom. Yeah, so you, uh, you split this atom and release the energy that's holding it together with that really fast moving electron. That energy release is essentially the atomic bomb. All right, so that definitely uh, blew our minds as far as how the uh, universe is comprised and made. Um, it's not even actually solid matter. It's just a bunch of energy spinning around. All right. Uh, what about another field that uh, also helped break down our understanding of the universe? What other field to study? Um, gravity bends space. That's true. Um, we'll stay away from the Einstein stuff. I think that's enough to show that Einstein broke our understanding of science. Quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics, yeah. And just in case you guys forgot what he was talking about, um, in when gravity is so intense, like you know a planet or a star, the reason why you are attracted to it, the gravity exists, is because it's actually bending space almost like you're putting a bowling ball on a trampoline, you put a marble on it, the marble's just gonna roll to the, to, to the bowling ball. All right, so it's the same concept uh, for space. So 
when objects are large enough, they have enough mass, a sun, or sorry, a star, a planet, they actually bend space around them. So that's why people, uh, when they come across this, you know, area that they're bending space, it's bent towards that large object. So they're actually falling into it. The part that's hard to comprehend though is a trampoline's 2D, so it makes sense. You put the bowling ball on it, you put a marble, it's just gonna go right to it uh, because there's only one direction it can go. But time and space are 3D, so it's like the Earth's sitting there, but it's pulling in from all directions because it's bending it in all directions towards it. All right, but if I'm far enough away, it doesn't affect me. All right, it's kind of weird though. Did you guys know that Jupiter's so big that it's actually bending space and actually slightly affects uh, gravity here on Earth and the tide? Really? Yeah, just a little bit, apparently. I didn't know that either. Um, so does the sun. There's a tiny little, like, sun tide, too. Uh, the, that's what the moon is, by the way. If you guys didn't know what the tide was, that's because the moon is large enough that its gravitational field actually crosses over onto Earth, and it actually pulls water with it as it circles around the Earth. Uh, that's what the tide is. So when the tide goes out, that means the, the moon has pulled water away from our shore. Uh, when the tide is high, that means the uh, moon uh, or sometimes the sun have pulled the water towards our shore. That's what it basically is. All right, and then when they line up, it's like a super tide, I guess. <clears throat> so, but, I, but yeah, again, Jupiter somehow actually affects that a little bit too. Not as much as the sun, the moon, though. All right, anyways, quantum mechanics. That's the study of what? Uh, subatomic particles. Right, subatomic particles. So everything, uh, I just erased the atom, everything atom or smaller. So everything atoms are made of. So electrons, protons, neutrons, and now we know that those are made of things called quarks and like it's, so it's getting, yeah, and I don't even know what all the new stuff is, but yes, uh, it's even smaller particles and, you know, uh, bounding energy. But anyways, it's a study of those things. So what are, they, what are some of the things they found out about quantum mechanics that really disturbed people and <coughs> showed that we couldn't even fully understand or control these things? Quantum leap. Okay, a quantum leap. What's a quantum leap? Basically, uh, electrons would uh, basically just transfer, uh, basically become uh, non-existent for a very small amount of time. At least to us, travel yeah. across uh, electron shells. Yeah. So the strata of electrons. So that, this is like you're getting into chemistry terms that I'm not even I'm not familiar with or I don't remember, but there are. Uh, the strata of these atoms, like you can only, it's like a mathematical, like uh, it's two could be on the inner part and then four could be on the second layer, then like eight can be on the third layer and so on and so forth. But the weird thing is these electrons move, but what's weird is they can't occupy the space in between the spheres and they switch places. And so the thing that we found out that was so weird is since they can't like go, oh, well, if I want to go to this ring, I can't just move because I can't exist here. They just disappear here and then reappear over here somehow. Obviously, another one have to move out when they did that, but uh, they somehow pop in and out of existence. They move through a dimension or a plane of reality that we can't comprehend or see somehow. And again, we don't understand how on that one. So yeah, uh, quantum leaps are a uh, big one. We have no idea how that works or how it can work. Okay, cool. Uh, what else did they find out about electrons? Did I tell you about the electron filter? Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, that one's a weird one too. They found out that electrons are somehow connected with other electrons across the universe and can switch places with them in a way we don't understand. What do they use the electron filter for? I don't know the specifics on that. I only know the simple explanations about how it actually works because I don't care about the specifics myself. But once I know about this weird property, then that's good enough for me. So um, just to simplify it, they would take these electrons that they could identify somehow. We'll just say black and white. They'd put them in a filter. This is more for inner than you guys. And they would filter out, oh, here's all the black electrons, and here's all the white electrons. And they're like, that's cool, got it. But then what really weirded them out is when they took these filtered electrons, like, oh, here's all the air particles, here's all the electrons, and they took the same filter and put it on it. What you should have gotten was, you know, just a bunch more white ones and then zero black ones. But what did they actually get? Both they got both again. Somehow these electrons were swapping place in the universe with another partner electron. And they, they don't, as far as I know, they don't understand how it's doing that, but they just know that it does. And again, you guys ask me like, well, how do you know this exists? Because the way we have organized our circuitry with silicon and all that, 
the way that circuits communicate, they would only work if our theories about these were correct. So we can't see these, we just figure them out mathematically and they're like, well, let's build a machine that works on them and if it works, then we know we're right. And that's pretty much uh, what happened. That's how computer circuits work. They somehow communicate in binary uh, with, those, uh, with the transfer of the energy with a zero or a one, uh, the charge basically. And if we were wrong about it, none of those would work. So that's how we know it works. Anyways, quantum leaps are a big one. And then of course, just the, uh, how can I phrase this, the existence of, uh, or the state of electrons and light. That was the other one that creeped him out too, was the one about light. You guys remember that one? Yeah. What was it? Uh, it can act like both waves and uh, particles. Yeah, it can be a wave or a particle. And when they filtered it out and they tried to uh, shoot a particle through to see where it landed, uh, what they found was it hit everywhere at once. And it was only in one particular place when you tried to measure it in one moment. And then after that moment, it was in another place. Uh, so that was something that they also couldn't understand. They're expecting, shoot the particle through, see which part got hit. And then they shoot the particle through and they're like, well, all of them got hit. How did that happen? Uh, so they, they, again, don't really understand that one either. All right, cool. Well, those break our understanding of ever possibly mastering the metaphysical universe and bending it to our will because, I mean, the way gravity and time work, there's no way we can move throughout the universe like that. And we definitely don't understand what other dimensions um, uh, or planes of reality exist that these electrons exist in. All right. Um, we'll even do really quickly, just to throw the whole social science thing out the window too, or not out the window, but certainly the ability for us to only have rational minds that are always good and doing things in the best interest of ourselves and others. Uh, who and how broke this concept that again, we could figure out the human brain and get us to be only uh, rational and moral and, and do things that are beneficial to us and others. Sigmund Freud, yeah. primitive and primitive. Right, cool. Freud, uh, he actually had, his discoveries are found on the unconscious mind. Mm -hmm. But to simplify this, he believed that there was a primitive or uh, unknown unconscious part of the brain that would drive and does drive people. We, we know that more so now as like the... Uh, older parts of our brain, like the more reptilian parts of the brain. Basically, the way your brain works is the stem here is like the oldest part of it. And then like, as you layer things on, they're newer and newer. And the newest thing is uh, our uh, cortical uh, layer up here in our frontal cortex. That's where your like rational brain is. This is your goal oriented brain. This is the one that says, oh, I should really study right now. And then sometimes you do. But the part of you that says, ah, but I could also just eat a bunch of food and watch Netflix and talk to my friends and stuff, that's more uh, the older part of the brain, the uh, limbic system and, and, and whatnot. It, there's an interplay between the two, but that's basically what it is. So we know now that Freud wasn't quite right with the whole weird unconscious thing, but uh, we definitely have parts of our brain that are not perfectly aligned with our uh, rational brain. And our rational brain does not have 100% control uh, at all. And again, we know this super easily because how many times have you gone home saying, oh, I need to study and do this, and then you end up not doing it? We've all done that many times in our life, right? And you know you should, but you just don't. So there's this part of your brain that is not rational, right? So we've got an irrational brain and a rational. And yeah, at times we tap into both, but we can never fully tap into one. And in fact, what you find is if you completely ignore one, somehow, it's just gonna kind of build up a bunch of tension and then just flood you. So for example, some of you might notice this when you get into adult or even now, if you like super, super uh, like, you know, basically slave drive yourself into doing stuff you don't wanna do, like uh, studying and doing housework and, and whatever, if you do that for a bunch of days, you're eventually get to the point that you're like totally burnt out and then all you wanna do is veg and do a bunch of stuff that's not helping out uh, your future. It, it'll be kind of like a, a backlash of you ignoring that part of your brain. It, it's weird, but he definitely discovered that. So our hopes of ever figuring out the perfect rational world are, are essentially gone uh, with, with uh, his discoveries. All right, what about the conflict we haven't talked about, at least on here, uh, World War I. How does World War I sort of trash our uh, view of mastering both of these, by the way, the metaphysical and the uh, social uh, science part of our uh, uh, existence? Uh, uh, as much as science can be used for good, it can be... Uh, yep, absolutely. So, really cool that I have a bunch of new inventions that make my life better. But, do I also have a bunch of inventions that could uh, possibly make lives worse? Yes. Yeah, right. Modern weapons. 
uh, while they can be used efficiently and effectively, they can also be used to kill people much more effectively than we've ever done before, and more sinisterly too, with like you know things like mustard gas and biological warfare. So uh, this is definitely both. It's like okay, inventions are going to help us, and our rational brain's going to help us, but we've also got uh, and moral uh, brain's going to help us, but we've also got a, a very uncontrollable at times irrational, and even malevolent. Malevolent meaning like you want to harm others. Benevolent means you want to help others. Um, uh, and malevolent means you want to harm them. So we've got people that are not a perfect set of I'm all benevolent and zero malevolent or, or either. You've got people that are mixed. And at times they're going to use this super cool new technology to make things that can harm people and do. And then they're actually going to use them to do that. All right, And that's when you get the... Uh, Stalins and the Hitlers and whatnot, they have this idea of how the world's supposed to be, uh, and then they tap into this part of their brain that just allows them to go and massacre millions of people. All right, and that's what it showed us. So World War II, and then even later too, you could say uh, World War II, definitely show us that uh, technology and the human mind uh, can be used destructively. And in fact, since our Technology is better. It's even more destructive than it was uh, in the past. All right, so that's the key thing Like we wouldn't even talk about these topics if it wasn't for this transition and the significance of it So what is the significance of me thinking? Oh my gosh, we're getting better and better We're going to a utopia to oh my god. No, we'll never get there Can you repeat the question? Sure, I just kind of gave you the answer to the question um, How did why do we? learn about these ideas. Yeah, some of them are cool, by the way, because that's you know how the world works in ways we can't understand. But why is this significant, and why am I comparing it to this? Because it shatters our thoughts of ever having a perfect utopian society. Okay, sweet. So it, it really does uh, end any chance of us reaching this perfect utopian world. It kind of shows that it's impossible. But you actually had some writers at the time, by the way, that thought this was bull. Uh, a guy named Dostoevsky thought it was bull. He's like, dude, this is crap. If you give humans what they want, exactly what they want, they'll be incredibly unhappy and they'll find a way to make the world worse so they can try to make it better again. And he's actually quite right about that. If somebody ever gave you everything you wanted, you'd be happy for a few days and then you'd be depressed because that's what happens. It's, what's weird about humans is, and this is AP Psych, what's weird about humans is our whole biochemistry and sense of fulfillment and uh, happiness even are bent on us making things better and working towards goals. If somebody gives you everything you want, do you have any goals after that? No, like, and that's why people get depressed. Really, who's making announcements on an hour after school? So they found this out, like, you know, people that win the lottery, they end up getting depressed later, because uh, either they spoil um, all of their winnings or they just have no real purpose. They just kind of float around, do some fun things for a while, then they get bored, and then they get depressed. People that work super hard, like, earn a PhD or a job position that takes them years to do and all this research is incredibly difficult and it's frustrating and then they get there and they, they're done with their PhD or they've got that top spot of that business or whatever and then they get depressed, depressed right, because they have nothing to work towards, no goal. So it's weird. So if you had the utopia, you're human, you'd be unhappy anyway. And then Dostoevsky also says they'd go even further. Not only would I be unhappy, but I would destroy it just so that I could mix it up and possibly rebuild it later. He ain't wrong. All right, cool. Um, let's at least start World War One, and I'll finish it tomorrow during class. I think before the quiz, which will help you all out anyway. All right, World War One. That goes back quite far. Obviously, the uh, years in which they were fighting are nineteen fourteen to eighteen, but um, I've got some. What's we're looking for? <clears throat> Causes that extend far further, be uh, that predate nineteen fourteen by quite a bit. Uh, imperialistic values. Okay, cool. So here, here are my causes. We'll get the uh, categories, and then we'll kind of describe them. So causes number one. This isn't necessarily like an order of significance. Imperialistic rivalries. <clears throat> okay. What else? Alliances. Alliances. Yeah. And nationalism. Nationalism, nice. All right, cool. What I don't want to see on short answers or essays is you guys using these as reasons, 
and not giving me examples. Be like, well, nationalism caused it because they wanted to form countries based on common ethnicity and then they fought for it. And then you go to the next topic and you get no points. What are some examples of imperialistic rivalries pro providing or creating conditions that would eventually lead to warfare? The Moroccan crisis. Okay, was that exactly, or roughly? Was it just one? Mm, Crises. Crises, yeah, there's two. 1905 and 11. Uh, do you kind of remember ish, maybe possibly what might have happened? Uh, is it when Germany was trying to go into uh, Morocco and try to uh, get a piece of the territory that was held by the French? Yeah, they were certainly trying to interfere with French control of Morocco. And they were trying to instigate or antagonize the French to, uh, to attack them. Right. So that's sort of like, oh, he hit me first, therefore I can hit him. Right. So they wanted the French. To, uh, they want to get a rise of the French, possibly get retaliation out of the French, and that would give them the green light, theoretically, uh, to go to war with them and start taking their possessions. That's kind of what was going on. All right. All right, so that's Morocco. Again, Germany trying to instigate war. So, uh, for example, one of the instances, they uh, intentionally put uh, German ships at a threatening distance from the French holdings in Morocco, which had a tense uh, standoff. By the way, this actually angered the British... Before these crises, the British were kind of like, eh, Germany and France, they want to go at it, whatever. That's fine, they can be them. But this was the point that the British were like, ah, the Germans are intentionally trying to instigate this. So they saw the Germans as a threat and kind of a bully. And this is the point where Britain starts saying, ah, oh, yeah, if, uh, if Germany starts messing around, we will try to help stop them. All right, what other imperialistic rivalries might we have here? Uh, naval arms race. Yeah, and this is what helps instigate the uh, arms race of the navies, anyway, uh, between Britain, Great Britain, and uh, Germany. All right. So that, again, who has the biggest navy in the world at the time? Britain. The British, right? Who tries to start catching up to them? Germany. Nice. So the British should be like, oh well, good for you. I guess you might catch up to us. What are they going to do? Defend their. Yeah, they're going to expand their uh, military spending and navy as well. So you got two sides building up these, na uh, these militaries to try to you know, match each other, and that just, of course, makes you more likely uh, to want to use them against each other. And the more ships and people you have out there, the more chances there are that some stupid thing happens and somebody shoots at somebody, and then you have a, uh, a war started. All right, that's a good example. All right, what about alliances? Triple entity. Triple entente, All right, that's actually after. Let's do the other lines first that helped motivate the formation of the Triple Entente. Triple Alliance. Triple Alliance, nice. That one was in, oh, it's 1880 something, 1884? I might have the years wrong on that. 1800s, I think it was the 1880s. Don't quote me though. Or is it, yeah, whatever. 1880s or 1890s. And that is, which countries? Austria and Hungary. Yep. Germany and Italy. Germany, Austria, Hungary, Italy. and Italy. I believe it was the 1880s. Uh, I don't know if it's in the notes or not, but what, do you guys remember what the purpose of that alliance was? Obviously, it's a defensive alliance, so if you get attacked, I help you, but Germany organized it. Why were they trying to organize this? I don't know if it's in the notes or not. If it wasn't, that's fine. Sounds like it wasn't. Germany detested the French, going way back to what Napoleon did when he humiliated them. So, um, basically, France... I told you about Napoleon, right? No, no, no. I didn't? I didn't tell you about how he helped inspire nationalism by making the Germans angry. The French took control of them. Oh, yeah. Then they wanted to kick the French out and start their own German culture and nation. Well, that's, that's essentially it. Just know this. The French had, a few decades earlier, conquered the German areas and imposed a lot of French culture and law on them. And that really, what's the word I'm looking for? Caused the Germans to dislike them. It, it made them resent them. That was what I was looking for. They resented the French for doing that. So they were looking for a chance to uh, get revenge. All right, and they do with the, the Franco Prussian War. But what they're trying to do is because they know they have a rivalry with France, they want to know I've got friends to help me if France tries to come after me. So they form this alliance to try to alienate or isolate uh, France from the rest of the world. So France's response, of course, is going to be to do what? Uh, form alliance of their own. It happens much later, and this Moroccan crisis helps the British, <coughs> motivates the British to join it. And in 1907, we have the, like you already mentioned, the Triple Entente, where you have Great Britain, France, and uh, Russia. 
And again, this is a defensive alliance. So how would this contribute to a uh, world war? You attack me, and then you have to attack all of them. Yeah, exactly. So instead of it, it just being, oh, Germany and France got into a fight, and it's just them, which is, I mean, terrible already because it's two industrial powers going at it. Now it's six, right, if they all uh, honor their alliance. So a fight between one or two, really, means a fight between six in this case. So it's going to not only make the two camps more hostile towards each other and more likely to fight, but also if one does get into a fight, they are now all in the fight. So whatever damage will be done by two countries fighting is amplified considerably by six. All right, cool. And nationalism. This will be the last topic we do, and then we'll, I'll finish the rest uh, tomorrow. Uh, Pan-Germanism? Pan-Germanism. What is that? Uh, basically, Germans uh, wanting to uh, gain power and uh, make their country more powerful. Right. Um, that's really vague. What I'll say is they wanted to unite all Germans under one German state or empire. All right, Hitler is a super pan-Germanist, by the way. Uh, that's going to be largely what starts World War II. So pan-Germanism, uh, we've got uh, Germans wanting a uh, single empire. All right, so that motivates them to form, build, and expand, definitely. Um, but even more clear of a cause relating to nationalism, regarding nationalism anyway, is, uh, is a different one. That's awesome. Yeah, and what's, how is this one different? Because they don't want to make a super nation like the Germans do. They want to free um, all Slavs under, under control. Yeah. So what Slavs are under control of others? In Austria-Hungary. Yep. So we got a lot in Austria-Hungary that are under control of others, like um, Croatians and Slovenians and Czechs and Slovaks and Serbians and others. All right. So we've got a lot of Slavic people that are currently controlled by some form of imperial empire, whether it's the Ottoman Turks or the German Austrians or well, that's pretty much the two uh, that are controlling them at that point. What's the only major uh, Slavic empire slash power I have at the time? Serbia. Russia. 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 Serbia is its own country at this point, but that is definitely not a powerful empire. Russia is though. Uh, but anyways, pan-Slavism. So Slavic nationalism and independence movements. All right, cool. So I do have a series of wars fought called the Balkan Wars in which these New Balkan states like Serbia do expand, yay them. Uh, but there's a group here that's going to spark it. What's the name of the group and who, how they spark it? The Black Hand. Black Hand, right. And what kind of a group are they? Well, a terror, I mean, yeah, they're terrorists. Yeah, they, they do use terror and assassination and bombings to achieve their objectives, their political objectives. Definitely fit the definition of terrorism. And I did say that, but like, uh, if you had to define the qualities of their beliefs, what might that be? An anarcho-nationalist? Yeah, okay, so not only are they anarchists, like they want no imperial governments, but they're nationalists, so they want Serbians to be freed, and then a, a large part of them also want no government at all. But regardless, they are Black Hand of Serbia. They are uh, Serbian anarcho-nationalists. You can, for the most part, ignore the uh, anarchist part and just focus on the nationalist part. All right, so why do they assassinate uh, Archduke Franz Ferdinand of, uh, of Austria? To give a message to Austria and Hungary. Yeah. Why are, they, why are they going after the Austrians, though? Because there's a large population of uh, Slavic people in the within the country. Of yeah, and, and Serbians, by the way, are like a specific ethnic group that are racially Slavic. Yeah, so I think you meant to say Serbians, but they are Slavic. So basically, what's going on here is we have Serbia as a new nation, uh, relatively new nation. They got independence from the Ottoman Empire a few decades earlier. But like you mentioned, there's a lot of Serbian people still not freed, still controlled by another imperial empire. So there's a lot of Serbians in Austria, Hungary not freed. So what these guys are trying to do for years is they're trying to, you know, assassinate, bomb, and terrorize uh, the Austria-Hungarian em uh, empire and government to try to get them to leave Serbia to the point that they're like, yeah, you don't have an army, but you're killing and bombing so many of our, our buildings and officials that we don't even want to bother staying here. We can't get anybody to go down there because they're unsafe, so they want them to essentially uh, pull out of the area and let those Serbians go. All right, so when uh, the Archduke is in the neighborhood-ish in Sarajevo, uh, they kill him in a parade, and that's going to be the spark that starts it. 
All right, so Austria, of course, is going to demand that Serbia be held accountable for this. It's like, well, you might not be the black hand, but you uh, uh, allow them to operate in your country, and we demand some sort of uh, reprisal for our Archduke dying. Serbia, of course, says no. Austria-Hungary declares war on Serbia for this assassination. And that should have been the end of the story. Like, Austria goes and crushes Serbia. But that's not the end of the story. In fact, this is the beginning of a large story. Russia and uh, Germany join. Okay, Russia first, though. Why on earth would Russia join this conflict? Especially knowing this alliance system exists. Uh, Russia tried to help out the, their fellow Slavs. Yeah, all right, cool. So they were... They opposed the idea of... Germans, Austrians in this case, because uh, Austrians are German, uh, they have opposed the idea of Slavic nations being absorbed or conquered or oppressed by um, other ethnicities or empires. So, despite not, as far as I know anyway, having like this official attachment or alliance to the Triple Entente, uh, Russia is going to come to the aid of Serbia here, and they declare war on Austria-Hungary. That's when we get in trouble, because who's got to back up Austria-Hungary now? Germany. Germany, right. And uh, Germany knows who Russia's friends are. So Germany declares war on Russia, and also on France, knowing that France is going to come to the aid of Russia. Uh, Great Britain actually stays out of this initially, uh, because they sort of see it as a uh, kind of an aggressive approach, an improper approach by the Russians. Um, and they actually stay out initially, but they do join shortly after. Why do the British join shortly after? After the uh, Germans went through Belgium. Exactly, okay. So this sparks the war. So you get huh, Austria-Hungary declares war on Serbia, and Russia comes to the aid of the Serbians, who are a tiny Slavic nation, because the Russians are Slavic, and they declare war on Austria-Hungary. And then Germany backs up Austria-Hungary, knowing that also France will back up Russia, declares war on Russia and France. And that's how the conflict looks initially. But the Germans decide they have to uh, end this war fast because they have enemies on both sides, which is problematic. This is the last thing I'll describe, by the way. They've got a two-front war. Nobody else has that. Everyone else, everybody else has one enemy on one side, with the exception of, you know, Austria-Hungary and tiny Serbia, because they're not really worried about them. Uh, but Germany has two large enemies on both sides. So their plan, it's called the Schlieffen Plan, Uh, the plan is take out France as quickly as possible because they are the biggest threat and the most industrialized, and then they can turn around and focus on Russia, who is less of a threat in their eyes. And they are, because they have uh, way less industrialized technology. So the French are ready. They built up their defenses on the Maginot Line on the border. The Germans can't realistically go through there, so their plan is to go through, like you already said, Belgium, Belgium right? And they catch them off guard. They invade neutral Belgium. They almost... Uh, get to Paris. The French stop them just outside of Paris, and Britain's going to join the conflict because they broke the rules of war, and the Germans invaded a neutral nation. So we get Great Britain uh, declares war on Germany, and this is, of course, where they get bogged down from machine gun fire and all that, and that's what we'll pick up tomorrow. Get out of here. All right, so we left off with World War I starting, and um, some... We don't talk too much about the actual events of the war. What we care more about is the causes and effects. But we will take, talk briefly about it because it did actually change the way we saw warfare. Um, so, way more destructive. There's a couple factors. Um, what are some of those factors? I don't mean like specific things. I mean like factors, like broad factors. New war group. Okay, cool. Yeah, we'll get a few of those specific ones in a bit. So, uh, uh, destructive uh, warfare. So we got, uh, how did you phrase it? New tech? Or? Yeah, new tech. Yeah. It's going to make killing a lot more efficient. Uh, what is, what's another factor? The trench warfare. Okay. That's more response to the technology, actually. Uh, but it is going to be miserable. Uh, new weapons. That's a technology. What are the factors we got? It does have to do with the weapons. Not the fact that they're new, though. Bob Blair. Uh, it's just another innovation. Yes, thank you. So that's kind of like the way in which we approach producing these weapons. It's going to be totally different. So uh, total war, and by the way, I'll put in parentheses, industrial warfare. Why would I uh, emphasize the industrial part of it? Because the economy is based around war. 
What's the total war part? What, what's different about industrialized warfare? Take out the total, total war part. Why is industrial warfare more deadly and destructive besides the fact that the technology itself kills you better? They focus more on the production of arms. Okay, and yeah, that's the total war aspect, but it doesn't do the production. So with industrialization, I'm gonna make weapons much more quickly, yes? Yes. Yeah. All right, cool. Even if they were old weapons, I could still make them much more quickly, therefore arming more people, therefore likely increasing the casualty. But yes, uh, total war is gonna make that even more, uh, exponentially increase that. New tech, give me some new tech that um, really changed warfare by killing much more efficiently than we anticipated or had ever seen before. Poison gas. Poison gas, that's more, oh yeah, yeah. Uh, that's definitely new and definitely uh, terrifying. All right. Barbed wire is only really effective because of, I'll put it though. So far everything has been a response or enhancement of this one particular invention. Machine gun. Machine gun, that's the one that changed it. I think I told you before. Yeah. Uh, it is particularly devastating because you can just take out waves of people without having a whole lot of individual, you know, uh, marksmanship. Uh, tanks and artillery. Right, so the tanks are a little late and they're kind of ineffective, but in World War II they're gonna be huge. But they do make their debut here, as well as, well as planes. And then what was the other one you said? Artillery. artillery, that one's a big one too. All right, and then trenches, yes, but trenches were more because uh, they had to hide away from the machine gun fire. They didn't start out with trenches as far as I know. That was like, wow, we just got mowed down. Uh, how can we not get mowed down? Uh, and the results in trenches. Because again, you can't like, well, let, could, let us build a building real quick. Real quick. They, they don't let you do that, obviously. Uh, but you can't dig your way to it because uh, they can't shoot you below the ground. So yeah, we have the uh, trenches. All right, so uh, the casualties are so much higher than any other war uh, ever, in the, at least in the amount of time um, that they are engaging in actual combat. Okay, um, total war also makes this even more, exaggerates these death totals even more. So tell me what this is uh, exactly. And how could I link it to nationalism, maybe? Um, basically the government was, uh, played a big part in it, and there were like, uh, factors like over taxation happened in order to fund all these um, okay. wars again. So state funds and efforts to manufacture weapons. Yeah, so you're gonna have like government stipends to private companies to start producing military goods now instead. I think we need everything they can to get as much money as they can. Increasing taxes, uh, offering uh, uh, um, treasury bonds, which is where you like give the government money essentially, and then they pay you back with interest later. All right, that's gonna be big. Propaganda. Propaganda, why? Um, because it was like, meant to like motivate the people to join like the army or help out the war effort. Yeah, how does propaganda work? So yeah, you want to boost uh, energy and participation for sure. What does that do? Something in my hair, damn it. There we go. Like glorifying the homeland and like, antagonizing the other country. Not antagonizing, but you're trying to you like vilify them, yeah, or, or demonize them, right. That's even better word. Uh, so yeah, you're trying to uh, Make yourself, your country, and your leaders look like the good people, the heroes, and then your enemies, whoever they are, are the uh, evil ones that must be stopped because they're trying to like take all of your stuff and kill all the men and women and children and all that stuff, all right? So yeah, uh, glorify self, demonize others. And by others, I mean other countries. And all the countries do this, or at least the Western countries do this. All right, what else? So far, I've got the government focusing on arms production and propaganda. Uh, civil efforts by people to participate with as much and help out as much as they can be more. Okay, like? Like people working in uh, arms factories. Okay, like who? Who's working in arms factories? Uh, women. women, right, because most of the men are gone, right? So we've got uh, female manufacturers or workers, we could say. Right, cool. What else, uh, and, and why are so many men gone? Army draft. Yeah, there we go, we got the draft. All right, draft. And if you don't know, the draft is the mandatory military service you have when you're called upon, usually between ages either 16 or 18 and uh, 41, at least in modern uh, ranges. So, um, all right, there are some ways you can get out of it too, medical reasons, you're also less likely to be drafted if you're like, you're married or going to college or have a job or have kids and all those things. Um, but um, yeah, so the draft, so I've got way more troops than normal. I've got uh, a lack of, or a desire to produce as much 
weaponry and, and, and provide as many supplies as possible. So I've you know, got a lack of a labor shortage, especially since there's a lot of men gone. So females can fill that void uh, for the most part. Propaganda to try to encourage you to participate a little bit extra in trying to enhance your country and stop others. And then, of course, the government is re, uh, restructuring factories to uh, produce weapons and uh, vehicles and things like that for the actual war. One more, too, about having to do with the amount of stuff you can get that is available to regular people. You're right, it's rationing. Good job. <laughs> what is rationing? Basically where the government uh, limits the amount of like food or material you can get. Yeah, okay, so it's basically reserving as much as it can for the actual war effort and giving you as enough to live off of, but not as much as you can get normally. So, I mean, not that you would, but normally you can go down and just get a bunch of car copper wire at a, at a hardware store, whatever you're doing. Right, that would be much more difficult during a war because they need that copper, copper wire for the machinery um, uh, and the manufacturing of weapons. So that is going to be a purchase that is uh, either cut off or limited, uh, as well as perhaps other supplies like food, metal, medical supplies are gonna be limited too. So it's kind of like, previously there's not really a max on how much stuff you can buy, especially in the United States, uh, because I mean, our government doesn't have those limits for the most part, but during war, times of war it does because it is What's the word? Allocating as many of those resources as possible for the uh, actual war effort. All right, so we got way more weapons, way more, way more people, and the weapons are much better at killing people. All right, so we have these ridiculously high death totals in a ridiculously short amount of time compared to other times in history, and all of human history. Um, and uh, there are some serious physical ramifications for this. Obviously, really high death totals, um, and you're also going to have incredibly high uh, physical. I guess you say casualties. Casualties meaning like somebody who is not, could either be dead or just injured, right? So you get injured from any of these, uh, being caught by strap on metal shot, but you don't die, but now you're handicapped or lose a limb or whatever. Or, uh, which I think maybe you're raising your hand for, was the whole, uh, what's the word? abundance of disease, because you have things like trench foot, because you're always in the mud and the water, and then it soaks into your skin and your, uh, the skill, uh, the cell membranes of your uh, skin gets so filled with water that they break and then you have these little micro cuts and then the bacteria gets in there because it's water uh, and then you have these infections and there's no antibiotics so you either die of infection or uh, cut off your limb and hopefully that works so people are just physically scarred by this but what's the new development that that no one's really anticipating so we've had physical ailments before but a new one appears during world war one that sort of shocks people okay that's a that's a known flu disease that's afterwards but yes or at just at the end. Shell shock. Shell shock. What's shell shock? Um, it's when you experience so much trauma that your your nervous system is completely fine, but your brain cuts off either your vision, sight. Yes, yeah, so you're anatomically okay, but you the perception uh, regions of your brain have cut off the perception or interpretation of the chemical messages. Because so, again, this is a really AP psych, but. You're, when you sense things, hear them, see them, touch them, whatever, it's just a chemical signal to your brain, and your brain reads that signal. So there, that region of the brain stopped reading the signal. And what was the reason for that? I don't know if you said it. You might have said it. Because of trauma. Yeah, they'd seen and heard and experienced so much trauma that their brains were involuntarily, I mean, the brain was voluntarily doing it, but unaware, people were unaware that the brain had like actually shut off uh, that perception area, unit, etc. So they were blind, despite having perfectly functional uh, eyes and optic nerves, or uh, ears, or you know, controlling of, of their, uh, lost control of their movements, even though their uh, motor neurons were fine. So physical and mental trauma. All right, shell shock's a good example. I told you how they treated most of these guys, right? By uh, talking to them. Talk therapy, right. They would get down to the bottom of whatever their trauma or fears were and generally those symptoms would go away over time with the with the talk therapy which really confused people Freud was a big part of that um all right so war drags on goes a few years um again we don't really care about the details so much most of the war fighting goes on over here in the western front where they're stuck because nobody while germany made that initial push the french stopped them before they got to paris and like that line of fighting does not change more than a few miles for the entire war. So four years of you fighting with the same patch of dirt and mud. Um, most people dying, of course, over time, because even if you get lucky for a while, 
something's going to catch you, whether it's a machine gun or an infection or you're caught in barbed wire or a uh, mustard gas seeps into your trench and you don't have your uh, uh, gas mask on or it's not on all, all the way, or a random artillery blast, which is bombing your trenches anyway, happens to get you a piece of shrapnel. There's all kinds of stuff that could uh, kill you. So if you're there in the first couple years of the war, you probably don't see the end of it. Um, that's going on for three or four years. Uh, and if you're wondering how it ends, Britain, France, and Germany absolutely exhaust themselves. Economically, uh, in terms of manpower, they really start getting down to you know the, bare, the, the bottom of the barrel as far as people. Like They start recruiting like 14, 15 year old kids. So like you guys might be put into service uh, or really old people might be put into service or people that have health problems that couldn't before but not now put into service, especially in Germany. Uh, so they're really, really getting down to uh, being completely exhausted of all their resources. Uh, and in 1917, thanks to a few factors, we don't really care. We talked about that in a push uh, when the United States is getting into the war. But just to sort of sum it up, um, we sort of in the United States aligned with the British a little more because we share their culture and language. Uh, also, the we weren't very happy about the Germans using submarines to sink all of our ships in the Northern Atlantic. Still a fair part of war, but still annoying for us. And uh, also, this was the straw that broke the camel's back. The Germans knowing that we were helping out their enemies so much, tried to get Mexico, who was in the midst of, or about to, oh, it was in the midst of a revolution. They tried to get the Mexicans to start a war with us, the United States, so that the United States couldn't focus on helping Britain and France uh, as much. So when we, when the British intercepted that telegram, it's called the Zimmerman Telegraph or note, uh, and we found out that Germany was trying to get Mexico to attack us and be allies with them, that's when we joined the war. Um, and it's not because America at the time was like so awesome or greater superior. It's just that we hadn't been fighting for like three or four years like they had. So we had plenty of people. Uh, we had plenty of uh, machine gun fodder uh, to be thrown at or to throw at them. Uh, and so when the United States enters the conflict, there's just, I mean, Germany just doesn't have enough uh, will or manpower to, to stop a whole new flood of millions of American soldiers uh, who are fully healthy and not traumatized and, and all of that. Um, Russia had actually dropped out. I think I told you why. Maybe I didn't. Uh, in 1917, they had a revolution. It's a Russian revolution. But that wasn't when they dropped out. That was when the new government, the Duma, made the mistake of staying in the war and gave the communists, the Bolshevik party, uh, a chance to have their revolution later. Uh, so when in October we have the Bolshevik revolution, which we'll talk about next week, that's when Russia drops out. So Germany actually gets surprised because they think they're winning because Russia dropped out like, yay, and then all of a sudden the U.S. joins and they lose uh, very quickly. All right, so U.S. joins, uh, Russia drops out <clears throat> due to revolution. And also, too, I should mention, this is better, more important Euro, there's actually technically a coup, or at least the, the Kaiser, the emperor, abdicates uh, in Germany as well, but that's that's more of an AP Euro topic. We don't we don't care about that as much here. So U.S. enters, uh, Russia drops out, but um, a fresh, undamaged United States is going to be too much for the very weary and war-torn Germans to stop. So United States comes in, Germany uh, sees the futility in continuing and surrenders in 1918. Uh, and that's when World War II is going to end. World War One is going to end. It's 1914 to 18. All right. But we don't care that much about the events, other than the new industrial warfare showed that uh, war is really bad now because we kill people too, e too easily, too well. Um, so impacts, we got a few. What uh, was the new, or who, what was the speech given by a US president that laid out several ideas for this post-war world, you got it? 14. Yeah, by, do you remember by something Woodson. Woodrow Wilson, yeah. It's, we just call it Wilson's 14 points. Now we're gonna talk about all 14, we'll talk about, I think, two of them. Um, so he has 14 different ideas about what to do after this war. But one of them is a pretty good one. He's like, huh, well we kill people way too well now, so we probably shouldn't have, shouldn't run as easily into war now as we have in the past. So he has an idea for an organization in the world that would try to mediate conflicts uh, and use nonviolent tactics like economic sanctions uh, to try to get countries to do things rather than go to war with them. Yeah, League of Nations, right? That's a pretty good idea. It doesn't work out the first time around, but 
2.0 version, the United Nations is working pretty well, or well enough. And I already mentioned the two tactics, mediation, that makes sense. If there's two sides that are in disagreement over something and they may go to war, it's a good idea to have a third country or person come in that has no interest in the conflict in that like, doesn't matter who wins the conflict, it doesn't affect them, to come in and try to mediate and, and you know, show them where one side's being unreasonable or, or what demands are you know, uh, inappropriate or whatever. Uh, and, it, and it's annoying and frustrating, takes a long time, but it, it is effective and it's way better than just killing everybody. All right, and then economic sanctions. What does that mean? Yeah, okay. So someone's breaking the rules like they invade somebody, right? Uh, let's say, what's an example? Uh, well, they do this later, kind of. Not exactly, but Japan's going to invade China later. And rather than go to war with them initially, the United States, Great Britain eventually are going to use economic sanctions. Uh, what that means is it could be a specific industry like oil or something, or it could just be the whole economy. Uh, but if one country is being aggressive, rather than everybody going to war with them right away, what they can do is they can just stop trading with them. And that'll really harm their economy, and it always does every time we do it. Uh, and it won't cause them to change their mind right away, but at least over time, a lot of people end up, or countries end up changing their mind because they're a lot less, they're a lot worse off if they're not trading with the rest of the world. Uh, so that is a good way to avoid warfare, warfare and uh, cause countries to change course without using military intervention. Uh, which again, if you've got two really powerful nations and they do that, it's really devastating. Not as devastating if it's a tiny nation and a big nation that just go in and fix things up, but if we're talking two big powers here, uh, you probably don't want them fighting at this point because it's too damaging. All right, what about um, these empires that are going to be ending here, the Ottoman Empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, partially the German Empire and Russian Empire. What does Wilson think we should do with these ethnic groups that are left without a, an imperial ruler, I guess you could say? Uh, yeah, so it's called self-determination, where they choose their own governments or borders and policies, right? Uh, and he wants, at the time, and they still really have it this way, they want it to be based on ethnicity, meaning like common culture, language, race, etc. All right, uh, nationalistic, very nationalistic. Uh, so we have some new countries in uh, Europe pop up that either hadn't existed for centuries or never existed before. Uh, yeah, that one's coming back. So we get Poland. We get Czechoslovakia, we get, what else do we get? Uh, Hungary, right? Austria itself. We also get... Yugoslavia. Serbia's already there, but yeah, yeah, that was the one I was trying to think of. Yugoslavia, actually, uh, Serbia disappears. It's eaten up by this Yugoslavia project that does not work out well. Okay, that's good enough. And also, I don't know if it's the notes, but... Everyone in the world noticed that Europeans started saying, oh, we should let people choose their own governments based on ethnicity, in Europe anyway. So who in the rest of the world might be like, hey, why aren't you doing that for everybody? The Arabs. Okay, yes, the Arabs, definitely. But what I'm, what I'm trying to say is, um, or maybe you got it. Uh, yeah. yeah, any of these colonies that they ha currently have, which, remember, at the time is pretty much most of the world, whether they're Arab or African or Asian or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, they're going to be like, uh, hey, why are you only doing it for these guys? Why aren't you letting all of us self-determine? Because we don't want you here necessarily. All right, so what we have here is a uh, rise in imperial uh, resistance, at least ideas for it. So a couple of notable examples are Vietnam, a guy named Ho Chi Minh is going to uh, come into prominence eventually there. And uh, Gandhi also as well is going to uh, start learning and working on his uh, tactics for battling imperialism in, Indi in India. So those are going to crank it up a notch. All right, a um, couple other impacts here. This one was completely unintentional. Because the world is so much better connected now, and we have a whole bunch of soldiers traveling all over the world, um, what's happened every time we've, we've connected major trade routes? What almost always follows when we do that? Disease. disease outbreak, right. So we've got like the Black Death. It's like, oh, look, we've connected Afro-Eurasia. We're all trading really well. And there's a disease in China, and it's all over the place and wipes out half of the people in, in Europe and other places. Uh, we have a similar, not as devastating in percentages, but equally devastating in number. Um, kills more than World War I itself in less than two years. Spanish, Spanish flu, right. Okay. Spanish flu is going to be uh, after World War II? 
it got the name, by the way. I think it originated in the United States. Don't quote me, though. But the Spanish flu got its name because the first major outbreak uh, came from soldiers that were stationed in Spain or were in Spain. But because you've got a bunch of people in close quarters from the war, and they're going all over the world, um, to and from the United States, to and from Africa and India and, 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 and uh, in Asia, other places in Asia, it's going to spread this disease very, very quickly. Uh, and it's a super-powered sort of virus that people don't have a lot of natural immunities to, because I believe it just crossed over from a, it was like a combination of, I saw this documentary on it like a year ago, but I forgot the details. I believe it was like some sort of cross between two animal viruses that somehow crossed over to a pig. I don't know if you guys know this, but our DNA is actually really similar to pigs. Uh, sometimes when they graft skin, they use pig skin because it's actually close enough to human skin cells that it, your body doesn't reject it. But it was like, I want to say it was like a cow and a, it was like a cow and a bird flu sort of thing. Got into a, a pig and then crossed over into uh, people somehow. And then, um, but I might be wrong. I might be thinking of a different flu. But regardless, it's a brand new version of the flu that we didn't really have resistances to. So when it spread around, it just wiped out millions of people. Like tens of millions of people died from this. More than actual World War I. So that's going to be the world's first a pandemic, which is like a worldwide disease outbreak that kills millions of people, right? We had like the Black Death before, that was not worldwide though. That was just uh, Europe, Asia, and then parts of North Africa and the Middle East, but that's Asia. So it just disappeared like that? Yes, uh, it didn't disappear. Uh, you can't say it disappeared necessarily, as, at least as far as not as I know, but um, either that or we got, we developed immunities to it, or we, yeah, I'm not sure if it disappeared per se, but uh, people stopped dying from it at that high of a rate. We've gotten way better at containing, containing uh, diseases now, by the way, because otherwise like Ebola would have gotten all over the place and, and all that. They do a good job of recognizing it, quarantining it, making sure people don't leave the country uh, who may be sick and all that. But anyways, that's Spanish flu. And we got two more quick topics to talk about, uh, the Arab revolt and the um, Armenian genocide. So I, I can, I've just for sake of time, I gotta do those real quick. Uh, I will do Armenian genocide first. And then I'll do the Arab Revolt. Armenian Genocide. The Armenian peoples are here-ish. Uh, they are, there's definitely some Muslim people in there. They're, they're Indo-European, uh, but there's a lot of Christians in them. So they're not Turkish, and there's a good chunk of them that are also Christian too. So how well do you think they get along with the Ottoman Empire? Not, so not very well, right. And so they know this. So the Turks, the Ottoman Empire, as this war is going on, remember I think I mentioned yesterday they were allied with Germany, I think I did? Yeah. yeah. So that means they're enemies with Russia. So Russia, while they're losing to Germany, they're actually winning versus the Ottoman Empire. And the uh, Russian army is approaching, the Ottoman Turks can't stop them. And they're getting closer and closer and closer to Armenia, which again, under control of the Ottoman Empire. What do you think the Ottoman Empire was worried about happening as the Russians got closer to Armenia? The, um, the thought of having Russia coming in they thought Armenians thought like they would back them up. Yeah, okay, so they thought that the Turks were afraid that the Armenians would rise up since they knew the Russians were approaching. Maybe they were right, maybe they weren't. Uh, regardless, their uh, reaction to this was grossly inappropriate. What they did was, uh, starting in Constantinople, or Istanbul now named, um, they wiped out the Armenians there, and then they quickly went through uh, Anatolia and got to the area of Armenia, and they killed uh, all the able-bodied males uh, immediately, just right off the bat, and then they marched the uh, women, children, sick, etc., uh, to the desert of Syria. And I think, I can't remember the exact total, it was in the notes, I'm sure. Several million Armenians died. It's known as the, uh, what was it? 1.5 to 2 million. Okay, that's actually lower than I thought, but all right. Well, regardless, it's in the millions. Uh, uh, Armenians died, and again, they didn't actually start any uprising, and um, they were, of course, killed without warning, and then marched off, a lot of them, to their death in the desert. Uh, and this is, again, known as the Armenian Genocide. And um, the Turkish people government, uh, to this day, as far as I know, deny it. But we have, we have pictures and we have lots and lots and lots of physical evidence to show that it happened. Um, if you guys know who System of a Down is, I'm sure a lot of you don't. They sing about this quite frequently, or at least they did. So uh, it's, a, it's a big deal. Uh, System of a Down, by the way, they're Armenian. All right. Uh, also, the Arab Revolt. I don't remember if I described this on the... On, to the internet, I don't think I did. So I will explain it again. Arab revolt, pretty simple. These people over here are Arabs, which are not Turks, right? 
they're still Islam or Muslim, but um, they generally don't like being ruled by the Turks. So, in an attempt to try to topple the Ottoman Empire during World War One, the British, who are right next to the Arabs here in Egypt, because they have control of it in the Suez Canal, they're like, hey, Arabs, you guys want freedom, right? And they're like, yeah. So their deal with them was that they would provide the Arabs with weapons and support, uh, financial support and supplies, to revolt against the Turks. And what were the Arabs supposed to get in return for this? Self-determination. Self-determination, right? They were supposed to choose their own government's borders, etc. All right, so the uh, Arabs accept, or I mean, not like all Arabs accepted this, but several Arabs, uh, prominent Arabs accepted this. They revolt against the Turks. They are uh, considerably helpful in uh, toppling the Ottoman Empire, at least their coastal holdings. Like I told you, a lot of their guns were pointed, they are fixed towards the ocean, so then the Arabs coming in from the desert had nothing to really oppose them. Uh, they took a lot of these bases, helped the British out, and World War I comes and they get self-determination, right? No. No. What do they get? Nothing. Nothing. The mandate system, right? So, uh, promise, 1916, of self-determination. But they don't get that. Instead, what they get is a, a uh, mandate system. This was declared by the uh, League of Nations. What the mandate system is, and this is actually quite important, this was the system where all the former territories of Germany and the Ottoman Empire that weren't German or Turkish, they're going to be handed over uh, as a protectorate uh, to the British and to the uh, French. So the British basically get most of the Middle East here, and the French get a decent chunk near Syria, I think Lebanon too. So this is like the French chunk, and this is like the British chunk. And then uh, the Ottoman Empire gets reduced to almost nothing, a tiny peninsula. Uh, on the corner of Europe, and then they now have to start, they start the Republic of Turkey. Ottoman Empire ceases to exist, um, and the British and French take over their holdings in the Middle East. The other holdings have largely been taken already by Europeans, and the British, I believe, get the lion's share of the uh, German territories that Germany held. So the British Empire grew, um, the Germans lost their colonies, also to Japan, by the way. Japan joined the war at the last second to try to nab some German colonies, which they get uh, in Asia. So they get the German portion, as far as I remember, of China, then their sphere of influence, and they get some islands too. Regardless, uh, mandate system. Know that one, because that's going to really destroy Arab and uh, European relations for the rest of the 20th century, especially when the British government starts allowing Jewish settlers to uh, locate into uh, British Palestine, because they now technically own what was Israel. So what they start doing is they start taking these uh, Zionists. I told you about Zionists, right? Have we talked about that before? We have it? No. Oh, you must talk in my world history class about that. All right, maybe that's a Euro topic. We don't talk about Zionism? We never talked about Zionism. No. We skipped that or the sub skipped that. All right, well, I'll have to address that when I come back. Well, Zionism basically believes that Jews should have their own nation. Right, yeah, it's a desire for Jews to have their own nation. We didn't talk about the Dreyfus Affair or anything? No. Wow. We skipped it, or the sub skipped it. I'm not sure. Whatever. We'll catch up on it later. Regardless, just know there was a bunch of Jews in Europe. They've been persecuted for centuries. They're like, hey, we want our own Jewish country. Uh, nobody would give it to them. So during World War I, a bunch of very wealthy Jewish families gave a lot of money to the British government uh, to help out against the uh, 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 Germans. And in return, it's called the Balfour Declaration, the British guaranteed to help the Jewish people start resettling what was old Israel. Uh, so that's what that is. Uh, but this mandate system here and the re, uh, resettling of uh, Jewish settlers uh, from centuries ago, that's going to greatly anger this whole region, well, this whole region uh, against uh, Europe. All right, let's do it. So uh, we have to go back a little bit to World War I, not too much, but just to mention that the uh, Russians were doing badly in. So, uh, Russian Revolution. There's actually two. It's in 1917. All right, a uh, little bit of back info. There were two major instances in Russian history in the uh, last, at least from this point, the last like 60 or 70 years, where the Russians were shown they needed to make reforms. They lost two major wars. What was the first one they lost in 1854-ish? Uh, Crimean War. Crimean War, yeah, they lost that against the uh, 
uh, well, Ottoman Empire too, but they really were, showed their ineptitude industrially against France and Great Britain. So they lost that, and there was a series of reforms put into place by Alexander uh, II anyway, like, you know, ending serfdom and some other liberal reforms. Didn't help out that much, though. Um, Russia tried to industrialize through state sponsorship. They didn't have the money supply. They didn't have financial institutions. They didn't have, like, uh, any sort of gentry class. It was just serfs and nobles. So it was really hard to do that quickly, and they, they couldn't do it for the most part. Um, and the, their lack of industrialization was shown again, although more embarrassingly, during what event? Russo-Japanese. Yeah, Russo-Japanese conflict. All right, 1905, uh, they lose to Japan, which is extra humility because at least before it was a, an industrialized uh, European power, uh, but back then they saw non-Europeans as inferior, so losing to the Japanese is a big slap in their face in 1905. So it showed the success of the Japanese industrialization program and the failure of the Russian industrialization program. Uh, was there a revolution in 1905? Yeah. I feel like I told you. The answer is no. There almost was. What did happen though? Oh, uh, the Tsar had to create a constitutional monarchy. There you go. Okay, cool. And in this, uh, it wasn't necessarily a constitutional monarchy, but he did have to create another section of the government that the people were involved in. That's what I want to know. Uh, Duma. Duma, yeah. That's the representative assembly. So, uh, Tsar Nicholas II, Tsar just means emperor, uh, Tsar Nicholas II, rather than have to give up his throne and have a revolution, he makes a couple concessions. He makes a couple reforms to make people happy enough not to kick him out. So he forms that representative assembly to be Duma. What's representative? Represent yeah. Representative assembly? That to other people. Yeah, exactly. You elect people to go be involved in the government, making laws, whatever it might be. All right, do we have one in the United States? Yeah. What is it? Congress. Congress, right. That's part of Congress, but yes. So Congress, or the two parts of it, House and uh, the Senate. All right, so they have a Dumont, and they sort of expect that to uh, help in and of itself, kind of like the French Revolution where citizens got involved and uh, it, it improved their overall national strength because they weren't just controlled by, you know, feudal lords and kings. It was like they had a part of the government. They had a national identity. Um, not going to turn out nicely for them because, and this is the last time the Tsar will be a part of a losing war, they get their butts kicked again in another conflict in 1917. Which one was that one? World War One. Yeah, World War One. They're losing to the Germans, essentially. Uh, World War One. So... Uh, they're losing slowly. They don't actually like surrender yet, uh, but they get fed up enough to the point that they're gonna want to kick, and then they do kick the czar out. All right, but there's it's more than just one problem. So they're losing uh, to Germany. They're also fighting Austria-Hungary and Ottoman Empire, but they're really just losing to Germany in this conflict. Um, and Germany's not even is Germany giving it their full effort? No, where's the full atten where's the bulk of the attention in, in France, France. yeah against France and Britain on the west western front, uh, but they're still losing badly. They have way less equipment. Um, they're just losing strategically and te uh, technically, uh, or at least technologically. So uh, they're losing. That sucks. So uh, reasons to be upset if you're a non czar or a non noble. Number one, you're losing World War One. That sucks because. Uh, What's the type of warfare they're using here, where uh, they're putting all resources uh, towards this war effort? Total war. Yeah, so it's not just like, oh, some of our mercenaries will be hired lost. No, this is our people that we're paying for and funding and contributing a lot of effort to uh, on, on an individual level. So they're losing World War I. That sucks. There's also a severe lack of food because uh, they're diverting a lot of food to the war front. A lot of those soldiers that would be farming are instead fighting. So they're experiencing, for several reasons, uh, a famine. And I've told you guys this before, a good way to spark a revolution is to have uh, a famine combined with losing some sort of military conflict or political uh, conflict. All right, so those two uh, alone are big deals. Okay, um, peasants also upset for reasons other than just them starving. They got overtaxed. Uh, they were overtaxed through the industrialization program, but um, 
even more important than the fact that they were overtaxed was the fact that they were the vast majority of people, but did they have most of the land? No. no, and we just talked about that actually like 30 minutes ago. That's a major complaint from a lot of, uh, well, a lot of people in general. When a very small amount of people have a lot of land and a large amount of people have very little land, they get upset, essentially. Uh, and hey, if I'm in the feudal hierarchy and I'm like a serf or a peasant and nobles own the land, can I like work my way up to the top and become no, a noble? No, no. no it's, it's like a class limitation. So uh, that's one where people don't have a chance to improve their own lives. And that's when you get revolution, all right? When people feel like they have enough control of their lives to improve their lives themselves, you're not gonna have a, re you're almost certainly not gonna have a revolution. But if you've got a situation where people feel like they're stuck, and they are in this case, by, by class, uh, and they're experiencing a famine and they're losing a war, like it's just like revolution soup right there is what you're making. All right, so uh, you have, I would say, disproportionate uh, land distribution, which means who doesn't have uh, land? Peasants, right. Who does have the land? Nobles. Yeah, in this case, like nobles and lords today. Okay, cool. So that's our situation. So um, the Tsar knows these things are going on. He knows the people are upset. So he tries to turn things around by uh, leaving Petrograd uh, and leading the soldiers on the front himself. Could work out. If they start winning, he looks like the hero. But if they, start, if they keep losing, he looks like the problem. Yeah, the problem. Or, yeah, exactly. It's inept, I guess you would say. That's what happens. So he goes to lead the soldiers on the front, they don't do any better, so people can now directly blame him. Before, maybe they could have pinned it on bad generals, whatever, now they pinned it on him. So in February, and I'm actually gonna point out the uh, month here because that's important. February, uh, 1917, you have a couple of upset groups that want the Tsar gone. Well, pretty much everybody at this point, but especially two powerful groups. One is the Dumas, which you guys already know. That's a legitimate part of the government. That's the representative assembly that they have. But also there's a group that's gonna be important in the second one. The communists or the Bolsheviks? Oh, that's, that's in the October Revolution, what you're thinking of. These guys are involved in both, although more so in, in the October Revolution. We have another group too called, and it's named after the city, by the way, uh, the Petrogra Petrograd Soviet. This is where the Soviet comes from in Soviet Union. All Soviet means, guys, is assembly or council. So it's like the Petrograd Council, if we're gonna use English. All right, well, what's a council though? What's an assembly? Group of people. Yeah, it's a group of people. It's a group of leaders. In this case, it's gonna be upset or disgruntled, however you wanna phrase it, uh, military personnel uh, and industrial workers. All right, they'll be important later. They're not as important in this one, but just know they exist and they are uh, a group in the capital that have a say and some sort of uh, power and influence, all right? So these two groups are upset and they decide to uh, engage in this revolution and they kick the Tsar out, and they do. And the Tsar knows his days are done. In fact, I think I told you that they, uh, when he tried to come back with soldiers to uh, put down the revolution, they just directed his train to nowhere. Uh, so we couldn't actually go back. Maybe I didn't play that, but I told him in regular world history that. Regardless, the Tsar didn't put up a fight about this one. He knew people were pissed at him. He knew they wanted change. So when they uh, opted to kick him out, he just abdicated peacefully, relatively peacefully. All right, so he just sort of said, all right, I'm not the Tsar anymore. I'm gonna take my family and uh, we're gonna go live off somewhere else in one of our uh, estates. So he does that, all right. So he lives out his life peacefully then. No, he's not going to. Did you guys ever see Anastasia as a kid? Yeah. That's this, all right? But they're, they're, this isn't what kills him. Later on is what kills him. All right, so, and his family. And Anastasia, sorry. So, let's pull up the movie. Um, actually, no, wait, in the movie, I think they leave it open-ended, don't they? Yeah. They found, they found her bones, though, recently. Because they, they found the whole royal family's grave, like their bones. But Anastasia, the daughter, was missing. They're like, oh, she got away. But then they found her bones recently, like three miles away or something like that, uh, from where everybody else died. All right, so this is a little morbid tale for you. Where am I at? Oh, okay, so they kick the czar out. All right, it's February. Now, if I'm a new government, it would be a good idea to fix the problems that got the old government kicked out. Can we agree on that? Yeah. All right, good. So 
you would think that the Dumas, who take over, by the way, um, since the Tsar leaves, they're still in there, so they just stay the head of the government. Um, they, uh, you would think they would try to fix these three problems. Guess what they do? Where's the Great War? I wouldn't say they create more necessarily, but they certainly don't fix any of these problems. They stay in the war instead of leaving it like most people want. The famine, they don't really know how to or do a good enough job to, to get rid of it, and they don't change the situation for the peasants. So none of the problems were, that made people upset were, were fixed, essentially. All right, you may hear the term provisional government. This just means temporary, and that's what they were. So uh, this confuses some people, so I wanna to try to clarify. The Dumas, right, the people they vote for to be in the government, they just take over. So there's no more Tsar, they take Tsar, they take over. Uh, they just had their elections, though, in January, so they decide, all right, well, we'll change the government uh, after we elect a, a, a new, fresh um, crew of people. So they hold off on elections to 1918, so that's like almost a year they've got to wait now. Uh, and until then, they're going to temporarily uh, function as the provisional government. And again, you would think they'd be like, look at these problems, we should fix them but they don't fix any of them. All right, what they actually expect to happen is kind of like what happened in France, that people would be so excited to have their own government that they would like try extra hard, make extra stuff, and have this national identity, but this is not 1789 France. This is 1917 Russia. There's no middle class, there's no bourgeoisie, there's, there's none of that. It's just serfs, poor peasants, and nobles, so it's not gonna work out very well. Go ahead and put that away. <clears throat> The, uh, um, your guys' uh, tablets that you have open. Thanks. All right, so they take over, they fix nothing. So do you think they're gonna last very long? No, no they don't, they last a few months. Uh, we have a second uh, revolution uh, in October. It's called the October Revolution, or some people call it the uh, Bolshevik Revolution. So they fix zero problems, or at least zero major problems. And people are still pissed off, so they're going to uh, get the boot. The people that do the booting are this group, who are still upset that nothing was changed. They're still in the war. Obviously, this has got military personnel in it. Not happy about it. No reforms were made to help the economy. Workers ain't going to be happy either. So, uh, powerful groups opposed to this new government. Number one, Petrograd Soviet. They're going to be the ones, by the way, that lead the uh, taking over and the kicking out of the uh, um, Dumas in Petrograd. All right, so them, but they're not alone. There's a whole nother, I guess you would say, wing, radical wing, that's going to uh, get a lot of support from the peasants. So you guys know who they are, I think, right? The Bolsheviks. The Bolsheviks. Who are the Bolsheviks? Communists. Communists. Why would peasants like a communist party? By the way, how many communist governments have we had so far at this point in history? Zero, right? So this is, a, this is a new idea that hasn't been tried. All right, so who, why would peasants like the idea of communism? So they can fix the problem disproportionately. Yeah, exactly. Because what's, what's the first thing a social, remember the step one is take over, step two is socialist phase. Government takes all things and hands them out. Uh, what's the uh, government gonna do if the Bolshevik party takes over with this land? Right, exactly. So they're going to take it from those who have a lot, like the nobles in this case, and give it to everybody evenly. All right, and they, they more or less do when we, when, when we get to it. All right, so the very popular party, and there's more detail in this. There's like a Menshevik party, which is also communist but less radical, but we're not an AP Euro. We'll just stick with the Bolshevik party. So the Bolshevik party is the uh, communist party. And again, very appealing because number one hasn't been tried. And number two, uh, it sounds good to the peasants who have almost nothing, and the idea of getting something for nothing is a, uh, is, is a very what's appealing offer, I guess you would say. All right. But uh, they might not have done as well for recruiting people if they didn't have a super charismatic speech slash, well, leader, I would say, who's good at giving speeches and, and whatnot. Well, Vladimir Lenin, right? He was actually banished from Russia for trying to rile up uh, uh, the overthrow of, of the Tsar, at least reforms. Uh, they banished him to Switzerland, and the Germans, knowing that they could disrupt Russia's government during the war to help him out, sent Vladimir, Bad, Vladimir Lenin back to Russia, and he did exactly that. He just riled up a bunch of support, 
He uh, had a very simple slogan. You guys, did you the sub tell you what the slogan was? Peace. Yeah, peace, line, and bread. Why would you choose those three words? Because that's what the Clinton was working for. Because what problems did they fix? Those yeah, those three, right. So peace, get out of the war, land, redistribute the land, and bread, end the famine. All right, and they're going to attempt to do that when they take over. So we got Vladimir Lenin. I think that's an extra nine. Whatever, I probably spelled his name wrong. Can't remember if it's an E or an I. Regardless, Vladimir Lenin, um, he's going to rally a lot of support from the uh, rural peasantry and the uh, and, and whatever industrial workers there were. In the Petrograd Soviet, they of course have the support of the uh, military and the uh, industrial workers in the capital, Petrograd, which is where most of them were. So when these two groups link up, uh, there's really not much anything the Duma, who is a member of this new provisional government, can do to stop it. So when they rise up in October, uh, promising to, of course, fix these problems, get rid of the Duma, and usher in a, a Marxist uh, uh, economic and political plan, which, again, hasn't been tried yet. Sounds good on paper. I mean, they would agree to that. Um, they're going to uh, have a lot of popular support. So in October of 1917, again, it's called the October Revolution, and also the Bolshevik Revolution, uh, they're going to take over uh, in 1917. And they're going to get right on the pathway to fixing these problems. So Vladimir Lenin immediately goes after these problems. He is going to be the head. Uh, they actually have a, a group, an organization that runs things called the Politburo, but we're just going to refer to it as Lenin for now, just to keep it simple, because he's the major figurehead in that group. So Lenin and his Communist Party associates are going to... Uh, Try to fix these three things. So immediately, what's the easiest one to fix? What can I fix immediately? Get out of the war. Yeah, get out of the war. Right. So they're going to surrender to Germany. All right. So they give Germany quite a bit of land, and actually, by the way, makes Germany think they're winning the war for a while, and then they lose a few months later. So they're going to surrender to Germany. They're going to. Uh, what's another one I can fix probably quickly? Land. The land. Land. Right. So they actually have a peasant committee come together. They take the land by force from any kulaks, which are like rich peasants, or uh, nobles that are left. They take it by force, and they redistribute the land somewhat equally to these peasant committees. So peasant committee, land distribution, right? So they expect agricultural production to go up, right? They assume that, oh, these people have land because they've well, in the case of feudal lords, they probably have, but they've taken it by force and they've uh, exploited us a as workers, which again, feudal system, pretty much true, or at least partially true, enough to be true. Um, but is that gonna actually create more production of, uh, of um, agriculture? No, what's gonna happen? Less. It's gonna drop, right. Because instead of having, because uh, remember, this actually goes back a little ways, back to when Alexander II, uh, freed the serfs, there was actually a good amount of uh, peasants, again, those are the kulaks, who I think we've talked about before, uh, they're the farmers that were successful, good at what they did, so they actually created quite a bit of um, uh, agriculture, which provided a lot of food, but if I take their stuff and distribute it amongst a bunch of people that aren't very good at farming, or aren't as good, I'm just going to have less food, so that's going to be a major problem uh, for them for a while, uh, and that's going to be the major problem for that government is they're not going to be able to fix the famine. The famines actually get worse. It worsens after these reforms. In fact, Russia's whole economy tanks after these reforms get put into place. Everyone expected to pick up, or at least stay the same, but it actually dropped. They have less agricultural production, but they also have less um, industrial production too, because those, those um, factories that were there that had owners that would you know uh, potentially offer raises uh, or better conditions if your if your company produced more or expand that doesn't happen anymore those are owned by the state because remember this is phase two of socialism once they take over or of communism the government's going to take over all assets all right so instead of having like uh, a factory owner who's good at I don't know starting businesses or managing factories or whatever it's just the government doing it. Uh, and they can't necessarily hire or identify people who are good at it. Uh, it's just overall worse. So they're gonna actually have less production across the board. Uh, and that's gonna be a big problem because uh, they've got people who are starving. 
and their economy is doing poorly. So they try this uh, Marxist system for about three-ish years. And then Lenin and his uh, associates decide, this is not working. We're actually going backwards for longer and worse than we thought we would. So they decide to make some changes. So to sum it up, uh, ec economic and agriculture production uh, decrease. So they want to initiate some reforms. Do you guys remember what the name of those reforms were? Did the sub tell you? Yeah, as I say, it's an economic policy. It's not an old one. It's a new one. So it's 1921. Am I on frame for this? I didn't even check. Mm, yeah. Oh, you can see me on the board here? Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, 1921. They make some reforms. It's literally called the New Economic Policy. Fantastic original name. Um, it's pretty simple, actually. Um, what it does is it just says, all right, we're not producing enough things. Uh, because and part of the problem is, by the way, if I bust my ass as a peasant and make a bunch of extra, like farming, uh, I make a bunch of extra um, uh, agricultural production, do I get to keep the profits or anything like that? No, no it just goes to the state and gets distributed. So like, do I have any real incentive to work extra hard? No, because no, I, I will never see the actual fruits of my labor. If I make like an extra thousand pounds of grain, I won't even see an extra ounce of grain because it's going to be distributed to millions of people. I won't even know the difference. Right? So people thought that you'd be able to go, oh, well, we're all this big one identity community. We'll all go as hard as we can. That's unfortunately not how the vast majority of people actually work uh, psychologically. So you have a lack of motivated people. How could you motivate them to make more? Incentives. Incentives, like? OK, cool. So that's kind of what they do. They do a couple things here. They do more than this. We're just going to pick two, though, to be a, an example. Number one. They still have what's called a quota. So like you have to give, I don't know, let's say a thousand pounds of grain a year has to go to the government. You got to do that. But if I get past that thousand, what could I possibly get? Or what? Yeah, so you could keep it. And if I keep it, I could use it myself or I could sell it, right? Does that give me some individual incentive to uh, make a bit more? Yeah. It does, right. And that actually helps, by the way. So they are going to, how can I phrase this? Uh, Allow possession of excess agriculture. There we go. So again, I got a quota that I have to meet that I have to give to the state every year, uh, and I get punished for not or fined for not doing that or imprisoned. But um, if I go beyond that, I get to keep the rest. All right, and that that's going to be enough to incentivize those who are good at it to uh, really try to uh, create more goods or agricultural goods in this case. All right, factories, not as easy to do because no one person owns the factory, uh, the state does. But how could I incentivize my one factory? Yeah, how could I incentivize the workers in a factory if all factories are still owned by the state? That's a tough one. If it wasn't that notes, you probably won't get it. What about it? Like some sort of health insurance type thing? Okay. Well, you, they, they're, ideally, they're supposed to give that to everybody. But like, how profit sharing would be a good one, but they're, that's a good idea. They kind of do that. Here's what they do. They say, all right, we've got, we're going to make a number up. We've got 2,000 factories. The fact, the top 3% of factories that make the most stuff, we're going to give you guys extra benefits, whatever it might be. Uh, maybe it's vacation time, maybe it's extra pay, or whatever. So if your factory as a unit makes more than others, or you increase your production by X amount, you actually get a bonus, all right? So you are rewarded. Do all factories get the bonus for that? No, no. no just your factory, all right? But it's gonna be enough to incentivize workers to do a bit more, because they actually get the reward directly. All right, so you have, uh, how can I phrase this one? Competitive industrial uh, production uh, rewards. And again, that just basically means if your factory exceeds the quota or makes more than your, your peers, other factories, you'll be rewarded for it directly, you and the members of your factory. And that both of these uh, policies are going to be enough to increase the production of agricultural and industrial goods in uh, the Soviet Union, um, which is, by the way, what they named it after the, the communists took over a couple years. So 
that's all fine and well, and Russia's doing better after 1921, but uh, what's wrong with this approach? It's capitalist. It is capitalist, right. And what was the whole objective of their, uh, of their revolution? The economies. Right, to, to apply communism. Now, they, they kind of skipped capitalism. They kind of went from feudal to, cap or to communist. But, yeah, communism is supposed to be the opposite of capitalism. But all they've done is have this communist revolution go, oops, that didn't work out so well, and they immediately start making reforms that are not Marxist or, or communist, they're actually capitalist. So if I'm, like a, if I'm like a hardcore radical communist, and I'm in the government, do I like these reforms? No, I'm, I'm totally against them. All right, and you guys know one guy, at least, that was very much opposed to these. So that in, exactly, it's Joseph Stalin. So in 1924, when uh, Lenin dies, and the uh, leader, I guess you'd say, of the Politburo or the Bolshevik Party, or the communists that run the nation, in other words, uh, Stalin's going to slide into that position. Uh, not peacefully either, but regardless, he gets it. So 1924, when Lenin dies, uh, Joseph Stalin takes over. And that is going to be a very, very different uh, chapter in Russian history. There was nothing about the Civil War in the uh, in the notes, right? I'm pretty sure that's AP Europe. I don't I don't think so. Okay, I do want to tell you really quick because I kind of like teased you with the whole Tsar dying thing. So here's why the Tsar died. When the Bolsheviks took over, this is an AP Euro topic, but I'll tell you anyway. When the Bolsheviks took over, uh, was the Tsar dead already? No. No. When he when he got kicked out in February, he uh, abdicated peacefully and left. So he's still alive and out there. All right. When these guys took over, do you think the entire uh, population of Russia wanted this? Do you think they all wanted to be communists, every person in Russia? No. no. Who might be some people that would not like the idea of being a communist nation? Obviously, peasants would want it. Who would not, though? Nobles. Yeah, nobles would want to, exactly. Who else might not want to? The Kulaks, yeah, or anyone who owns any sort of factory. So anyone who is benefiting from capitalism or the old feudal system. So you could say nobles, you could say factory owners, you could say what else? The kulaks, right? Those are all people that do not like these reforms. So those people actually formed a uh, resistance force. They called, uh, they're known as the white army. And that's made up of, uh, and these are the nobles for the most part. Uh, but they're known as czarists, people that want the czar back because they want to keep their old noble holdings because they had a whole bunch of land and, and, and peasants and whatnot. Uh, but also any capitalists, so kulaks would definitely be lumped in there. Uh, any factory owners definitely lumped in there. Uh, and anybody who doesn't think that Marxism by itself is the solution. So they actually fought against this new government for about four years. Uh, Russia had a civil war for about four years. Uh, which, of course, made things even worse. That's a Euro topic, we won't get into it much. By the way, what do you think the name of this army is? Red the Red Army, yeah, exactly. Oh, those are the uh, communists. So yeah, the White Army was made up of anyone that wanted the old feudal system, uh, the, the czarists, anyone who benefited from free market policies, so like factory owners, uh, kulaks, and then any moderate socialists, ones that didn't want like this total revamping of society. All right, so Joseph Stalin. Uh, he's got a new solution, though, for how to increase economic productivity. What is the? Uh, what are his plans? Okay, we're gonna. I'm gonna hold off on that. But you're right, because that's actually right after his new plan. Yeah. Okay. What the hell is collectivization? Taking all the land from all the people that own it. Okay. Majority owner. Yep. The government will take it and then redistribute it. We don't. But minus the redistributing. Okay. So here's what it is. They take all the agricultural land, I don't know about all, but they take a, a giant chunk of the agricultural land. Now the government owns it. So who's going to produce agriculture on it then? There we go. It's like a wage-based uh, system. So instead of saying, everybody has their own little plot, please make enough food, they say, nope, the government owns this plot. Come and work it for money. That's kind of what they say. So it's like a forced occupation, but you are paid for your labor. All right, so we have agricultural collectivization. I don't know if there's any sort of like pay payment incentives for working better than others. I, probably not. Uh, but uh, I do know that this system 
didn't work as well as the new economic policy, but it still worked better than just saying, here's your even chunk of land, just make enough, please. It, it, it was somewhere in between that. All right, so yeah, at collectivized farms. So again, government buys up or controls the uh, agricultural production and they pay you to work it uh, based on a wage. All right, does that make sense? All right, that one's the easy one. Here's the one that's not easy. Five year plans. So remind me who make who owns all the factories? The government. The government. Remind me who owns all the banks? The government. Okay. So they have all the money and they have all the factories that make stuff. Here's what they do. And here's what it technically worked. So I don't want to say this was like bad and it failed, but it was really miserable for those that had to be a part of this. Uh, Five-year plans are when the government, who obviously controls the money and the factories, they say, here's our goal. We're going to make this much steel, this much coal, this many trucks, this many ships, whatever it is, uh, and they have five years to do it. So what they do is they try as hard as they can. They make you work overtime. They make you uh, uh, work as hard as you can, as long as you can, basically, to try to reach these five-year goals. That's really all it is. This five-year plan is five-year industrial uh, goals. So again, they'll be like, we want to make 30,000 tons of steel. That's probably impossible, but 300 tons of steel. I don't know what realistic numbers for five years of steel production back then, but we're going to make this much steel, this much coal, this many ships, this many whatever. Got five years to do it. All right, so they really crank up the, the production. They use all the state money they can to build more factories, to make workers work overtime all of that. So you have a very miserable population who is overworked. You have a lot of people dying on the job because there's not a whole lot, at least back then, uh, safety on the uh, work sites. They also don't know that a lot of the stuff that they're using is toxic, like asbestos, lead. Uh, some of these materials are radioactive and they don't know it. Uh, so you have a very, very, very high financial cost, a lot of wasted materials, a lot of miserable people, uh, a lot of death. But they do actually achieve those goals. So it was a very brutal way of doing it, but they actually achieved, for the most part, at least the first ones, the goals that they set. In fact, I think Stalin was super happy because his first five-year plan was done in three years, something like that. Um, so yeah, it actually took the Soviet Union, what was Russia and is now the Soviet Union, it took them from being not industrialized to on par with the United States, Great Britain uh, and Germany as far as being industrialized uh, pretty quickly. So once this five-year plan worked in three years, do you think they were like, all right, we're good? Another one. They just did another one, right? They just keep, kept stacking on five-year plans. All right, times infinity. Is that the infinity symbol for infinity? It's like an eight sideways thing? Eight yeah. sideways. Yeah, there we go. That just keeps on going and going. And that's like the standard communist way to, to, to uh, catch up industrially, catch up industrially. So China tries it, every communist state tries it five-year plans. That's what they are. So just know, government controls all the resources, forces you to produce as much as they can to reach these five-year goals. There's a high financial cost, high human cost, a lot of waste and materials, but they do get it done. All right, so that's, I think, it from the Russian Revolution, if I'm not mistaken, right? Okay, sweet. So the reason why I went so into that is because the people that write the AP tests for Euro and AP World, they just love the Bolshevik Revolution. It's always in there for the most part. Like, there's been a couple times when it wasn't, but it's pretty rare that it's not in there. The biggest things they love including in both is French Revolution and Russian Revolution. Like, I've never seen a test that didn't have at least one of those as a, as a focus uh, for a, a, a good chunk of the questions. All right, any questions about it so far? All right, it is a complex network of events, but at least you have a, a layout here. Is it on? Yeah. Yes. All right. So let's do, uh, we'll do the uh, end of the empire, specs of revolution. Maybe we'll have time for the ideas, then we'll take a break, uh, resume at 2.45 and do World War I and get out of here. Uh, so yeah, it's not in order, but oh well. After World War I, we had the end of several land empires. Uh, first one is, let's see, is there, there's Russia, Ottoman Empire, Qing Dynasty, the Mexican Revolution. So we'll do Ottoman Empire first. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the decline first. 
I think we've talked about this before. What made the Ottoman Empire weak? I'll look at the Morgan Buck sheet. Any explanations? You know, just like one word answers. Obviously, one was first. Uh, what made the Ottomans weak was that they uh, they didn't impede or not impede, like industrialize at the time that everyone surrounding them was industrializing. What Germany. time was that? That was the uh, 18th century. 19th century. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 1800. Mm-hmm. All right, cool. Uh, do you remember what stopped them from industrializing? Uh, the Janissaries uh, stopped them from industrializing. Right. Mm-hmm. So the elites and Janissaries were opposed to it and literally killed the sultan that was trying to do it. So not many other people tried. So weaknesses, not industrialized. What's their economy ma- based on? Agriculture. Yeah, agriculturally based. Which is, uh, I mean, at this point in time, if you're not in financial markets and manufacturing, you're way behind. All right, so, and still the case, but certainly back then, all right, economy. economy. Uh, and they've just been slowly withering away. Uh, they lost several things. They lost a bunch of their territories from Russia and Eastern Europe. They lost a bunch of their territory for, for, to Austria-Hungary. They had some uh, independence movements, uh, some nationalist independence movements. Can we think of any examples in the 19th century? Greeks. Yep. Serbians. Serbians. <clears throat> right, and uh, Bulgarians too, but yeah. So you had some... Nationalist uprisings. Examples are Serbia. These are all, of course, the Balkans. Serbia, Greece, uh, Bulgaria, all in the um, 19th century. So they're shrinking in Europe. Uh, Austrian and and Austro-Hungarian and Russian empires are whittling away at them. Uh, The British and French have whittled away at them uh, in North Africa. But even before then, they already lost, like, the Kedavate of Egypt. I don't know if you guys remember that, with Muhammad Ali. They became a, a vassal state, so they weren't directly linked with the Ottoman Empire, necessarily. They got to do their own thing economically. Uh, so they were really dependent on having those landed elites getting their corvée-type labor and some of these taxes. When they lost Egypt, that was a big uh, blow. So they lost Egypt, uh, North African territories, they lost uh, European territory. So they're, they're shrinking, and they are not industrialized, so they're not going to catch up. All right. Anybody know who they decided to uh, join with in World War I? Germany. Yeah, Germany. The uh, Germans and Ottoman Empire had a pretty good relationship. From what I remember, I don't know that much about it, but I'm pretty sure that the Germans were trying to establish railroads that ran through uh, so they could have a connection to oil in the Middle East directly. Uh, but obviously the Ottoman Empire is about to cease to exist, so that never gets to happen. So far as I know. All right, uh, World War I, they're going to, of course, join the uh, Central Powers, which were, at least at the start, Germany, Austria, Hungary, and Italy, but they end up losing. So, they're the losers. And they're going to lose all of their, almost all of their non Turkish territories. All right, what was that system called after World War I that uh, took apart all of the Central Power foreign holdings? Okay, that was that was this treaty with Germany specifically. The mandate system. Yeah, the mandate system. What is that? That was basically land from communism being being spread out from to British and France. Yeah, there you go. It's Britain and France for the most part. Well done. Don't give me that one. That was a good answer. All right. Yeah. So uh, they're going to be picked apart after World War One with the mandate system. So they're going to lose all of their imperial holdings, meaning like all the territories where they have control of non-Turks. So this is where we get Turkey now. So most of the Middle East, Arabia, the Caucasus region uh, are gonna be free. They'll keep keep Istanbul, but this is gonna be known from now on, at least after 1922, as the Republic of Turkey. So no more Sultan, no more empire. It's just Turks run by a republic at this point. Uh, And again, the former territories were given to uh, Britain and France. And after 1922, they're the Republic of Turkey, confined to Anatolia and then that little dinky peninsula in Europe, too. And that's the end of the Ottoman Empire. Any questions about that one? Nice. Uh, Qing Dynasty. We got a nice story for this one. Did they try to industrialize? Yeah. They did. Yeah, they tried that self-strengthening movement where they try to do like basically as little change as possible, just trying to make 
the minimal economic and military reforms because they wanted to keep their superior culture and all that. Um, but that was a failure, and we got to see that fail when? A couple times. The Japanese invasion of 1937. Okay, that was, well, this is before that. We're talking about the end of the Qing Dynasty. That's when they're the, the Republic of China. People's Republic of China? No. Republic, they're just the Republic of China. Now they're the People's Republic of China. Of the first Sino Japanese War? Yes, the first Sino Japanese War. You're talking about the second. First Sino Japanese War? That wasn't even their first one, though. I'll put that up here in a second. What was the first time, or the first couple times, they got uh, smacked around? The Opium Wars? Yeah, the Opium Wars. That was before the self strengthening movement, but yes. So initially they have the Opium Wars that uh, showcased their weakness, and then the, the big one was, like you said, the first Sino Japanese War. Who did they lose to and why was it embarrassing? Extra embarrassing. The Japanese, because they were once tribute state. Yeah, they were a one-time tribute state, much smaller, and to lose to them was extra humiliating. First Sino-Japanese War. Excellent. All right, extra humiliating, because they lost to Japanese in 1895. All right, and uh, another one that's going to be, it's not technically the last rock, this happens a little later, uh, or a little bit before the revolution, but what also angered them and made them upset with the Qing government because of what they allowed to happen. The Right, uh, so it wasn't the rebellion that was mad, that was a result of the anger due to, do you remember, what was going on in China that they were so upset about that they had this boxer rebellion? Uh, yeah, what was it called though in China in the 1890s specifically? What is it called in the 1890s in China specifically? when all of those countries are in there carving up their own economic zone and building factories, ignoring Chinese law and customs. Yeah, the spheres of influence, nice. All right, that's 1890s and all the way, is it 1902 when the Boxer Rebellion stops? One. Might have been 1901, up to 1902. All right, so those are all examples of them declining, showing their weakness, and uh, people are upset with this. Ooh, I don't, I'm not 100% sure if I told you this or if I told my uh, war, regular world history this. Do you guys remember what it was called when the emperors in China, because they had this belief for like 3,500 years, when the emperors in China were believed to have like the blessing or divine connection of the gods? Yeah, this is where the, the, the Han people believed the Qing had lost the mandate of heaven. All right, they rose up against them in 1911, so they thought the Qing lost the mandate. And they're going to uh, have the uh, Chinese Revolution of 1911. All right, and this is where they become, I don't the exact year, 1644 to 1911. I think it was 1644. Um, 1911, they had this revolution. Uh, it's led, it's got more of a Western model. Have the Chinese ever used or dealt with Western government uh, or political ideals before ever? Okay, oh, that's a religious idea, I guess. But um, what I'm asking is, do they have like, in their own culture, did they develop these you know, ideas about natural rights and having a democracy and a republic. It's just a yes, no, it's a no, right? They've just had a dynasty forever, right? They have Confucianism, they're very, you know, rigidly patriarchal, which is uh, the home life supposed to reflect the social life, etc. So this is like totally foreign to them. What I'm trying to say here is it just doesn't stick. All right, so they do have a revolution. They're gonna become a republic. It's led by a guy named Sun Yat-sen. Uh, but it's not going to do very well because, again, it wasn't organic, meaning it didn't like come out of their own tradition or culture. It didn't develop. It works in places like the United States, eventually in France, uh, England, because those ideas developed and were fostered over time there. It took decades and different wars and conflicts and uh, different rules and laws being put into place over time. Here it's just like we go from an emperor to a republic just like that. It's not going to be, uh, it's not going to stick. Uh, at least not well. So this doesn't make China very peaceful. What they're going to have is a very similar situation to what they've had in the past. Whenever they lose an emperor or a dynasty, 
what tends to happen in China, I think I told you this, I, I think it was part of that pre, uh, that summer part. A warring states period. Yeah, it's, it's very similar to that. So a warring states period just means like local powerful families or, you know, feudal lords, warlords, as they call them, uh, are kind of going to try to fight for regional power at least. So it's almost similar to a warring states period. Uh, it's basically just a period of civil war among local warlords. And again, a warlord, it's very similar to like a, a feudal lord. Like they have controlled the peasantry in that area and they're trying to consolidate their control and, and maybe even expand it. Uh, that goes on for a very long time. That goes on from 1912, so this is not a peaceful time, to 1937. And actually, Aaron already mentioned this. What's going to stop all, almost all the Chinese from fighting each other and focus it on, a, on something else? Yeah, the second sign of the Japanese war, uh, which doesn't make things any more peaceful. Somebody else, somebody answer that and just say it's Morgan's room. Second sign of the Japanese War. So that's going to be an uh, eight-ish year period where the Chinese at least stop fighting each other. Uh, but as soon as World War II ends and the uh, Japanese have been uh, have left, they are going to pick up on the fighting again uh, for another four years. That's where we have the communists versus the nationalists, and communists end up winning. We'll get to that later, though. Just know this: they do kick out the Qing because they showed multiple times uh, in the 19th century that they were incapable of keeping up with the rest of the world, so they felt they lost the mandate of heaven and got rid of them. Why didn't this new government in 1911 work out? Yeah, it was a completely foreign idea and set of ideals for China. Uh, could it have worked? Possibly. Uh, probably. But it would need time to develop. You can't just be like, here's a brand new idea, and expect everybody to just uh, go along with it. So again, a lot of civil war and fighting among local uh, Warlords, like feudal lords, and then of course the Japanese invade. They unite-ish to fight the Japanese. I w it's hard to say that they unite because they still kind of like keep their little camps and don't really intermingle much, but they at least stop fighting each other to fight the Japanese and then pick it back right up once uh, the, the Japanese leave. All right, cool. Any questions about the Qing Dynasty? All right, Russia. We're out of room? Whatever. Russian Empire. I don't know exactly what year you'd start this. Sometime around Ivan the Great, I would, I would guess. They call himself Tsar, so we'll say 16th century. Or he's, what is he, 15th century? I forget exactly what year he crowned himself Tsar of the Rus. Whatever. Earlier on, uh, all the way till uh, 1917. All right. Russian Empire. Uh, do they have a couple examples of failing to thrive in the uh, uh, earlier decades, preceding decades? Okay, yeah, that doesn't work. But I want to. I'm like specific examples of like the whole world seeing their incompetence. We'll get that though. Uh, during. I don't remember exactly what war when they fell to industrialized and everyone thought they were powerful, but they turned out to be bad. Yes, I need a specific answer, but I, kn I know which one you're referring to. Someone, can someone else give it to me? Well, France, France and Spain were all... Uh, uh, Spain, Spain was... Oh, go, go. Colonizing America, mm -hmm. and they were becoming rich off of maritime trade. Russia failed to do that. Okay, that's true. But at this point, it's more about the lack of industrialization. But you're not wrong, right? They didn't get in on that early maritime trading empire, wealth building, all that stuff. You're totally right. Uh, their loss in the Crimean War. There we go. That's what you were talking about. So, Crimean War, not super important. It's 1854. It's more important in, in AP Euro. Or is it 53? 53 or 54. Um, the reason why this is important is no one knew Russia 
was unindustrialized and inferior to Western powers yet. They just knew that they were getting bigger, they were a huge empire, and they were a threat. This war, though, when the British and French helped the Ottoman Empire, which was weird at the time, um, because they're trying to contain Russia, they find out, wow, Russia's actually not very industrialized and we have a massive advantage over them. So Russia was definitely embarrassed here. And that's when we begin the, I think it was you, this, no, it was you that said the industrialization, yeah. yeah. This is when they begin that state-sponsored industrialization uh, attempt, which of course doesn't work out well because, and I think you mentioned this, or no, you mentioned this, that they didn't get in on the uh, early maritime trading because they didn't really build up good money supply. They didn't really have any commercial enterprise or financial institutions like you know major banks. So they're, they're way behind the West. They're trying to go from like super agricultural base to all of a sudden jumping into industrialization with nothing in between. So it's, it's not gonna work out very well. So yes, they do overtax and all of that. Uh, state sponsored industrialization, it's not going to be uh, very successful. Uh, they also try a few reforms to be more like the West, to be more liberal and free and have natural rights and whatnot. What do they do in the 1860s that is an example of enlightenment thought? Um, yep, there we go. Alexander II abolishes serfdom and the other um, liberal reforms, which of course ends up costing his life because the nobles assassinate him or arrange it. Abolish serfdom. So they're trying. But they find out that their industrialization program has failed, even though they have a nice trans cabinet and a railroad and all that. What, uh, what shows them and the whole world that their industrialization program was a failure? The Russo-Japanese War. Yeah, it was a big one. Russo-Japanese War. Essentially, a fight over a railroad or access to the railroad in Manchuria. Um, they lost, obviously the Japanese, they sank their whole navy in one battle and beat them on land, and it was bad for the Russians. So bad that the emperor, the Tsar, almost uh, is overthrown. But he is going to initiate some reforms to uh, obviously stay in power. Initiates, not initiative. What did he, what, what liberal reform did he make? The big one, I'm pretty sure I told you this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what's the Dumas? You're like, I have no idea. The yes, it's their uh, representative assembly. What does that mean? <laughs> You're like, that's a great question. What's a representative assembly? Do we have one? Yeah, In the United yeah. States? What is it? Congress. Congress. Do the British have one? Yeah. What is it? Parliament. Okay, so what's a representative assembly? Congress. Parliament. Yeah, I know, that's an example of one. The people legislate. You vote for people, vote for there you go. When you vote for a representative to go make laws and legislation policies for you, all right, cool. So they're like, look, uh, or the czar's like, look, no, we'll 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 be kind of Western. Well, I'll stay the emperor, but we'll also have this Dumas you can be voted into, so you're a part of the government. And that's actually enough to make the people not overthrow him for now, all right. But the problem for the Russians is they get into uh, another conflict that shows their ineptitude. Ineptitude means, of course, they're incompetence, their failure, why they're, how they're bad at uh, warfare in this case. World War I. Yeah, so they join World War I, and they get their butts kicked by uh, Germany. Butts kicked. <laughs> <laughs> That's the technical term, of course. Uh, even though Ger Germany, I almost said Jeremy, even though Jeremy, uh, even though Germany was only using a, a much smaller portion of its forces, because most were off in the West fighting the uh, British and the uh, French, they still outgunned them, uh, not, not outmanned them, outgunned them. They had more equipment, <coughs> artillery, etc., and they essentially beat the Russians while focusing the majority of their forces on somebody else. And that's not a very good morale booster if you're the Russians and you're just fighting a fraction of their army and you're still losing. Uh, so. During World War I, they're getting their butts kicked, they're losing. Uh, also, since most of the men are off fighting and dying, um, and there's not a lot of agricultural production going on, what's probably going to be happening within the economy of that uh, Russian empire? The women are going to settle to the roles of the men. What? The women are going to settle to the roles of the men. That's true, but they're going to have um, a lack of food. That's also known as a famine, by the way. Famine, that's no good. It's a really good way to uh, start a revolution. Like, that's the recipe right there. Uh, be too controlling, lose a war, or have a famine. 
right? Those are like the three things that like almost always start these revolutions. All right, so we have that. And also too, because I don't have a middle class, there's no like gentry or commercial class or enclosure or anything like that. It's just you're a peasant or you're a super wealthy, large landowning uh, noble, essentially. All right, so do you think the peasants, while this is going on and they're starving and they have no money and they're losing, but they're gonna be like, yeah, well, we still got our nobles though. These nobles are great. No, what, what are they gonna wanna do with this noble land and territory and power and money that they have? Take it. Yeah, they're gonna wanna take it, exactly. So uh, they're going to, what, what's the word for it? I guess complain or desire uh, land redistribution. And they were uh, correct in that um, this wasn't like this was a really good uh, worker who worked his way up and purchased property. No, this is like you were born into the family, so you get to control these people on and around it. All right, they're not serfs. They don't have to be there, but they, it's not like they can get their own land necessarily. All right, so you've got all these conditions, and um, that's going to lead, of course, to eventually the uh, Russian Revolution in 1917 when the Duma decides, all right, Mr. Tsar, your time is over, especially when he goes and blames the losses on his generals. He actually goes to the, the uh, fronts and begins to lead the troops, and they still lose. Uh, so then they're like, well, clearly it's you at this point, because you're over there leading them, and we're still losing. So when he tried to, when they uh, started a revolution, this is kind of funny, actually. When they started a revolution in uh, Petrograd, which is the um, capital at the time, uh, he tries to take a train back with some troops, but the Dumas controlled the railways, so they just sent his train off to nowhere, essentially. And he never got there to put down the, uh, the rebellion. So, Russian Revolution, February. Notice the month there, 1917. Dumas takes over, and uh, that is the uh, end of the Tsar, as far as, not as light yet, that's when he uh, loses his power. So, Dumas takes over. They're gonna hold elections in uh, 1918, and uh, they've got about eight, Ten, 10 months to not screw up so bad that they have a second revolution. And guess what they do? They screw up so bad they have a second revolution, right? They stay in the war, they do nothing to address the famine, and the peasants don't get any redistribution because they're waiting for these new elections. All right, so that's when, and we'll talk about this next week, that's when you have the Bolshevik Revolution. I know you don't know what that is yet. That basically just means the Communist Party. You have the Bolshevik Revolution in October of 1917, uh, and that's when, they, uh, that's when they actually go after and kill the Tsar because they're afraid of him trying to stir up uh, resistance and, and overthrow the Communist Party. Uh, that's when the Communists take over. And we'll go into detail on that next week about Lenin and the Bolsheviks and their regime and their reforms. And then they're, oh, that didn't work. Let's try this instead. And then Stalin coming in and killing everybody. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll do that next week. Got Russia? All right. Now Mexican Revolution, and that'll be it. <clears throat> Mexican So that is, I guess you could, it's kind of murky on the exact years. You could say 1910 or 11 is the starting year to about 1920, but uh, the fighting largely stops after 1917, which we'll talk about here in a second. So the, um, I'm just forget his first name. Porfilio, thank you. Uh, Diaz. Porfilio Diaz. He was essentially a uh, semi-corrupt president slash dictator uh, for about 30-ish years. And since there was no real way to replace him, because whenever they try to elect a new one, he would just rig the election. Um, and so after he did that in 1910, they're like, yeah, screw this. Uh, we like this other guy, I think his name is Maduro, better. And um, they revolted openly and deposed him, got rid of him. Um, what they wanted to get rid of, though, was some of the repressive constraining factors of Mexico at the time. I know there's not much context to this because, I, and I don't really like this about the uh, curriculum that they lay out for AP World. They kind of have you learn nothing about Mexico and then all of a sudden you learn about the revolution of Mexico. Like you know about the encomienda system from Spain and that they had revolution in uh, independence movement in 1820 and there's kind of like nothing in between. So let me just say this. A lot of the corrupt practices that occurred under the Spanish continued uh, even into Mexico. And this is where they're gonna try to get rid of a lot of those. So here's the three things, we actually know about one of them. Here's the three things they are focused and bent on getting rid of. First one is they want to disestablish the church. And I know you don't know what that means. 
Church with a capital C, what's that mean? Catholic church. Catholic church. Disestablish means not that you like want to burn the church down. It means you want to take them out of the government. Who's next? At least okay. That means you want to take them out of the government. So does that mean I want to get rid of all Catholic churches and priests no, in New Mexico? No, no, but I want them to have no political authority, right? They're not going to be a part of public education. They're not going to be a, a part of a, a representative assembly or anything like that. All right, so they want to disestablish the church, just like Europe did a long time ago. They also want to, um, those encomienda lords, I guess you could call them, uh, encomienderas, they were like the nobles of Europe, and they had a, um, a much larger share of power and land than anybody else did. It's just like in Russia. you got a bunch of nobles that have all the land just because they were born into it, and you've got a bunch of peasants that are pissed off about that. So what they're going to try to do is they're going to try to uh, rid the uh, landed elite. Landed, of course, meaning they own a lot of land and have a lot of authority and power because of that land. All right, so they want to get rid of the nobility, more or less. They want to get rid of the church out of the government. And lastly, there's some economic imperialism going on in Mexico as well. That we at least know about. So you've got like Western companies, you know, bribing people for perks to have the best land, you know, keep wages low and tax benefits. So that's another one they want to get rid of. Foreign investors. All right. So they pretty much do all of this, roughly speaking. In, um, and by the way, this doesn't necessarily mean that Mexico is fantastic afterwards, but at least they don't have these three entities uh, controlling them. They're going to uh, finally, after years of fighting and infighting, they're going to uh, agree on the uh, 1917 Constitution, the Mexican, Mexican Constitution of 1917. And there's a whole bunch of things in it. The things that I want you guys to know, though, that, that's good enough, is they're going to try to attack... Uh, these establishments. I think even a little earlier, in 1950, they're going to uh, take all this land that's owned by the elites in the church, uh, or sorry, not the elites in the church, the foreign investors in the church, and they're going to redistribute to the peasants. So, they just took the power away from this group and this group. All right, what's left? The church, and that's exactly what they do. They uh, remove the church from the government, for the most part, And they attempt to, in a sort of enlightenment manner, enact some natural rights. And they try to use the government uh, to establish public education, uh, science, and uh, pres preservation of Mexican culture. All at once. Um, pretty much any time in history you try to like do a whole bunch of changes all at once, like completely transformative. It tends not to work out very well just because it's not developing over time. So there's going to be a lot of troubles in Mexico and still are. But uh, at least they're moving in the right direction here by trying to allow natural rights, trying to get the church out of the government, and, uh, of course, taking the power out of the hands of the nobles, or what were like nobles, and um, foreign investors. All right. So... Uh, it's kind of the first socialist slash social justice uh, revolution. Now, of course, we've got all these things already in the West, but were they ever like one single revolution where they just like did it all at once? The French tried. It didn't work out very well. They just went backwards. Uh, there's some countries that did this like slowly over time, adding changes uh, and changes in policy and conflicts little by little across several decades. Yeah, England did that, right? You could argue the United States did too. I know we had our American Revolution, but it took a lot to build up to that point. And even when we had the revolution, we had a lot to change and fix and alter, and that took decades. So uh, generally speaking, it's better to do things slower, but um, better try it all at once than not at all, I suppose. All right, that's pretty much the gist of the Mexican Revolution. So I, I would just want you guys to know they were fed up with the... Uh, uh, dictatorial rule of, of uh, Porfirio Diaz and his election rigging, and they wanted to disestablish the church, they wanted to get rid of foreign investors, and they wanted to get rid of what were like the nobility in Mexico. So their constitution, 1917, pretty much does that uh, in the 1915 land reforms. That's what you gotta know for Mexican Revolution. We good? All right. Let's do the uh, depression quickly. 
And that's probably all we have time for. If we do have more time, I'll briefly tell you about totalitarians. All right, Great Depression. The sub, tell you about that one? That one's easier to talk about, I think. Yeah. Okay, good. So we're probably a little less lost on that one. I don't blame him for not mastering the Russian Revolution. But Great Depression is pretty easy, I think. All right, Great Depression. So we won't get too much into like how terrible it was. It was terrible. People sold their kids, you know, that sort of thing. What, well, you didn't see the pictures? I did. Okay, good. You saw it. Uh, and it's not like they were like, ha, oh, let's make some money and sell our kids. It's, it's more like, we can't afford to feed our kids. Let's hope whoever can can take them and, you know, make sure they don't die of starvation. All right. Or, or temporarily in some cases, like they would send them off with family members or whatever. But yeah, there are some cases where they would try to sell kids off like for adoption. Again, not because they didn't want them, but because they couldn't take care of them. Anyways, Great Depression, 1929 to, well, World War II. I don't know the exact year, but until World War II, which, by the way, was 1939 to 45. So somewhere in there, you would say it ended, uh, between 39 and 45. All right. Causes. So for AP classes, the big thing is, uh, obviously, you want to be able to compare it to other times, but uh, causes and effects here. Effects, obviously, depression, unemployment, economic, just absolutely uh, uh, economic disaster. Causes, though. We want to know those. Causes. Uh, does anybody remember off the top of the head like what the causes were? That would be impressive. I'd be impressed. Um, Not impressed. Um, Just kidding. <laughs> People were investing into the stock market because they were sure everything was going to go up. There we go. Okay, cool. So speculation buying is definitely one of them. Well done. I think that was the second one I had on a list. Overpriced stocks. Oh, uh, that's speculation buying. But yes, it, it, not wrong. So after World War One. Demand for certain things like uh, agricultural products, demand dropped, but production was still as high as during the war. Uh huh. So cool. So, what's the term I could use to describe that? Or inflation. Okay. Inflation. That's actually deflation, by the way, that occurs. Uh, but we'll say over production. And that's, by the way, agricultural and uh, manufacturing, industrial. All right, and then uh, these both contribute to the thing that actually caused it. Do you know it? The bank failure? Yeah, the bank system failure. I sh shouldn't say the bank, I should say U.S. bank system failure. This is where we found out, wow, a lot of people are very dependent on uh, the American banking system. So this is where a global economy is actually a bad thing. So if one major country screws up, everybody suffers. Uh, but it's on the whole better because we all go up together. But anyways, getting ahead of ourselves. So first, let's do this overproduction thing real quick. Let's do agriculture. Um, World War One, farmers doing good or bad? Good. 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 Why? Because no, nobody's really farming, and they could they could sell their. Yeah. Okay. So there's a lot of people that need food for the war effort on on all sides. So even if I'm, even if, how am I trying to phrase this? I'm not just selling to American soldiers or the U.S. government. I'm also probably selling to. Uh, other allied uh, countries, France, Britain, whatever, because they probably don't have enough food. Okay, cool. So, World War I, I have uh, a high demand uh, for agriculture. All right? And uh, that's a good thing. Yay them. And even after World War I, I have a high demand in the United States. Or I should actually specify in the U.S. Um, because the U.S. kind of has to feed Europe for a while. Why would we have to feed Europe for a while? World War I. It's over. But do all of the people that died just get summoned back up like zombies to go work the farms? No, because they're having farmers. Right, yeah. So not only is a lot of their uh, mm, uh, land perhaps not farmable because they destroyed it from you know the, the conflict, uh, but also you have just millions of men are just gone. They just poof, disappeared, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a lack of... Uh, uh, agricultural production. So the U.S. sort of makes up for that. Japan too, by the way, but mostly the United States. Uh, they're going to uh, have a big market in Europe. And we have, fortunately for us, we had a lot of space to, to do it. So during World War I and right after, we have high demand because, again, a lot of Europeans have died. Their economies are in shambles. It's taken them a while to recover and get back up to their regular production. So for quite a few years, in fact, most of the, the, uh, uh, the 1910s and the 1920s, 
we uh, have a period known as, well, the 20s anyway, the Roaring Twenties. Um, because it doesn't matter what sector you were in, whether it's agriculture or um, manufacturing, if you were in the United States, there was a huge demand for the stuff you make. Because again, we just went over it. In Europe, they destroyed themselves. Most of the men died, at least in a generation. Uh, a lot of the facilities that they were building things or farming with were destroyed. So if I needed manufactured goods or agriculture, you would buy them from American companies. So if I'm in the United States, my demand just skyrocketed. I'm just making a bunch of money, essentially. So in the 1920s, I have a huge demand because Europe just sort of punched itself in the face and was unconscious for a while. When they wake up, though, and their manufacturing and agriculture production pick back up, how, what's that going to be like for uh, American farmers and factories? Demands Demands going to drop. drop, exactly. And that's going to be a problem because of a new, two new things. First new thing is a thing called credit. Y'all know what credit is? Mm-hmm. Yeah. What's credit? That's basically the trust that you build over time which, in which lenders can see and they'll give you money. Yes, but, but take out the trust and the time here. Just lending money to people. All right, so if I loaned you $1,000, like, do you just pay me back $1,000? No. no. What do you pay me back? $1,000 plus interest. Plus whatever the interest is, right, which in most cases is probably about double. So um, even though it says, like, oh, 6%, uh, it's not that you only pay back, you know, 60 bucks in the case of 1000 You end up paying a compounding interest rate across uh, several years, which ends up being about double, which is quite disgusting. So um, nonetheless, this whole credit thing is going to be new. We've had credit before, which is what you were describing, uh, but this one's going to be like minus the trust. They're just be like, do you have a job? Great. Here's a loan. That's kind of what it's going to be. Uh, and in some cases, they don't even have a job. Um, so you're, you might be wondering, like, well, why would they use this credit? Because if I'm a farmer or, or a, um, a factory, and there's actually, like, more people that want to buy my stuff than I can actually make, do I need to make more? No. Okay, let me rephrase that. I can make 100 cars a year at a factory, but there's a demand for 300 cars. So there's 200 people that want a car that don't get it. Do I need to make more cars? Yes. I do, right. So that means I need more workers, right? Yes. I need more factory supplies, all that? Yes. Okay. Do I probably have enough money to just pay for several new factories to be built? No. No. What am I going to need then? A loan. right. So you go the credit route. So whether I'm a factory or I'm an individual farmer, I'm like, wow, I need to make more stuff. There's a lot of people who want to buy this. Uh, factories bought, uh, hired more workers. They bought more materials. They built more factories. Farmers bought more land, uh, bought more equipment, because they knew, or at least they thought, even if I borrow the money, I'm making so much, I can just pay it off later. And that works if the demand stays high. But the only problem is when Europe comes back into the fold and they start making factories again, or they start making manufacturing goods again, they start farming again, what's going to happen to the amount of people who want to buy my stuff from the United States? It's going to drop. drop. Why am I going to be in trouble? You got a lot of loans to pay back, right? So it would have worked out if that demand stayed high, but it's not going to. So here's where, here's where farmers and, and companies get themselves in trouble. Is uh, and it's not a bad idea based on what they saw. They uh, borrow money uh, to uh, make more money to make uh, more. So again, I buy new factory uh, factory equipment or farming equipment or hire more workers or I buy more land, whatever it might be. I take loans to do that, but it works as long as that demand stays high. But when Europeans, in the late 1920s, like the latter half of this, when they start you know, coming back into the fold with uh, agriculture production and uh, manufacturing production, my demand drops. And again, the problem here is I borrowed money, and now that less people are buying my stuff, uh, I'm in trouble because I can't pay my bills. So this cycle starts going backwards. It starts coming back at them. So all those farmers and factories that borrowed money uh, to make more, they're, they're getting bit for that decision when Europe uh, re-enters the economy uh, and the uh, agricultural sectors. All right, do you guys kind of see that that's a problem? Yeah. All right, why did they get a bunch of credit in the first place? Because the demand was high. The demand was high, right? So anything make more, I'll borrow more money, produce more things. Cool, I'll just pay it off over time. That works, except when? When Europe comes back, recovers, and what does that do if I'm an American farmer? Yeah, exactly. They're not buying my stuff anymore. 
Again, why is that a problem? They have to pay back their loans. Right, so making us less money, but yeah, that's a problem. I got to pay back those loans. So what happens is, well, you got, do you guys know what happens if you can't pay the bank back? They take your they, they, take, they take your stuff exactly. So if I bought a new tractor and I can't pay it back, tractor's gone, or land's gone, or factory's gone, or whatever. All right, so I very quickly have this nasty cycle that goes in reverse, where farmers that were doing good a couple years earlier, now all of a sudden, uh, the bank's confiscating uh, my equipment, my land, or whatever, and, and I very quickly have an unemployed farmer, all right? If I'm a company, I got a factory, and my uh, demand drops, because Europe comes back into play, or, or whatever, do I immediately just have to shut down my factory? No. No. What do I do first? Let workers go. I can, and I'll also give the answer because that's the correct answer. If I'm a factory, and uh, there's less demand, like Europe comes back into play, less people want to buy my stuff. So I have, I have like a surplus of things. I make a thousand, but only 500 people want stuff. I'm like, I'm left over 500. All right. Uh, so I'm gonna have to make less. Okay, and that's when I start laying workers off. All right, so if I'm a factory and I don't need to make as much, well, goodbye, Joe and John and Jim and all of my workers whose names start with a J, apparently. Uh, they are all now without a job, all right? Um, because as a factory, I, I had a surplus. I didn't need to make as much. I had, like, extra. It's like, well, i got to cut costs, so I'll, I'll start uh, getting rid of workers. Or I'll shut down, like, one of my factories, which means all of those guys get laid off. Uh, so what you see happening is in both the manufacturing and the agricultural sectors are, uh, you have layoffs, or in the case of farmers, people that have their stuff taken away. All right, so they don't have a job, and now they have no stuff. So we have uh, layoffs, and uh, what's the word looking for? Not confiscations. Foreclosures. Foreclosures, that's more of a, yeah, we'll just say confiscations. All right, but they can't work anymore. So they are, in both of these cases, they are unemployed. Why is that such a bad thing? Exactly. So now the people in the United States that were buying stuff, they're buying less because yeah, they don't have jobs, right? So this, this is nasty cycle that goes in reverse. Uh, there's a cycle that really helps you out. It's, I think I've shown you this before. It's if there's more money coming into the economy, right? And in this case, it was loans from the banks. Uh, what do people do when they have more money? Spend they spend it. Some might save and invest, but for sure people spend more. All right. So they use that money uh, to buy more. Okay. They buy more stuff from uh, factories. What do factories do in response? Yes, they might raise their prices, but if I have got a thousand people that want something and I'm only making 500, what am I going to need to do? Produce more. Produce more. Right. So I need to make more. But to do that, what do I need to do as a company? Hire more people. Hire more people. Cool. That means more people have jobs, so they have more money. What are they going to do? Spend more. Spend more. Which means that I have to? Make more. Which means I have to? Hire more. Right. It's, you see the cycle here? All right. So what happens, though, when uh, something stops this? Less. Yeah. Less what happens to the cycle? Less money. Yes. It doesn't just stop. What does it do? It ah, it starts going the other way. Exactly. So when I get people that are being laid off and unemployed, that's less people buying things. That's less money in the economy. So it starts the cycle going in reverse. So that's overproduction. All right. Boom. Any questions about that? Okay. One thing I forgot to mention, by the way, is they had a new technique that allowed them to make way more stuff than they could actually sell, and that was called the assembly line. Henry Ford. That was, again, instead of making a car by myself, uh, which takes a long time to do, I would be a specific specialized worker who stands in basically one location uh, on an assembly line, and I'm doing the same task over and over. So instead of me building a whole car, which takes a long time, needs a lot of parts, uh, I'm just staying in one place and putting one part on that car all day and then it goes down the line so like let's say i'm like the wheels guy right here it comes down the car that's already partially made i stick my wheels on and it goes down and then the next guy puts on the doors and the glass and there it goes it's done 
All right, that's an assembly line. It's actually a much quicker way to do things uh, because yeah, it's specialized. So you get really good at your job. Uh, you have a bunch of uh, tires or whatever you're putting on stacked up. So when it comes down, just put it on, goes to the next one. Put it on, goes to the next one. Uh, it's a much quicker process. So that also increases production a lot, which leaves them with a surplus, which means they have to lay people off when they stop buying. All right, speculation buying. Stock market. Okay, so the stock market. Um, that is where you, a stock, have I told you what stocks are? Yeah, I did, because we talked about financial institutions, right? Okay, so you're buying a part of a company, you remember that? Yeah. All right, and then you can, you can trade it. If your company does well, obviously the value goes up, so you could potentially buy it early when it's cheap, and then the company does well. Oh, now it's worth 30 instead of 10, sell it, make money. Remember that? Yeah. Okay. So as long as the company's doing better for the most part, your stock value goes up, right? Yeah. Okay, cool. So in the 1920s, what's happening to pretty much all companies? Sure. They're getting bigger and better. They're growing, right? Because, you know, Europe's out of it. Uh, the United States is untouched. We make much stuff. We sell much stuff. Pretty much any company you could pick is doing well, better. So if I put money into a company after a couple years, what's probably happened to that money I put into it? It's gone up. It's gone up, right? So, and, and you can't really fault them, but you kind of can because they're not thinking about it. Um, for a long time, for like 10 years or so, it was like a guarantee if you bought stocks in a, in a semi-big company, you were gonna make a lot of money. And you didn't have to do anything. Like I just go, okay, what's it? Ford, there you go, they come up with the assembly line. It's like, oh, I just buy a bunch of stocks in Ford, it may say $1,000 worth, I just go about my life, herp de derp de derp Three years goes by, oh, those are worth 4000 now. Ta-da, I just made $3,000 and I did nothing. pretty much nothing except buy that stock, right? Uh, that was a pretty much that was pretty much a guarantee was that if you bought money in a company you would make money all right so what do you think people are gonna do if that's the situation buy, the stocks. buy stocks right and they also make it a little worse when they add credit to the stock market with a thing called buying on margin which is a fancy way of saying here's a loan to buy stocks all right so what happens is since these companies are doing well everybody's buying them and Banks and uh, other lenders are giving people money to buy stocks very 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 quickly the prices of stocks become inflated What does inflated mean? Uh, obviously means big, but what does inflated mean? economically value goes up, actual value. Not just the value goes up, but Because it does You have so much money that the the thing becomes cheap. So in order to like Stay equal stay equivalent the prices go up They do right, but it's that's just a general development over time between wages so and production costs. It's actually the, the, I think you guys know this, it's just hard to articulate. It's when the price gets so high, it exceeds what it's actually worth. All right, you're like, what does that mean? What that means is, we just had this happen a few years ago uh, with, the, with the recession. Houses went from like going for $200,000 in like mm, 2000 to 2007, they were going for $650,000. Does that sound like a big increase? Yes. 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 So only six or seven years have gone by, and yet the house of prices, the house of prices, the prices of houses have tripled or quadrupled. Do you think people are gonna pay $650,000 for a house when a few years ago they paid $20,000, $200,000 for it? No. No, that's where the price has gone way above what people are willing to actually purchase. So that happens to stocks, which is quite bad. So too many people invest because Things are doing well. In fact, they're borrowing money to do it. And eventually, these prices of these stocks get so high that people just decide that's too much. All right, so people stop buying stocks. Here's the problem, though. What happens when people stop buying a stock? Okay, but let's just say it stayed the same. Well, it could lose value. If people stop buying it, how would I sell it? If $10,000 for a stock is too much and I'm trying to sell it, what am I going to do? Lower it. I'm going to lower it. Ooh, here's where the problem starts. Whenever the market, in this case the stock market, gets too high and people stop buying, everybody lowers the prices. But there's a major problem here. What happens if stock values start dropping? They lose money. Okay, yeah, that's true. They do lose money. Um, are you going to buy stocks if the value is decreasing? No. 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 Right? So what's going to happen if no one's buying it at 9000 It's going to drop to 8000 
What happens if nobody buys it at 8,000? It's going to go to 7,000, right? And that's exactly what happens. This is when this is called a bubble bursting, essentially. The Dutch had this happen with tulips. Uh, they found tulips, uh, and they brought them back to uh, the Netherlands, and they were so, like, uh, beautiful and rare that it became a sign of, like, uh, uh, wealth and power to have them. And people went crazy over this. They, like, traded entire estates and houses for, like, one tulip seed. Um, <laughs> That's how ridiculous it got. And then uh, pretty soon, I mean, there were a lot of tulips around and no one cared about them, or not enough anyway. So all these people that traded their whole life savings and their house and, and all this land for these tulip seeds was just like, well, here are my tulips, and now no one will pay that much for them, so I've just out all of my money. Uh, that happens with the stock market. Uh, but it's worse than that. It sucks if I bought something for 10000 and then I can't sell it and it goes down to $200. It's like, wow. I just lost $9,800. That sucks for me. Why is it worse, though, if I borrowed the money? Because you don't pay the Yeah, you're in debt, too. So it's not just I lost the money, it's I actually owe somebody else the money. All right, so this is where we start seeing a, uh, oh boy, what's the word I'm looking for? It's, it's a negative cycle. It's, it's sort of like this. Once people stop buying them, it's getting too expensive. No one's willing to buy them, so the prices just plummet to the point that you can't get anywhere near what you paid for your stock. So people just lose millions and millions and millions of dollars in just a couple days when these stock prices just absolutely hit the floor. It was so bad, by the way, that like people would uh, lost entire fortunes in just like, like overnight, essentially, because they put like a million dollars in the stock market and the whole thing crashed, and now they could only get a thousand dollars for the million they put in, uh, so they'd like jump out of the building or, 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 or whatever. Like they, it got pretty severe. Uh, but uh, that is. Um, one other reason why uh, the economy is going to tank. A lot of people just lost most of their savings and wealth in this uh, stock market crash. Um, it did actually recover later, but the damage was already done. People no longer had faith uh, in this institution. Uh, and the last thing I'll say is the banking system failure, this is where we'll, once I explain this, we'll go. The banking system failure is what actually kicks the uh, Great Depression into, uh, into action. This is where because uh, all these people have no jobs and all these stocks and brokers and uh, other companies are losing money, nobody's taking out loans. In fact, they're unable to pay their loans. So if I'm a bank, does that mean I'm making or losing money? Losing. losing. So here's what happens to the small banks. If I'm a big bank and I got you know, millions of dollars and I lose a little bit, I'm okay. But if I'm a small bank and some of my investors in the stock market or some of my uh, customers who borrow money to get land or equipment or whatever. If I lose a little bit of money, I lose the bank. But back then, if I had $100,000 in the bank and the bank went under, what happened to my $100,000? It's gone. It's gone. Poof, it's gone. So here's what happens. It's called a run on banks. It's like a panic. When some Everyone small does. banks start failing and people lose their money, what's going to happen to all the other people that have their money in other banks? Everyone's yeah, they're, they're, they all panic. Like, oh, I don't want my bank to go in or lose my money. So everyone, it's called a run on banks, everyone goes to the bank to pull the money out. And so then any small banks that were left, they go out of business. Medium banks also go out of business. Uh, and so what we have here is, is, is a banking system failure. Yes, a lot of the big banks do stay in business, but when I lose banks, this is what I lose. I no longer have loans coming in keep the economy flowing. So a combination of unemployment, uh, a loss of stock, wealth, and a lot, lack of loans to the bank have this cycle going backwards. And no one knew how to get that cycle going again. So that's why we have um, a, a, a depression in the United States. And because the whole world was dependent, at least partially, on loans from US banks, when US banking system failed and stopped giving out loans, or at least as many, uh, it didn't just cause mass unemployment um, and economic mm, disaster in the United States. It also uh, happened, uh, affected the economies of Europe and Japan and everybody else. So it wasn't just the United States that got this. This was the first global depression because the U.S. banking system failed. Right? And, and it's all these factors put together that caused the small banks to fail, which caused the runoff banks, which caused the medium and small banks to fail, which stopped all the loans coming into the economy, which crashed the U.S. economy, and then crashed the economies uh, of the rest of the developed world. So that is how the uh, Great Depression occurred. And what they're going to try to figure out, and this is what I was hoping to get to, but I didn't, is how to start the cycle back up again. 
all right? And that's where John Keynes comes in. So we left off, uh, we had just finished the Great Depression last week, and now we're gonna talk about the way they tried to fix it, then we'll do totalitarians, and we'll try to squeeze in World War II super fast. Um, yeah, that's the goal. And then uh, next week on Tuesday, because it's finals week, next week on Tuesday, we'll do a study hall for Cold War, decolonization, counterculture, and then the Wednesday will be the last one about the stuff from that week. And that'll be it for AP World, and then on to Euro, and then a couple of you on to whatever class you're doing. All right, so, uh, Great Depression. We had uh, a few causes. Can you close the door all the way, please? Uh, we had a few causes. Um, overproduction, credit, banking system failure, et cetera. First global um, depression. How did, no, who was the guy that came up with the theory about how to possibly fix the problem? Which was, if you guys forgot, uh, we kind of like broke the, the, the money flow into the economy, right? So banks were providing money before, which gave us all more money, which means we bought more stuff, which means we uh, need to make more if you're a company, which means you uh, hire more people, which means they have more money, and they buy more, it's that cycle. Uh, when the Great Depression occurred, and we broke our banking system, it stopped that nozzle that was pumping money into the economy. So what happened to this cycle? Reverse. Yeah, it, it stopped and it started going in reverse, right? Because, oh, less people have jobs, so they need to make less stuff, and, or they have less money, um, so they make less, and it just goes in reverse, and they buy less, and they have less money, all those sort of things. So what was the, uh, or who was the guy, if you remember, uh, the guy's name who uh, came up with an idea about how to start this cycle back up again. Nope, he tries a strategy though, at least halfway. It's a British guy. Keynes, there you go. So it's John, uh, John Keynes, John Maynard Keynes. Uh, and his theory is called, it, 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 it could be either one. It's called Keynesian economics, put his name in it, or some people call it demand side. All right, here was his uh, solution. He was like, well, we need money coming to the economy, but our banking system failure, our banking system failed, so the private sector is not pumping money into the economy, so this thing can't start back up again. They were stuck for a long time. So his, uh, his theory was, well, there's one other entity that could force money into the economy. The government. The government, right. They could borrow from the banks that are left or other countries or whatever, run up their debt temporarily, that's the idea, and instead of uh, banks pumping money in to start jobs, the government pumps money in, uh, in two ways. Either they pay for private companies to make them stuff for the military, or the uh, government hires, uh, for example, construction companies to make a bunch of infrastructure things, like bridges and roads and dams and things like that. All right, is that supposed to be a permanent solution? No, the idea is once you start getting that money in, and you start uh, giving companies opportunities to build things, whether it's military equipment, or like I said, construction companies and infrastructure projects, that's supposed to theoretically sort of get this rolling again, because you hire some people. So now those new workers that are at the factories or in the military or, or on construction, they have jobs now, correct? Right? They do. You guys are so quiet. All right, so if they have more money, what are they gonna do with that money? They're going to spend it, right. They will probably, since the Depression, hold on to a little bit more of it than they normally would, but they'll still spend some. And the idea is that gets that uh, cycle to, uh, to roll again. So the government spends uh, money on military spending. So they order a lot more tanks, cars, guns, etc., for factories to build. Um, and they also increase infrastructure projects. Remind me what that is? Construction. Construction of what? Bridges, roads, dams. Yeah, exactly. Public goods. All right. Yeah, bridges, roads, dams, etc. All right. That all works. Uh, why is it called demand side, though? I know this is all stuff the sub taught you. But why would we call it demand side? What are they trying to do? What's the goal here? To stimulate demand. Yeah, they want to stimulate demand. And they do that by uh, creating jobs. And, and that gives people money. Uh, so then you have a demand for goods because people have the money. So they're trying to uh, help restart the economy by creating demand. And they do that by using government money uh, to pay companies to hire people, essentially, uh, to give them money, 
and also so they start spending it. And that restarts the cycle back up. All right, so the goal is we need demand again. The demand dropped to nothing because this nozzle uh, got cut off, so people didn't have money. They weren't buying things. There was no demand for businesses, and that started going in reverse. So they're like, all right, let's create some demand. Let's uh, pump a bunch of money in the economy, get people to hire, uh, get companies to hire people so they have money. That, that'll create demand. Like, oh, I have money now. Now I can buy things and start to back up. All right. Why is that not a good long-term solution? The people will lose their jobs once the structure gets done. That's true. You could always keep building, though. What's it mean to deficit spend? I said they deficit spend. The government is deficit spending. The government is taking too much debt from it. Yeah, okay, so the government's spending money it doesn't have, it's borrowing money. It eventually has to pay that back. Do you think people, banks or other countries, are gonna keep loaning money to a country that doesn't pay its bills back? No. No, right. So it, it's not like a forever solution because if you stop or you don't pay things back, people aren't gonna loan you the money even if you're the government. Right, and then you have to like just take it, and then you're just a communist government, and it's not going to work anyway. Uh, so the idea is, once this starts getting back up again, the government's supposed to start uh, pulling out of the uh, spending. So they're supposed to, you know, reduce the amount of infrastructure projects or military stuff they're doing slowly, while the private sector gets going again, and then they can repay their debt. The United States does not do that, by the way. We just spend the whole time. And we're still spending. You guys ever seen our, our uh, national debt? Like yeah, it's like near 20, is it 20 or 21 trillion, which looks like this, in case you're wondering. Thousand, million, billion, trillion. So if every person in the United States gave every dollar they could to the government to repay their debt for a full year, we still couldn't do it. It would take almost two years, a year and a half at least. But that's impossible. People can't just give all their money to the government. So, and this is going up. You should, by the way, look up the ticker. Like, it's always going up, and this number, like, you can't even, the numbers are moving so fast down here, like, it just looks like, like zero to, zero to nine over and over. You can't even tell uh, as this thing keeps increasing over time. It's ridiculous. Anyways, hopefully that keeps going while we're, uh, before we, we all go uh, later on in life. So anyways, uh, that is the idea behind it. Okay, so we talk about two countries that either fully or partially do this. All right, and it does work at least for one. Uh, in the short run. We never got to see how it played out in the long run because they lost World War II and ceased to exist. But uh, who's going who's gonna to use this strategy to try to help their economy out? What two countries? Nazi Germany and... Yeah, exactly. So using this uh, tactic is going to be uh, the U.S., right? And the, the, the main proponent of that is the president, FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And he can't make laws himself, but he's going to propose them to Congress to pass. And they're going to... They're going to want to change something because uh, it's the middle of the depression and they're, they're willing to uh, try this new strategy even though they don't go all in. All right, Nazi Germany kind of goes all in though. So all you need to know really is what this is, kind of basically how it works. Like you don't have to get too into it. Just know the government's going to try to create jobs so that the uh, economy can start back up again. People, I mean, they spend it and it's slowly supposed to uh, back out. All right, U.S. and Nazi Germany. So Nazi Germany, after 1933, when the Nazis take over, uh, they're going to go all in on this. They're going to use both of these strategies. They're going to rebuild their military by borrowing money and forcing corporations uh, in um, Europe to uh, do their bidding, essentially. Did you guys know the Nazis were socialists, by the way? Yeah. You did? Okay, that's actually what the uh, uh, Nazi stands for in, in German. It's like the, uh, it's the National Socialist... Um, I can't remember what the German words are for, but it's National Socialist. So uh, even though they're very anti-Marxist, they were, at least that part of them was pretty Marxist, where the government would control corporations and the economy uh, to help out the nation. Now the difference is their goal wasn't to like spread communism throughout the world. Their goal was to make Germany better, but it's definitely still socialism. Uh, but anyways, so Hitler and the Nazis are going to, of course, re-militarize. So they borrow a lot of money. Uh, they're going to uh, borrow a lot of money to build things like new tanks, uh, new planes, new bombers, new bombs, uh, increase the size of their military, build a lot more U-boats. They also start building the first Nazi aircraft carrier, which never gets finished. Um, it's in the bottom of the ocean in the, in the, the North Sea, I think? The Baltic Sea, whatever. The Russians sunk it. The Russians took it after World War II, and they're like, how do we sink a carrier? Like, I don't know. 
let's practice on this. So they just like sailed it out there and just bombed it a bunch of times so they figured out how to sink it because they didn't have one. So anyways, uh, they remilitarized, they built a, a ton of equipment uh, and they expand their military a lot. Uh, they also are going to use, uh, spend a lot on infrastructure. So here's a couple things they're gonna build a lot of. Uh, you guys know what the interstate system is here in the United States? That's a big no. So what's that big freeway like right over there? Oh. Well, between states. Yes, it does go between states, right? It's called, uh, that, that's Interstate Highway 5, right, I-5. That goes all the way from, I don't know where it ends in Mexico, but it goes all the way from Mexico straight up the coast to, to Canada, and I don't know where it ends in Canada. But you can just literally drive one street all the way from Washington uh, to uh, Mexico, uh, or from Canada to Mexico, starting in Washington, ending near San Diego. Um, can I, do you think I could do the same thing going west to east? Because that's north to south. Yeah. The simple answer is yes. Uh, we got another one near us named, uh, called I-80. You can take that one also from uh, Sacramento-ish. I don't know where it actually ends up, because of the Bay Area. Uh, and it goes all the way across to the east coast. All right, and there's multiple of those. I don't have the U.S. up here, but here, here's a really ghetto U.S. <laughs> you look funny. <laughs> All right, so that's, that's not bad. So uh, you have I-5 that goes, and you've got I-80 that goes, I don't actually know where it ends, but it ends over here. Uh, and there's lots of these things. They go you know, across the south, they go across the north, there's a couple going across here. And there's a, there's a few in between, but there's a lot over here because that's where most of the people in the United States are uh, in this area. Uh, and that's the interstate system. That's not till after World War II that the first country to develop this idea and make a unified, very fast, in fact, no speed limit freeway going from side to side, and, or from north, south, and, uh, uh, north, south, and, damn it, north, south, and east, west, is actually the Germans, and it's called, anybody know what it's called? Interstate. No. <laughs> you guess though. It's called Das Autobahn. Oh, yes. Which just means uh, carway or freeway. Uh, that's the street that people like to take their cars to, their fancy cars to, because it has no speed limit. Uh, it has a conditional speed limit, like if it's raining, it'll pop up like an electric signal for how, what the speed's supposed to be, but if the conditions are good, there's no speed limit, you can just pull, go as fast as you want on it. Uh, that was uh, the Nazis' idea. Why do you think they wanted a freeway system to go uh, all over uh, Germany very quickly? Unwarranted. What? Just war in general. Yeah, so for the war that was coming up, they wanted to be able to move their troops and supplies and all that stuff. Uh, from front to front, because they knew they were going to be fighting most likely uh, both ways. Okay, so that's a freeway system. Uh, they also build bridges, and another thing they build is stadiums, and they loved this uh, to like show how great Germany was and how good their economy was doing, have like these rallies. Uh, they would just build these big concrete stadiums. They were like one of the first countries ever to do that too, especially on a large scale. So like all those clips you see, those old clips of like, you know, the Nazis marching around and Hitler's up there going, oh, back to them, like making all those, uh, you know, movements and sounds. Uh, most of those rallies, which, which they were, are at these gigantic stadiums, like in Nuremberg and places like that. Also, in case you guys didn't know, uh, Hitler hosted the Olympics. So in 1936, before World War II started and all that, like all the Americans and other athletes in the world went over to Nazi Germany, uh, and then we uh, used their stadiums uh, for the Olympics. And then, of course, several years later, we were at war with them. But we all played ball together first. Um, so that's what Nazi Germany is going to do. What do you think happens to the German economy? See, the same gets worse, gets better. It's better. It gets way better, right? And we don't know how this would have played out in the long run because the Nazis ceased to exist, you know, a decade later. But uh, in the uh, short term, at least until World War, uh, probably until like 1941 or two, you could say, uh, you're going to have a a very very mm, rapid uptick or growth in, in Nazi Germany. In fact, they're, compared to the rest of the world at the time, they make the biggest jump from like absolutely terrible to uh, uh, one of the best and most productive economies in the world at the time. All right, um, yeah, so that's Nazi Germany. How about the US? We don't go all in like this. We do, we go kind of in, all right? So we don't so much build up, not, I will say we remilitarize. We build a bunch of aircraft carriers. Thank goodness that we did that, by the way. Thank goodness we were nervous about Japan because we had reason to be. 
All right, uh, we re remilitarize a bit, so we do build some aircraft carriers. We got a Pacific fleet, and we get, we have a, a standing military. We're not trying to go to war, like this is in U.S. history, but just know at the time the U.S. wanted nothing to do with anybody. We just want to have a military to be safe, and we wanted to fix the Great Depression. We did not care what Europe or Japan was doing for the most part. That's why we weren't even in the League of Nations. All right, and we do do some infrastructure. We do do. English is so weird. I don't know any other language that says, I do do, or we do do that. Like, why would, why do we say it twice? Whatever. <laughs> We're also the only country, as far as I know, early language that says, uh, I do not. Or like, um, how does it go? So it's like, uh, if I was in German, I wouldn't say, I do not know. I would just say, I know not. That's what almost all languages do. But we add this do to it. I do not know. It's weird. So anyways. <laughs> Infrastructure projects like uh, Hoover Dam, we have some bridges and whatnot. Also, uh, I think these are in the notes if they weren't, well, now you know them. Uh, FDR, and oh, I forgot to, I forgot to say, uh, what's the name of his new legislation that he proposed to Congress and they passed, or the system of them, that puts in a whole bunch of Keynesian changes and provides a bunch of aid to uh, people? Yeah, New Deal. <laughs> Great job. New Deal. Uh, by the way, don't think that's like one thing. It's like a bunch of pieces of legislation that kind of lump together. In fact, that happened twice. I think it was in 33, 35, don't quote me, but yeah. Um, two different sets of uh, legislation. Uh, so some of them are just straight aid to the poor. Um, so like, you know, people are starving. So if you don't make enough money, the government gives you a small amount of welfare money. Uh, they might help with uh, food purchasing. I think these stamps started, maybe they didn't. Uh, but you do get financial aid, or you can, so a little bit. They also start Social Security. Anybody know what Social Security is? What did the sub teach you guys? Everything. And nothing. <laughs> Just sat there and wrote the notes. Yeah, sounds about right. Uh, well, at least he had that, at least. Um, so, what, what was my question? Oh, Social Security, what is it? Uh, that is uh, retirement through the government, essentially. So, here's how it works, and here's how you probably won't get it. But you'll pay into it. I mean, honestly, so will I probably not get it, but the best plan is to plan not to have Social Security. Make your own uh, option. So, here's what, how it works. What the government does, I'm not sure if they match it or not, but I know the government um, collects a tax from you, basically. So every paycheck, let's say your paycheck is, uh, I don't know, this isn't the... 1930s, let's say you're making $100 a month. There's no problem with that, what am I doing? Um, they take a small amount of every check and it goes to Social Security. You guys will see this, by the way, when you get jobs. You'll get your paycheck and be like, sweet, I made $400. Oh, no, I didn't. Because you see all these minuses for, for taxes. One of them is Social Security, what? I got a $600 paycheck and I got so sad when they took $100 off. Yeah, that's low, by the way. Yeah, uh, that's low. Usually it's around 20 to, depending on how much money you make, 20 to 30%. So yeah, enjoy it while it's that low. But anyways, 100 bucks, yeah, and you'll see, it'll, it'll say like, you're like, what is this? It'll be like, uh, minus federal income tax, minus state income tax, minus Medicare, minus Social Security, minus all these other things. Uh, so yeah, they take a little bit of your money. I don't know the exact percentage. Let's just say it's 2%. So there's two bucks. Um, and every worker in the United States is doing this. So all this money is going into this big ball, essentially, of money. But it's not. It's just stored by the government. Uh, so all workers that are currently working keep paying into this. And once you reach, so that millions of people paying into it constantly. So once you reach retirement age at about 60, I don't know what the official year is, but it's somewhere between 62 and 65, or 63, whatever. Let's just say 65, you say. Once you hit 65, they're like, you're old enough now to get money from that giant ball. Uh, so everyone's still paying into it, and then uh, when you hit 65 and you retire, uh, then that money starts coming to you every month in uh, you know whatever amount. It's gonna be less than you made normally, just so you know. Uh, but at least it's something, right? Which is better than absolutely nothing for those who didn't prepare. So uh, that's how it works. The only problem is back then, most people didn't live that long anyway, so there's a lot of extra money. We do now though. In fact, most people live in their 80s. So we have a huge chunk of people that are uh, born in the you know, 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, uh, back before birth control and abortion were really popular. So there's a lot of people. And then starting with uh, my parents' generation and then me and then you guys, we don't have nearly as many kids because of birth control and abortion. So currently, way more people are retiring than are entering the workforce, which is gonna mean they're 
most likely going to start draining this uh, to the point that they're taking out more money than they are putting in. So you guys might not get your social security. I might not get my social security. But that's how it works. Uh, what else was I going to say? Oh, I kicked it over here for some reason. So anyways, that's social security. So uh, does that sound like uh, Keynesian spending? Is the government putting money to the economy to create jobs? Yes. Social security is? No. No, uh, that's, that's, that's aid uh, in, uh, for the poor, um, which you know can be important, but that's not part of Keynesian economics. So this is not Keynesian. This is, though. All right, so spending money on military production, infrastructure production, uh, not aid to the poor. Uh, and not surprisingly, our kind of halfway approach to it gets kind of a halfway result in that the New Deal, despite what maybe history teacher told you in the past, I know my uh, junior high history teacher totally lied to me or was just wrong. I want to think, I, did I tell you this already? Like went to high school and like, I'm like, yeah, I like history. And then like uh, my teacher says, oh, the New Deal will suck. I'm like, well, I thought it fixed it. And then everyone's like, no, because I was going to a new high school. And they'd all been taught it correctly. I was like, well, my teacher said that. And they're like, your teacher's dumb. She was, at least on this topic, uh, because she said the New Deal like fixed the Great Depression, which is just not even true at all. Uh, at the very, at best, it just did nothing. At worst, it gave us a lot of debt. Programs that have not worked out so well. Um, on the notes, was there anything about the CCC or TVA? No. No? Okay, good. All right. That's uh, all I want you guys to know about Keynesian economics applied. And that's all the AP test would want you to know either. What it is, kind of how it works, and then where was it tried? And this is what you guys, uh, by the way, struggle with on your written questions. You'll be like, here's what we'll do. Let's say I have a question like, provide an example of trying to remedy the Great Depression. And then some of you will be like, oh yeah, Keynesian economics. And you might even describe this wonderfully. But what did you not do when you described this and then stop? You'd have no historical example. You gave me the theory, which is great, and you need that, but you also need to show me uh, an example of how it works. And by the way, don't just say Nazi Germany did it. What am I going to need to say besides that? So I'll describe this, say Nazi Germany did it, and then what how they did specifically what they did. Right. So that's, that's what you guys largely miss on almost all of your written questions. You think just naming the thing or describing it is an answer, but it's not. you got to describe the concept, and then you got to give me a specific example. And you can't just say Nazi Germany built things. Like, what did they build? How was it Keynesian? But that's what you got to do. All right, any questions about the Great Depression, fixing it and whatnot? All right, cool. Totalitarians. We haven't talked about that in study hall, I don't think. What's a totalitarian? wants or has absolute control over the entire country. Yeah, okay. Uh, that could be just a monarch, but they also rule through uh, um, fear and control of information propaganda. So that's kind of the, the added element here. So when the Great Depression begins and things get tight in certain countries, and Germany, of course, just got embarrassed during World War I and limited by the Treaty of Versailles, uh, Italy is not doing very well. They want to recreate Rome. Um, the Soviet Union's trying out communism for the first time and it's not working out very well. Uh, all of these leaders are going to use uh, some new tactics to uh, become popular and then uh, keep very, very strict control. Uh, and these new types of dictators that are going to appear in the 1930s are called totalitarians. All right, totalitarians. And uh, what kind of defines these guys, what separates them maybe from like a basic king or something like that, or an emperor, is uh, they rule through uh, complete control of the state. That's not that new. But they can't just base it on like, oh, God chose me, or uh, uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a higher class as a royal, and you peasants have to listen to me. There's no like system keeping them in place. So they keep their position by force uh, through fear, and controlling information, which is really just propaganda and censorship. So uh, control through fear and uh, propaganda slash censorship. What's propaganda? When the government basically instills fear or popularity throughout the people. Yeah, I would, I would say, you're not wrong. I would say that they, they basically lie to you or they only give you one very biased perspective. So they'll, basically the general message is, 
whatever government they are, whether it's the Nazis or uh, under Hitler or, or Mussolini or Stalin, they say, wow, our government is the best and our leader is the best and everybody else is awful and they're evil and they're trying to make us worse so we can't listen to them. Uh, that's pretty much what propaganda is. You see those like posters of like, damn, I didn't get to show you guys. There's a poster. You guys, by now you know how awful Stalin was, right? How he killed millions of people. He's one of the worst people in world history. There's like a picture of him like smiling in the sun and he's like holding up a baby and like going to kiss him or whatever. And it's like, lady, run. Like, first of all. But anyway, <laughs> so, uh, but it's a drawing. Like, he probably never actually did that. Um, in fact, I, think he, I think believe he killed his own son. So he's not, he's not too uh, keen on being a fatherly figure uh, or, a, or, a, or a parent. So anyways... They're going to control through fear and propaganda. Because, again, these aren't kings. They can't just rely on you listening because, you know, you think God put them there or, you know, that's your feudal class and you have to listen. It's none of that. They have to just do it through tricking you, essentially, and making you too afraid to, to do otherwise. All right. So there's several tactics they use. Do you guys remember any of the tactics they use? I don't mean the organizations. I mean, like, what they would generally do to keep people afraid to uh, speak out against them. Yeah, so they had secret police forces, which would, again, these were the people that if they heard you were criticizing the government or, 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 or planning to run against them or whatever, they would make sure you uh, disappeared, essentially, right? You're not going to get a fair trial or anything like that. You're just going to be, not be there one day, essentially, all right? Uh, whether that means you get put into prison or, uh, or, or I don't want to give away the other things, or other alternatives. What else did they do? We're not using specific ones yet. We're just talking about general uh, strategies. Labor yep, labor camps. So uh, if I disagree or I'm a political enemy or they think I'm a political enemy, off I go to work till I, I'll probably die. We'll do specifics here in a second. What else? What? Exiling? Expediting them out? Uh... They weren't that nice usually. Uh, you're right. They would encourage people to leave. You had like the Nuremberg laws that, you know, banned Jewish citizenship and stuff like that. But looking for other things. Military. Yeah, paramilitary means not officially part of the government, but they're still you know armed and trained. So you got paramilitary groups. Nice. What else we got? We got at least two more. I made two more bullet points. Yeah, propaganda. I mean, it's up there. <laughs> One more. This is where, when I come into power, or I'm afraid of others preventing me from coming to power or stealing my spot, I go and make sure all those top officials I think are against me are killed. Yeah, that's an example. These are oh, what you call purges, though. Oh. oh. Great purge. <laughs> yep, that's one of them. Cool. Oh, you know what I would add to this? That's not necessarily in here. Uh, genocide, and in the case of the Soviet Union anyway, classicide. What's genocide? Masculine ethnic group. Yeah, masculine ethnic group or race. What's classicide? Class. Yeah, killing of a class, right? We mean social class, by the way. So, uh, what are uh, what was my secret police group in Nazi Germany that enforced the Nazis? Gestapo. Nice. So we'll put uh, Germany, G. All right, labor camps. Do I have any, where, where, where do, what do they call, where do I have them? Gulags, where those at? USSR, right. And those are not camps where you like, it's like summer camp. That's where you go to literally work to death in terrible conditions in the cold with not enough food. So the gulags. Did I ever tell you about the guy that had to go to both, what, what was the next one? What's the next one? Logs, concentration camps, right? You talk about a death camp. That's a bit different. I think you said it. that's a bit different. So gulags are in the USSR, and then of course concentration camps are in uh, Germany as well. All right, there was one unfortunate soul who had to go through both camps. He was uh, a Russian that was caught during World War II, and he had to go to concentration camp, but he survived, and he was liberated by his uh, Russian. Uh, uh, comrades, and then uh, he wrote a letter 
where he criticized some of the decisions they made in the military, like super lightly too, guys. It wasn't even like, whoa, screw Stone, he's terrible. It was like a really light criticism. And they intercepted the letter, and they read it, and then they shipped him off to the gulag. Uh, and so he had to go from the concentration camp in Nazi Germany to the gulags in uh, Siberia. And he lived there too. He lived through that one. Uh, and he got released after a, a thing called destalinization, which we'll talk about later in Europe. But yeah, uh, Alexander Zoltanitsyn, I believe is what his uh, name was. And he wrote a book about his experience. Anyways, paramilitary groups. Who these guys hiring as goons to enforce their uh, uh, political power and, and, and instill fear? The Black Shirts. Yep, the Black Shirts. Who's that with? Uh, the Mussolini yep. of Italy. Mussolini in Italy. Oh, duh, we should have named like these totalitarians are. <laughs> My bad. USSR, uh, he was fur. Oh, was Mussolini fur? Oh, I just gave him one. I think Stalin was first. He's 24. I'm not exactly sure when Mussolini came to power. I know 29 is when he started doing some things. So we'll just assume he was. Italy. I know Hitler was last, though. Yeah. Uh, and that's Germany. And I just gave you all of them Stalin, Mussolini, and Hitler, yeah. All right. Uh, what about, oh, what about another paramilitary group? Schutzstaffel, the SS. Schutzstaffel. Yeah, it's German. It's just, we pronounce it different. So the SCH is just like school, but but, but like a sh sound, like sh, uh, boots, and then the Zs are always like a pizza Z, like pizza. So Schutz, and then Staffel. Germany. That's just the SS. All right, uh, propaganda. I don't know if any specific ones are there for propaganda. Did I? Nazi van architecture. Yeah, there you go. So they would like you know make those giant uh, coliseums uh, that they would do their rallies and things like that. Grand architecture. Absolutely. So stadiums. That's a big one. They even had two. I don't know if it's on the notes or not. They even have like a, a whole department dedicated to it, headed by uh, uh, Goebbels, Joseph Goebbels. They had, like a ministry or department of propaganda. Like, that's his whole, whole job was to make posters that made Jews and communists look bad and the Nazis look good and make you want to, you know, fight to the death for your country. And You guys ever hear, heard of the Hitler Youth? Yeah. yeah. Okay, that's where they, they would set up education programs so you go up being like super pan-German pro-Nazi and anti-everybody else. All right, they're, they're getting ready for this big war. Uh, purges. The Great Purge. Where's that? I don't know. But it was great. <laughs> All right, that's the uh, uh, Soviet Union. That was in, I was thinking from 36 to 38. Right before World War II, Stalin went and killed his top military officials and political leaders because he thought that they were all conspiring against him. All right, and then, uh, and then World War II starts and he's out his most experienced military leaders. All right, uh, there's another one too. Uh, that's one I think you mentioned. Night of Long Knives. That's where, that one's much le much smaller scale. This was like over a million people. I think it's 1.2 million. Uh, the Night of Long Knives was, I think, around or less than 100. And that's where uh, Hitler went out and essentially just had um, his political rivals uh, killed. I don't think it was on the house. Is there anything about the Reichstag fire, the enabling act, anything like that? No. Okay, we don't get that much detail then. That's cool. We don't need that much detail anyway. Oops. Not Hitler. Night of Long Knives. That's Germany. All right, um, and then uh, what we got for genocide slash classicide? How people look like they Yeah, that's classicide for sure. So exterminating the kulaks, which creates a famine, of course. And then Stalin intentionally focuses his famine on a certain group of people that he does not like because they want to separate. Is that what you're raising your hand for? No. no. Holocaust is after World War II begins, guys. That's not a valid answer here. That's not under Nazi Germany. That's under the Ottoman Empire, World War One. Good guess, though. Uh, you know what you could say, though. You could say uh, you could say ethnic disc discrimination because they do have the Nuremberg laws. Was that in there at all? Yeah. Okay, good. Nuremberg laws. That's where they banned Jewish citizenship in 1935 and said you couldn't marry uh, German and Jewish people anymore if they were more than a quarter Jew. Uh, and they also allowed people to ransack and destroy Jewish synagogues and homes and stores in 1938. That was the uh, if it was on the notes, the crystal knot, the night of, night of broken glass. Mm -hmm. I get confused, but I told my regular world and you guys. But yeah, 
Those are just some strategies they use to instill fear. So again, their whole point was, oh, I forgot, by the way, under propaganda, censorship. So again, if you were criticizing the regime or like if you're in Nazi Germany and you were a socialist or a communist, uh, you would be quickly uh, silenced and or removed uh, by force. So those are all examples of uh, how totalitarians came to and then also maintained power. All right, lots and lots and lots of people die, especially in the Soviet Union. That's kind of ridiculous. All right, so um, I think Spanish Civil War is next. Isn't it causes World War II, Spanish Civil War? The Spanish Civil War was in the notes, right? Yeah. All right, cool. It's really hard doing this like when I didn't actually teach it to you. Okay. All right, so a lot of these... What are we talking about? Fascism, huh? That's what I forgot. I forgot one. All right, you guys are whispering and, and talking to us. I'm just gonna start kicking people out. So shut up. All right, so unless I ask you a question, then you can answer. Um, so what about um, fascism? That was in the notes for this, I think, right? Okay, fascism. We already know what, what Marxism is. Uh, and we already know that the only Marxist on this list is right here, right, Marxism. <clears throat> Uh, is that radical right, radical left, center? What is that? Radical left. Marxism? Left. Radical left, yeah. All right, radical left. Uh, why are they radical left? Because of Marx. Because of Karl Marx, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I might have told, do I ever draw like the political spectrum and put fascists at one end? Yeah, and, did. Okay, I did, all right, all right. So you just forgot, okay. So Marxists are what? What do they believe in? Marxism. Obviously Marxism and Marx, but like, what, what does that even mean? That everybody can do a job and it'll create like a perfect society where everybody supports one another. Okay, yeah, uh, that's the goal is like a commune, like a utopian society where everybody shares the load and does what they do best, et cetera. Okay, cool. Um, so let me ask you this then. Do they believe in hierarchies and borders and barriers and exclusion? No, what are they all about? They want world peace and say all borders. Yeah, they want to end all that. So they want to end any limit, uh, limitation. So they don't like hierarchies. They don't like physical borders. They don't believe in private property, right? So they want to eliminate all these things, right? So they're uh, very much uh, against, and when I say radical, by the way, I mean, they think this is the one, and this applies to the right as well. Uh, when, when you're radical, you believe like there's one very simple explanation for the world. And then once we do this thing, all the problems will be solved, or most of them anyway. Right, and then they're also willing to do anything to achieve that, which means, oh, you oppose me? Uh, we're not gonna hash it out and debate. I'm just gonna get rid of you, essentially. Ban you, put you in prison, kill you, whatever. All right, so uh, they are uh, very much, what do we, what do we say, anti-oppressor. Uh, Who do they see as the oppressors? The uh, rich bourgeoisie. Yeah, middle class, the rich. All right, so who do they wanna get rid of then by force? Who? The middle class, right. And who they want to give all their stuff to, to split up and use and share? Everyone else. Yeah, the, all the poor, the working class, the whoever's poor, right. Uh, and they are very much um, against national borders or any sort of limitation based on class. They want everyone to be the same, essentially, because they think we're all equal. And the only reason people have more than others is because they're taking it by force or oppressing you. So they think if they get rid of private property and make everyone the same, that things will work out uh, better. And again, they're willing to go to any means to achieve that, uh, whether it's you know killing entire um, classes or going through purges or silencing people, whatever, whatever it takes. All right, that's the far left. What's on the far right then? Uh, they want, on the far right, it's they want to keep borders, but they want to just have like, um, they want to get rid of all quote unquote biological Inferiors. Okay, cool. So, I don't know if this is even on the screen. Let me check. Oh, it kind of is. There we go. So, uh, the far right, the radical right, what would we, the, the Marxist is over here, at least in, at this time. Um, those over there on the far left, what ism is on the far right then? You just shout it. Oh, fascism. Fascism. There's like three answers there. <laughs> The, the pro-nationalism is definitely a part of fascism. Okay, so um, they're not anti-oppressor. They're actually cool with people being richer than others because they're like, oh, you're better at whatever it is. So we want you to have more, essentially. Right, so if they thought you were good at something, they would just 
put you in the position of power and give it all to you, and that, they thought that was a better thing. Right, so they're, uh, what's the word we're looking for? They believe in superior, I guess you could just say genes, um, and that others are inferior. And again, in this case, under you know Hitler and Mussolini to a lesser extent, they uh, took that to mean by race. So they thought certain races were superior to others. Uh, right, in the case of Hitler, he thought the Aryan race, uh, Germans, uh, were. Okay, and again, uh, somebody already said it, but how do they feel about borders? They should be preserved. What? They should be preserved. Yes, they want to preserve it, because what do they want to do with the population? Protect it. Protect it. Not just protect it, though. Expand. Do they think everybody in Germany is fits this superior race? No. 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 What do they want to do with people in Germany that are not German, that fit this? Get them out, right? They want to like purify it essentially. So they definitely believe in borders. So they're a very pro border. I would say pro shut border. Uh, unless, of course, you're a German and you want to come in. Uh, but everybody else, they want out, right? Because they think they're the reason. They're like defiling the nation and making it worse and inferior. Okay. Uh, and uh, so they're very pro border. Um, would you say they're nationalistic? Hyper-nationalist. Yeah, hyper nationalist. The point that if you're not us, get out, and uh, we want to expand and take your stuff. And when we take your stuff, are we going to let you stay there? No. No, we're going to get you out or, or kill you in the case of World War II, at least uh, towards the east. Right, so they're hyper nationalistic. Again, meaning they, they just want to expand, take stuff from you, and, and get rid of whatever uh, peoples or race that was there in the first place. Okay, and the last thing I wanted to say about it was border hypernationalist superior. I guess that's good enough, actually. So yeah, it's pretty much just as opposite as you get. Oh, that's what I want to say. How do Marxists feel about nationalism? Everyone's equal. Nobody's superior. So. Right. So do they believe in One. nationalism then? No. no. Why not? Because nationalism is specific nationality or ethnicity. Yeah, exactly. So they're saying, you know, one nationality or race is superior, so Marxists are against that. And again, the borders thing, like, they're against private property. Nationalism inherently implies we own this, and Marxists are very much against that. So they're uh, very anti-nationalistic. Uh, Excellent. So, again, that's the biggest difference. Well, one of the biggest differences is the fact that they want to end all nations because they don't think that the oppressors are like a superior or inferior race. Are there rich and poor in every single country in the world? Yeah, yeah. yeah right. That's what they want to get at. They want to wipe out all of the uh, upper class people. And it doesn't matter what country you're in. Uh, they want to just wipe that out. So to them, borders uh, don't matter. In fact, they want to get rid of them because they don't believe in private property. On the other hand, though, fascists on the far right, they're very uh, much the opposite. They like borders because they want to get you out of their border, and they want to take your stuff. Uh, and then when they get that, they want to chase you out of it. All right, so they're very nationalistic, very border-based, very much about a pure ethnic group, right, in this case. And then the Marxists don't care about ethnicity. They care about class, and that's all over the world. So they want to wipe it out all over the world. So you with me on that? Yeah. All right, cool. That's the main difference, by the way. And that makes these guys radical right. Yeah. And that makes these guys radical left. All right. So, by the way, uh, that doesn't mean if you are, um, well, you shouldn't think races are superior. Uh, but just because you uh, want to allow more people in or maybe limit it based on the time and place uh, regarding borders doesn't make you a Marxist or a fascist. Right? It's more nuanced than that. If I'm saying I want 100% open borders because all people are equal and we should have everybody in and it's oppressive not to, yeah, you're probably pretty Marxist. Uh, or if you're saying, no, we should close all borders 100% and let nobody in because we're the best nation, everybody else sucks, it's like, ah, you're probably pretty far right, leaning on fascists. Uh, but in between, it, it's not that, that simple. All right, so the reason why I went this whole d description of uh, fascism is because I want to talk about the Spanish uh, Civil War. That'll be the last topic we do, by the way. Uh, we'll, I'll, I'll do World War II real quick tomorrow in class, like at the end of class. Um, so, Spanish Civil War. Okay, this is from 1936 to 39. I think it was still 39. And um, it's in Spain, obviously. So who are my two uh, belligerent groups here, the two that are going at it, that are fighting head-to-head? -head? Republicans and nationalists. Yeah, okay, cool. So this confuses a lot of students, by the way. So I've got the Republicans <coughs> and the nationalists. And hey, based on what you know about nationalism, 
and borders. Which side do you think is fast fascist? The nationalists, right? That hopefully makes it easier to remember. And if you're wondering why the communists are called the fascist or the um, uh, Republicans, it's because they were, they might not be the first ever, but I think they're the first, one of them, certainly. They actually voted in a majority communist slash socialist government. Uh, I think it was called the Spanish Popular Front, where a whole bunch of very left-minded thinkers, some communists, some moderate socialists, legitimately, democratically voted in a government that was mostly communist or socialist, and they started implementing reforms. Obviously, half-ish of the people hated that idea because they were uh, more nationalistic, and the uh, torch was taken up uh, uh, for their cause uh, by the nationalists, or by the fascists, rather. So, who was the leader of my fascist group? His name's like redundant. Francisco, Francisco Franco, yeah. But why on earth would we care about Spain's civil war? Because at this point, sorry, Spain, you're insignificant for the most part in the world. Why are we talking about the Spanish civil war? There's other civil wars that go on. I'm going to talk about them. Two major powers back east of the sides. Yeah, exactly. This is kind of like a practice run, especially for the Nazis, uh, for the upcoming war. And yeah, this is the first, as far as I know, head-to-head, -head, even though it's kind of indirect, head-to-head -head match between uh, communist and nationalist, or in the case, fascist forces. All right, so... Um, immediately, or almost immediately, aid is going to be given to these rebels, because the nationalists are the rebels here, uh, by Italy, because they were fascist under Mussolini, very nationalistic, as well as uh, fascist Nazi Germany. All right, so they're giving aid. And by the way, it's not just aid. They're actually sending troops and equipment there, too. Uh, so supplies and direct military uh, aid and help. And who is going to come to the aid of, although they don't work, uh, of the uh, Republicans? You in mean this? the socialists? Yeah, exactly. It's the uh, uh, so, uh, USSR. I almost said the Stalinists. I don't know why I was. Although they are Stalinists. Okay, cool. Uh, and they're, of course, Marxist. So these two uh, go head to head. And uh, who at the time has got the, uh, has got more, what's called? a more developed military, more money to do this sort of thing. Germany, Germany right, uh, uh, compared to everybody else. In fact, the Italians kind of embarrassed themselves a bit. Uh, and in case you guys forgot, Stalin's Soviet Union is going through the Great Purge, or just about to. Uh, they've just finished up uh, a massive famine. They're, they're, not, they're not doing well in the 1930s. Uh, so they don't really have the supplies or ability to help out that much. And the, uh, and the Germans, of course, at this point, their economy is just off the charts compared to everybody else. So they've got more equipment uh, and, and more aid that's going to be given. So inevitably, that's going to mean the fascists win. But uh, that's not all we're talking about here. Why, do, why are we talking so much about um, Germany and, and all of this? Yeah, it, it, it is important that we have foreign help that you know, prolongs or, or, or helps out this ideological battle between Marxism and fascism. But... Why do we care that Germany helped them out? How did, how did Germany benefit from this, actually? So let's just drop the ball there. So this is where Germany gets to practice several of its new tactics. So when World War II does come around and nobody else has fought a war in like a couple decades, Germany's like, oh, we know how to do this. And they go execute their strategies um, well. And they really, really wipe the floor with everybody for the first couple years. Uh, what are the two new tactics that the Nazis are going to try out? Blitzkrieg. The Blitzkrieg? And yep, and firebombing. And firebombing. So what is firebombing? Continuous bombing of cities. It's a little more complicated than that. All right, so first of all, this is the first time you can, like, drop bombs from planes in mass. Like, in World War II, they tried, like flying their crappy little plane and, like, dropping them off by hand. Mm -hmm. But they'd, like, get shot by rifles or they'd bombs that blow up on them and stuff like that. This is way more sophisticated. This is like planes dedicated just to bombing. Like big planes with large loads, and then they have like, you know, doors for this. They just drop out and blow up when they hit the ground. And they have like smaller fighter planes that are protect them and shoot down other, other people's bombers. Um, but it's more than just the bombs. The bombs are actually designed not to just blow up, because they found out that most of the damage doesn't come from the bomb blowing up. Most of it comes from the fire afterwards that spreads to other buildings. So what they would do is they design these bombs, they're incendiary bombs, they would drop, they blow up, and they would uh, cause these surrounding buildings and area uh, to catch on fire. 
So they would bomb a bunch of areas and then the, the fires would of course spread. There's no fire departments gonna rush out and get all those fires, especially when they're being bombed. Um, and so it ends up destroying far more of the city than just bombing it. Because they used to have artillery, one second. They used to have artillery and you could knock <clears> buildings <throat> down, but that was about it. But you use fire bombing and you bomb a section of a city, that whole thing's probably gonna burn down. Is that what napalm is? No, napalm's a bit different. That one is, um, I'm not exactly sure what it is per se, but it is used uh, in Vietnam, for example. Uh, and I believe it's used to, don't quote me on this, I believe it is used to uh, help with the firebombing effort in the jungle, but it's also toxic. So if you're on it or near it, you like had a high chance of developing cancer or having birth defects to your kids and all that stuff. Uh, I, as far as I know, that's now legal because of that reason. But uh, yeah, that's firebombing. Uh, and they actually annihilate an entire city, and that's what that painting is about, if you guys didn't know. In 1937, Pablo Picasso painted that, and that's supposed to be the aftermath of the bombing of a Spanish city called Guernica. Uh, and that's just the name of it, is Guernica. That was kind of his like protest to say, to be kind of anti-war, before World War II even started. Uh, and you can kind of see there, too, uh, by the picture itself. Obviously, these things are dead and broken into pieces, be it people or animals. Uh, so yeah, that's firebombing, and that's going to be an example, of course, is Guernica in Spain. That's even a painting by Pablo Picasso. All right, last little topic here. Somebody tell me what Blitzkrieg is. Lightning war. Yeah, yeah that's what it means. Why does it work? So tanks would rush in, and since they're so heavily armored, infantry would rush in right behind them and just overcome them. Yes, okay, so I want to add one little element to that. They didn't know how to use tanks back then, or at least they only used them one way. And that was like the French, for example. They would take their tanks and they would spread them out uh, along their line. And they'd have their infantry, their soldiers in between, just kind of in a line across. The Germans came up with this strategy in the Spanish Civil War. Worked well. No one really knew about it. So they used it at the beginning of World War II and they just wrecked everybody for a couple years. They would come in, ideally, with uh, their planes and, and sort of disrupt this line if they could. And then, and this is something nobody could stop, they would put all their tanks in one spot and they would drive through with these panzer units all tightly wound up and they would use them to, and again, no one could stop this, they would just straight drive through the enemy uh, line. Like, they just run over what's ever in the way, shoot a couple tanks around them, even if you lose one or two, most of them are still there. And now they're behind you, and that's a problem if you're fighting them because they split up, they surround you from two sides, Following up on these guys are a bunch of infantry, uh, either on foot or on motorcycles or in trucks uh, that penetrate with them, uh, and then the uh, regular forces uh, come from the front. So they, they very quickly, I guess you would say, divide and conquer and surround their enemy, and, and it's faster, it's more mobile than anybody had ever seen up until that point, and it is very effective in World War II for at least the first two or three years. Russians figure out how to beat it, though. Uh, they figure out that you can't really do this well if you just put all of your troops in a city uh, because then you can hide in individual houses and buildings and uh, block the roads uh, for the tanks and force the Germans to fight you building to building. Um, it's really gnarly and nasty and terrible, but it works for the Russians uh, later, which I'll talk about tomorrow. Bye. So, World War II. Uh, it, you know, it depends how you interpret it, but some say it started in 37 with Japan and China, uh, but most consider it uh, when it's both fronts. 1939 to 45. So, let's talk about what starts first in uh, in Asia, with the with the conflict between the second conflict between the Chinese and the uh, 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 Japanese. The second Sino-Japanese War. Yeah, second Sino-Japanese War. All right, and that's 37 to 45, um, and it's going to start here before anything else. So. Japan is looking to invade China. They're trying to spread their imperial realm. What's their overall goal in Asia? Yeah, take it over, but like why? What do they want to do? Who are they removing? Chinese. What? Chinese. I mean, they are killing the Chinese, but what's their overall objective here? Who, who do they have to remove from this sphere uh, to be the overlords, the imperial overlords of that area? Westerners. Yeah, exactly. I don't know if you guys remember this. Maybe I didn't tell you it was the sub, but they had like this motto, or someone gave them this motto, like Asia for Asians, right? They want to kick out all the Europeans and Americans. And again, not to like 
make it wonderfully free over here in Asia, but they wanted to be the imperial power over there. All right, and that's what they started doing, and they start first with China. All right, so they'd already beaten Russia a few years earlier. They'd beaten China even a few years earlier than that. Uh, so the second time around, they're pretty confident that China's just going to get slapped around again. And they are. Is China even uh, unified at that point in time? No. No, it's got a bunch of like civil war activity going on in it. Uh, so it's particularly vulnerable and still un not industrialized. So uh, Japan's got to find an excuse to invade. Uh, they can't just outright invade because they'll look like the aggressors and then everybody will put sanctions on them and it'll suck for them. So do you guys have any idea how they uh, fake? How can I phrase this? How they make it look like China instigated them, even though they did not. Do you know? Yeah, so the Japanese, after their conflict with Russia, had some railroad uh, possession in Manchuria, northern China. So the Chinese made it look like, sorry, the Japanese made it look like Chinese nationalists had bombed the Japanese railroads. Right, so that gave Japan, I mean it was fake, but it gave Japan a, a, an excuse to put troops over there. That of course angered the Chinese and the and Chinese troops in the area, uh, and eventually they, they, uh, they fired on them. So the Japanese were like, oh look, they shot at us, so we, we can go to war with them. We're not bad guys, even though they arranged the whole thing. Uh, so they do. And very quickly, they uh, invade through Korea and into the uh, uh, northern inlet towards Beijing, the capital. Uh, and they're very quickly going to use their industrial superiority and uh, take over pretty much the coasts. And if you guys didn't know this, most people in China are around the coast. There are some in the interior, but like this is mostly an, almost an inhabitable mountains, except for like you know, that, that plateau. There's a bunch of desert and, and um, other mountains in there. So most of China's population is towards the coast anyway. So Japan fairly quickly is going to occupy uh, these coastal regions, right? And that's the second Sino-Japanese War. People aren't very happy with it, uh, especially when they find out because of Western journalists in China at the time, what the Japanese are doing to the Chinese there. Anybody remember what, know what they're doing to them or where? Yeah, they're torturing, raping, Yeah, thousands, hundreds of thousands, by the way. So they are, they're not just like, hey, we're in control, do what we say. It's like, hey, we're in control, we're superior to you, and we're going to uh, uh, do terrible things to you, like rape your women, kill all of the men. Uh, and, and brutally too, by the way, torture, uh, execute them by uh, using their, their, their swords, like decapitate them, like there's footage of that. And I think in the notes we had some footage or some pictures anyway of like all the bodies that they just threw into the river and it just like made up the entire bank of the river. And uh, it, it was pretty bad. Uh, do you remember the name of that city? Nanjing. Yeah, Nanjing or Nanking. Correct. Uh, some people know it as the Ma Nanking Massacre or the Rape of Nanking. All right, so behavior like this didn't land too receptively on the, uh, on the eyes of the West. So eventually, Britain and the United States are gonna do something about this. So what is the one resource that industrial Japan needs very, very badly, but it does not have a lot of or any of it uh, naturally in their own territory? Oil. Yeah, oil, where are they getting it? Starting with Andre over there. Remember? I already said the two countries. UK. There you go. UK and US. They, they for the most part, had a, a large amount of control or were in cohorts with the uh, governments that, that had a, a lot of oil access, especially back then in the Middle East around the Persian Gulf. Remember, back then they hadn't really tapped into all of Russia's reserves or the US reserves yet or other areas. All right. Uh, so they are going to cut off uh, oil. So we have, uh, this is a little later. It's by like 1940, 41. I think it's 41. Uh, an oil embargo uh, by the U.S. and uh, the United Kingdom, or, or what was Great Britain. Okay, so Japan, they're already invading China, they, they're, they're occupying most of it. Obviously really hard for them to keep going further in because it's a lot of desert and mountains and all that stuff. Uh, but they own all of the uh, major coastal cities. Where could the Japanese, or what, what, what options does the Japanese have with this uh, oil embargo going on? Where? And the Pacific Coast and Pacific Ocean. All islands? You're right, it does come uh, in and near those though. Take American and British uh, colonial possessions for like the resources there? Yeah, um, they, they go for those resources. That's more so to uh, take out the threat to them militaristically. Uh, but there is some, a good rule of thumb for oil is if you've got a, uh, 
a lot of rain and uh, soil and, and vegetation in an area for a long period of time, that's the kind of stuff that makes up oil for the most part. Um, so if you can find an area that has traditionally been rained on and has a lot of vegetation around it, you can almost bet that there's oil in that area. Uh, and for Southeast Asia, or sorry, in Asia, that's gonna be in Southeast Asia and Indonesia, because there's all kinds of rain and jungle here. Uh, that's what used to be in the Middle East. Obviously now it's mostly desert, uh, but it used to be there for a long time, so that's why there's so much oil packed in there. All right, so the Japanese are going to uh, want this territory here, but uh-oh, who controls that territory? The United States? The Netherlands, right, the Dutch, uh, the French. You have the British have some presence in here too with Hong Kong and Singapore, et cetera. So they're just gonna have to go through Western powers to do this, all right? Now, by 1941, I know we haven't talked about the start yet, but by 1941, World War II is already going on over here. So we'll, we'll get there in a second. But with World War II going on over here, are the uh, Dutch and French and uh, these other, and the British, are they gonna be able to uh, stop the Japanese if they try to take their territory? That's a simple yes or no. No, why not? Yeah, they're either occupied by uh, Germany already, or they're, they're busy fighting and they don't really have the resources to go out and fight uh, across the world with two different major enemies. So who's the only real threat to them there in the, uh, in the Pacific? Yeah, where's the most of their, where's most of their Navy at? Yeah, Pearl Harbor, right. So that's what they're going to uh, decide to do. They got about six-ish months after this embargo starts. They got like six months supply or so. So they had that decision to make. It's like, do we pull out of China and return to trading uh, for oil? Or do we just go for the knockout blow in the Pacific, taking out our only major threat here with the U.S. Navy at uh, Pearl Harbor? And then the European stuff would obviously be a lot easier to take since they're already occupied by or fighting with the Nazis. That's what they do. So we have uh, in December, seven, December 7th specifically, 1941, Japan simultaneously attacks like seven different spots. One of them is Pearl Harbor, right, with their aircraft carriers. But they also uh, believe they invade uh, the Philippines, or at least bomb it, with the US bases there. Uh, Singapore, the British, Hong Kong. Um, they might have already been at Hong Kong. I can't remember exactly. But they very quickly go into uh, the Netherlands as well. And within just a few weeks, well, months or weeks, you could say, the Japanese just wipe out all military presence here uh, by the West. So very quickly, uh, in early 1942, Japan already pretty much owns this sphere here or so. So the Japanese Empire got big really quickly. All right, so we got Pearl Harbor, Singapore, uh, Indonesia, Vietnam, Philippines, all these places are gonna be occupied by Japan. So yay them for a bit. Real quickly though, if it was mentioned in the notes, I don't even know. Uh, you guys remember the major errors slash bad luck that they encountered when they bombed Pearl Harbor? Because they could have really devastated our Navy, but they ended up not devastating it that bad. Yeah, 300 people died, 3,000 people died, and that sucks. We lost a couple ships, but that's not that bad considering we had no idea they were coming and they just uh, got a free hit on all of our stuff. Oh, the U.S. aircraft carriers weren't uh, docked? Yeah, so as, as far as I know, most of the repair facilities weren't damaged or damaged enough, so we just repaired a lot of the damage they did to us when they bombed. Uh, also, they didn't hit our fuel reserves, and our aircraft carriers happened to not be in port at the time. And uh, those aircraft carriers are going to be incredibly uh, important during World War II. They don't quite know this yet, but, but here's why, if I haven't told you. How did ships have to sink one another before aircraft carriers? Artillery. Like, okay, they could have artillery, or they could ram each other, right? But in either case, so here's my ships, they either have to shoot each other, or, you know, if they catch them off guard, or they can like ram them, right? And then, and then sink one that way, okay? What is the case, though, with both of these instances? Like, what's, what's one quality I have to have? You have to see them. Yeah, you've got to see them. They're going to be within visual range, which also means, by the way, you are within lethal range yourself. Like, so for you to be lethal, you have to put yourself within lethal range. How does an aircraft carrier make that different? The other, the other can't see you. Yeah, you could potentially start harassing the enemy ships without them even knowing where your ship is, right? So my aircraft carrier could be like 100 miles away, but if I know their location, I can fly my uh, torpedo uh, planes and whatnot, uh, bomb and sink parts of their navy and their ships, and they don't even necessarily know where I am. Right, because radar is super new, not everybody has it. Uh, as far as I know, it's not working well on ships yet. 
Uh, so at that time, aircraft carriers were super important. Uh, in fact, that's how the Japanese were able to catch us by surprise and bomb us at, in Pearl Harbor. Okay, so that obviously is going to get the United States involved in the war, uh, whereas they had not before. So do we understand the start of World War II in uh, Asia and how the United States got drawn into it? Okay, do you guys happen to remember why the U.S. was so reluctant to join the conflict? Because of the kind of isolation and attitude towards other countries. It did, but why, specifically? They didn't want to get involved in the Yeah, you're right. They totally were isolationists. They didn't want to get involved in the world. What was going on at the time that really was preoccupying them and their attention? Didn't they just come out of a war? They did. Um, the same time as everybody else, though, with World War One, That wasn't much different. Uh, the Great Depression. Yeah, the Great Depression was still crippling them. Oh, where did that pen go? Yeah. You stole my pen. All right. Um, that was one. Yeah, that was one. Somebody else answered a question before that, though. I think it was. Okay. okay. So, um, what was I saying? Stuff about things and people and places. Great Depression. Great Depression, thank you. Uh, Great Depression was occurring, so they, they were very hesitant to join the conflict. They tried to help out uh, the, the Allied side, like, France, well, France got knocked out pretty quick. Uh, the UK and the USSR later, uh, by sending supplies and trading supplies for bases and you know having them pay cash. But it was brutal because the Germans were just knocking out a massive amount of their shipping uh, with their uh, German submarines. They call them like uh, wolf packs. They would just cruise around these big groups of submarines. And even if you spotted them on the radar, uh, or sorry, the sonar, like it was like too late. You're just cruising along your ship or a few ships and all of a sudden a whole bunch of German submarines pop up and boom, knock your uh, boat underwater. They had to start using these large convoys of ships uh, to get anything over. So like a whole bunch, like, you know, a big chunk of their Navy just to get any supplies over. All right, speaking of which, no, I'll, I'll say it. Then. So that's the start over here in Asia. They call that the Pacific Theater of the War. All right. Um, European theater, different start. We already talked about the Spanish Civil War, but it's going to start a bit differently here in Europe, and a little bit later, like two years later or so. It starts mostly with Hitler, though, in Nazi Germany. All right? So, real quickly, and you guys just had this in your short answer, why did Nazi Germany want to invade other countries, generally speaking? There's a couple of reasons. You can go one of two ways or, or both. What? Everyone wants living space. Living space for what? What do they believe was going on in the world? The Nazis, anyway. Yeah, it was like a racial struggle or war, right? So they believed that they had to get all inferior races out of their country, which they had been doing already. Um, and they also had to take land and resources from other inferior races. And, and to them, by the way, which direction would that lead them in Europe? South, east, north, west? Slavs. Mostly east and, and, and south, right. Uh, they, they saw the Slavs and, and uh, Romanian people and gypsies and all of them as racially inferior. They saw the French, though, and the Scandinavians as like Aryan or Aryan enough. Uh, so they didn't want to. They knew they'd have to fight them, though, because they're not going to just let Germany roll out and conquer everybody. All right, so he wants to expand. Uh, but he has to uh, kind of test the water first. He can't just roll in and invade Poland. Uh, so Hitler's going to test the water first. He does that first action before World War II even starts in 1936. I don't know if it's in the notes or not. But one of the things he was not allowed to do was build up his military and uh, put it in the neutral zone on the border with France. So he does that. That area is called the Rhineland. And he's nervous about it. But they, they remilitarize and they place troops in the Rhineland. And at that point, and again, that's like right here on the border with France. He puts troops there. First of all, he makes his military bigger than 100,000, builds an aircraft carrier, starts building his navy. All that is technically illegal, according to a certain agreement that Germany signed in 1919. What was the name of that agreement? Yeah, Treaty of Versailles. So he's breaking the Treaty of Versailles. And there's supposed to be repercussions for that, economic, if not militaristic. but. Who does nothing and why? Uh, the U.S. because they don't want to get the cost. Not the U.S. The U.S. is already like not involved in any of this. U.K. and UK. their other buddies across the... Austria? No, Austria loves the Germans. They're going to join up with them real soon. That's a good question. <laughs> France. France and? 
The one she mentioned. What? Really? Oh, man. Okay, why? So they wanted to appease them, so they went to the war, so they signed them. No, no, you're right, right. That's the strategy of appeasement. We'll get to that. But, like, why are they so hesitant to uh, do anything? Stick with you on this. Their economy is super low. There we go. They're still struggling with that. They're trying some Keynesian uh, and socialist policies that aren't necessarily helping the economy out. So they're struggling. So they don't want another World War I. They know how much death and destruction that comes with and the cost and all that. So they, they don't want any of that. So they, they go, ah, it's, it's fine. Germany can build its stuff up. You know, we're not going to go to war over that. So then they get involved in the Spanish Civil War, too. That's not something they should have been, in, been doing according to the treaty. Um, next, though, is a big one. They actually expand Germany, not by invasion, uh, but by a peaceful means. So what did they do peacefully? They annexed Austria. Yeah, that's supposed to be illegal. That's where Hitler, Hitler's actually from. But they, they voluntarily annex Austria because Austria, in case you had forgotten or didn't know, those are, I know it's a different name, but they're actually Germans. Like, they're German culturally, uh, racially, and, and, and ethnically, and linguistically. So... 1938 comes around, and this was explicitly forbidden, by the way, in the Treaty of Versailles. Uh, they are going to uh, join or annex Austria. It's called the Anschluss. So Austria just gets absorbed by Germany. All right, they're supposed to do something, but they do nothing. All right, so Hitler gets away with that one too. He's like, ooh, all right, they didn't do anything for that. Or the remilitarizing, so I'm gonna do something else. So where are there other Germans that he starts demanding uh, to have access to or control over. The Sudetenland. Yeah, the Sudetenland where? In Czechoslovakia. In Czechoslovakia, like along that border, right? So he starts demanding the uh, Sudetenland. Right, those are, those are Germans in Czechoslovakia. And the Czechs are like, no thank you. Uh, so it's a big issue, he's demanding it, and they don't want to go to war. So they all meet, including Italy too, they all meet in uh, Hitler's quarters. So the Prime Minister of Great Britain, um, Neville Chamberlain, the uh, President of France, who I don't know the name of, and Mussolini and Hitler all meet in a city, and they form an agreement. So what was that city slash name of the agreement, and uh, what was the what were the terms of the agreement? Uh, agreement. Yep. What are the terms? I'm allowed to peacefully take on the uh, Right. So without the consent of the Czechoslovakians, um, to avoid war. They are going to basically say, Britain and France are going to say, hey, uh, you can have these Germans in this region here, but uh, no more, essentially. So it's, it is appeasement, right? They're trying to give Hitler something he wants so that uh, he'll stop, right? It's like, oh, you just want this? Okay, you can have it. We just don't want to fight. That's what appeasement is. It's like uh, if a bully says, give me your money or I'll, I'll hit you, and you give him your money, you're appeasing the bully, right? And that's not a good way to get rid of a bully. That's a good way to encourage a bully. Fight back even if you get hit. <clears throat> so... Um, yeah, they do that, and Hitler takes the uh, Sudetenland, and that's where it ends, right? No, no, no. no. What, what else does he do? Yeah, he, oh no, not yet, just, we haven't gotten that far yet. Yeah, he goes way beyond the agreement and just keeps those tanks rolling and takes the entirety of Czechoslovakia. Right, right. All right, so, and that's super... It's a huge violation of the agreement. And this wasn't made like 20 years ago, like, oh, okay, you know, it was 20 years ago, it's a bad agreement. This was like, we just made this a few days ago, and they just roll in and take all of Czechoslovakia. So he just totally slaps them, backhands them, uh, Britain and France, after this agreement. So Munich agreement, but then he's going to invade all of Czechoslovakia, <laughs> not just uh, the Sudetenland. So now they go to war, right? Because they, he's violated this agreement, and they, he humiliated them, right? Nope, there's nothing. So, if I'm Hitler and I keep getting away with it, what am I going to do? Yeah, and so he's going to focus on Poland, but why Poland, by the way? And also, who also wants, also, 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 also who wants a piece of Poland as well? So that's a two-part question. Why? You got the name right. Okay, so Hitler and Nazi Germany and Stalin and the Soviet Union, they both want to invade Poland. Why? Why would they both want to invade poor Poland? What did they ever do? They're just happy over here in Warsaw. They can have access to the Poland. I think they already do, but I mean, you're right, they want that. I think they already do though, but don't quote me. Um, what I will say though is, well, let's stick with the Germany part. Why does Germany want Poland, specifically? 
Yeah, there's, a lot of those used to be Germany or Prussia. Uh, so they want them back because there's Germans there, or at least there was old German land there. Okay, so they want that, uh, obviously. And then the rest, of course, they just want. It's living space with which they're going to chase out and kill most of the Polish people and Jews that are there. Uh, the Soviets, though, in case you guys forgot, they gave a bunch of territory away when they left World War I. Right? The Russian Empire ceded a whole bunch of territory to the Germans, which was later taken from the Germans, and then they were given their own country in Poland, and these are called the Baltic states, Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, and Finland. So those are all brand new countries, or in the case of Poland anyway, a reinvigorated old country. Uh, and they've only been there for like 20 years. So Stalin wants those territories back, all right, because they'd lost them before. So they come to an agreement, and that's called the uh, Nazi-Soviet Non-Aggression Pact. And what's the agreement to do? Besides not attack each other? Invade Poland. Invade Poland, which they do on September 1st, 1939. Wait, why is this so odd that uh, the two are buddying up? Why is the whole world shocked by this alliance, specifically? Because they're in opposite alliances. Exactly. They are uh, at polar opposites of the political spectrum. Like, they are two radicals at either end that generally and wholly hate each other uh, for their ideology. So the, uh, they're, they're like natural enemies. Um, it's like, you know, to go all Looney Tunes on you, it's like, you know, a, a, a cat and a mouse working together. It's like, no, those two are supposed to be enemies, or a cat and a dog, or I know cats and dogs get along, but um, it, it's like two natural enemies sort of uh, hooking up, and it, it was very confusing, at least initially. Uh, Hitler's only gonna do it, though, because it's gonna make Stalin less prepared for when he inevitably does invade them. All right, so they invade him. Poland's got no chance. Um, and the Soviet Union doesn't just go after Poland. Who else do they go after? The Baltic states, wiped off the map. And to the embarrassment of the Soviets, who else do they go after? Finland. And kind of lose to temporarily. Yeah, Finland, right. So they invade Finland. The Finnish people hit, much, hit back much harder than the Soviets anticipated. Uh, and they have to go back a second time uh, through a lot of effort, but they do actually end up taking Finland too. Okay, uh, and the Germans, what's the new strategy they're using against the Polish people that should wipe out their, their forces incredibly quickly along with the fact that the Soviets are invading on the other side? Blitzkrieg. Yeah, they use the Blitzkrieg, right. So very quickly, um, Poland ceases to exist. The Soviets take the Baltic states and after some effort, Finland. Um, and this is the start of World War II. This is where Britain and France go, nope, that's too much. After you've done this like what, five or six times? That's too many times. So they declare war and then they immediately go to war, right? No, nope. it's like seven months they mobilize. They call it the phony war because they declared war and they don't fight till like 1940. All right, uh, so you do have this kind of phony war phase, but they eventually do fight, and the Germans have a pretty good strategy for taking on the British and French. The British and French, by the way, are prepared for what the Germans or what they think the Germans are going to do. So the British send over their troops to France. The French have their army. Uh, where are they going to anticipate an attack? From the French border. Okay, so yeah, they have to imagine no lineup, obviously, so that's, that's protected, but what did Germany do last time that they're, they think that they're prepared for, or the possibility of? Yeah, but, but do you know what, they, what actually happened? No? Uh, well, they went, they went around and basically got the whole line. I thought they couldn't go around, there's mountains and stuff in the way. They went through the mountains. They didn't go quite through the mountains. Okay, there's a, there's a, a dense forest uh, called the Ardennes Forest that the French did not think the Germans could go through quickly. To their surprise, they did, right? Because, you know, trucks, tanks, motorcycles now, uh, much more fast moving, and apparently they didn't need much in the way of roads to go through it, as well as planes. So uh, the French and British forces who are ready to meet and are actually facing a, a sort of like fake offensive by the Germans in, uh, in Belgium, uh, to their surprise, the rest of the German army appears behind them, completely surrounds them, and uh, almost all of them are killed or captured, except for the 400,000 or so that escaped thanks to civilian efforts uh, out of Dunkirk, right? But this is a major loss for the, uh, for the Allies. All right, so this is 1940. It's the Battle of France. And very quickly, in the first major battle, really, uh, France is out. They lost their whole army with some that got away to Britain. Uh, and the British are defeated, too. So the Germans have no real uh, opposition now in France. So they marched to Paris take over, occupy the north to keep fighting Britain, 
in the uh, south, they install a uh, pro-Nazi leader. What do they call that area down there? Vichy France. Yeah, Vichy France, correct. So France is now half occupied, half allied to the Nazis, uh, and Hitler has his, uh, uh, he's won World War I in his eyes. Right now he's just gotta knock out Britain, okay? Invades Belgium, invades the Netherlands, invades Denmark, invades Norway, because uh, they got a lot of iron up there. Uh, and they also have this thing called, uh, damn, what's it called? They have a factory that makes hyper-condensed water or something, which the Nazis need to conduct experiments on uh, developing a nuclear weapon, atomic weaponry. Um, so they, they actually had a chance to develop the atomic bomb before we did, but we should actually thank the Norwegians, because they are the ones that stopped them. They sabotaged the delivery of this water. I just learned this like two weeks, so that's why I'm telling you this. Uh, they uh, had this factory that made this condensed water in Norway, and they, it took them forever to make the amount they needed, and they were shipping it back. And these Norwegians, uh, who knew about it, they sort of sacrificed themselves, and they sabotaged and sunk the ship that this water was on, and whew, down it went to the... Uh, uh, the bottom of a uh, super, super deep uh, fjord, and then the Nazis never got it. So good job, guys. You uh, potentially stopped the Nazis from getting nuclear weapons. All right. Um, what do we call the attempt of the Nazis to uh, bomb Britain into submission? Because they don't have the Navy to invade them. So they try to sort of bomb them into surrender or, or, or to futility or utility. Battle of Britain. Yeah, Battle of Britain, right. Uh, but it's not going to work as well as the Nazis would like because number one they're getting a bunch of supplies from the United States and volunteer pilots, but uh, The British and Americans have just recently developed ways to see Enemy planes or ships in the air and the water right including the uh, submarines that just tore up all the British and American shipping during uh, World War one. What are those two? Yep What's the one in the air? Radar. Yeah, sonar and radar. That's huge, because that allows you to see German submarines underwater, so you can prepare and, and combat them, throw your mines out or whatever, avoid them however you can. Uh, and in the air, it's even more important, because if you can see the planes coming in advance, what does that allow you to do? Prepare your defense. Yeah, prepare your defense, but like, well, why, why is it better to prepare my defense before I can see them as opposed to when I see them coming? So you have a better chance of winning the battle. Yeah, that's really generic, but true. Why is it so important for aircraft, though, in particular? You can launch your uh, fighters. Yes, because if I'm waiting till I see them, I can't run to my plane, start it up, and launch in time. They're just going to shoot down my plane while it's on the ground or while it's trying to take off. Uh, this way, though, if they see it coming, the planes get in the air and they have a much better chance of stopping. Also, in the towns, people can know in advance so they can go underground and take cover. So it's gonna really minimize the human damage that these uh, bombing raids do to the British. So radar, super helps now. Uh, the Americans goofed, by the way. We actually saw the Japanese coming on radar, but uh, the radar is brand new, so you couldn't really tell the difference between a bunch of planes. Yeah, go to the bathroom. Go to, uh, between a bunch of planes and, um, uh, what's it called? A flock of birds, for example. Um, and so when they saw these Japanese planes coming, they thought it was either a flock of birds or it was potentially some uh, uh, American planes flying to California were supposed to go through that day. And uh, unfortunately for them, it was the uh, Japanese attacking. Yeah, I know. Go. All right. So uh, radar and sonar are going to save these uh, allied forces in the long run. Cool. So this is, I think this is labeled on the AP test as like Anglo... American innovations. This is really important for them to, uh, to know. All right, so these Anglo-American innovations include, of course, radar and sonar. Um, how do they also know what the Germans and Japanese are doing besides the fact they can see them coming? Like, they even know about these operations in advance. How's that? The code breaking? Yeah, they, they broke the code. So the, the, as far as I know, the Americans just outright broke the Japanese code, so they knew what they were doing. Like, for example, the big turning point battle, we knew where the whole Japanese, well, all of the Japanese carriers were, because they were going to attack this uh, spot at Midway. And that movie's like out right now, I haven't seen it. Uh, so we found out, we're like, oh, we're gonna send our whole Navy there. And we met them there, kind of could have gotten by surprise, and then ended up not, we kind of screwed up. We tried to send a bunch of bombers out to their aircraft carriers, but they just shot all our bombers down and ruined the surprise, so that didn't work. Um, but we ended up winning there anyway. So that's the only reason we were able to uh, defeat the Japanese, uh, at least at Midway. And then uh, 
the British, it was far more complicated. The, the Nazis had this thing called the Enigma machine, which uh, you could never break it. It's, it, would, it would be impossible to break the code set by the Enigma machine, because there's like 30 million options as to what the code could be, and they change it every day uh, based on this like keyboard thing. So there's no way to do it. It's not possible. Uh, but the Polish resistance steals one, somehow gets it out, gets it to Britain, and even though they have it, there's no way they can use it still because they don't know what that little code key is to uh, activate uh, which, which set of uh, letters to use for the code. Uh, so it's kind of useless. So they try to break the code with humans, but then every day it changes. So unless you happen to solve it that day and know what they're going to do maybe that night, it's not really that helpful. So this is where that, uh, I think his name is Alan Turing. There's a, what is that movie called? It's a, it's a really good one, Benedict Cumberbatch. It's about the British code breaker. Anybody remember that? <coughs> I don't, I can't remember what it's called. But this guy basically invents computers to uh, do enough computations in a day to break that German code uh, in a day. But they have to know if the message is right. And the only way they're knowing if the message is correct is the uh, Germans, well Hitler kind of screws this up for himself, uh, all of their messages end with this two word phrase. Heil Hitler, yeah. So. What they do is every single day, at like midnight or whatever, they would plug the Enigma machine into their computer, which they invented, and um, it would just go through and try to uh, try different combinations. They could do thousands and thousands and thousands in a day, and they would know it was correct if that last, uh, those last two words were how Hitler. So every day they'd break the code at some point, or almost every day, uh, and they would know what the Germans were doing, where their troops were, what they were planning, and, and all of that. Uh, but what was interesting for both the Americans and the British is, what happens if, I, uh, if I'm always in the right spot? Like if the Germans or Japanese go to attack and I'm always in the right spot every time? They get suspicious. Yeah, they're, they're gonna know. They're gonna know that they've somehow broken the code, they'll change it, and you're screwed. So both the British and Americans had to like, let the Japanese and Germans get some uh, surprise attacks. Um, or you know, not show up at the right time so that they weren't suspicious or weren't as suspicious. So they did a pretty good job of that. So code breaking. By the way, the Americans had a pretty good idea for uh, setting up a code that couldn't be broken because we had a code, but not only was there a code, even if you decoded it, you would decode it into a language you didn't know existed because we used the Navajo code speakers to do that. So even if the Japanese broke it, the Germans broke it, it'd just be in Navajo, which they don't know. Uh, and they don't even know about it or have anyone that speaks it, so it was no good to them. All right, so that's going to be the way that the Allies are going to uh, turn this uh, war around. Now, it's important to know here that Germany's not alone. They have some allies. They have more than these three, but the three main allies are uh, Nazi Germany, Fascist Italy, and the Mussolini, uh, and Japan is going to agree to join them just because they kind of have common enemies in Western Europe and the United States. So. Uh, those are known as, of course, the Axis powers. I should have said this earlier, but... And the three there are Germany, Italy, and Japan. And the others, the Allied powers, is pretty much the rest of the world that's involved. Uh, among the major members are the British, French, later the US, and later the uh, Soviet Union, and China, plus others. But uh, that's pretty much the main belligerents um, in this actual war. So we were at World War, oh yeah, so Anglo-American Innovations, for the Axis and Allied Powers, okay, cool. So uh, Germany's gonna throw this into a, uh, they're gonna do something unexpected again. Uh, once they figured out that, well, they're not going to uh, bomb the UK in submission, and the uh, Allies are doing a much better job of getting supplies over, but they're not really under any immediate threat of the, the British like invading them. So they're like, well, whatever. We can't beat them, but they're not gonna beat us. So they just kind of let Britain be for the most part. Uh, who do they focus on, though, to the surprise of most of the world? Soviet. Yeah, so, I mean, remember what that was called, the invasion? Uh, Oper Operation Barbarossa. Our Operation Barbarossa, correct. Okay, cool. So uh, that's in 1941. So again, once they figured out that they can't beat the UK, but the UK's not gonna beat them, uh, Hitler engages that sort of uh, racial struggle campaign to, to take living space uh, from the Slavic people. He's, he's already got Poland, obviously. Um, he's either allied or added the people of uh, 
uh, southern Europe for the most part. But uh, this is where most of the fertile land and the thing that Germany needs most besides food living space is uh, oil. Yeah, the oil. There was quite a bit of oil or enough oil uh, in the uh, Caucasus region over here uh, in the uh, steppe and delta region, so near the Middle East. So uh, that's going to be the target. So Operation Barbarossa, and this catches the Soviets by surprise. There are several things that uh, screw with the Soviets here, 1941. Uh, first of all, Stalin killed a lot of his best military officials a couple years earlier in the Great Purge. Um, and they're, again, not really anticipating this, this attack. So the Germans plan this attack as like a three-pronged assault. One going for this oil-rich region here. Um, the uh, primary city they have going for is Stalingrad. The capital of Moscow, obviously. And the main uh, port city, and the former capital, uh, Petrograd. So going for those three. And uh, they're going to uh, do well, because again, they catch them off by surprise. The Russians have kind of hurt themselves militaristically, and nobody's figured out how to beat the Blitzkrieg. But a combination of weather and uh, Russian uh, innovation is going to uh, do the Nazis in eventually. So they catch them off guard, and they go for these three points, and they get to two of them in Moscow. They get just outside of it, but they take a huge chunk of, um, of the, the Soviets' territory. So it's looking bad for the Allies because by 1942, so from 1942, Hitler owns pretty much all of Europe except for Great Britain and a couple of neutral countries, or, the, or they're allied, and then Japan owns pretty much the whole West Pacific. So it's looking quite bad for uh, the Allied powers. So just know that, that the Nazis get off to a, a good start. Uh, as well as attacking uh, the USSR and trying to knock them out there, they're also going to try to uh, uh, go in through the uh, Italian area, they're Sicily, of course, gone. Uh, they're going to try to go in through North Africa and get at the British uh, in their oil fields, or at least cut off the British from that oil field. They don't have a whole lot of troops to spare, though, uh, so it becomes kind of a lopsided number fight, but the uh, Germans do a, a decent job at making it difficult uh, for the British. However, the British do stop them at, I think, a place called El Alamein, something like that. Um, I remember from a video game, Battlefield 1942, when I was a kid. Um, they stopped them there. And the Americans, when they actually join in, in Europe, they're going to invade through North Africa first and up through Italy, and the Germans are going to have to uh, retreat. So um, they attacked the Soviet Union, and there's a couple things that stopped them in the uh, Soviet Union. Number one, they didn't learn the uh, lesson that Napoleon learned earlier, uh, not to invade Russia when winter could set in. Uh, but they thought that they'd be a lot better off because, like, well, they're not horses, they're not walking around, they've got a bunch of vehicles. But what was the problem with uh, winter in Russia and those vehicles they drove? Yeah, it has to do with the fuel. So it's not that they don't have the oil, although they want more oil, uh, but it does kind of bind up the diesel fuel because it's so cold. Uh, from, what I, from what I understand, it clumps it up or makes it unable to combust as easily or flow through the uh, motor. So uh, the harsh winter, which I think set in a little early, like with the Soviets, uh, is going to slow them. And again, their diesel fuel uh, doesn't work or doesn't work properly. And that's going to stop the slow the German war machine. And they're pretty far away from Germany at this point. Right? And the Russians are, uh, well, they're on their home turf for the most part. Okay, uh, the Russians do several things here that really screw up the Germans besides this whole winter thing, which is you know, out of their control. But there's one thing they do that is within their control that is very effective that they also did versus Napoleon earlier too. Can we get that door, please? But they also did versus Napoleon too. Since the Germans are very stretched for supplies and their fuel doesn't work very well, uh, this tactic ends up working really well. This is where they're going to try to deny the Germans from using any of the materials that are there, like their livestock, their clothes, their water, their, their power, whatever, from the cities they take. Scorched earth. Yeah, scorched earth. So they go, they kill all the cattle, uh, burn the buildings, take the food, spoil it, you know, poison the water, things like that so the Germans can't use them for supplies. They have to like bring them from Germany. And again, it's the winter, their fuel doesn't work that well, so that's really going to stretch out the uh, German army, uh, who is halted, um, unluckily, uh, by this winter. They also, I don't think I told you this one, they also figure out how to beat the German Blitzkrieg. Blitzkrieg only works sort of uh, out in the open. I kind of told you yesterday, what is it that they do? They just hide in buildings. Yeah, um, what they do is they, it's a little more intricate than that, but yeah, you, you, you roughly have that. I'm glad Siri's trying to tell you. Um, <laughs> They, uh, they, they, they bunker down in major cities, because again, you can't really run an effective blitzkrieg. 
even if you bomb it, like it just makes the tanks unable to roll through it. So they would block whatever roads they could, blow whatever bridges they could, uh, and they would hunker down in buildings, and that would kind of prevent the Germans from executing that blitzkrieg strategy that wrecked everybody out in the open. So the Nazis had to go building to building, and even though they had you know, more uh, weapons and things like that, or better weapons, the Russians had more people and, and overall supplies. So if it came down to a war, a war of attrition and trading casualties, like the Russians would win in the long run, especially with Germany stretched out over all of Europe. Because the Russians only really had to worry about this. They initially worried about Japan, so they kept a bunch of troops over here in Siberia. But once they realized Japan wasn't interested in that, and they couldn't really, it wasn't that valuable anyway, they took these uh, Russian troops into Siberia, who by the way are used to fighting in the cold, and swapped them on over over here uh, to the uh, Western Front. All right, so that's gonna mean the Nazis have to win quick somehow or the Russians are gonna win in the long run. The Russians actually, you got the Russians a lot of credit here. Uh, the Russians also do their innovative thing. So what, what could I put here? Uh, bunker down in cities. All right. Um, they're also going to uh, realize that the Nazis are in range of bombing their factories. So uh, the Russian production is mostly in this region and uh, they realize their factories are very vulnerable to the Germans just sabotaging and bombing them. So. Within roughly one year or less, and this is pretty impressive, they dismantled what they could of these factories and moved them over the Ural Mountains out of range of the uh, um, German bombers. So that, that's, a, that's a, huge, a huge feat uh, to accomplish uh, in the winter, under pressure, uh, in such a short amount of time. Uh, and the Russians are able to do that. And that way they can keep producing materials, because again, as long as they can bunker down these cities and force the Germans to play the long game, uh, it's gonna go in their favor, they think, and they're right. Uh, that it's going to. All right, so the Nazis uh, get bogged down in these three areas with the Germans, um, or with the Russians, and Hitler is going to make the mistake of, despite the advice of his military advisors to uh, uh, get out of their position here in Stalingrad, because they really want access to that oil there. That's gonna help Germany out a lot since they were unable to get this oil in the Middle East. Uh, Germany believes that like the German will or their superiority or whatever is going to shine through if they just kind of stick it out uh, and they make the mistake of keeping their uh, best, biggest group of large troops there. I think it was the 6th Army or the 9th, I can't remember 6th or 9th. Um, and the, the Russians end up surrounding them uh, and killing or capturing all of them. And by the way, when I say capture, I mean sent them to the gulags, which pretty much meant they were going to die very quickly. Uh, and that was, that's a massive blow uh, to the Germans. They're going to lose the 6th Army, at least. I think it's the 6th Army. Uh, and other troops. And that is going to be the uh, turning point in the, uh, in the uh, European theater. And that's the Battle of Stalingrad. And the Soviets win that, in quotes, they lost a lot of people, but they do deal a, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Not lethal blow. Crippling blow? Crippling blow to the, uh, to the Nazis. Uh, in 1943. So that's a big one. And once they capture those troops, with that being such a large number of limited troops the Germans have, uh, losing a lot of resources there and a lot of their best uh, troops, it's, it's just like the, uh, the degulakization that we talked about. You wipe out the best farmers, can you just replace them? No, they're gone. So it's the same thing with the military. You wipe out a lot of their best soldiers, well, you can't replace those. So the Germans are going to start a, a, a slow but sure um, uh, what's the word called? regression where the Soviets are gonna slowly take this territory back uh, day by day, week by week, over the next couple of years. So that's, I mean, obviously there's two more years left and many millions of deaths uh, that are going to occur, but that's pretty much it for the Nazis' hopes when they lose that, their sixth army, and they lose in uh, Stalingrad. That makes sense? All right, it's not over for the Russians. Plenty of casualties to go, uh, but anyways. U.S. does get involved, though, um, although you could largely say Russia probably could have slash did pretty much do it on its own. The bulk of Nazi forces, were, I think three quarters of all their, their military was over there, and they still lost. So uh, what would the United States' primary concern be when they first enter World War II? Germany, Japan, Italy, what, what's their... Uh, Japan. Japan, yeah, they're the, one, they're the biggest threat to the United States. Germany's nowhere near going after the U.S., uh, so the big concern for uh, the U.S. is dealing with the uh, Japanese Imperial Navy and stopping them in the Pacific. So while they are going to send some effort, uh, relief efforts uh, to the European allies, because, I mean, Stalin, like, begging for help, especially when the Nazis jump out and almost take their major cities, 
Uh, the U.S. is going to send what it can afford to, because again, most are going to stay here in the Pacific, uh, over here into the European theater. And when I say Europe, I mean Africa, by the way, because uh, they invade in North Africa first to help the British out, chase the Nazis out of North Africa, and then they begin this kind of disastrous or at least slow and clumsy campaign in Italy. Uh, so the U.S. Uh, in Europe, that's going to be first through North Africa. They're going to help clean up the uh, uh, remaining Germans there, chase them out, and then they're going to go through Sicily and Italy. But again, these are brand new soldiers, uh, and then the, the Italians and Germans, they're going to fight. have been fighting for years at this point. Uh, and if you guys don't know this, I mean, it's just like when you're playing a brand new video game. If you just buy a brand new game, a new first-person shooter, and you just immediately go online to play against other players, you're just gonna get wiped out for a long time. They know all the spots, they know all the weapons to get, so you just, you're just gonna be dying a lot. Well, in real life, you don't get to respawn, so it, it's gonna be a, a very difficult, uh, a very difficult experience for the American soldiers there. Um, but nonetheless, they're gonna invade, uh, so that's 1942 to 43, and then in 43, they're gonna invade uh, Sicily and uh, Italy, in 43. And they're going to win out eventually, but it's a very clumsy and bloody and, and embarrassing and costly campaign for the Americans because they have a huge numerical advantage and, and all of that. But if you, a very small amount of Italians and Germans give them a lot of trouble. Uh, part of it's terrain based because there's a lot of mountains and stuff in Italy. And so it's easy to shove troops up in the mountains and then just kind of camp at the roads essentially uh, in mountains. So that makes it difficult, but uh, the US kind of blundered through and eventually is able to uh, chase the small amount of German Nazis and um, uh, Italians out of Italy. And then before they even get there to Rome, by the way, the Italians turn on Mussolini and like, uh, go after him. So he tries to get a disguise and run out and they catch him and strip him naked and hang him uh, in public. So his, his ending wasn't exactly great. Wait, so wait, is that how the Colosseum got destroyed? Partially? Oh, I don't think so. I don't know. Well, I mean, that's just old. And Rome's been... Rome's been sacked a bunch of times, like four or five times by Germanic and Gothic uh, in invasions, and uh, again by the Byzantines, so I, 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 I doubt it, maybe, but Rome's been invaded a lot since they, you know, it's, it's heyday. Anyways, um, so yeah, so the U.S. does knock out Italy and chases them out of uh, North Africa, but the Germans can kind of ignore that because there's no real chance of the U.S. coming up to the Alps and invading. Uh, it's not much of a threat. That's why Stalin's going to complain. They're like, no, we need some real help, not your like fake help here in Italy that, that it's not actually that helpful. All right, by the way, that kind of sows some seeds of distrust between Stalin and, and the United States and Great Britain. All right, but the U.S. does do a full-scale invasion and opens up a Western front against the Nazis eventually. D -D -D yeah, the D-Day invasion, or Operation Overlord. So the United States, Great Britain, or sorry, the UK, Canada, other members of the Commonwealth, like Australia, they're all going to uh, uh, launch the largest amphibious invasion in, in, in human history uh, in Normandy, France. They make it look like they're going to attack one point, so the Germans rush their troops there, and then they go for a different point. Still super bloody, though, because, I mean, they're rolling up on a coast, dropping off soldiers to a bunch of Germans sitting up in bunkers on a hill with machine guns. So, like, if you guys ever seen Saving Private Ryan, that, that initial scene, like, that's what it was like. Uh, and the, uh, the Americans uh, and, and British and Canadians uh, took a big... Uh, Big hit there, but they, they it does it does work, especially since the Germans are at this point they're outnumbered like seven or eight to one in the air, uh, which is a big deal, um, and they're they've only got roughly a quarter of their troops to put over here, and the rest are over here losing to the Soviets. So by the time the Americans do this, it's like yeah 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 thanks a lot we already won anyway, and and now you're going to show up, uh, but they do, and that's uh, of course D Day invasion uh, in 1944. June 1944 specifically, uh, and that's, it, it's not going to be, I mean, it's going to be roughly a year, a little less than a year, uh, and then the, uh, the Germans are going to end up surrendering. All right, so that's pretty much it. They invade through here and go through conquering uh, westward. The Soviets continue their expansion, uh, sorry, east, and then they're going to go west, and they're going to roughly meet in the middle. The Soviets do get to the capital in Berlin first in 1945. Hitler, rather than be captured and humiliated and tortured and all that, he just commits suicide, um, and then... Um, yeah, that's the end of uh, World War II in Europe. That's uh, 1945. I think it was May 1945. I always forget these last dates, but uh, Germany's going to surrender. Hitler dies. Russia's occupy the capital uh, and all of that. But here's the thing I want to talk about quickly before we move on to the end of, of the war in, in Asia. 
What, uh, what were the Americans, and especially the Soviets, coming across as they took this German territory that they were not expecting, other than the top officials that knew because they broke the codes a long time ago but didn't tell anybody? Concentration camps? Yeah, uh, the death camps specifically. Uh, because initially, you know, the Nazis kind of went to this stage of like, well, we'll just try to encourage Jews to leave, and then we'll, we'll, we'll scare them out, and then we'll uh, ship them out, and then... When that became unreasonable or, or too difficult, then they just started slaughtering them, right? So that progression is like 1935. Let's just do the progression, actually. Holocaust here. Here's the progression. So before World War II even starts, 1935, I think this is the notes. The Nazis come to power in 33, and immediately Hitler starts persecuting um, anyone he sees as inferior. He starts having, like, uh, handicapped people and criminals sterilized. They can't reproduce. Um, he's going to... Uh, revoke the citizenship so now they're not going to be protected by the police and, and laws like that uh, revoke the citizenship of the jews those are called the nuremberg laws are those in the notes yeah okay nuremberg laws and then of course they also can't intermarry with germans jews and germans um and they go a step further a few years later with 1938 they sanction or or, or don't punish people for uh the uh, crystal knocked which was where they sort of allowed or sanctioned people uh, and paramilitary forces to go out and uh, <coughs> damage Jewish synagogues and, and, and homes and, and businesses and things like that with no, with no, uh, no punishment, essentially. Most Jews got the clue there and, and bailed, uh, but some unfortunately did not, or they couldn't. Um, let's see here. Uh, oh, I heard this one terrible story about a lot of them tried to, about this time, get out on a ship uh, for the United States, and then they, they got to the U.S., I believe, and the U.S. is like, nope, sorry, our immigration cap is full. Uh, so they sent them back, and they all just died in, in, in the Holocaust. It's pretty, pretty terrible turn of events for them. Uh, but anyways, so, uh, but from, from in World War II, from 1939 to 42, they weren't necessarily systematically trying to kill uh, the Jews yet. They, they were still more about get them on trains and get them out sort of thing. All right, but uh, that became an expensive process and difficult process because then they, what are they going to dump them off because they're, they're expanding already. Uh, so as the war progresses, it becomes more expensive, more difficult. That's when they have that meeting. Uh, you guys remember the name of the meeting and the decision? But that might have not, not have been in the notes. There's a conference. No, it wasn't in the notes then. <laughs> uh, it's called the Wansi Conference. The what? Wansi Conference. That's the name of the, the town or area they were in. Uh, that's where the Nazi officials met, you know, Hitler, Goebbels, and all those guys. And this is where they made the decision that uh, we're going to switch our strategy of trying to encourage or chasing Jews out to, uh, and Slavs out to just wiping them out, essentially. Uh, and this is known as the uh, final solution. Uh, and that's when, I mean, the Holocaust had already begun, but this is when the uh, systematic killing began. So this is when they started forming death camps, not in Germany, but in areas where there were already Slavic people uh, and Jews. So in the areas of Poland and the Ukraine and Soviet Union, this is where those uh, really bad death camps you guys have heard of before uh, in English and whatnot uh, or other history classes uh, were. So you had you know, Auschwitz, uh, Kelmno, Treblinka, et cetera. Those are in foreign territory. So most Germans never even saw these. They were run by the SS uh, and uh, maybe some members of the German army got to see it. But this is where it wasn't just a prison camp. You would show up right on a train, and these, these furnaces are going all the time, and it smells like this burning, terrible hair smell, uh, people always noted. They'd show up on a train, immediately they'd split you up. Women, children, old, and sick go to one, and then uh, able-bodied men go to the other. They gas and kill the uh, men, women, uh, sick, and, and uh, children right away and burn them. Uh, and then the, uh, oh, you guys haven't heard this, I'm seeing some drop jaws. Uh, and then uh, off to the right, the men go to work to themselves to death. So they'd give them like 600 calories a day or something and they'd die after however many months. Uh, or some of them were smart enough to figure out how to get other, other ways to get food to live. Uh, but as soon as you were looking weak or sick, uh, they would just kill you. So like they would try their best to look healthy and upright and all of that, even if they felt terrible. Because if they were sent to the infirmary and they didn't recover immediately, they're just killed. Uh, so that's what, that's what the Holocaust was like um, in these death camps. Again, if you were not an able-bodied male, you were gassed and killed on, on Pretty much on arrival, and then uh, the men were worked to death slowly. So that's, a, that's not a good way to go. Was it just Jews? No. No, this is a large chunk of them are Jews, but you've got a, roughly the same amount of, uh, so that's like five to six million killed in this whole campaign, uh, European Jews, Ashkenazi Jews as they're known. 
uh, but also uh, Slavs were a big target. I think they also had around five to six million killed. So if you're a Ukrainian or a Russian or a Polish person, they still see you as inferior and, and they, you were part of that program too. Either they would take you to a concentration camp, or sorry, a death camp, or more, uh, more popularly and brutally, they would just straight execute you when they would invade. They would just go in, line the hand up, and take them all out. And then they'd have them bit, dig their own graves and then just you know kill them and have them fall in and, and, and go. Uh, or, yeah, that was the best way to go. Uh, or they would uh, just basically take your city, like this entire region uh, of Warsaw, which is their main city. It's called the Warsaw Ghetto. They just like barbed wired them in, put soldiers around it, and just waited for them all to, to, to starve for the most part. So uh, these people were, were subject to some pretty serious trauma and, and death. But yeah, Slavs, Gypsies, which are kind of a Ro Ro Romanian type area of people that, that kind of travel, uh, at least uh, stereotypically. And uh, homosexuals, I know it's not a race, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, etc. Anyone they deemed as genetically inferior, uh, you know, by whatever their terms were. So uh, most of the Soviets saw those ones, and that was a little traumatizing for those Soviets who had no idea, and then they'd show up this camp and be like, what the hell is this? Uh, all these piles of these, you know, starved to the bone bodies and uh, graves and the gas chambers, and it was just uh, unimaginable. The United States came across some concentration camps, not quite like the death camps over here though, uh, but we did come across some uh, over there in other parts of Germany. All right, but yeah, that's the Holocaust. Uh, so Hitler himself was responsible for the death, uh, genocidally, of you know, somewhere between eight and 11 million, depending on the, the stats you look at, plus all the casualties from the war itself. So pretty high totals. Not Stalin or Mao numbers, but they're, they're way up there. All right, any questions about the Holocaust? Do you guys remember why he was doing this, by the way? Was it just he just didn't like Jewish people? No. No, well, he didn't like Jewish people. But like, it, it was a little deeper than that. Not that it was right, terribly wrong, but uh, he thought he was doing something good. Pan-Germanism? Yeah, it was kind of like pan-Germanism, but it was more social Darwin. Well, it's kind of pan-German, too. He had this idea, and I think I already said this, that there's like this worldwide racial struggle, like this Darwinian racial struggle. And what was the objective for all the races? To compete. Yeah, compete. And he took that to the extreme. By competition, it means war. Yeah, war and elimination, right. So uh, you're a potential enemy that may end my race or subjugate it. So we're going to take it from you, take your land resources, and just either exile you or eventually kill you, right? And he actually believed that's what was going on. That was his reality, right? Just like Stalin and Mao's reality about the whole class war and, and, and that, that whole you know, utopian mess that killed millions, so did, so did this one. Right, ideologies, these like simple explanations for how the world works and lumping people into groups and wiping out groups you see as enemies and then never, ever, ever ends up working though. <clears throat> Especially not the Marxist ones. All right, good on the Holocaust? Yes. All right, that's the end of war in Europe. One thing I want to mention about the end of war in Europe before we move to the next topic over there in the Pacific is uh, the Allies, primarily Great Britain, the United States, you can't see, and the Soviet Union met up a couple times to sort of agree about what to do with the uh, territory they had. Because, I mean, none of these governments exist anymore. Everybody either died or had to leave. Uh, so, like, they take all this territory back, but it's not like you can just hand the keys back to the president because it's like, well, that president died five years ago. Uh, and all the Congress members or parliament members, or they, or they fled or, or whatever. Or they, were, they joined up with Hitler, and so now we're, we're imprisoning them or executing them or they already died uh, in the interim. So the question is like, what the hell do you do with all this territory, right? With all these governments that are just in shambles, including Germany. Uh, and so uh, they meet a couple times. Uh, they have the, uh, crap, I can't remember the order. I think it was Yalta first. Yeah, I think it was Yalta first in the Crimean and then Potsdam in Germany. Um, don't quote me on the order here, but Yalta and Potsdam conferences, this is two different ones. Uh, in 1945, this is where uh, they're going to meet to, because uh, before the war was over, they knew they were going to win, uh, by 1945 especially. So they were like talking about what they should do. So they agreed on a couple things. Firstly, I think the first meeting they agreed, um, we should, and, and I think as you guys know, they immediately, or at least the Soviets immediately go against this. We should let everybody choose their own governments, whether it's uh, democracy or uh, an authoritarian regime, or it's communist economy or political style, or capitalists, we should let them vote for it and choose their own borders and governments. All right, what's that called when you do that? 
Self-determination, right. All right, so the, uh, the uh, areas they were in that they had liberated from the, the Axis powers in Germany, and they were going to hand the keys back to the government to. They, of course, had to choose them because they didn't exist anymore. Uh, they decided they were going to let them self-determine. So that means we're not going to force you to become democracies or capitalists or communists or, or whatever, right, in theory. Right, so that, that makes sense? You guys get that? Yeah. Okay, because the Cold War is going to instantly show us, oh, that's not going to happen. They also decide on what they want to do with Germany after the war. And what they want to do is they want to split it up into four zones uh, while it self-determines. And the uh, idea is uh, the Soviets get East Germany, uh, the British get uh, the northern portion here, the French I think get the middle portion, and the US gets the uh, bottom portion. Yeah. The, the US and, and the France might have been flipped, I can't remember exactly, but four zones. And the idea is once we settle things down, uh, we have the Germans vote for their own government, and then uh, once they're settled and peaceful, uh, we uh, combine the zones and leave. Like, that's the idea. All right, is any of this going to happen? No. No? Four zones temporarily. Don't France and U.S. combine? Yeah, they, the, all three of the Allies end up combining pretty quickly after World War II. Um, so you could say we made the first move on screwing that one up, but that was at the point that we already were pretty convinced that the Soviets were not going to be uh, allowing governments to choose themselves. Because, for example, Stalin wanted to do another Treaty of Versailles type thing where they took a bunch of territory and took their army away, made them pay for the war. But then all of the allies, except for France, they're still pretty salty. Uh, the British and, and Americans were like, uh, no, that's a bad idea, because last time this terrible uh, uh, depression happened in Germany, hyperinflation, let a, a power vacuum of a weak government, and then Hitler comes in, and we have World War II. So, like, we don't need a World War III. Let's just try to rebuild Germany. So there's a big disagreement there on that. Uh, but we'll get to that. Well, we won't. I just told it to you. So there you go. All right. Good on Europe and Potsdam and Yalta and all that. All right, sweet. So let's talk about the end of World War II in uh, the Pacific. All right. I already uh, previewed it a bit. But in 1942, we use our code-breaking uh, skills to break the Japanese code. So we know that all their aircraft carriers and most of their fleet is going to try to take us out at Midway and then probably Hawaii later. But we know they're going for Midway. That's a small island roughly halfway through uh, the Pacific, hence the name. And uh, we have a, an Air Force base there. So we take our uh, three carriers, which thankfully for us were not in the harbor when it was bombed. And the Japanese, I believe at the time, had four carriers. This is a super, 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 super important battle. And that's because the winner of this battle, if one side sunk the carriers of the other, ugh, they might win the entire war. And even if, uh, like, let's say the Japanese won and, and weren't able to win the entire war, it would have really, really, really prolonged the war. And here's why. At the moment, Jap Japan had, of course, one more uh, or, than us. And they were building one aircraft carrier because they're, they're very expensive. They require a lot of steel and a lot of fuel and all that stuff. Japan doesn't have a lot of resources. We do, though. So we are building, and I might be wrong on the exact number, but I believe it's somewhere around 10 aircraft carriers. It was a lot more. All right? So this is a huge battle because let's say we lost, and they went, and they took our three carriers out, and we took out one or two of theirs or whatever. Uh, they are going to prolong the war substantially because where do you have to build an aircraft carrier? On land. Nope, not on land. You've got to build it on a coast, right? Because they're too big and heavy to, uh, I mean, it, I guess it's possible you could build it upriver somewhere, like along the Mississippi. That would have been clever. But um, for the most part, you, you kind of have to build them at or around the ocean, like a shore. What does that make them vulnerable to? Sea attack. A sea attack, right? So if they take out our aircraft carriers and we don't take out theirs, take out theirs they could really delay us building more aircraft carriers and sending them back out. Because they could be like, oh, sweet, well... You can't do anything about our aircraft carriers, so we're just going to sail on over here to the coast. Oh, you're building one in San Diego? Well, we're just going to bomb that. Oh, you're building one in San Francisco? Oh, we're just going to bomb that. And they could really, really, really uh, harm our ability to replace those ships or, or delay it. I'm not saying they would have won, but it would have made World War II in the Pacific a lot longer. Fortunately for us, though, we knew they were coming. We kind of wasted our ch chance to surprise them, but uh, we had this uh, battle with them. I, I believe we were actually outnumbered. Um, I can't remember the exact numbers. It was close either way, and uh, fortunately for the United States, we sunk all of their carriers, and they only sunk one of ours barely. Uh, so we escaped this uh, battle with the 
Japanese losing all their aircraft carriers and us losing uh, just one. But that's really important because that means now they have no real way of stopping our uh, uh, production uh, of aircraft carriers. And in this war, in the Pacific and just in general, if you had the aircraft carriers, you won because you're able to take out their whole Navy without them uh, being able to really fight back. And uh, you can bomb their coast anywhere you want uh, and catch them by surprise, especially if they don't have like developed radar. Uh, and that's exactly what we do. We totally abuse this advantage for the rest of the war. Um, we're going to, of course, uh, harass all of the islands that they possess, uh, their navy, and our aircraft carriers are going to be uh, a major, major advantage for us. So we win that battle, Midway, 1942. That's the turning point battle, because again, we knocked their carriers out, we got ours, that's gonna keep us uh, safe in the Pacific and let us take advantage of our massive uh, uh, production uh, capabilities in the United States. Because keep in mind, the US is kind of the only country that is really untouched throughout all this. And we got millions of people, we got tons of factories, tons of resources, so we kind of like won the war of production. Uh, the Europeans and Chinese and, and others sort of took the brunt of the force as far as you know damage goes. Uh, and we were kind of off on our own continent, just just chucking, you know, producing things at a ridiculous rate. All right, like men, all, a bunch of men joined the army, and then women went to the factories, and we just produced as much as we could. It was total war, right? They turned all the factories that made radios and, and, and cars and stuff into military production. They rationed the food. They drafted people not they needed to because plenty of people signed up after Pearl Harbor was attacked. And like I said, women joined the workforce, uh, so we were producing a ridiculous amount of stuff. We already have plenty of... Uh, iron deposits and um, uh, oil, and we were uh, buddies with uh, the UK and Canada, so their resources were available to us too, so we had a huge, huge, huge advantage there. All right, we also win uh, in the Southern Pacific uh, a battle called Guadalcanal that was on land and on sea, and those two battles are going to be really it for the Japanese. This is going to be their slow regression all the way back, just like Germany did, but it's going to be the Japanese. So Guadalcanal. I think that's the same year, by the way. I think it's 42 to 43. Might be off by a year on that. I'm not sure if it ended in 40. I think it did. But uh, once the Japanese lose those two, their uh, navy is far too damaged, their troops are too spread out, uh, and they're pretty short on oil. They're pretty much short on everything, by the way. This is when the Japanese start getting desperate. Right. Once we start, once we win these two major battles and we start pushing them back uh, closer and closer to Japan and they're already locked up and fighting with the Chinese who are not out of it and also getting supplies from the British uh, through the uh, jungles and across the mountains. Um, the Japanese get increasingly desperate and uh, this is when they start using those kamikaze tactics where they're running out of ships and supplies and soldiers so at this point they're just strapping pilots and planes with explosives and just trying to run them into the biggest ship, preferably aircraft carriers, uh, that they can find. Uh, I would highly suggest, if you have time or you care, which I, you probably don't, but uh, there's a really cool set of footage that's like all of the, and it's largely in color too, they convert it to color. Uh, it's all of the footage of kamikaze pilots attempting to hit American ships. And it's from the perspective of the ships that they are targeting. So it's like a particularly terrifying experience where yeah, it's scary, your enemies are flying around, but this is different, like, they're not trying to bomb you and, and escape, they're just flying straight at you. So every gun on the ship is just desperately trying to take this thing out of the air, which is hard to do uh, before it hits. It's not like they had missiles, they could just heat seek it. it. They had to like actually aim their guns and then take this thing out before it hit. Uh, so it's pretty, uh, it's pretty intense. Um, so I was just looking at it, it's pretty short. Uh, anyways, they close in and the Americans realize that, well, I mean, Kamikazes are pretty hardcore, uh, the whole concept of it. But the Japanese are not keen to surrendering. Um, once they are in a bad position, uh, they generally don't surrender. If they run out of uh, ammunition or it's clear they're overrun, again, they don't really like to surrender. Uh, a lot of times they'll fight to the death or uh, conduct what they call like a bonsai charge. They just attach their bayonets and just charge you even if they're, there's no way they can win. Um, so the death tolls are pretty high. Uh, even though the U.S. has a major advantage, they still have to go to every one of these tiny little islands and force the Japanese off because they just, they just don't surrender. So the Americans decide, well, this is uh, unnecessary. Uh, some of these islands we don't even need. So they, what they did was they chose the islands they thought were significant, like they could use for an Air Force base or supplies or whatever, and they would chase the Japanese off of those islands. But the other islands, they would just 
ignore basically. They're like, well, you got no navy to come get you, so have fun over there. We're just gonna keep on going and let you guys sit on your island for the rest of the war. Uh, and that was called, anyone remember? Nope, the sub didn't tell you? Island hopping. Yeah, island hopping. What do we pay that guy for? I'm just kidding. Oh. I'm totally kidding. It's really hard to be like, hey, can you cover these thousand slides that these AP kids who are class never taught? Like, that's not easy to do. All right, so I don't blame them. Uh, anyways, uh, that's island hopping. All right, and that takes a long time still. And we slowly whittle our way back uh, to uh, getting closer and closer to Japan. They're still fighting the Chinese. Um, the native populations, by the way, like the Vietnamese, the Filipino people, are, uh, they're at first happy that the Japanese show up, like, yay, they're kicking the Europeans out. And then they very quickly find out the Japanese are way worse than the uh, French or the, the Dutch or the Americans or the British were. Uh, so they're very happy to take up arms against the Japanese once uh, the US and British and the French show up. So they're, they're getting uh, closer and closer. They're starting to withdraw from China. Um, and uh, as we get closer, there's two islands that are close enough to Japan that we can set up air bases there and bomb the Japanese directly from those uh, islands. Uh, and we do. So we've been, uh, since we have a massive aircraft carrier advantage, we've already been bombing the main cities and production facilities of Japan. Tokyo is a disaster. We've knocked out all military factories and, and targets that we can, major ones that we can think of. Um, so it's, it's kind of coming down to a very <laughs> small number of cities we can really target for bombing uh, uh, by this point. But we want these two islands, and they are Iwo Jima and Okinawa. And these are the last two and, and, and biggest uh, uh, major uh, face-offs between the United States and Japan. Uh, bloodiest, as far as I know, uh, between uh, the United States and Japan. The Japanese, of course, are not am uh, opting to surrender, so they fight to the last man. So the casualties for both sides are quite high. Um, and they, and they, they bunker in on these like island mountains too. So the, the Americans have to land, vulnerable to being shot, and they have to go through these like uh, jungle hill bunker regions, uh, which they're very vulnerable in. Uh, of course, getting shot and then the uh, Japanese uh, too are um, not keen to surrendering. So you've got to like go in there and get them. They're probably not coming out, which meant, you know, they would use, that's when they started using flamethrowers, by the way. They'd be like, oh, you're gonna sit down in that bunker? Okay, so just come up and, and burn them out essentially. Uh, but yeah, they do capture these two, 1945, and now they have uh, islands from which they can uh, directly bomb the Japanese. All right, and this is where we started using our brand new bombs, which were uh, developed in um, a certain program that was started by FDR when they found out the Nazis were trying to develop uh, atomic weaponry. But thankfully, the, thankfully, the Norwegians sabotaged that. Manhattan Project. Yeah, the Manhattan Project. Did I ever tell you like an atomic bomb works or anything like that? Yeah. Okay, good. I did. I will briefly tell you just for the internet, but at least you know. Um, Manhattan Project. So yeah, we, we developed the atomic bomb uh, first. We, we do, of course, use a lot of uh, uh, Jewish, Italian, and German scientists that you know, fled from Europe doing this whole pre-war and World War II thing. We have our own American scientists, and uh, we're the first to uh, develop in uh, New Mexico, which I can't point to because I'm in the U.S. up there, uh, develop this atomic bomb. So again, uh, just in case you guys forgot, uh, Adam is, uh, as Einstein pointed out to us, matter itself is not actually you know, physically there. It's actually just energy. Uh, it's electrons spinning around a nucleus of protons and neutrons so quickly that it like makes a solid surface. Like I told you, it was like a, a plane propeller spinning so fast that you, you couldn't actually stick your hand in it to get it cut off because there's no space for you to go in because it's spinning so fast. All right, it's kind of a metaphor that works. So that's how it works. Uh, and that requires a ton of energy to move that quickly to keep that, you know, amount of space covered. Uh, so the idea, the concept is, if you could, since all matter is, or these atoms anyway are, are energy, if you could theoretically split that atom and release the energy those electrons are, are, are using to bind that up and take up the space, it'd be a ridiculous uh, amount of energy. Way more than like a bunch of dynamite or, or, or gas, whatever explosion could be uh, per atom. So we're the first ones to do that. Uh, and they set one off in 45, and then they warn Japan, hey, you better surrender, uh, or else we're gonna drop this super bomb, uh, for a couple of reasons. Reason number one, they were like, well, if we drop this super bomb on them after they successfully tested it, what do you tell me? No, I, I, I have a question. What is it? So what, what caused radiation then? 
The radiation, well, I'm not exactly sure on the um, uh, physics behind it, but from my very limited knowledge on it, uh, these atoms are unstable, like the uranium and the plutonium, things like that are used. Uh, and somehow unstable particles are created or released when you split these things. And that's what radiation is. It emits that, that, that energy that we can't feel or sense without you know, technology that ends up uh, disturbing our DNA uh, and depending on the dosage, killing you quickly or over the decades from, from cancer. Um, but uh, anyways, so, uh, and I think I told you too, the first one they set off, they were like, well, hopefully when we break this atom, it doesn't start a chain reaction of electrons spilling out and breaking other atoms and then ending the entire world uh, pretty much instantly. Uh, but fortunately for us, it didn't. Uh, but uh, they, they threatened Japan for a couple reasons. Um, so that's atomic bomb, obviously. And they threatened Japan because, uh, and they're right about this, if they could bomb a couple of J Japanese cities, and obviously that's going to take out several thousand people, uh, their argument is if they surrender because of that, that'll actually save people. Because if we have to invade Japan directly, because uh, we're not sure they're going to surrender, although we, we were kind of sure-ish, uh, that, that they're going to surrender, we'd have to invade, and that would have meant like, over a million Americans would have died because every able-bodied Japanese person was going to fight us. They weren't just going to be like, oh, yep, you got us. Uh, and then I don't even know how many Japanese civilians would die, way more than that. Uh, so by killing a few thousand people doing this, they actually saved millions of lives uh, in lieu of a, an American invasion. Also, too, so yeah, avoid invasion. Also, uh, the Soviet Union, as per their agreement, once uh, Germany was defeated, they, um, I'm not saying they were super nice, they just wanted the territory to spread communism, they uh, obliged our agreement and uh, began fighting against Japan in East Asia. Uh, they'd already taken most of the Japanese territory in northern China. They had already gotten to Korea, as you guys know, North Korea. And uh, they were taking more territory. So the, the, the Americans decided, well, we'd rather end this war quickly and occupy Japan without the Soviets getting there. Because we knew what they were going to do. They were going to try to install their own communist governments in Korea, in Japan, in China, wherever they got their, could get their hands to. Uh, so we wanted to end more quickly, so to stop the Soviet expansion. Also, too, we wanted to uh, scare the Soviets, who we kind of already knew were probably going to be our uh, main rivals. Uh, so stop Soviets and scare them, because they don't have this technology. They steal it later, but uh, they don't have it now. All right, so we do end up uh, dropping it. We, we warn Japan. They obviously don't believe us. It's like, oh, yeah, a super bomb blows up a whole city. Why didn't you use it the whole time, bro? Um, but we just, we just made it. Uh, so we end up dropping one on Hiroshima, and then... Uh, uh, after a week or two, they hadn't uh, officially surrendered. We dropped another one on Nagasaki, and then they're going to surrender. And it literally did wipe out the entire city, and uh, or at least most of it. And like I told you guys before, wow, that's not even a word. Like I told you guys before, it doesn't hit the ground, the actual bomb, because that would limit its damage. The ground would stop, you know, half of it or, or whatever. So this bomb would, the plane would fly over, it would drop it off like a slingshot, because if it's standing over it, it would die. The rising heat and radiation would just kill the crew, make the plane drop if, uh, if they were above it and the, the heat got to them. So they had to like do a slingshot drop and fly back the other way and uh, let this bomb drop over the city. And again, if you let it hit the city, it, the ground takes up a good chunk of the, the damage. So they set it off with a, a barometer, which, which detects like how far up in the air it is, its altitude, and it blew up in the air to maximize the uh, damage of the explosion. Uh, and as you guys know, that area then became radioactive for uh, quite a while. Uh, depending on the direct exposure, it could be up to like 30 or 40 years where you can't actually go there because you will uh, become, get radiation poisoning, whether you die quickly from that or get a, you know, cancer later. Uh, so it was, it was pretty devastating to the uh, two cities. Uh, I think the death total was over 100,000 with the two cities. I could be wrong about that. I think it was like 120, but uh, it, it, it's tens of thousands. Uh, but the Japanese do surrender. The Soviets are halted. Uh, they obviously do get into China, and China's going to become communist very quickly. North Korea, which also becomes ch communist. But we get South Korea and Japan to occupy, uh, and we're going to turn those into democratic capitalist uh, uh, states. Around for now. So we'll do Cold War, which was like a couple weeks ago, but we never covered it. But it's still period four, so it's relevant to you. I forgot the, the Americas. I'll leave it in the Americas. The U.S. Good enough. All right. <laughs> so... That's what I think is all we're talking about, because it's decolonization, which is pretty much all over here, so, uh, and the Cold War. So, Cold War, 
That's going to begin right after World War II, uh, and we've got two opposing sides. Before we get into that, uh, let's talk about how. So they had the uh, conferences, which we mentioned last time, uh, the Yalta, and uh, I'm trying to pull the title it. And uh, for those of you who don't know, or the ones on the internet, that's going to be roughly 19, you could say 45, but we'll say 47, because it's like the Berlin Airlift and, and all these other policies, uh, and the Truman Doctrine, uh, to 1991. Okay, um, so the Yalta and Potsdam conferences, uh, what were they uh, talking about at those conferences? What was the purpose of those conferences? Don't all raise your hands at once, guys. To like decide what to do with uh, the German areas? Yeah, uh, not just Germany, though, like all of the areas they occupied. Because remember, and I mentioned this last time, like these governments all ceased to exist. Uh, that was years ago when Germany and uh, the Soviets initially invaded all that stuff. Uh, so those people are dead or gone or, or some combination of that. Um, so you do have Soviet military presence, like their army literally came and liberated these areas, and they were temporarily staying there to maintain order. Because you can't just roll in, kick the Nazis out, and then leave, because then it's just be a huge power vacuum. Like, it, there'll be a bunch of chaos and disorder. So the Soviets and the Americans do stay in Europe for quite a while uh, to maintain uh, some peace and order. And, and then this, these talks are about how do we build these governments back up again. That's gonna be the main talk. And then one of them uh, was about, I think it was Potsdam, was about uh, what to do with Germany, right? What did they, what did they wanna do with Germany, by the way, until they could uh, uh, leave? Like basically get there and like, until they become, like get to administrate themselves, just be there to administrate them. Either. Yeah, they were splitting them up into how many zones? Like four. Four, four yeah. So uh, you had the Soviets and then uh, the British, French, and the US occupying those areas. Uh, Berlin, the capital, is in the Soviet zone, which is important here in a second. So yeah, uh, it's basically the fate of Europe and the uh, 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 occupation of Germany. So what, what was their decision on what to do with these governments about uh, as far as letting them uh, uh, start governing themselves again? Self-determination. Yeah, self-determination. Okay. Uh, just so you know, if you're going to work on other things, I'm just going to kick you guys out. Got that? Self-determination. Meaning what? They get to choose what type of government they want. Right. Cool. Uh, based roughly on ethnic borders, or roughly speaking. Okay. So uh, uh, that's the agreement. But who's going to, uh, well, both sides are kind of going to uh, back out on this. But one side definitely backs out way more on it. Um, what do they do, and, and who are they? Uh, the Soviets and they like install like basically a puppet government. Yeah, they install these uh, communist puppet states. Wait, wait, why is the Soviet Union, which is roughly this area, this is way off proportionally, but whatever you guys get at USSR uh, in China. Um, what? Why is why is the Soviet Union trying to uh, make these states communist? Is that a part of their? Well, just just answer that. That's like part of their idea for communism to have a world without borders. And Exactly, that's the overall goal, because they want to instill as many communist governments as they can, so that when, all, when they're all communists, you can eliminate those, ideally, uh, eliminate those national borders, right? So that's what they want to do. So uh, uh, the USSR is going to uh, install uh, communist puppet uh, governments. And again, what we mean by puppet means they indirectly control them, the Soviets do. So they accept money and military aid from the Soviets, uh, and then they do what the Soviets say, essentially. All right, and if they don't, then the Soviets cut back on the aid or put somebody else there, so they kind of, they kind of have to uh, do what they say. All right, and uh, what countries are gonna be swallowed up by this Soviet uh, occupation? I should actually write this better. Communist puppet governments. Poland. Nice. Like you think? Yeah. Hungary. Yep. Romania. Yep. Uh, Bulgaria. Yep. Czechoslovakia. Nice. Eastern? Uh, oh yeah, Eastern Europe, oh, yeah, good call. I was gonna do the, the um, Berlin airlift thing, but yes, you're right, they're gonna do East Germany when it becomes East Germany. Uh, Yugoslavia is gonna be communist, but they do that uh, of their own accord. The Soviets aren't pushing that. Ukraine, Latvia, Right, so those are uh, actually states that were voluntarily absorbed into the Soviet Union. So you're right, those ethnic groups are definitely trapped in there, but they've been there already, uh, most of them at least, uh, pre-World War II. These uh, Baltic states are now involuntarily apart in, in parts of Finland, uh, but uh, you're right, there are still ethnic groups all over, especially in Central Asia and Eastern Europe, that are not Russian, that are not truly voluntarily there. 
but I'm talking about separate states. And then, in this case, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, uh, Romania, Bulgaria, and then East Germany are going to be uh, sufficient. Okay, cool. So uh, the Americans and British see this happening, these developments. Uh, and they also notice, too, that uh, keep in mind, guys, the world doesn't know that the communist governments are a total failure uh, yet. Uh, the Soviets have really kept secret how bad things have been. It's not going to be until the 50s uh, and then later the 70s when word gets out just how horrible things are uh, in uh, the Soviet Union and later China. But uh, for now, nobody really knows how bad it is. They still think it's relatively good in those communist countries. So communist uh, parties, and, and, and they actually call them popular movements, but socialist and communist parties become really popular over here in the West. So especially in uh, France, uh, Italy, uh, and, and some of these uh, Western European countries, including the, even Great Britain uh, to a degree, uh, they're going to have communist and socialist uh, movements, substantial ones, by the way, ones that threaten to actually uh, take over. Why after World War II would those political positions be so popular? There's a specific reason as to why after World War II. So let's think about this a second. How's Europe look after World War II? Weak. Weak? What do you mean weak? Economically. Yeah, economically. Why are they economically weak? Because like, most of the labor force is gone. Yeah, they just destroyed each other. They destroyed their infrastructure. So don't forget this, guys. Uh, Europe is in shambles. Oh, it's going to be off screen, actually. I'll just put it way over here. Uh, Europe's going to be in shambles. Uh, they have uh, n their infrastructure <clears throat> destroyed. Bridges, roads, railroads, all that stuff was bombed and destroyed during the war. So no infrastructure. I should put an X. No infrastructure. How about their factories and all that? Destroyed. Yeah, yeah. largely destroyed, at least temporarily. Yes, infrastructure. Uh, infrastructure. Sure. Uh, their uh, factories and production facilities out their population, like I think you mentioned immediately, uh, uh, population is going to be uh, substantially lower than it was. A, a lot of males missing for sure, but women and children too, especially in uh, uh, Central and Eastern Europe because of the whole Holocaust program. All right, so millions of people are dead. Uh, and then of course the factories and infrastructure destroyed. So does socialism and communism sound better to me? if I'm rich, middle class, or poor? Poor, poor. poor right. Uh, and in this situation here, if I'm poor, and most people are, is there really anything at the time I can do to really change my situation? No. no. Not much, right, just because there's not much going on. It's gonna take them a long time to rebuild. So in the short term, policies like that sound appealing uh, because they don't really have any ability to improve their own lives. All right, so that's what's gonna make these particularly appealing over here in the West. The United States uh, has a pretty good idea for preventing communism from spreading. So they don't want to roll in militaristically and, and stomp them out. Because we, we know by now, well, we should, we should know by now. We tried in Vietnam again, but whatever, it doesn't work out for us. Uh, we kind of have a good idea that if we just roll in and, and force people to become democratic, that not only are we going back on what we said we would do, but also uh, people would not accept it willingly. We would seem like imperial occupiers, all right? So they would not like us with our militaries there telling them what to do. So how do we give them a situation that naturally makes these parties less appealing? It's not by force. We, we have a whole new uh, plan to do this. By proxy wars. Okay, that's how we're gonna do it across the globe. But I mean specifically in Western Europe right after World War II, about 1947 or so. Yeah. Uh, capitalists. Well, any, anyone, by the way, that would accept it. But yeah, there were some strings attached. But what was the name of that plan? Uh, basically, those that, were, that accepted capitalist uh, governments would be given aid. And, um, and then, like, they could rebuild and get Correct. What was the name of that program, though? Do you remember? Sure. Close. That's, that's another one that's similar, roughly the same time. What's the Marshall Plan? Marshall Plan, yeah. So you described it perfectly, except for the, the capitalism is an economy, not, not a government. But yes. So uh, the Marshall Plan, this is billions of dollars in uh, aid, and that's going to be some in grants, some in loans. It was 1947. Uh, and the idea here is, well, we know that uh, these kinds of governments or these kind of political parties tend to do well when people are, are, are poor and desolate. So let's just give them and loan them billions of dollars, because the US has it to loan out. We're, we're relatively untouched during World War II. 
Like our factories didn't really get bombed. We only got bombed like uh, what, some Aleutian Islands off the coast of uh, uh, Alaska that nobody was on, and then uh, Pearl Harbor, which we repaired. Other than that, we were pretty much just pumping out production and our economy was booming. So we got plenty of money to, to uh, give out, so we do. And we uh, send out this aid, and there are some strings attached, like you mentioned. Uh, if you accept our money, you have to have a capitalist economy, uh, and you also have to buy certain American goods. So it's kind of like a quid pro quo, like we give you something, you give us something. But nonetheless, it's going to fairly quickly uh, revitalize Europe. So they're gonna rebuild within 10 years, uh, and they're, in fact, it's gonna be called an economic miracle, especially over here in West Germany. Um, that's going to largely get rid of this whole push for uh, 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 communism and socialism. So it's uh, aid to rebuild and discourage communism. A, a good rule of thumb for any country, uh, if you're thinking about, oh, is there going to be a revolution or not? If your government's stable, like there's law and order, and people feel like they can improve their own lives, like it doesn't feel like they have no options, like they're stuck. Like, oh, if I go out and work harder or have an idea or go to college or whatever, I can improve my life. They're not gonna have a revolution. They have revolutions and they have nothing to lose. And they feel like they can't go up and they have nothing to lose, all right? Uh, so if you're living in a society with a stable uh, government as far as law and order, uh, you've got economic opportunity and you can do what you want, uh, you're probably not gonna have a revolution. And, and they don't for the most part. Okay, so that's the Marshall Plan. It is successful. Uh, it does keep West, Western Europe communist free. And, and like I said, as I sort of mentioned, within a few years, they're gonna uh, completely rebuild to the point that Europe is, uh, is an economic powerhouse again. So this is a very successful program. And the US benefits too, because they're gonna be buying their stuff and paying back those loans. So everybody sort of won there. Uh, by the way, Japan also accepted that uh, aid and they're gonna be a part of it too. We offered it to anybody. All right, um, so do these communist countries in the East accept it? No, no, no. No, they're told they can't. So the communists come up with their own like, oh, the Soviets kind of like, oh, we have our own Marshall Plan type thing that they're gonna give uh, to the Eastern countries. I don't know if it was in the notes. Does this sound familiar to anybody? Probably not then. Uh, it was referred to as the, uh, well, the acronym is Comicon uh, to communist states. So the Soviets are going to loan a bunch of money to these uh, East, well, a bunch, uh, some money to these Eastern uh, European communist states. Okay, um, the first real standoff, though, it's, it's kind of a two-parter. It's all going on in 47. It's a very busy year. Uh, this is a, uh, an aid program that takes a long time to develop. But two things that happen in 47, like in real time, is uh, the Berlin airlift, which I don't know if that's in the notes or not, uh, as well as the uh, communist uprisings in Turkey and Greece. All right, so let's talk about those two. What, uh, was the, um, what did I just say? Berlin airlift at all <coughs> in the uh, notes? Uh, I don't think so, but I'm pretty sure you explained it. Okay, well, I'm gonna do it again. Why did I explain it? The where the, the official stuck in the capital and then- Oh yeah, I did. I don't remember telling that, but I guess I did. Well, I'm gonna tell you again, because uh, this is kind of like a, an, un, an unofficial starting point. Uh, what happened was, these uh, four zones were supposed to merge eventually and allow Germany to choose their own uh, government and, and all of that. But the, uh, the Soviets, well, I should say Stalin, Stalin did not want to let Germany recover. He was afraid that they were gonna do the same thing again because he just went to war with them twice in like his own lifetime. So he's afraid of the Germans and he wants them to pay for what they did because he just wrecked the Soviet Union as far as their population and territory. So Stalin wants to punish them also, France wants to punish them because they're not too happy about this whole thing. They're still pretty salty about World War II. Uh, but the British and Americans are like, no, 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 no. We're going to try this new approach. Obviously, the Americans are. They're going to offer real aid to anybody, enemy or uh, uh, ally during World War II or after World War II. Um, why do you think the Americans and the British are uh, going to tilt this towards the let's not punish Germany side? Because they've already done this like once. Before. Yeah, they saw the uh, impact of that from World War One. All it did was make uh, Germany a, uh, a, a resentful, uh, punished, and um, what's the word I'm looking for? Discontented. Yeah, I mean that's just I don't want to know how they feel emotionally. I mean, like, what did their economy? It destroyed their economy. Uh, so it just made every aspect of their society worse, and then it, of course, left this power vacuum and this, this, this thirst for revenge uh, that Hitler just walked right into. All right, so they're like, we're not gonna do that again. Uh, let's try a new approach. And so far as I know, 
on this scale, this is the first time in world history where somebody was defeated and instead of punishing them or, or occupying them, obviously temporarily they occupy them until they get going, uh, but we're gonna befriend them. Like Germany and Japan are great allies slash friends of the United States, like that's never happened. Where you beat somebody, uh, you drop atomic bombs on them in, in the case of Japan, uh, and then after the war is over, instead of punishing them, uh, you actually give them as much help as you can and try to make them an ally. Uh, and, and we actually do that pretty successfully. So yeah, yeah, so that experiment's worked so far. Um, but this Berlin airlift, I got kind of off track there. Uh, this Berlin airlift, uh, they were supposed to unify these zones and allow Germany to uh, uh, administer itself. But like I said, there was a disagreement on what to do with Germany. So when the Americans, French, and British merged their zones uh, preemptively, obviously because these three had a consensus, it's just they were waiting out the Soviets. Uh, the Soviets got kind of upset about this and thought that this was part of a Western uh, ploy to betray him uh, and uh, allow Germany to rebuild, uh, to take him out. Because he knew they did not like communism. So he thought, he's kind of paranoid at this point in his life. Well, since the 30s, since he wiped out his top military officials uh, and government officials in the Great Purge. Uh, but he's pretty paranoid at this point. So he cuts off East Germany completely. He's like, nope. We're gonna keep this, we're gonna stay here. And in fact, like you mentioned, the capital, which has Americans and uh, British and French officials and military personnel, you can't even come get them. They're stuck. There's no road in or out. They're stuck uh, in, in Berlin in their, in their zones, uh, which was also split up four ways. So rather than go to war, uh, we came up with the solution of uh, the Berlin airlift, which is we basically just had planes flying around the clock uh, from Great Britain. Um, to drop supplies off in Berlin. So they were bombing them, not with bombs, but with like supplies. They actually called them candy bombers uh, because they would sometimes in the crates would be like Hershey's chocolate bars and uh, uh, gum and stuff like that. Uh, so this was the uh, kind of the first uh, standoff uh, where again, the USSR closed off East Germany. In fact, they're not gonna give it back. Uh, they are gonna let um, the Americans, French and British uh, leave Temporarily, they closed it back off again in 1961 when they built the Berlin Wall. But um, they're going to keep East Germany communist. And so for a weird sort of duration of time, like roughly 50 years or so, uh, Germany is going to be split between a capitalist democracy in the West and a uh, socialist uh, uh, dictatorship, essentially, or at least one party state in the East. You'll never guess which one did far, far, far better. Western. Yeah, the Western by a, by a mile, by miles and miles. Uh, do they, they do better economically. In fact, it's actually scary for most of Europe how well they do economically because they uh, surpass the French and the British with you know roughly half of their population. Uh, anyways, so that of course consolidates the East Germany or the East Germans as a communist and the uh, West Germans as a, a democratic uh, capitalist states. Communist authoritarian. All right. Uh, so very quickly, within a couple years here, we've uh, we've already got two. We've got a line in the sand. We've got two sides. Uh, what are the uh, names we use to designate these uh, two sides? There's going to be a third one later, but for now there's just the two. Oh, first world. Is yeah. Good. Okay. Cool. So there's a couple names here. The first world, or some people call it the Western Bloc, at least in Europe. With, a, with just a C, that's not a spelling error. Bloc means like a political group or, or, or it basically means group. Uh, there's the first world and the uh, second world. Obviously the third world comes in later when, uh, this looks gross, let me fix this. Obviously the third world comes in later with the non-aligned movement, but for right now there's just the two. All right, uh, and this is called the Eastern Bloc. Am I off screen over here? No. No? Okay. So, uh, First World Two. Capitalists. Okay. US and allies. US. US plus allies, and yes. You know, I, I can't say they're all capitalists because they're not all capitalists. No. Uh, when, when we get it, they are mostly capitalists, though. When we actually get into the, the Cold War for, uh, a few years in, we're taking anybody on our team who is not communist. Uh, in fact, we support some pretty gnarly dudes, uh, like, for example, uh, in Uganda, this brutal dictator uh, named Idi Amin. We help him out. That's a pretty nasty stain on our uh, uh, 
record, I guess you could say historical record. Uh, we befriend the Saudis, we still do, even though they have been a pretty oppressive monarchy um, for the duration of our alliance with them. What about South Korea? And then uh, South Korea? Yeah, was it the like, leader? Yeah, in the beginning they were pretty good. Place. I'm not actually that familiar with the, with the early South Korean history, uh, so I can't quite give a, a fully informed opinion on that, but I can for Uganda, EDMN, I can for um, uh, also, um, who's the other one I use as an example? Oh, Chile, it's not on the map. Uh, it's in South America, but in Chile we backed a guy named Pinochet. He was a pretty nasty guy, as far as he was a he was a military leader, uh, and any opponents he had, he just imprisoned and made disappear. I'm not saying he like wiped out millions of people, but that was not somebody you would think the United States would support, uh, just because. And, and we only support him because he was so anti-communist. It's like, well, he's a terrible guy, but he's anti-communist, so uh, we ended up supporting him. All right, uh, the U.S. plus their allies. And again, that's not just capitalists, it's anybody who's anti-communist, even if they're terrible dictators, which we've done a few times in history. All right, and then of course, the second world is the USSR uh, plus their allies. So for a while, we have a nice advantage because we have atomic bombs and they don't. But uh, through a series of uh, efforts on their part, through their scientists, uh, some German scientists and Italian scientists that they get their hands on, or at least German ones, and then some secrets they steal from us, so good job to them on spying. Uh, they're able, and I think it's 51 or 52, uh, they uh, detonate their first uh, nuclear weapon. So that's going to change things, but we'll get there in a second. First, let's talk about this issue, because this is the real, you could say maybe that's not the beginning of the Cold War. I would say it probably is, at least this gives a good preview. This definitely is, though. Greece and Turkey, they're both democratic nations, but they're both doing badly, obviously, because World War II, they suffered the same uh, consequences that everybody else did. Uh, they're doing badly, and of course, since they're doing badly, it's insta unstable, there's not much economic opportunity. Communist movements are very popular there. Uh, and as an added bonus for them, so I'll write this up here, Greece and Turkey. Nineteen Uh They're also, these communist forces that are rebels, by the way, so they're not the legitimate government. You have, again, uh, democratic government, democratic government, but there are communist rebels and socialist rebels that are trying to overthrow the government. Uh, the added bonus for them is they're getting help from somebody else who's uh, giving them some uh, under the table uh, aid. USSR. Yeah, the Soviets are, are starting to begin uh, their efforts to spread communist <coughs> revolution, right? Now they're not necessarily invading everybody, they are gonna do a little bit of that later, but in this case, the Soviets are invading, but they're trying to help out any communist uprisings they can, and this is kind of the first area they're able to really do that in. Here it was easy because they're already there, but in these two places, they aren't there, so they're gonna be sending aid. So again, communist, uh, socialist uh, uprisings, uh, aided by USSR, however much they can afford to at that time. All right, so what is the uh, response of the United States? They back the democratic government. They do, right. Truman goes and gives it, because remember, he doesn't have the power to enact, uh, he has no control of finances as the president. He ha if somebody's going to send uh, aid or declare war, or whatever, it's got to go through uh, Congress. He can't operate the military on a temporary basis. I think it's up to 90 days, something like that. Of course, that's at the War Powers Act. I don't know what it was back then, but he can't declare war. He can't raise his own funds. That's got to go through Congress. So he goes to Congress and gives this whole speech, and that's when we uh, get what's now known as the, the Truman Doctrine. All right, and that's what you described. So we're going to aid the uh, anti-communist forces in uh, Greece and Turkey. So supplies, money, whatever it is they need, uh, maybe direct military support if we have to, we're going to provide that aid to them. All right, and that's gonna be our official policy, hence the name Truman Doctrine. So uh, what is the Truman Doctrine then? So here's what we're doing. So what is the actual Truman Doctrine? Yeah, yeah, we give aid to uh, these guys. But we're gonna apply it many times across the world. How would you actually describe that Truman Doctrine? By the way, Truman being the president at the time. What is it? You could literally describe it in one single word. What you got? Uh, commitment to containing communism by supporting anti-communist forces. Yeah, okay, so it's, it's containment basically is the one word you could use. You've got obviously the uh, giving supplies to anti-communist forces here already in the description. But yeah, this is uh, containment. So they're like, all right, communism's already here. We're not gonna go in and remove it by force, but we, what we can do is try to prevent it from spreading. So that's what they're gonna do. So containment, and that's gonna mean uh, containing, I'll just put containing communism. 
contain communism by aiding any anti-communist forces. It starts out as democratic uh, uh, countries, but then again, like I said, our standards kind of, we kind of lower the bar later on and just anybody who's anti-communist. Okay, cool. And that's in 1947 as well, because that's the same time that this is all going on. All right. And that's all fine and well for a few years, but like I said, things get a little more complicated in 1951 when the Soviets detonate their first atomic bomb. Because before, we could kind of bully people if we wanted to. We had the best military, uh, so if we had to go ahead and have the Soviets, if there was no atomic weaponry, we still had the advantage. We certainly had the economic advantage. Uh, but we had an atomic advantage. That was just, that was huge. Uh, how does this whole uh, Soviet detonation of atomic bomb change things quite a bit? Evens it out. How does it even it out? They both have nuclear weapons. Uh, it's a little more than that even. But you're right, it does sort of even the playing field. If they both went to a war with each other, they could both destroy each other. Yeah, they would certainly end each other's existence, right? Not even just by blowing them up necessarily. I don't know if I told you this, but uh, when you have uh, nuclear weapons, a lot of them, uh, the radiation sticks around. You guys know that, I think. Uh, but what would happen, and this is how we would actually end the world, uh, is we wouldn't blow up every single city in the entire world. We would just blow up enough cities, detonate enough bombs, uh, to the point that the uh, radioactive uh, particles in the, in the radiation spread into our airways, into our water systems, and we would just all die of radiation poisoning. Uh, and we wouldn't be able to reproduce, it'd be a bunch of birth defects, cancer, all those sorts of things. So it'd be kind of like a, a nuclear winter. There's also uh, some climate change that would occur too. Uh, I don't know the exact details on that, but the explosions wouldn't be what ends the world. It would be the uh, effects of the, uh, all the nuclear detonations that we wouldn't be able to survive unless we were like, you know, two miles underground in, in a concrete bunker or something like that, but we can't all do that. So um, that is going to change warfare because now no longer can the United States and Soviets directly fight because once one feels threatened, they're gonna drop atomic bombs on the other one, and then the other one will spawn, and then they'll at least end each other's lives, but, but possibly the entire world. So that policy of where we can't directly fight them is called what? Mutually assured destruction. Yeah, it's the mutually assured destruction policy. It's like, well, we can't fight directly because if somebody decides to use the atomic weapons, which they would if they got desperate, um, I mean, we would end the world. Certainly our own existence, uh, but pro probably the world, at least a good portion of it. All right, so how do they fight then? Because we're still going to fight. We're still going to be stopping communism around the world, and they're still going to be trying to spread it. Proxy war. Yeah, proxy war. So what's a proxy war? A war that's um, indirectly fought. And uh, so, like, there's an anti-communist force fighting the communist force. The, you, the first world would support the anti anti-communist in the yep. U.S. as long as support the communist. Exactly. Uh, and, and another layer I'd add to that, that's a good description, is if the Soviets are there, like troops on the ground, we are not there, right? If we are there, troops on the ground, the Soviets are not there, all right? Or in many cases, like you mentioned, it's just both sides aiding communist forces in their case and anti-communist forces uh, in, in our case. So again, uh, a good rule of thumb is if the U.S. is there, Whatever country they're fighting in, uh, USSR is not, and vice versa. And again, the, uh, it's called a Cold War because there's no actual direct fighting. It's a bunch of wars and conflicts, but it's never the Soviets there versus the Americans, because uh, that would literally end the world. Uh, so it's gonna be, if the US is there, like in Vietnam, for example, when the Vietnam War uh, rolls up and, and we get to that, uh, Soviets aren't gonna be there. Are they gonna be providing supplies and support to the communist forces though? Yes. Absolutely. When the Soviets invade Afghanistan, they're dealing with a lot of issues there. Uh, the Americans are not gonna be there, but we're sure as hell gonna provide weapons and training to any Afghan people that we can. Like Osama bin Laden, by the way, uh, was one of them. So uh, that's kind of gonna be the general rule. And in the case of neither country being there, they will just aid any communist forces across the world. And this is going to happen all over the world, guys. It's not just like a couple times. It's like, uh, I don't know how many times total, but it, it, it's, it's over 20 at least, uh, as far as all these countries that are going on. Uh, and then we're going to aid any anti-communists, even if they're bad dudes. All right. That's the Cold War. That's proxy wars. Give me some examples of proxy wars besides this uh, Greece and Turkey, because you definitely use Greece and Turkey. 
as uh, examples of proxy conflicts. What about you? Shout them out. So you Korean. Korean. Korean okay, War. Korean War, right? I think that's next yeah. anyway. So yeah. yeah. Well, I, I would say actually Chinese, Chinese Civil, Civil War is next. Uh, then, yeah, Korean War. Vietnamese. Yep, Vietnam, Vietnam War. Soviet Afghan. Yeah, Soviet Afghan. That's good enough. That's a nice list there. And that's actually in chronological order, too. Recent oh, Soviet Afghan War. What? Recent Turkey. Yeah, I think I put that up there. Yeah, sorry. All right, and that's like 40s, 40s, 50, early 50s. Uh, that one's a long one. That goes from the 50s to the 70s. And this is uh, uh, 70s and 80s. Well, basically 80s. So yeah, uh, and uh, that's sort of what's going on in these conflicts. But there's more than just these uh, actual wars here, because th that, that's where you can point and see, oh, here are uh, two sets of forces directly fighting uh, and, and well-funded. It's not all that going on, because the US and the Soviets are also doing something else behind the scenes. Sabotaging. Yeah, they're doing whatever they can to sabotage communist supplies to these sides, and the Soviets are doing anything they can to sabotage American efforts or supplies for the anti-communist side. So yeah, you've got uh, what you would call uh, spying, or we'll say intelligence. Intelligence not as in they're smart, but intelligence as we try to find out as much about you and what you're doing as we can and keep our secret. Yeah, so you've got uh, intelligence operations and uh, espionage, right? So that is, again, trying to like wiretap use your spies, uh, et cetera, to figure out what their plans are, what they're doing, uh, and they're trying to do the exact same thing to us. All right, and so, um, I mean, you guys all know James Bond is, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, that whole thing's with the Cold War. I mean, I know they, they keep, James Bond keep going and, and he's doing other crap now, but it was really just a Cold War, uh, kind of almost propaganda, not necessarily propaganda. It's about the Cold War, uh, because if you'll notice, in almost all cases, the enemies are always the Soviets or linked to the Soviets or the East Germans or something like that. All right, uh, and they're usually, and obviously the British example, uh, he's operating from uh, MI6, which is their primary intelligence agency. Uh, what's ours? CIA. 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 And what's the uh, Soviets? KGB. Yeah, KGB. You put MI6 there too. That's what James Bond is. He's basically trying to find out secrets uh, that the, uh, the Soviets or the Chinese or whoever in the second world are working with, uh, and then that he's trying not to die also uh, to the uh, uh, Russian or, or Chinese or whoever it is uh, that he's trying to spy on or, or East Germans. All right, so that's going to be uh, pretty much the defining features of the Cold War. So as long as you know that, first world, second world, what they're trying to do. Uh, the one thing I'll add to that is the military alliances. Uh, so, uh, and I almost forgot this, but unfortunately I remember, Western countries were afraid, at least briefly, uh, of what happened over here with the Soviets occupying it and creating what they call the Iron Curtain, where you basically couldn't go because uh, the Soviets controlled that area. Uh, they were afraid the Soviets were going to do the same thing in Western, uh, uh, Western Europe. Now, they had the, I erased already, they had the Marshall Plan aid, but the militaries weren't like ready to go. So they were afraid that the Soviets would either uh, invade directly themselves or use these countries to do that, uh, invade or, or provide troops uh, to... Uh, uh, foster these communist revolutions. So, these democratic countries in Western Europe, not just Europe, by the way, also in Canada and uh, the United States, they form a defensive military alliance in 1948. NATO? Yeah, NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. That is still in existence today. <clears throat> All right, and that's a defensive alliance. What does defensive alliance mean again? So if one, like, whenever country gets attacked, Everyone will come in yep, an attack on one is like an attack on all, essentially. All right, so I mean, if somebody goes on the offense, it's like, ah, well, you're bad. Uh, but if they're attacked by somebody, it's, it's considered an attack on all of them. So, for example, if East Germany did invade West Germany, well, now East Germany's got some serious enemies uh, all around him in all of these countries, including the U.S. and Canada. All right, cool. Uh, the Soviets, though, are going to slowly respond to that with a communist alliance of their own. Whether they legitimately thought Westerners were going to invade them or not, I'm not sure, but uh, nonetheless, they make an alliance of their own. What was that one called? It wasn't in the notes. The Warsaw Pact. Warsaw Pact. Yes, it was, or each knew it. All right, that's named after the city in which it was arranged in Warsaw, Poland. Okay, cool. So that is the Cold War. So you're going to want to know the uh, military alliances, the, the, the general strategy, the impact of the atomic weaponry, uh, proxy wars, 
some examples of them, whichever ones you can muster. And then, uh, yeah, kind of the First and Second World War and, and what they were doing. You guys understand the Cold War? All right, cool. That's going to define, uh, well, the world for, uh, like I said, almost 50 years. And again, keep in mind, people are legitimately afraid the entire time because if these two do go to war, everybody dies. So any time that, there was two times that the world literally almost ended. There was one, did I ever talk about this? Cuban Missile Crisis. One was Cuban Missile Crisis, yeah. They were, the Soviets were trying to install missiles in Cuba. Uh, we said, uh, at this point they could just fire missiles in the 60s. Uh, they could just fire missiles from Cuba and just hit all of our major cities on the East Coast. And we didn't want them to have that ability, even though we could do that to them, because we had nuclear weapons in Turkey. Um, so when they were sending them, we found out that they were sending them, thanks to our intelligence operations uh, and, and new satellite imagery. We sent our Navy to stop them, and one Soviet nuclear sub that had these missiles on it, there was, here's the detail, something like this. Normally there's one commanding officer. If they say, do this, it, it gets done. For whatever reason, the particular submarine that was exposed to the US Navy, um, there was three commanders on board, so all three needed to give the go-ahead to uh, fire the nuclear missile, which would have inevitably got a counterfire from the United States and started a nuclear holocaust uh, in, in the 1960s. But for whatever reason, one of the commanders said no, even though the other two wanted to. Uh, so he saved the world, literally. And the other guy that saved the world, these are both Soviets, by the way. The other guy saved the world in 1984. I think it was 1984. They uh, had these new missiles, like I kind of mentioned before, that could go across the ocean uh, in, in the 70s and 80s. And uh, the US and Soviets both had these radar systems that would detect. Obviously, you want to know if these missiles are coming so you can fire back. Um, so they have these missile detection systems in place. And the uh, order is, for the Soviets at least, if the system goes off, there's a human check on it, obviously, uh, then you're supposed to retaliate. Like, psh, just, that's how it is. So this guy, whose name I forgot, um, it's an 84, and their missile detection system uh, has a dysfunction, or malfunctions, and it shows American nuclear missiles coming at the Soviet Union. And, uh, and it was a mistake, there was no missile launches. And uh, they were about to hit the button, and the uh, commanding officer at the time, even though protocol says he has to fire back, because they're, there's no way they could confirm that it wasn't actually missiles, that they weren't actually missiles. Uh, he actually said, no, I don't think that's it. I think it's BS. I don't think this thing's right. Why would they fire missiles right now? So he uh, told his uh, officers not to fire them, so they didn't fire them. And then, again, that inevitably saved the world. Because if they did, then the Americans would have seen actual missiles coming, and then we would have fired actual missiles, and that would have been it. So uh, twice a Soviet has saved the entire world, or at least the United States, uh, from nuclear uh, holocaust. All right, cool. There's a fun little tidbit there. We'll zoom in here on, on, on Asia. So we got China. Actually, that's Korea, my bad. There we go. That's where it would be. All right, China. Okay, and then Taiwan. Uh, China, we're, again, we're just zooming in on China. China is uh, going to, uh, right after World War II, once they, they've sort of, I don't wanna say they worked together, but they at least didn't fight each other. Uh, they uh, were, United against, again, just kind of meant that they weren't fighting each other, against the Japanese. Once the Japanese are out by 45, that civil war picks right back up. So 1945 to 49, you have the Chinese Civil War. And this is actually one of the first proxy wars, too, by the way, for the Cold War. Uh, you guys remember what a proxy war is? I didn't use the Cold War at all. It was 100% sub. So. Indirect war uh, that was backed by either the U.S. or the U.S. Yeah, war. exactly. So in the Cold War, they couldn't fight directly because fairly quickly, I think by 51, the Soviets got a nuclear bomb too, uh, and that meant that the two, the United States and the, and the Soviet Union could not fight directly um, because that would mean the end, at least of our countries, if not the world, from the nuclear winter and fallout. Uh, so they had to fight each other instead, indirectly, by supporting, if you're the Americans, any government that is anti-communist, whether it's democratic or a terrible dictator, it doesn't matter, as long as they're against communism. And the Soviets, on the other hand, they're going to aid whoever they can uh, that is communist. So if the United States is in the conflict, the Soviets won't be in it, but they'll be helping out the enemy of the uh, United States or whoever the communists are to support them. Same for the United States. If the Soviets are there, we ain't gonna go there, but we'll give weapons to the anti-communist forces that are, that are operating it. Uh, and we'll do that you know, through espionage, the CIA, and, and all that stuff, which we'll talk about later. But Chinese Civil War, though, two sides. We've got the uh, nationalists, 
they're, they're a corrupt bunch. That's, of course, why they didn't do so well. Uh, but they are mostly capitalistic, uh, but uh, also corrupt, too. They would keep plenty of the, 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 the supplies and money that were meant for everybody there uh, for themselves. Um, and then, of course, the uh, Communist Party. All right, who are my leaders? Do you guys remember? Chiang Kai-shek and Mao Zedong. Yeah, Chiang Kai-shek. And Mao Zedong. I've got a couple Mandarin speakers tell me to say Tung, so I just say that. If I'm wrong, joke's on me, they got me. All right, so uh, these two forces go at it. But again, uh, there is going to be a substantial amount of aid uh, from the United States to the nationalists, and uh, I don't know how substantial, but at least some Soviet aid uh, to the Chinese communists. Uh, who was more popular among the majority of Chinese who were very, very, very poor peasants? Communists. Yeah, communists, by a large margin, right? They were uh, clearly corrupt to most people, or at least uh, by uh, uh, reputation. And uh, Mao did a good job, at least at the beginning, of making it look like he was all about uh, helping out the peasants. He actually kind of was, especially at the beginning. He really believed that you could, you know, uh, take all the land from the rich, uh, from the warlords and the rich farmers and split it among the peasants, and he's going to do that, um, and that's, uh, that would help things out. Of course, he finds that it doesn't work and then makes things worse. We'll get to that in a minute. All right, so uh, he's got the peasant support, and uh, he and his forces, which are operating more, mostly in northern China, uh, they're going to, uh, this is most, more so the nationalists, uh, they are uh, much more efficient militaristically, more numbers, and they uh, are really good with guerrilla warfare. And uh, over the next, I mean, it takes a while, three to four years, they're going to eventually begin to outnumber and chase out the uh, nationalists, who are going to have to flee uh, to the island of Taiwan, where they uh, largely remain today, as far as like their, uh, their economic and political practices of democracy and, and, and capitalism. All right. That's actually technically a part of China, by the way, but they, they do their own thing, much to the uh, anger and resentment of the Chinese mainland. All right. uh, there's a reason why the Chinese didn't chase them there, by the way. Why didn't the Chinese chase them there? The United States. Yeah, the U.S. Navy would not let them. Uh, the U.S. Navy couldn't you know, go over here necessarily, uh, but they sort of gave, granted the, uh, the, the, the nationalist protection in Taiwan. Uh, however, in 45, that meant that uh, China would, and still is, at least politically, a, uh, a, a communist government, specifically authoritarian, meaning like it's one party. You can't be a, an, uh, a rival political party. Whatever they say goes. They have really, really tight restrictions on speech and freedom and things like that. Um, I have, I've had customers and things like that from China, and they can't even see any of our stuff over here uh, on the internet. They have to like go to these select places and get a VPN and you know have their IP changed and all that stuff. And if they get caught, they're at a pretty big risk. Like they don't have access to YouTube or uh, Twitter. Uh, they've got agreements with American companies like Blizzard uh, so that they can only play certain video games that are changed to make China look awesome. And then, like, even that, they have, like, these government time limits. They're going to play, like, an hour or two a day. It's, it's ridiculous. I would never want to be there. Some of them don't know any better, but I feel like they would know that there's a lot of control there. Anyways, so they're going to be communist uh, authoritarian. Uh, and, and they're still that way. The reason why I mentioned that, by the way, is their economy is going to change in the 80s with Deng Xiaoping, like I told you guys before. But they're going to remain in an authoritarian one-party state the, the whole time. Uh, anyways, so... Here's where they start failing. Well, they don't fail right off the bat, but pretty quickly. Uh, too industrialized, they're like, hey, the Soviets did this five-year plan thing. Let's do it too. And it kind of works, especially because they get a ton of donations and machinery from the Soviets uh, to do this. But now start some five-year plans, and you know, it's kind of inefficient, and it's really difficult, and it's taxing. There's a lot of costs and waste and human suffering. But uh, these five-year plans do help to... Uh, industrialized, especially with some donations from the Soviets. Uh, but it's not going to last very long. And he's going to be frustrated with the progress. So Mao does a couple things. First of all, he pulls a kind of dekulakization thing of his own. Um, I don't know if there's a name for it necessarily. Uh, it, it's not quite the Great Leap Forward yet. That's when they kind of get mad and it's not working and try a little harder. Uh, but he does, uh, and again, I don't know if there's a name for this program. If there is, I don't know it. Uh, but he does, he's going to take all the land uh, from the uh, uh, warlords, like the feudal lords there, uh, the rich farmers, 
And of course, you know, anyone that's not in agreement is just going to be killed or just killed anyway because they're sort of anti, you know, they're Marxist, they're very anti upper class. Uh, so they're going to uh, take from the warlords, uh, rich farmers, uh, even medium farmers, really, uh, land, and they're going to redistribute it as equally as they, they can. So yeah, they're happy about that, but what's, what always happens when you do this? Every time in history, 100%. Famine. Famine, famine right, yes. They, they don't make enough food, right? So they experience a famine. But this is the other thing these communist governments do. They don't want the world to think that they're doing bad, so they don't admit there's a problem. They lie about the numbers, and then they export grain to make it like, oh, we got some left over, we're fine over here. Well, you know, millions of people starved. Uh, so several million, I don't know how many tens of millions, but like the hilarious, not hilarious, terrible, but kind of hilarious, is how uh, these estimates for uh, the Chinese, hilarious in, in that like it, this system is so bad, I don't know why people try to advocate for it, um, but terrible for the people that suffered, in that uh, the estimates are in the tens of millions. It's like, who cares if it's 60 or 100 million? It's like that's more than anyone's ever done ever as far as uh, killing especially their own people. Anyways. Famine kills uh, tens of millions. Whoops. So then, in frustration, thinking that like, oh, people are sabotaging us, or we need to like really uh, clamp down and, and make this better, they revamp the uh, whole process. And that, that's that great leap forward he tries in the uh, uh, 50s, and I believe it goes into the 60s, but I'm not 100% sure on the exact ending date. I wanna say 62 is when it ends, but. Great leap forward, we'll say 50s and 60s. That's where he tries his like own industrialization. So he's like, screw these bourgeois factories and experts and intellectuals. Uh, they don't know what they're talking about. Like, we can do this too. They're just uh, capitalists in another form, or they're just capitalists. So they imprison, kill, or chase out all of them, dismantle the factories, and they're like, you know who's going to make the uh, steel? The peep. Yeah, the peasants. The uneducated peasants who have never worked with metal, know nothing about metallurgy, nothing about chemistry, nothing about heating, uh, or anything. And they're giving like these like plans. I don't know if the sub showed you the pictures, but I found one picture of it that China didn't like censor, get out or destroy. Uh, and it's, it's like thousands of peasants out with like these big clay uh, vats and they're like stumbling around trying to figure out how to melt pig iron to make steel. So you have like all these blunders, these fires, these accidents, these maimings, deaths, because it's like hot, heavy, r ridiculous stuff. I mean, that sound like, never mind. It's all, <laughs> it's all, very hot temperature, heavy weight stuff uh, that, that uh, harms and kills people. Uh, and, it's, and it's really crappy low quality steel when they finish because they don't have the, the, the knowledge of refining processes to do it. But hilariously enough, they try to have uh, uh, peasants uh, make steel. And as you can imagine, that works terribly. It doesn't work at all. And uh, China falls further behind. And they have to trade food uh, for machinery to the Soviet Union. So the famine that's already going then gets uh, uh, worse. So not only do they uh, persecute, it's just, it's a joke when you just think about this stuff. It's like, people really try this and then, I don't know. Uh, persecute factories, experts, etc. And then of course they have to uh, trade food for machinery from the Soviets. And uh, the famine that's already going on gets worse. So you have tens of more millions die. Tens of millions. Like, it's just, it blows my mind sometimes. All right, and as you can imagine, that's going to make Mao and his Communist Party not very popular. So, do you think Mao's like, all right, we'll relax, we'll make some reforms, we'll change things? What does he do? Does he reform things? Does he do the same thing? Does he double down? Kill the industrial, the people in power. He, he, that's what I meant by double down. He's going to double down. This is when he's going to, uh, because he's becoming less popular, uh, implement the uh, Cultural Revolution because he still thinks there are some like uh, individualistic, capitalistic Western ideas plaguing them and causing them to suffer and struggle. So this cultural revolution in the 1970s, thankfully his last a real memorable moment in history, is uh, gonna be uh, this program to try to make everyone the same. And I think I told you about this. This is where like, they force everyone to have the same clothes and hair and, and they, 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 anyone that is not just working land is persecuted, killed, imprisoned, or chased out. So unless you're a farm-working peasant, uh, your life now sucks. Uh, if you're a teacher or any sort of academic expert intellectual and you're still there, uh, your life either sucks or you have to get out. It actually worked out for India and us because a lot of those Chinese end up coming over here. China. That was the smart entrepreneurial people. 
so yeah, uh, I'll, I'll just put sameness, right? They try to eliminate any individual differences. So like, again, if you ever find these pictures, it's like you can't tell the difference between the males and females um, because they have the exact same haircut, same clothes and, and, and everything. It's kind of ridiculous. Uh, sameness and persecution of experts. Okay, cool. Then he dies, thankfully for everybody, uh, in the 70s. And uh, a new uh, leader is going to take over. And he's still a communist, and he's still, well, I can't say he's a communist now. He's still a member of the Communist Party, um, and he's voted in by you know, the upper echelons of that party. But he's going to be like, yeah, this doesn't work. Okay, so we're going to do something else. By the way, this will be the last topic we talk about is, is uh, Deng Xiaoping. Yeah. All right, so Deng Xiaoping comes into uh, power uh, in the uh, 1970s, especially in the 80s. And he makes some reforms, and he's going to westernize a bit. I don't actually know when he died. He might have gone to the 90s, but I know that the major changes were implemented in the 80s. So he's like, screw this whole communist uh, economy and, and, and attempt to make things with peasants and get rid of all experts. No, we, we want those. So his, his strategy is to adopt a, not entirely, but more free market slash privatized economy, right? So he wants, and this is the advantage that they do have, is that people can't really do anything except that they, what they say. So they, they're like, we're going to keep our labor super cheap so that all these countries that, are, that it's expensive to operate factories in because they have like regulations or environmental protections or taxes, they're going to want to come here because it's just so cheap to make stuff, right? So they keep labor cheap. And their whole idea is, we want people to bring their factories here or make our own, and we'll be the makers of things in the world, and we'll sell it back to them. And that's how we'll make our money. And it does kind of work for them. Uh, and that's a good time, too, because we're starting to transition into computers and information, so people aren't. I mean, that's why we have so few factories here now. In fact, do you know San Francisco, it, its name, or at least it was its name, it's still in the hills in South San Francisco. It says the industrial city, because that used to be a big production center. They ain't making crap now. Now it's a financial city. It's just all uh, lawyers and financiers and, and things like that. But anyways, in tech, Silicon Valley, obviously, uh, to the south. All right, so uh, labor cheap and then uh, exports. And hey, this works out really well for them, at least way better than uh, the, the crappy Marxist uh, strategy they were using uh, did. So China, very quickly, especially in the 80s, uh, increased even more in the 90s. and the early 2000s, they really peaked. They've kind of flattened out a little bit since. They're still growing, but not quite as fast. Because when you, when you have like nothing and you do really well, the, the jumps are huge. They're like, oh, we were doing this in the early 20th century, then Mao came into play and the Cultural Revolution, and then, oh, dang, and then it, it, just, it rises very quickly. Uh, and then eventually kind of starts leveling out a bit. All right, so they're going to, uh, their economy is going to grow, living standards are going to uh, a raise, no, not raise, living standards are gonna go up. And again, living standards means, oh, I have, I have access to things for cheap, like not all, all the Chinese have this yet, but increasingly more Chinese have access to running water, electricity, cheap clothes and shirts and, and, and food, things like that. Things they didn't have access to before. Uh, and that's all great. And the whole world's like, yay, China's kind of turning a corner here. They're westernizing, they're becoming more friendly. It's gonna be great. They start having these universities, and in fact, some of these students like, start learning Western ideas, and they're like, you know what? We should reform the government, too, because this is all economic. Uh, and a lot of students meet up uh, in Beijing in, in 88 and 89, and they're like, you know what? We, we, should, we should try to get some reforms here. So they, they get some Western ideals about democracy and individual freedom, and, because they have none of that in, uh, in China. And uh, they start that uh, protest in Beijing. Where at? Tiananmen Square. Yeah, Tiananmen Square. And uh, to the delight of the world, they get to watch this, like this wonderful protest. And, and, the, uh, and the West has got you know, video cameras there. We have TV media by now, live TV media, and pictures, and it's all looking good. And people are like, wow, China's changing. Except one part of China did not change. And that was their uh, government. authoritarian government. Right. So they took this uh, protest in Tiananmen Square by you know, hundreds or thousands of uh, college students as a threat to their existence as a government. And they responded as authoritarians do. They sent in the tanks, despite the efforts, of course, of that one guy with the briefcase to stop all the tanks by himself. <laughs> uh, the, uh, the, uh, this part's not funny. Uh, the tanks do actually, and the military does go in and roll over and kill 
uh, hundreds of these uh, protesters. It's like a, some of the pictures I had in the notes, the mangled bikes and the bodies on the ground. Um, and again, China tried to kind of like cover that up, but there was Western media there. People saw it uh, on TV, uh, at least the, you know, the tank man, things like that. Uh, and the, the world was very, 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 and this is in 1989, by I forget the year. The world very quickly was reminded that, yes, China had reformed their economy, and they were improving there, but they were still very much a single or a one-party authoritarian regime, and uh, it became clear we were not going to get along with them in the long run. And we, we really haven't since. Uh, we're, we're, we have a very shaky, tenuous relationship with China. Uh, they're, more, they're kind of like a frenemy, a little more towards the enemy at this point, especially with those islands they're building in, in the South China Sea. Get out of here. <clears throat> What are we on to now? Decolonization? Decolonization. We'll start it. We probably won't be able to finish it. Well, we can go kind of quick. We don't need that much detail. So, after World War II, the Europeans are going to struggle to hold on to their overseas colonies. Because they, guys, don't forget, they basically controlled most of the world uh, before World War II. Uh, and now they're not going to. So why do you think after World War II, this Europeans are going to struggle so much. Their economy and armies are... Like yeah, <laughs> they're a little war-torn, yeah, and they're not doing so well. And also, they had made some promises, too, by the way, to some of those uh, uh, countries who had remained loyal during World War II with the promise of, oh, if you help us out in these tough times, we'll let you go peacefully afterward. India was one of those countries, by the way. There's a couple reasons for this. Number one, uh, Europe is uh, weakened. You also have the case that uh, these colonies, <clears throat> how can we phrase this? I don't want to say they were promised, because they weren't all promised, but they sort of saw that Hitler and Japan uh, were the bad guys, and they wanted to also get rid of them. But afterwards, they're like, ah, now we don't want to be controlled necessarily. So colonies, I would just say, self-determined, more self-determined after World War II. And in some cases, too, like, they were actually liberated. I mean, they were liberated by the wrong people, in, the, in this case over here, like Japan. Like, for example, uh, in the Philippines and parts of Indonesia, and certainly in Vietnam, when the Japanese came in and drove out the French and the Dutch and the Americans, uh, the natives there initially were like, hooray, they kicked out the, uh, the West. And they're like, oh, the Japanese are way worse uh, occupiers. So uh, some of these countries were obviously active in fighting against the Japanese because they were terrible occupiers. Uh, they were way worse than any Western powers were. Um, and when they end up kicking them out with the help of the United States, Great Britain, whoever is helping them, uh, they don't want to just like go, okay, well, we just kicked out all the enemies. Come on back and tell us what to do. Like they don't, they're not necessarily up for that. So you had some, uh, some already experienced uh, independence and uh, they ain't going to want to give it back. And so that's why, particularly in Indonesia, Vietnam, uh, even the Philippines, they're not going to be very receptive to the West showing back up on their beach and saying, hey, remember us? We, we, uh, we want to tell you guys what to do again. All right, cool. So let's start with the more peaceful one in India. Yeah. So this one's pretty unpeaceful. Aside from the fact that the British sort of agreed to let them go anyway, uh, the Indians are going to... Uh, behind, who we've already talked about anyway, uh, Gandhi, they're going to have a pretty good strategy for encouraging the British to leave without violence. What is the strategy they're going to use, by the way? Uh, civil disobedience. Yeah, mass civil disobedience. Now, they're doing this before World War II anyway. The salt march, I think, was in 1930, where he went and like picked up salt uh, with a whole bunch of Indians, and they couldn't even arrest them all, so they just tried to arrest the, the leaders, like, like Gandhi. Then he hunger struck. But anyways, uh, India, 1947. So they're led by uh, Gandhi, and who's that uh, political party, by the way, who's, who's educated in the West and is, is fully aware of Enlightenment ideals and, and is moving for a peaceful separation transition? Congress. Yeah, the Indian National Congress. And these guys are uh, a major part of orchestrating this mass civil disobedience. And again, what is mass civil disobedience if you had to uh, define it? It's not just disobeying laws, by the way. It's, it's a little more than that. Oh, all the hands went down. What you got? It's like where if someone sees a law like unjust or something, they, they get a, a huge group of people that also think that it's like right. not right. These are laws that they feel are unjust, like they're uh, prejudicial, right? Basically on race or gender or something like that. Obviously nobody's in a protest murder, things like that. But uh, yeah, mass civil disobedience is like, oh, well, Indians can't use this salt or Indians can't run for office or whatever it is. 
Well, we don't think that's right, obviously. Uh, so then they use this mass uh, protest where they have thousands of people come and break this law peacefully to the point that no government can arrest all these people. Uh, and that usually ends up in the government having to use violent tactics to disperse the crowds, makes them much less popular than they already are, uh, and it makes it very, very difficult for them. It's constantly going on, so it's an expensive process. All right, so that's going to be uh, used very successfully. All right, some issues, though. They, uh, the British agree uh, to bounce. But uh, not all the Indians agree on how they should bounce and how India should be run afterwards. What's the main, what's the primary agreement? I should mention, by the way, Gandhi did not want this to occur, but you know, there was a sizable minority that did. Two-state system? Yeah. Muslims also have a... Right. Have Technically, it would be three states, but you're right. So they're going to want to partition or break up uh, India uh, on the basis of uh, religion. What are the two primary religions they choose? Because there's like over 100 in India. What are the two primary ones they choose? Islam and Hinduism. Yeah, exactly. So what they're going to have is a, uh, I guess, like a disagreement on um, uh, borders, obviously. So the British are going to partition based on the propositions of the large Muslim minority. Uh, by the way, in case you forgot, Muslims have been there for a while. The Delhi Sultanate in the 1200s came in. You also had the Mughal Empire. But you have a huge Hindu population that was already there and still is. So border issues, um, you have uh, Muslims and Hindi people, or adherents of Hinduism anyway, not the ethnic group necessarily. Okay, uh, what are, what's a major group though, a large minority that's kind of left out that doesn't get their own state that wanted it, that probably had the, uh, well, probably deserved it, at least based on number alone. Sikh. Yeah, the Sikh people, or Sikh people, yeah. They are sort of left without a homeland and they're going to be, uh, uh, not a willing participant, and I won't quite say a victim, although they were definitely the target of persecution uh, on this, this mass migration. So it's gonna be, the partition's gonna be three parts, India, uh, Pakistan, and East Pakistan, which later becomes Bangladesh. All right, so this is where the uh, Hindu people go, uh, Muslims uh, to Pakistan and East Pakistan, and then the, uh, a lot of the uh, Sikh people are gonna be in this uh, Punjab region, which is, as far as I know, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, parts of Pakistan and India, as far as the actual uh, demographics go. So, uh, although as far as I know, as many uh, Sikh people as, they, as could got out of Pakistan pretty quickly, because India, generally speaking, is more tolerant of other faiths, uh, and uh, uh, Muslim Pakistan is not quite as tolerant. Uh, so yeah, I think that is uh, correct. Who led this, uh, or advocated this splitting up, this partition based on um, uh, religion? Muhammad Ali Jinnah. Yeah, cool, yeah. we'll shorten it as just Jinnah. But yeah, Muhammad Ali Jinnah uh, and his, his minority group inside the Indian National Congress, known as the Indian Muslim remember? League. Yeah, All India Muslim League. Uh, they helped orchestrate that. Uh, and uh, you could say it was peaceful. There was no technically no war, but we had the biggest voluntary migration in all of history. Several million people are gonna swap borders. And there's not much law and order uh, during this phase as people are transitioning. So you have a lot of instances of theft, murder, rape, uh, killing, etc., cetera, uh, that go on. So, uh, and, and the Punjab people, or the Sikh people are uh, part of this as well, unfortunately. So uh, it's not without violence, uh, but it does occur. And uh, Pac Pakistan and India are not exactly friends uh, even today, they still argue over the border up here, along with China. Uh, I think it's called the Kush region or something like that. Kashmir. And then, uh, yeah, Kashmir, thank you. Um, and that's, uh, that, that's still an issue today. That's on scene in 10 all the time, uh, if any of your classes watch that. All right, cool. Any questions about India? All right, obviously, uh, they try out Nehru, which we uh, mentioned uh, uh, later on, uh, or earlier, technically, because we filmed it earlier. But... That's what goes on there. Well, uh, other examples in, uh, so we've done India. That's pretty much it. We talk about Indonesia later, so we'll skip that for now, but that's one. Uh, Vietnam, we'll do Vietnam real quick, and that kind of wraps up Asia. And we'll do, I'll think I'll, I think I'll just do the uh, African decolonization uh, real quick in class tomorrow. So uh, Vietnam, who's that gonna be led by? Yeah. Ho Chi Minh, yeah. So uh, he's all about self-determination. He was educated in Western ideology. Uh, so he knows communism and, uh, uh, you know, enlightenment liberalism. Uh, so he's all about national identities and forming your own self-determined government. 
and he goes to the uh, defenders of freedom and self-determination, the ones that came up with the idea, the ones that had been all about that since the beginning, aside from the economic imperialism thing. Uh, he goes to the United States, asks them for help. Like, hey, could you help us, you know, convince the French to leave who, who came back? They owned this area before World War II, and the French are going to try to reoccupy it. Uh, so they, he reaches out to the United States, and the United States says no. They actually consider him an enemy. Why do they consider him an enemy? Because it sounds like they should like this guy. Because he advocates for communism. Yeah, he, he's, a, he's a communist, right? He's a Marxist. So this is the middle of the Cold War. Um, this is in the 1950s. It's actually earlier than that, too. But when the, the conflict's picking up, it's the 1950s. Um, and uh, we just can't support it. Because, again, what's, our, what's the mission for the United States during the Cold War? Containment. Containment, right. So, yeah. Obviously, trying to, you're, you're operating anti-communist forces, but... You don't want it popping up anymore. So any communist rulers, we're not going to support them. We're going to be on whoever the other team, uh, the side of whoever the other team is. All right, cool. So uh, he is going to work with his political party slash uh, paramilitary group, uh, the Viet Minh. Uh, and they're going to uh, battle and defeat the uh, French, who at this point are considerably weaker. Obviously, they're occupied by the Nazis, destroyed by World War II. They're fighting on several fronts in Algeria and across the uh, world trying to reclaim the colonies they had. Um, so they're going to defeat the French. Uh, the French, I believe, actually requested that we drop the atomic bomb on the Vietnamese, uh, which we declined to do. Um, but yeah, they're going to drive the French out of the northern parts of Vietnam, which are the, the Viet people, not the Champa people. The Champa people are in the south from the Champa Empire. Yeah. All right. Uh, they're actually slightly different ethnically than the people of North Vietnamese who are like the Viet people. Uh, and there would be North Vietnam here. So very quickly, we have a North Vietnam, Vietnam and a South Vietnam. All right, and uh, obviously he's in the North, so that's going to be the communist state, and we are going to support their uh, enemy state in the South, uh, South Vietnam. So the capital they're going to operate out of in the North is Hanoi, North Vietnam, and the, uh, the, the anti, I, I mean, you could call them capitalists, I guess, but we'll just call them anti-communist. The anti-communist uh, South Vietnam, Vietnam, is operating out of Saigon. All right, so the two draw a border, uh, but they're gonna fight over that border. And uh, also, Vietnam is very poor, mostly peasants um, that are scattered across the countryside. There's no real industry there. So uh, which political ideology is gonna sound really good to them? Communism. Communism, right. If they know about any, then the communism doesn't sound good. So it's already kind of hard for the South right off the bat because you've got enemies to the North, obviously, but they're more unified than you are because you've got a bunch of poor people that don't even really want to be a part of that system necessarily. All right, and so the, uh, the communist sympathizers and insurgents in the South that are operating against that South Vietnamese government are known as, uh, you guys remember? Viet Cong. Viet Cong, yeah. So again, those are South Vietnamese people, but they're communist South Vietnamese. All right, so what are they going to be trying to do for the next 20 years? South yeah, government. defeat the yeah. South Vietnamese uh, government, right. So, a few years go on. The U.S. obviously is part of the Cold War. We're going to be sending aid to... Saigon. Yeah, Saigon and the South Vietnamese. U.S. aid. But, um, North Vietnam, even though they don't get along with them very well, traditionally, they're going to get some aid from their communist buddies right to the north. China. Through China, right, and also uh, the Soviet Union. Soviets did the, the heavy lifting on the aid, though, so far as I know. Okay, and it gets to the point that uh, in the 1960s, the uh, South Vietnamese, it's looking pretty shaky, as if they're not going to be able to hold on. So the U.S. is kind of, kind of looking for an opportunity to go in themselves. All right, but we can't just invade. We've got to, uh, have, a, we, we've got to have a reason to uh, go to war here. So we uh, increase our naval presence over here in the uh, South China Sea, um, and whatever the sea is down here that's called. And uh, we're sort of just waiting for the North Vietnamese to make the mistake of, of attacking a ship, which they do. I think they did it twice um, in the uh, Tonkin Bay. So once they do that in the 60s, uh, the president at the time, Lyndon Johnson, goes to Congress uh, and uh, asks for a declaration of war, which he doesn't get. But they do give him something else. They give him the, uh, uh, the Tonkin Gulf Resolution, which allows him to use the military in Vietnam without a declaration of war. So we don't declare war on them, but Congress says, you know what, just go ahead and use the military to, uh, to, 
to fight these, these communist forces in Vietnam that attacked us. All right, well, they did attack us. We have, there are bullet holes all over the uh, ship to, uh, to show it. So it's called the Tonkin Gulf Resolution. We were fired on, and uh, uh, Congress gave the President of the United States the, uh, the, the authority to use the military directly. Uh, so what's the United States going to do in the 60s? Send troops. Please. They're going to actually start sending troops, right. So now we have a uh, direct U.S. intervention. And uh, the U.S. is going to find out um, how difficult this is going to be. We're used to World War II Korea when uh, we knew the enemy was, right? Oh, they're the German soldiers. Or, oh, they're the Chinese soldiers or Korean soldiers. It was both, by the way. The Chinese uh, fought on the side of North Korea. So... Um, is it obvious in the Vietnamese conflict who they're fighting against? No. No, no right? Anytime it is, by the way, obviously the United States uh, wipes the floor with them, right? Because they, they have way better technology and training. Uh, so the, the Viet Cong uh, guerrilla fighters and the, uh, even the uh, North Vietnamese soldiers, they can't actually defeat the U.S. military. So the military, U.S. military rolls in and easily occupies all the primary cities. But here's the problem. Most of Vietnam is jungle filled with, you know, uh, villages and, and, and peasants and things like that, that are just constantly harassing uh, all of these stations, all right? And then what happens when the United States goes in the jungle to try to find out who they are? <laughs> what? <laughs> they do start speaking Vietnamese, but like, what do they go in when they, uh, is it hard, is it easy to find the people that are the enemy? No, because they, they don't dress up in uniforms, right? They, they act like, well, they are, they act like uh, just regular citizens. So it's hard to differentiate who civilians are and who uh, guerrilla fighters are. Uh, and they also, of course, are going to use, um, they're going to hide in the jungle, like they're going to have traps, uh, they're going to run ambushes there. And uh, they are going to lose way more people than the U.S. forces are going to. Uh, but it's very, 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 very expensive to go for 10 plus years sending troops and supplies and fighting constantly. Um, uh, against a guerrilla force that is not exhaustive. So uh, the U.S. has a really hard time because they don't know who the enemy is. They go in looking for them, and then they either hide or they blend in with the, uh, the population, so they don't really know what to do. So they, they make a kind of a bad decision uh, as far as how to approach this. So again, the problem here is guerrilla warfare. And there's no shortage of supplies to these fighters. Normally, that'd be okay. They'd run out of guns and stuff, and then they'd have to give up. But they're not going to because... They are being funded, again, uh, by the Chinese and Soviets, uh, and they are providing supplies in South Vietnam uh, through uh, Laos and Cambodia uh, on the Ho Chi Minh Trail, as it's called. So there's plenty of supplies coming in. So there's really no end in sight. So how does the U.S., maybe it's on the notes, how does the U.S. decide to go after these uh, guerrilla fighters? Massacre whole villages. Yeah, what is that strategy called? They don't necessarily go and just wipe out every village. That has happened a couple times where they, they, they do, they are involved in some uh, massacres like the My Lai, Ma My Lai Massacre, but do you remember what strategy is called? They're called... Wait. Okay. Was it the tent offensive? Oh, good guess. I was going to get to that. It's actually called um, uh, Seek and Destroy Missions. So if, if, they, if they head off into an area of the jungle, they don't know where they want, they just blow up the whole jungle in that area. Like they firebomb, napalm it. Uh, they go into uh, uh, every village and they try to extract the Viet, uh, Viet Cong by force, whether that's torture or harassment, or in some cases they end up just killing people in the village indiscriminately because they think they are. Um, and the only problem with that, I mean, maybe they could have gotten with, away with that 20 years ago or 20 years before this, but uh, why can't they get away with that sort of, uh, those sort of tactics now? TV. Yeah, you've got a media presence there and television. So people see this stuff happening, I don't want to say live, it's not like camera crews are walking with the soldiers every day, but they know exactly what's going on because there's a media presence and they report it back to the United States and to the world. So the U.S. Uh, and their reputation is going to take a big hit here, uh, thanks to these sea destroy missions, these fire bombings. Uh, and like you mentioned, somebody mentioned, the Tet Offensive, when we thought that we had kind of exhausted them and that was it, uh, it, it turns out it was only quiet because they were planning an offensive uh, called the Tet Offensive. And that Tet Offensive, while it's not going to like win, uh, it is going to show the world, though, that they still have plenty of um, uh, vigor left. Like this fight's not ending anytime soon. At this point, it had already been years. Uh, so this is when the U.S. public and the world public uh, really is going to turn against the United States uh, as far as popular opinion goes. This is when they start hating troops and hating the government and 
protesting to get out of Vietnam and all that stuff. And then you have the Kentucky State incident when the protesters get shot at, even though they're unarmed, and, and so several students die. And the pictures of those students face down on the ground, you know, go around the nation. Uh, so very quickly in the, the mid to late 60s, well, late 60s, you have, uh, I would say, popular opinion. Turns. And again, it's for the reason I mentioned, seeking destroy missions, the uh, media coverage, the fact, the Tet Offensive that showed that we are not anywhere near exhausting our enemies. It's just going to keep on going. Um, people were very unhappy about the draft. We had to, there weren't enough volunteer soldiers. So we had to like force soldiers with the draft, uh, which they weren't happy about, to go and fight in Vietnam for a war that they didn't even believe in necessarily. Uh, and then also you have, um, like I said, the uh, universities and protests and the Kentucky State shooting. Uh, all of those are going to be... Uh, Monumental in convincing the United States to eventually uh, leave Vietnam. Not victoriously, right? Uh, they're going to leave. I guess technically they didn't lose, but they certainly didn't win. I, I would say that's a loss. If you, if you go in with the mission of stopping communism and chasing out insurgents, and then you don't do that and you leave, that sounds like a loss to me. Uh, so they do end up leaving uh, in the 70s, 74, 75. I can't remember exactly what year. Or maybe 72. Whatever year it was. As soon as they leave and South Vietnam is on its own, what happens in South Vietnam? It gets invaded. Yeah, it gets invaded and taken over by the, uh, the North Vietnamese, and it becomes a communist state. And then they employ their Marxist scheme. Uh, they give themselves a nice famine. Uh, they kill a bunch of people that uh, they consider uh, insurgents, and we just have a repeat of the Soviet Union and China. But nonetheless, uh, that is how uh, Vietnam is going to become communist and get us independence. Get out. So yesterday we left off on... Decolonization, so let's continue that. We will do, uh, what are all the places do we do? Angola, we do Algeria, which I've already made the X for. We did Vietnam and India already. Oh, we do Cambodia. Cambodia, what else do we do for decolonization? Yeah, that's more about the socialist reforms. So for socialist reforms, we're gonna do, just so we have a list that I'll talk about and write up here later. We do Ethiopia, Mengitsu and the Red Terror. We do Tanzania with, um, this is last in a year, eh? and that, These are all failures for the most part. The only one that was like, actually got a little better was uh, in uh, Kerala, India, because they had like a feudal economy. And so even a, even a socialist economy is better than a feudal economy. Uh, that, Kerala, uh, India, there's a couple others too, I'm trying to remember. The White Revolution in Iran. We've also got Yurgan, Gandhi, Gandhi. Uh, in India. I think those are the five. Yeah, because we we've already done Nehru's uh, mixed approach, more socialist though, and we've done we discussed the nationalizations in Egypt. We discussed the, oh, Ghana. That's what we forgot. I was like, I we forgot one. Because uh, he's going to be kind of both. So we have Ghana. And Israel. That's not as much of a decolonization as it is the Arab-Israeli conflict. So we'll do that last because it's the longest. Uh, so we do those four. Israel, then uh, the socialist regimes. And if we got time, we'll squeeze in globalization. That gives you more time on Friday to study before the test. All right, so we'll do Angola first. This isn't in chronological order. If I think we want in chronological order, be well, let's just do chronological order. Uh, Ghana. We'll start with Ghana. I think Ghana and Algeria were roughly at the same time. Uh, Ghana is uh, was held by the British. So this is held by the British previously. This is decolonization, remember? Uh, Algeria by the French. Cambodia was by the French as well and Angola by the Portuguese. So, uh, Ghana, this is primarily gonna be led by, um, I forget the name of his party, but uh, Kwame Nkrumah, and this is gonna be relatively peaceful. And this is a kind of a, uh, this guy's got kind of a, what's the word I'm looking for? Kind of a Jekyll and Hyde here, as far as how he was. Um, started out great, he, uh, damn, what was the name of his party? I might have written it down. I forget what the name of his party was. He had a political party. I want to mention them too because he's going to make them the one party in the entire state. 
I unfortunately did not write down his party. Can somebody please look that up? I forgot the name of his party. Um, Kwame Nkrumah in Ghana. Uh, he's the leader of some party, which one of you will hopefully look up for me. Good, you are. Um, and he, uh, party. what? Convention People's Party. Convention People's Party? Yeah. Convention. That actually doesn't sound that familiar, but we'll, we'll go with that. Anywho, Kwame Nkrumah, he's going to lead this movement. They're going to vote for freedom from uh, Britain, which they, of course, vote uh, positively for. And uh, Britain's going to leave relatively peacefully in the 50s. And uh, it's going to be a decent start. Uh, he's going to nationalize a few industries. Uh, he's going to advocate a more, uh, kind of reject a lot of the Western approaches. He likes, initially, Western democracy. Um, and he's going to go a little bit more, just like most of these African states, go more of a socialist route. And the kind of trend here is most African states reject Western ideologies, or well, not ideologies, but uh, policies. And uh, they're gonna try to go more socialist routes. Uh, a little, they tend to be a little more dictatorial as well. Uh, and almost all those regimes are gonna fail, economically and politically. And by the 90s and early 2000s, including now, uh, most of these countries have transitioned to, even if they might still be dictatorships, are transitioning more to the democratic side and certainly more to the market, free market side. As a result, they're doing a lot better, especially with uh, you know smartphones being so accessible. Okay, uh, so they're going to win their freedom, and it's going to start relatively well. In fact, Kwame Nkrumah is going to be uh, a, a integral, an integral part of that uh, uh, Bandu conference and the non-aligned movement, which we talked about before, and uh, he is going to also. Uh, advocate a new ideology which believe that all sub-Saharan Africans share common ancestry and uh, not that they're making a super nation here like a pan-German uh, or a pan-Slavism idea but they want to help foster these new countries or help uh, achieve freedom independence for these countries and help them maintain that so what was that that sort of yeah pan-Africanism exactly And by the way, that encompassed uh, Africans outside of Africa too, even ones that had, you know, uh, gone to the Americas or the, uh, the Caribbean region, uh, by choice or not, uh, and and we're now inhabiting the region. But again, uh, kind of a common ancestry, solidarity, help each other out, foster independence, sort of thing, not form an empire like that. All right, uh, but it does go uh, sour for him in the '60s. He does, uh, and I actually watched a documentary on him too, uh, which was interesting. Uh, and it actually interviewed people from his party that were supporters and people that were obviously opponents of his. Um, when it became difficult, because this is a problem with democracy, he sees the Democrats and Republicans all the time, uh, they bicker about what to do and then they'll, like the Democrats want to do something, but, the, but in Congress the Republicans will stop it or vice versa. Um, and he didn't like that uh, bickering and that debate. He just kind of wanted to do what he wanted to do. Uh, and rather than have some of the great minds in the area on opposing parties, he wanted them all in one party. So he made only one party actually legal. He created the one party state. Uh, there was uh, some light censorship as well. He imprisoned or exiled some political opponents, which again are all practices of dictators. Um, I mean, that's what I mean, he's Hitler, but. Uh, at this point, you would definitely say he's exercising the power of a dictator. Um, and uh, what was the other thing he did? He did something else that was... Oh, he himself president for life. Uh, that's, a, that's a good sign that uh, you're uh, uh, going to be a dictator. Oh, yeah, and he rigged the election uh, for giving him that power. Uh, and apparently the entire Congress voted like 99.7% in favor of him or something like that, which is a good way of knowing that, that, that those aren't real results. You can't get 99.7% of people to agree on anything, um, let alone uh, choose a political leader. All right, uh, so he, he did have a one-party state. Uh, he, again, adopted some of the uh, characteristics of a dictator, and as such, um, with some help from the CIA, because they didn't like his socialist policies, uh, and the, uh, well, he was not aligned, I guess, but still, uh, they sort of did help recruit some intelligence and support for his opponents, and um, when he was out of the country for, I can't remember where he was, I think he was over in the, uh, somewhere in the Eastern Indian Ocean. I don't remember exactly where. But uh, when he was gone, they basically just said, yeah, don't come back. They deposed him. Um, and so uh, he uh, was kicked out as the leader of Ghana. Uh, nonetheless, Ghana still maintains its independence today, uh, and that's how they achieved it. Any questions about Ghana? 
All right, important guy to know though. Uh, and he had some excellent contributions. Peaceful transition's great. Uh, the idea of Pan-Africanism not being like a violent sort of uh, uh, movement, more of a, a movement of solidarity, that's a good thing. Start the non-aligned movement to not be a part of the Cold War, those are all positives. Uh, but uh, this is how he uh, lost his position. Okay, um, none of the, the other three are gonna be uh, as nice of an ending. So uh, next I guess would be Algeria. So over here, you've got uh, a mostly Muslim population, mixed Arabs and others, uh, controlled by the French. And uh, in the 1950s, I think it was 54, but don't quote me in the year, I think it was 56 actually. Well, mid 50s, 1950s uh, to I think 1962, uh, they're going to um, fight for independence from France. Uh, and they're the closest to France. And I think actually they were technically <coughs> even considered a part of France, not just a colony. Like, those people were considered citizens of France, if I'm not mistaken. That's old knowledge I'm, I'm banking on, but I think that's true. Uh, regardless, they wanted their freedom. The French didn't want to let them go, at least initially. Uh, so I think I did. If I didn't know well, then I'll just talk about Ghana by myself later. <laughs> so, um, what was it? Oh, Algeria. So, uh, yeah, they're, um, they're going to fight for independence, uh, but the, uh, there, there are some reasons why we focus on this one. So, first of all, uh, the political party that turned paramilitary group, and it's gonna be a common name for anti-imperial uh, movements. National Liberation Yeah, the National Liberation Front. Okay, and uh, the French, of course, are gonna oppose this. Um, of course, the Algerians are not industrialized and they don't have the, the, the military capacity to directly fight the French army, much like the Viet uh, Cong in Vietnam later with the United States. Uh, but they do resort to guerrilla uh, tactics, and we have the roots of modern terrorism here. Um, <clears throat> obviously, guerrilla tactics have been around for a while, at least 100 years at this point, 150 years, since the Spanish used against Napoleon. Um, so that's not abnormal, and it's effective. But uh, what, what separates terrorism from like the assassination attempts of the anarchists or guerrilla warfare? Terrorism is more, more focused on civilians. Yeah, or, or anyone, but yeah, including civilians. So they are targeting civilians, in this case, uh, to achieve political goals. I think that's something like the definition. Basically, that means if they want something, like if they want you out of their country or another country, and they can't do it militaristically, they'll uh, harass and bomb your population until you do. And in this case, they're, they're bombing and targeting French people because they want them to leave out of sheer terror that they're eventually going to be a victim of a terrorist attack themselves. So bombing trains, buildings, marketplaces, things like that. That, I'm not saying this is the first time it's ever done, but on a large scale and popularized, this was one of the first instances of that. So you have the uh, roots of modern terrorism. Uh, and the French were not particularly uh, benevolent either. Uh, there were instances, of course, of torture, which are outlawed uh, as of the Geneva Convention. Uh, which was, you know, because of World War I and World War II, they basically agreed, no, we should, um, or at least World War I, they agreed that, uh, no, we should uh, have some rules on warfare and what things you can and cannot do, like after the, you know, mustard gas and all that stuff in World War I. Uh, so they're gonna break that protocol. But the French, they are going to be losing all their colonies at this point in time. Uh, their economy is gonna be a struggle. They're gonna have the counterculture movement hit pretty hard in France. Uh, I mean, that's a little later in 68 when they have their real uh, issues with uh, stability. Nonetheless, the French population is not supportive of uh, the uh, government's efforts across the world to imperialize. Because remember, there's a movement going on that makes people somewhat, uh, or I should say very, um, opposed to anything that could be conceived as oppressive. What's going on in the 60s, the that movement. But okay, that's when postmodernism sort of comes to fruition. Uh, and then you would see its effects in this movement that, yeah, counterculture. So it's kind of a combination of both, yeah. So anti-imperialism, anti-racism, those are all kind of lumped together. Uh, in France, I think I talked about the counterculture movement. Maybe I didn't. Did we talk about the counterculture movement at all? Yeah, we did, okay. Well, just to reiterate, in France, you have uh, a lot of students who have been, of course, educated by most of these uh, postmodern professors and a lot of disgruntled workers who are losing jobs to you know immigrants and, and things like that and women entering the workforce. So uh, there's a few groups moving together against the government, and they actually over almost, they do challenge the stability of France, but France is able to make some reforms uh, and hold on. That's a little later though. Um, but you can kind of see the early roots of that in this movement. So I would say French public 
opposed to conflict, especially when it started dragging on, just like it did for the uh, U.S. public in Vietnam. These things go on and on and on. There's clear no, clear no winners. There's uh, violent practices going on, and they're, they're much, very much against it. Okay. I just wrote all that under Angola for some reason. We'll just switch those. Algeria. Angola. Portugal. Okay. Well, let's do Angola next. Angola. Um, the uh, Portuguese are the ones that are still in control of one of their last colonies, and they're going to struggle to um, hold on to it in the 60s, and especially the 70s. Uh, there are several groups moving against them, by the way. It's not just one, like a National Liberation Front, but the main one is the MPLA, which is the People's Movement for the Liberation of Angola, but, but in Portuguese, it, the acronym is MPLA. Um, I think that's what it was. I don't need to look. And uh, they're opposed to a few practices here. So we had um, a lot of very slave-like conditions in the cotton industry over there with the cotton plantations. So that was a major issue, was uh, cotton plantation abuse slash conditions. Of course, that's the Portuguese generally owning them and the uh, native Africans there working it. So they were upset about that. And again, there were several uh, socialist groups moving against the Portuguese here. The one that sort of kind of came to dominate all of them was the uh, MPLA, which would lead the uh, country after they successfully kicked out the uh, Portuguese. I don't know too much about uh, aid to the Portuguese during this, but I do know that the socialist groups received aid from another country attempting to foster communism across the world. You may be able to guess who they are. Uh, the Soviets. Yeah, the Soviets, right. Uh, so they do have USSR support. I'm not sure how involved the US CIA was or wasn't in this, but I do know that the Soviets do uh, provide some support. And again, by the 70s, Angola is going to be free as well. So we had Algeria, Angola. By this point, Vietnam is also free. India, uh, what else we talk about? Next, we will talk about Cambodia. Okay, Cambodia. That one is a tragic story. And I think I mentioned this before to you guys. There's a lot of Cambodian people in this area on the west coast of the United States. Uh, I've had a few students, and I always ask them just out of curiosity, and almost all of them, their uh, grandparents or parents had come over, well, grandparents at this point, uh, came over during this era. Uh, everyone was trying to get the hell out of Cambodia. So where uh, things went wrong there was when a group, a radical group took over, a communist group took over uh, in the 70s, late 60s, early 70s. I know by the late 70s, or by the 70s they were in power, uh, is the Khmer Rouge, as they were known. And they were uh, radical leftists. Uh, their leader, at least the one that uh, gets all the credit for it, Pol Pot. yeah, it was Pol Pot. And they were quite vicious. So they were vicious in that they were anti-capitalist. So anybody that they labeled anti-capitalist, you're gone or dead, right? And, and is, by the way, being a capitalist, can I just like walk up and see, oh, you're a capitalist or, no. oh, you're, no. no. So that's something you can label anybody you don't like, really. Like, oh, he's a capitalist. He's harboring money and blah, blah, blah. So they can have anybody eliminated they want to. But they don't just target capitalists. They also, so they, they're classicidal in that they're trying to eliminate a class, but they're also genocidal uh, because they're trying to wipe out all non uh, Khmer people, or at least the Vietnamese people in there. Um, and that was an issue too. When they uh, drew these lines for these borders, like we've talked about many times, you never have these nice, neat borders of like, oh, all the Cambodian people are here, and oh, all the Vietnamese people are over here. There's always you know, villages and populations that are spread across so no matter what border you draw, some people are not going to be the same ethnicity, right? So I have a chunk of, this is kind of messed up right here. Let me try to draw this. Cambodia-ish, Laos, Vietnam. So I'm going to have, no matter what, um, some Vietnamese in Cambodia, maybe some Cambodians in Vietnam or Khmer people. Uh, and that's the case here. So what they're trying to do is ethnically cleanse the uh, Cambodian region by chasing out and killing the Vietnamese. So they're gonna target anyone who's capitalist, uh, the Vietnamese, and they're also communists. So what else are communists against besides capitalists? The rich people. That's the capitalists. What religion does communism have? None. None, right? Well, that is their religion. That's their ideology, the thing that they faithfully adhere to uh, despite evidence. Uh, but yeah, they're anti-religious, so they're going to target any Christians or Hindu or Muslim or uh, Buddhist people uh, in the region. 
And um, when these people are rounded up and killed and buried in these mass graves, the uh, areas in which they are killed and buried are called the uh, killing fields, massive, massive uh, graves, killing fields. Now, the death total here is not, not going to sound as high as, you know, like the Soviets with their, you know, upwards of 40 million and the Chinese with their 60 to 100 million. But the difference here is, even though the numbers are low, uh, they're in the lower, they're, they're not even, they're in the single digit millions, they're still in millions. But uh, that was like more than a quarter of the population of Cambodia, uh, which is a really high uh, ratio. And then that's not even counting the people that just outright left because they're like getting the hell out of there, uh, whether they're going to flee to Vietnam or uh, Thailand or the United States, wherever they're going, or Philippines. All right, so they, they get out uh, as best they can. So mass death here. And what happens when you wipe out your best producers and, uh, and everyone else leaves? Yeah, you have mass famine too. So people are suffering economically, they're starving, they're getting killed by this oppressive regime, and they have the uh, gall, the guts, or the stupidity, uh, to also try to invade Vietnam uh, and take some of this territory that they're arguing about over the uh, Mekong Delta and some of the highland regions. And uh, Vietnam just basically kicks their butt. Uh, during the Cambodian-Vietnam War. And it, it very much goes the opposite way uh, that the, the uh, Khmer Rouge wants. They end up losing badly. The Vietnamese uh, invade them and actually topple their regime. So uh, that was a good ending for everybody when they, uh, they were kicked out and removed, but big mistake on their part. So, uh, and that, that kind of goes back to, again, that border issue of you know, they say they own this and they have ethnic groups trapped across the sides of the border. Uh, so that's that war. And thankfully, the Vietnamese were able to uh, end that oppressive regime. Any questions about Cambodia? All right, just add that to the checklist of failed Marxist regimes. So Israel, that one's more complicated. All right, how come before World War II there's no Israel? You don't have to whisper, you can just say it. Somebody who whispered over there and is too afraid to say it. Oh my gosh, someone say it. Because it was only formed after like, World War II. Yes. But why didn't it exist before World War II? <laughs> why didn't it exist before World War II? Because it was only formed after. Yes. But like, why? Because we've talked about it before. Like, that was already a country. And then, so what, what, what's happening here? Because the Jewish population had been uh, kicked out before and they were Arabian or. <clears throat> It was land ruled by the Arabs. Correct. Okay, so there's actually a few changing of hands here. So we can't say that, you know, anyone's really indigenous to this region, uh, not even the Jewish people that were there 2,000 years ago. But um, if you guys remember correctly, uh, the Jewish revolts against the Roman Empire uh, aggravated the Romans to the point that they just eradicated them for the most part, destroyed their city, the temple, uh, you know, Jerusalem and the temple, and dispersed the Jews throughout the empire. So many of them, what was that called, by the way? that event where all the Jews had to leave Israel and spread across the Mediterranean and Europe and Silk Road. Yeah, there you go. The Jewish diaspora. And that was in the, it was, I think it was 185, we'll just say second century. So it's a long time ago. And since then, you know, it had been populated by Greeks and Phoenicians and Romans and Persians, uh, you know, over time. Um, and then when the uh, Arabs did come in in the 600s and chased out the Byzantines. Um, so from roughly uh, the 600s, and again, it was occupied again in that region by the Europeans during the Crusades for a couple hundred years. Uh, but since roughly the 600s minus the Crusades, um, even during the Crusades, they stayed there. It had been, for the most part, Muslim Arabs. <clears throat> All right. Um, so, who's controlling the region after World War I, though? And that's going to allow the Jewish state to reestablish itself following World War II. France and Britain. Yeah, Britain, actually, yeah. So France does have Syria, which is in the region up here, uh, in Lebanon, but uh, not Israel. But yes, so that was called British Palestine, and the British are going to um, help establish this. Why are the British going to do that? Besides the fact that everyone felt really bad about the Holocaust and all of the history of anti-Semitism in Europe and around the world. After the war, they didn't have anywhere to go to. They called the survivors of the Holocaust. Right, but why would Britain just be like, here's a chunk of our land? Are they just feeling particularly nice? I don't see them do that for the Kurds, or the Gypsies, or the Serbians. Why are they doing it for the Jewish people? 
they promised uh, Jews the land. Yeah, they did. Okay, so if you guys remember, I think I told you this anyway. I think I just told my world history this. Uh, in the 1800s, there was like this Dreyfus affair where they blamed a Jewish officer for sabotaging uh, the French military and leaking secrets. Do we not talk about that? No. Okay, we didn't talk about that. Point is, in the late 1800s, there was a movement to try to establish Israel again, and then the Jewish state. But I mean, it was hard to convince people to do that. So basically what happened was uh, a lot of the more wealthy Jewish families uh, were willing to donate money to uh, political leaders if they were going to help them get a, a Jewish state, wherever that might be, hopefully in Israel. So during World War I, and this is complex, uh, during World War I, a lot of these families uh, are going to willingly help fund the British in World War I in exchange for something else. Self-determination. What? Self-determination. Well, uh, their own state, essentially. Self-determination would just mean they could make a Jewish state in the UK, which is not going to be the case. But yeah, uh, that's called the, well, so the movement, first of all, to st start their own homeland is Zionism. Uh, and that's going to result in the 1917 uh, Balfour Declaration, which is when the British agree officially to start having, helping Jewish settlers go back to uh, the ancient Israel, essentially. And they do. The first Jewish settlers are going to be heading there uh, starting in the 1920s. But they don't have a country yet. After the Holocaust, though, uh, that's when the United Nations, which again is the new organization, um, especially Great Britain, is going to actually be like, all right, let's give them their state back in what is now British Palestine, but we'll call Attention, Israel as the old name. So they do that. In 1948, they're going to uh, reestablish Israel. The U.S., part of the U.N., are going to establish Israel. Who doesn't like that idea, though? Yeah, the Arabs in the region very much so opposed to that. So they're already salty with the British for not giving them self-determination after the uh, Arab revolt, which they were supposed to do after World War I. Instead, they did the mandate system and controlled the region uh, temporarily, but never gave it back. Uh, so they're extra upset about this. So what the surrounding Arab states do, and again, the original plan is, we're going to zoom in on Israel here. It roughly looks like this. The original plan was, I'm going to get some of these shapes wrong, but it's generally this. Uh, they, they kind of split it between um, the Arabs and the Jews. So the Jews had roughly the region of uh, this, and the Arabs kind of had the rest. And Jerusalem was like supposed to be in the middle, and nobody owned it. It was like an international city, like not a part of either country or people. All right. Um, but again, the Arabs were not friendly about the Jews uh, establishing a state there with the help of the West. Uh, and by the way, when I say help of the West, I mean... Uh, millions, if not over time, billions of dollars from the United States, uh, as well as military equipment, which they're going to need very quickly, because the surrounding Arab states, uh, Jordan, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Egypt, I'm missing one, and somebody else, uh, they're going to tell the Palestinians to leave the area because they're going to invade, and they do. Um, and how does that go? Bad. Bad for who? The Jews? Yeah, the Arabs are losing badly because the uh, Jews, of course, uh, have modern military equipment, uh, and the Arabs do not. So the uh, Israeli uh, people end up winning this uh, war that happens immediately when the British. In fact, some British weren't even out yet, so the British, some British planes and soldiers remained and had to fight uh, the Arabs. Um, so that was a mistake on their part, uh, and they end up losing. And uh, does uh, Israel go? Oh, that's all right. Uh, no big deal. We all make mistakes and let them go back. No, no. no, what do they do? They yeah, well, they do. Maybe we're more to retaliate. In fact, I should erase this. They actually occupy a large portion of that territory that was supposed to be uh, for the Palestinian uh, Arabs. So I'll actually draw this back up here. Um, so, again, instead of maintaining just that position they had, they are going to uh, uh, occupy a lot more, including Jerusalem and part of the West Bank region. All right, so now at this point, so if this was the agreed upon territory. The Israelis, and again, this isn't exact, which give you an idea, are now occupying, this dotted area represents it, um, territory that was supposed to be for the Arabs. By the way, most of this is like yeah. not well-suited desert, uh, so it's not, not the best locations. All right, uh, that happens again, I think in 67, it's a very similar situation with a very similar result. A well-funded and uh, equipped uh, Israel is going to fight off several Arab nations again. Uh, but in 73, it's a little bit different. Israel still wins again, but it's a lot closer. 
uh, because the Egyptians had been taking um, equipment and support from the Soviets. And this is the one that I think we've talked about. Uh, it's in uh, 1973. It's called the Yom Kippur War. That was like the, uh, the, the Arabs intentionally attacked on that day because that was like a big Jewish holiday. Uh, Yom Kippur War. And uh, who's going to help out the uh, Israelis when they get invaded again? US. The U.S., right. The U.S. and other Western countries. And what's going to be the response of Saudi Arabia and, and all of the other Arab um, members of OPEC? Oil embargo, right. So we have the whole oil embargo debacle that's going to lead to like the whole stat. inflation, price rising, wages staying flat, that whole debacle, right? And uh, OPEC is just the oil and petroleum exporting countries, I think is what it stands for. And um, they are going to, uh, uh, most of them were, at this time were Muslim or Arab, and they're going to, of course, boycott uh, oil of the West, which is going to really cripple the West. All right, and this happened several times. Uh, it, it heats up again in the 1990s. It, it's kind of like a roller coaster of, oh, sometimes of peace and uh, relative agreement, and then you've got some times of terrorism and uh, Israel uh, lashing back out or settling when they're not supposed to. Uh, so there's a lot of back and forth uh, retaliation. Uh, at this point, there's no way you could say either, either side is completely innocent. Um, they've both done things that would be considered inappropriate or wrong or evil, uh, however you want to phrase it. Uh, but nonetheless, the two sides definitely detest one another uh, across history. Again, we've had periods of relative peace, but um, the Jews uh, of Israel, or I should say the Jews, Israel has um, occupied areas not supposed to. The Arab, Arabs have retaliated um, in a non-diplomatic or militaristic fashion, you know, with terrorism, firing rockets to civilians, and then Israel's done the same thing back to them. So it's just, it's a big tangled mess. Um, and what do we uh, call this series of conflicts that have taken roughly the last 60 to 70 years? Arab yeah, the Arab Israeli conflict, right. Because again, it's an ongoing series that is uh, still certainly not settled. All right, so that is decolonization. Any questions about, and border issues. So border issues there, border issues with India, border issues with Israel. Any questions about that? All right, let's do these uh, socialist regimes, and then we'll do, what are we gonna do? We'll do 20th century violence and globalization on Friday before the uh, final. All right, so we have several locations that are going to attempt socialist reforms. Like I told you, it was a very popular uh, anti-Western strategy in uh, uh, post-colonial Africa, uh, as well as in India, Indonesia, other places. So the places we're going to focus on are Africa, Africa, India, Iran, India. All right, so Tanzania, roughly here. Ethiopia, roughly here. Uh, there's a couple attempts here, both end quite badly. One more badly than the other. Um, so all of these, for the most part, I think all of these examples are taking place in the 60s and 70s. I think one or two might start in the 50s, but it's pretty much 60s and 70s we're talking uh, for these. So uh, we've got uh, Mengitsu here in uh, Ethiopia, and he is going to try several reforms in Ethiopia. He's going to topples that Solomonic dynasty in the 1970s, uh, ends uh, that, that really long Christian dynasty, dynastic kingdom there. And uh, he's going to employ immediately uh, some socialist reforms. Um, he's going to uh, employ land reforms uh, and other reforms in an attempt to uh, form a, um, he's not the Marxist Leninist, Leninist necessarily, but he, he's trying to formulate a more fair socialist but non-Western approach to it. Uh, and it's, as, as we, we know, in all of these states, it's not going to go very well. The only places where it doesn't, isn't a total disaster is India. And uh, again, some people link that up with the fact that basically the whole uh, developed world at the time was, was rising rapidly. So of course they're gonna ri rise a little bit. Um, but for Mengitsu, it's gonna get a little bit more uh, violent. So if anybody had that topic, I don't know if you did for the research project, uh, something happens that is much akin to the uh, uh, violent movements in Cambodia and in uh, China under Mao and, and Stalin and the USSR. Yeah, the Red Terror, right. So I, I believe the death toll is two million. 
don't quote me on that, but I believe, I believe he was responsible um, for the deaths of roughly two million and held accountable uh, by his people later and the UN. Yeah, that's the Red Terror. So uh, there was an assassination attempt on him, and, and after that, he became quite paranoid, uh, understandably, and he's going to be targeting people based on what he believes to be uh, anti-communist views or anti uh, against his regime. Uh, so not only do you have the struggling economically and the famine issues, but you uh, uh, have the, uh, the terror added to that. Um, and uh, that is, of course, not going to be a recipe for success. And again, that was Ethiopia. I forgot to actually write that. Under Mingitsu. All right. Tanzania. I think it was Julius Nyere. I might spell his name wrong. N Y E R E R E. Tanzania. Uh, Nyere. Uh, he is an actual Marxist Leninist, like just like Stalin was. Uh, he, in fact, they were really closely tied with uh, China, uh, Maoist China. So these guys were buddies. Uh, good thing for them. They, they actually benefited from this relationship. Because if you guys remember when I told you about the Great Leap Forward and, and the uh, Cultural Revolution, how China couldn't make enough industrial stuff because peasants don't know how to make that stuff, even though they tried. So they had to trade food for machinery to the Soviets. But what did the Chinese already not have enough of? Food. food. Yeah, they already had a famine, and then they made it worse by trading their grain away for, for machinery. Um, in an attempt to look like they're doing well, of course, they, they do that. They trade with other countries. Like, oh, we've got extra, so we'll just trade even though our people are starving. Um, Tanzania is one of the countries that benefits from that uh, because they did very badly, and they are heavily dependent on foreign aid uh, and uh, food supplies. And China was able to step up to the plate and pretend like they had enough food and, and hand some out to uh, Tanzania. But we had a very similar development here. So he's a Marxist-Leninist. And of course, uh, uh, the economic policies are, are, are going to be a failure. He's going to do the, the typical land redistribution, nationalization programs, just like Ethiopia. Uh, and the results can be very similar, although he's going to uh, enjoy a bit more foreign aid. Even though China can't afford to do it, uh, they're still going to do it. So you have a lot of foreign aid, uh, but ultimately uh, a failed uh, economy. Uh, so it's not going to last that long in Tanzania either. All right, it's a pretty similar story for most of these countries. All right, what else we got? So Ethiopia, check. Tanzania, check. Uh, also starting in the 60s, I think it started in 63, 53, 63. 63 to 79, which is when they had their Islamic revolution. Um, Iran, formerly Persia. Well, they're still Persian people, I guess. So Iran, from uh, 1963 to 1979, uh, their ruler, you guys remember what the uh, name of the ruler of the uh, uh, Safavid dynasty was? That is going way back. Because it's not a king. Shah. Shah, there you go. Iran. The Shah. Uh, that, that's a dynasty that goes back just millennia. Like that's what, how many thousand years old that dynasty is. It's been different rulers, obviously, in families, but having a, it's like in China, having a, a line of dynasties in Persia was, was a big deal. And it's going to end here in 79. Uh, but before we get there, uh, the Shah, he is very closely aligned, like economic imperialism aligned, with the U.S. Uh, and the West, right? So it's, 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 very, it's very quid pro quo, like, you know, quid pro quo is Latin for, like, I give you something, you give me something back, like, uh, tradesies. Do, you do me a favor, I do you a favor. Um, Western companies, mostly the United States, uh, are, of course, benefiting from the large amounts of oil in the region. And uh, in return, uh, for the companies operating there uh, at a very low cost and having the uh, economic benefits, uh, the Shah is going to accept aid from them. So again, it's kind of like a puppet government sort of thing. Um, in Iran, they're uh, Muslim, and they're very much against foreign intervention. So the uh, growing middle class there dislikes them. And that's a good way to get your butt kicked out, uh, is if the middle class does not like you. All right, so he's like, well, these guys hate me. Maybe I could get somebody else to like me. So he's going to use a series of reforms. It's a little odd because he's a super high up, like uh, elite aristocrat who was a king, technically. Uh, but you would think he wouldn't care for you know the lowly peasants, uh, and he doesn't. But he wants to have some allies against this growing middle class that that disdains him or holds him in disdain. So uh, what could I do to make the lower classes like me if I'm essentially the king in the area? Yeah, implement, implement some socialist policies. So he kind of pulls a Bismarck. Uh, so he does employ some social reforms. 
uh, does include land reform. He nationalizes forests and pastures uh, for the lower classes. He's going to employ uh, um, education programs and uh, health programs to try to help out the, the peasantry in the lower class. Uh, but ultimately, it's not going to work. In 1979, they're going to uh, kick his butt out during the Islamic Revolution. But this series of reforms and uh, taking land from the uh, feudal uh, lords that were there and upsetting the middle class, uh, this series of reforms is known as the White Revolution. All right. Uh, ultimately a failure, though, because he does get kicked out in 79. Clear on the White Revolution enough? All right, cool. By the way, uh, Iran's government is still in place since 79, and they absolutely hate us, uh, if you guys don't know about that. All right, last place is India. We'll talk about the uh, Kerala uh, reforms, which is probably the only one that really was a positive one in uh, uh, Indira, her reforms. She's the prime minister that followed Nehru. So she was, I don't remember the exact year she was in office, but I know, she, I think it was, I think her five-year plans were 69 to 80, so... 1969 to at least 1984. Uh, she's going to uh, Indira. So she's the prime minister after Nehru, and uh, she's going to be even more socialist than he was. Because remember, Nehru was definitely more socialist uh, than privatized, but he was still a little bit privatized. She's going to shift more towards the socialist. Uh, and again, they're not really big on uh, international trade. They're a little more focused on the domestic economy. So it's not going to be that effective of a system, uh, but it does grow a little bit uh, during that era. All right, so she has the uh, India's fourth, fifth, and sixth uh, uh, five-year plans. And while no one would call these a raving success, oh, and she's, of course, going to nationalize and socialize more uh, industries. Uh, while no one would call these a, a resounding success, there was... Uh, at least it didn't go backwards, and there was a light amount of economic growth. Uh, but again, India's not really going to start exploding economically until uh, uh, they uh, adopt more free market policies. Uh, and we know this about India already. Um, the caste system is still pretty limiting over there, uh, and they're not entirely a free market economy, and there's actually a lot of corruption too. So uh, you see a lot of this in the Western United States. There's a huge uh, Indian population over here, whether they're uh, Punjabi or, or Hindi or other. Um, Anyone who can comes over here because, you know, you have freedom of opportunity here. You can just roll over here and uh, be an entrepreneur or go to school or, or whatever. So that's why you see a lot of very successful uh, Indian populations over here. In fact, I think, I think by ethnic group in the United States, if you look at like the average income of a, 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 by race or whatever, I think, I think uh, Indian is actually the highest. It's higher than all of the other uh, groups, whether it's white or Chinese or, or, or whatever group. Uh, they're the highest. And for that reason, uh, there's like 1.2 billion people in India. So there's a ton of geniuses over there, you know, just by sheer volume. Uh, and the ones that can and are smart, they get out and they come over here. And they do very well because uh, they're not limited by a caste system or, or, or political corruption. Uh, nonetheless, they do their best, but they're not really going to grow over until um, uh, they, they privatize more of their economy. And uh, there's still an outflow of a lot of the best minds of India uh, to the United States and or Britain, not the UK. Any questions about that? All right, one more topic. And then, um, yeah, let's do one more topic. I'll do all the globalization stuff and the borders. Yeah, okay, so, Kerala, India. Uh, this is actually a, a region in India, uh, Kerala, India. The uh, issue here is going to be there's still basically a, a rigid caste slash, because um, they're one of the more Hindu regions over here. I can say that now because I know where they are. Um, they're a much more feudal society, uh, rigidly placed in the caste system. And uh, what they found was, obviously, that almost all of the land was owned by uh, the feudal uh, princes and, and what is the nobility in India. And the, the majority of people had nothing, either no land or very, very little land. So they thought that was a pretty easy fix. Uh, they rolled in and they uh, stripped the uh, nobility of the, uh, or the feudal uh, rulers of their land. And uh, by the way, in the feudal system, I realize this isn't the exact feudal system, but if I'm a lord or whatever noble and I own a bunch of land as people living on it, what are those people generally called that have to work it and can't leave? And, yeah, serfs, right. So what you had was... 
when they did that and they took their land and they redistributed it to everybody, you had a ton of serfs that either got their own land uh, or they were able to join the uh, workforce. So serfs freed in the area and they were able to join the workforce in the cities or uh, obtain their own land. And if you take a capitalist system and do this, it's gonna get worse. But, unless it's highly corrupt, which is possible. Uh, but when you go feudal, uh, that, that's still actually a net benefit because the feudal system, you know, in the last six or 700 years, that's the worst system we've run. It's even worse than a, a, a socialist economy. So uh, this is actually a, a net improvement. Uh, and they do that by redistributing the land, obviously, and they're gonna put a cap on uh, land ownerships, so like a max that you can add. Uh, and again, the benefits here are the serfs are freed now, so at least have some freedom to go join the workforce, farm their own land, or whatever. So at least in this one region, uh, I don't know if it's still doing well today, but it's, it's, a, it's a net benefit compared to the feudal system that they had there earlier. All right, and that is uh, Kerala, India. You guys got that? All right, I think, that's, uh, I think that's it. We'll finish up on Friday before the test. Sweet. So, also going on around this time-ish is, uh, since the 1960s anyway, we have a, uh, a, a wave of reforms that are going to help out several groups. Uh, one thing I want to talk about, this is actually going to be a little bit longer because I forgot I was going to mention something. Uh, I never told you about postmodernism, did I? No, I didn't. Okay, this is quite important because you're going, I'm not saying all colleges and professors are like this, but you're going to go to college and there's going to be a lot of uh, uh, professors or ideologies that are rooted in postmodernism. Okay, so if you're like, okay, well postmodernism, what the hell is modernism? Uh, let, let, me, let me try to break that down for you uh, relatively quickly. This is actually incredibly contact, complex, but I'll take a shot at it. All right, so modernism is the idea. It's kind of like positivism. The idea that, um, if you even remember what that is, it's kind of the idea that we're getting closer and closer to figuring out physical and social science to the point that, um, and, and using rationality and logic to uh, form a better and better society. Right, so we, we kind of see what works, what doesn't work, we apply the scientific method and logic, and we can make the world better and better and better. Like it works one way, and we'll figure that one way out. Does that sound remotely familiar? About how we're, okay. That's, that's modernity, that's modern thinking. Postmodernism is obviously after that, and he, here's why. Because you're, like, you're probably wondering like, well, what else is there, or, or what do they, what's their point? So here's how it comes along. From the, uh, Mid 1800s, all the way till about the 1970s, you had uh, Marxists, right? Communists. They thoroughly believed that uh, capitalism was evil, that it was unequal, that it was exploiting the poor, and people on the very far radical left were, were firm Marxists, right? This doesn't sound too unfamiliar. I think I've told you roughly that just before. Okay. Uh, but here's the problem with, with Marxists uh, after, um, when they get into the 20th century. So up until about mm, 1954 or so, when Stalin dies, <clears throat> nobody in the world, except for in the Soviet country, or in these communist countries, nobody knows that communism actually sucks when you apply it. Like, meaning, there's no economic growth, there's a bunch of authoritarian uh, killing of innocent people, there's no real... Uh, uh, you know, right to a trial. Uh, it often ends in famine and in mass death by the government killing people, imprisoning people, or because you have no economic or agricultural output. Nobody really knows this, though, until Stalin dies and a lot of information gets out. Uh, and then Mao tries it out in China and that information gets out. For a long time, Marxists thought, hey, this is a, a, a way to run the world. This is how we should run it. It's, it's much nicer and better and moral because you're trying to provide for everybody. You don't want a bunch of people controlling everything, you want everybody to have an even amount. But again, keep in mind, they don't really know how bad things are in these actual countries. However, Stalin dies, some word, not even all of it, some word gets out that it's, uh, it doesn't work out so well. And by the 1960s and 70s, when a guy named uh, Alexander Zoltanitsyn, who I think I've told you about, he's the guy that was in both forms of prison camps for the Nazis and the Soviets. Did I tell you about him? Yeah, the, the, uh, just in case you forgot, he was part of the Russian army, captured by the Nazis, put into a concentration camp, survived that, 
went back to Russia, criticized the government a little bit in a letter, which they saw, and then he spent uh, the next uh, however many years in the gulag system. So he got to experience both and survive both. When he got out, he, uh, I don't remember the exact details if he went to Britain to do this or, or whatnot, but when he got out of the gulag, he uh, wrote about it. He exposed the Soviet Union for what they were doing. He told them about all the deaths, about the whole, uh, they, they already kind of had some idea about the degulagization program after the information about Stalin got out in the purge, but he was detailing exactly what it was like to live in the Soviet Union and how desolate it was and how uh, oppressive the government was and how little people actually had and all the people that were dying of famine are sent off to the gulag war camp systems. So by the 1970s and 60s, but certainly by the 70s, uh, anybody who was pro-Marxist before had just no leg to stand on. They were, uh, even the most hardcore Marxists had to admit that uh, communism had failed uh, and that it was actually a, a terrible system when you put it into practice. So they needed somewhere else to go. All right, and the thing that condemned them was, uh, was evidence, obviously. People saw what was actually happening. They saw, oh, you're in a communist government. What, what's gonna be happening? Well, you probably have a lot of oppression, right, of uh, anyone that they see as a capitalist or, or whatever. Uh, imprisonment, uh, economic, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Not deflation. Decline, I don't know I can think of a decline. Economic decline, famine, millions of deaths. Uh, they saw the statistics and they, they were uh, convinced that uh, obviously communism didn't work and they couldn't figure out what to do. They're like, well, we want to believe this uh, idea that capitalism's evil and that we should have a system that's for the people that are oppressed, uh, but, they, but Marxism obviously didn't work. So if I have a problem with my theory because evidence says it's bad, what alternative do you think I have? What? Very close. You're kind of indirectly saying what these guys believe. Here's what they said, and this is where I might lose you. Maybe I won't, though. Since the evidence that was stacked up against Marxism was so bad that they couldn't deny it, instead of denying it or trying to uh, uh, frame it differently or, or try new versions of it, they just said this. Evidence isn't real. That's pretty much what they said. All right, I'm way oversimplifying, but, but try to hear me out on this. Postmodernists believe that, and there's lots of books written about this. Postmodernists believed that uh, there was no such thing as an objective reality, and what I mean by that is they believed, if I'm if I'm phrasing this correctly, that uh, all an individual could know was what they experienced. All other things, the society itself, was all subjective, it was fake, it was constructed by humans, it doesn't actually exist, uh, and in fact, even more so, the society that we think we live in, not only is it not real, but it was constructed by um, the, the powerful to control you. So science, uh, logic, mathematics, all of those are not actual interpretations of reality, they're not real, they're just a power play by the uh, rich or powerful class to control you. And to thinking science is real, and thinking math and logic are evidence, and thinking that the world is actually a certain way. You have the most confused looks I've ever seen on anyone. And I understand. So uh, let, let me just frame it like this. Since they had no argument based on evidence, they rejected the idea of evidence. So you go up to somebody and say, communism doesn't work, look how many people died. Right? It, it, they would say, oh, they tried running it, uh, it didn't work out, it was oppressive and people died. And then they would tell you, no, because that's just your interpretation of reality. That evidence isn't actually real. There is no such thing as actual evidence. All we have is language to try to uh, control people uh, and uh, essentially trick people uh, into convincing them that their vision of the world is correct and not yours. All right? Exactly. So they, they, they say there is no such thing as something that is objectively true. 
Uh, it's only what you experience. And anything else, anything from, that comes from other people or society is actually what you call a social construction. It's just language twisted to uh, subject you to their authority. And in this case, they believed that the authority figure that was tricking everybody with science and rationality and mathematics uh, was Western culture. Uh, so they believed that uh, Western culture, specifically uh, uh, white males, obviously, uh, had developed these systems like logic, uh, mathematics, what else, rationality, which is kind of the same as logic, what else did they think was science, the scientific method, that those weren't actually ways to get answers, those were just twisted languages, or was twisted language and social uh, 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 constructions to trick everybody else to follow their system to keep them in power. That's what they believed, honestly. Go ahead and go to soccer, whatever you're doing. Go to soccer, right? Yeah. All right, cool. Um, so that's what postmodernism actually is. Uh, again, using language to uh, control other groups. So they didn't believe individuals existed, by the way. So if you were a, a white male, or you are, because they're still postmodernists, uh, they would believe that you can't have your own views. You're just a mouthpiece uh, for your group, whether that's race or gender or, or whatever it is. So uh, even if I'm not trying to, all I could do if I was a white male, which I am, is uh, try to get my point across to you, but I'm not really trying to get a point across to you. I'm trying to convince you that this is the system you should listen to so that white males can control you. That's, that's what they mean. So you guys know flat earth theory? You've heard of it? Yeah. It's rooted in this line of thought. Because if you try to prove to me, if I'm a postmodernist or, or, or someone who adopts some of these views, if you try to prove to me that, the, uh, uh, that space exists by showing me pictures or, 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 or explaining to me uh, gravitational uh, calculations or, or proving it some other way other than me going there specifically, or even if I go there maybe, uh, to look at it, I'm gonna say, no. The only thing that's true is my experience, my interpreta interpretation of the world, everything else, is a is a social construct and it's uh, it's a subjective perception of reality. So I know that's extremely confusing, but that's what postmodern thought is. is. Uh, and again, it's going to come out of the far left because again they were sort of backed into a corner uh, because their their views were completely thrown out the window based on evidence. So they threw evidence out the window. Or is there like two postmodernists with the same thing, but they both believed in different? That, here's the thing though, here's the, and this is modern philosophers, not modern philosophers, contemporary philosophers agree with this, like this is kind of an old view, and most philosophers think this is boring because it's actually got so many holes in it, it's hilarious. Um, but yeah, you're right. Even them saying that this is the truth by their own theory is untrue, right? Because they're saying, oh, there's no such thing as a real reality except this thing that we're describing to you. It's like, well, then that thing's not a reality. You're just using your language to twist and control me in that case which is what they, they, they end up trying to do. So again, they don't believe in, it, it's like Marxism applied differently. So they still believe a, a few things are true even though they say nothing's true. Number one, that you're a, a mouthpiece for your group, whether that's gender, race, or whatever. Uh, that there's no such thing as an objective reality, it's all just the use of language to control others uh, subjectively. And that also those that are using it to maintain power, in this case, Western culture or white males, however you want to phrase it, um, the only thing that there is to do is to stop them from controlling others. So you're supposed to act on behalf of the oppressed. So they're saying nothing, nothing objectively exists for real except the stuff we said about language, about power, and about having compassion for those that are uh, being persecuted, essentially. All right. So what, a lot of what you'll see discussed in universities now is uh, this stuff being taught for several generations now. So now you've got the professors who used to be students of the original thinkers of this in the 60s and 70s uh, that are teaching it for the second generation or now they're on the third generation uh, of, of teaching it. All right, and it's got a bunch of logical holes in it. But you know what, that's okay because they don't believe in logic anyway. So it's just you twisting a uh, language to uh, control or maintain power for your group. 
and you're not actually an individual with individual abilities or an opinion, you just only hold the opinion identity of your race or gender or whatever it is that they choose. That's the other thing too that's weird about it. It's like, well, what's my identity then? We're all like several different things. We're all, you know, different mixes of races. Almost none of us are like one specific race, especially here in the United States. Um, you've got, um, okay, gender groups. It's like, yeah, males and, males and females, but like there are a very small amount of hermaphrodites. What are they? Um, how do you include them in the, in the, uh, in the, in the uh, identity pool? Uh, are those the only two grounds we're basing it on? Is it based on other identities? Because if people have other identities too, like how tall are you? How athletic are you? Uh, how good looking or not good looking are you? Like there's all kinds of identities. Uh, your, your body's ability, like your able-bodiedness or level of handicap, like those are all different identities. So it's like, well, where do you draw the line? And what if it's a, 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 a white female and a black female? Like who, what, what team are they on in that case? Do you go with the gender or do you go with the race? So that, that's what makes this uh, very, very difficult to discern. Okay, so that was a very long and complex explanation, and I'm sure there was some miscommunications by me because it's really, really complex and irrational. Um, but what comes out of this is your mission should be then to tear down the Western system because it's inherently racist and sexist and oppressive. Like it can't be redeemed. And any, any evidence that points to things getting better, like you know the abolition of slavery, the civil rights movement, all that stuff, that's all just smoke and mirrors, language used to control you so that uh, uh, Westerners stay in power. So their solution is, again, destroy society. They're saying it, it doesn't exist. Society isn't real. Uh, we should tear it down, is what they're saying. Okay. So the reason why I didn't even mention this is, oh, you got a question? It is kind of similar to anarchism. I mean, a lot of the far left stuff is kind of similar because what keeps happening is um, the far right's horribly wrong too, obviously, but it's obvious why it's wrong. With the left, it's less obvious why it's wrong because it's like, well, all they're doing is trying to help out people who are unfortunate. Like, that doesn't sound like a bad thing, but then when you actually apply it, it doesn't work. So they, they, they keep trying to reform it and reform it till it works uh, to the point that they found that it doesn't, and so now they just say, well, you know what? Evidence isn't real actually anyway. There's no actual real reality, uh, and this whole system that we're in is just a large power play and twisting language to control us, so we need to tear it all down. End the West, essentially, is the mission. Uh, and by the way, a lot of these thinkers were uh, French, Europeans, and so they themselves were white males that were saying this, which was another layer of oddity added on to it. Um, so, yeah, that's the idea here. And uh, he, here's, here's where it goes wrong and right. So it's wrong that it just wants to tear down all society, because we know what happens when you tear down society. You get anarchy, which is just worse, because then people just rape and kill and take, and there's no productivity, and everyone's anxious, and it, it's terrible. We know what that's like. Um, we've had instances where, you know, like the, the police or military go on strike or they aren't there, or, or you can look at some uh, uncontacted peoples in the world and the way that they engage uh, in their hunter-gatherer societies uh, are very, very violent. Um, so we know what happens. Um, so that's bad. We don't want to just tear down society. Is it perfect? No. But instead of just replacing it or getting rid of it and having anarchy, you should be trying to uh, make it better and improve it. Uh, but again, their argument is you can't improve it because whatever you think is good isn't good because that doesn't exist. Uh, it's just you trying to control other people. But anyways, so that's not good. But here's what is good, though. This did help propel the counterculture movement, the, uh, the positive aspects of it, right? Which were, of course, uh, second wave feminism. That's a very good one. Equal opportunity for women. They should be able to do whatever they want to do, obviously. Uh, it's also going to be anti-imperialism. That's a good thing, too. We shouldn't just roll around controlling other countries uh, because they can't stop us. That's not something that people generally think is a good thing or a moral thing. Another one is uh, ending uh, uh, racist policies in the West. So like any lingering segregation, like obviously slavery has already been gone for 100 years, but segregation in uh, the United States, um, in South Africa, getting rid of that, that's, that's a positive, getting, giving minorities a chance to uh, uh, enjoy equal opportunity as well. So there, there are some uh, positive sides here, right? Obviously the people that are hardcore believe these things and want to destroy society, ah, that's not a good thing. But um, wanting to end these things that do limit people based on their uh, 
uh, gender or race or whatever, that, that is a good thing, right? So that was the positive part that came out of it. And that's what I forgot to, well, I didn't have a chance to explain it to you because I wasn't even here to teach it to you. So that, that's what it's rooted in. And again, you guys are going to go to university and uh, you're going to see these ideas and hear them. And you'll see them in practice uh, when you're, uh, uh, when you see people. Have you guys ever seen videos about where like they go to a college campus or something and somebody, here's something they don't like, like you disagree with somebody and then they say, I have a right to exist or you're denying my existence or your speech is violence. You ever heard that stuff before? No? Some of you have? Well, you will, or if you look for it, and, and it's rare, I'm not saying like you're going to campus and that's all kinds of people. There's just a few of them as far as I know. Uh, but this is what they're referring to. Because if you disagree with them and say they're wrong, they think that you're denying them their reality. Like their reality is their experience, their interpretation of the world. So if you're saying that's not true, that's actually violent to them. As in they're, you're saying their existence is not legitimate and they're not legitimate, which they interpret as violence. So it, it gets really complex. And again, you probably won't actually see that. Um, I was just in college a few years ago. I didn't see any of that. I've seen clips on the internet. I don't know how actually prominent it is, but uh, it is out there in some places with some people, and this is what it's rooted in. Whether they understand these uh, policy, uh, ideas or not, uh, that's what it's rooted in. So that's the negative, but again, the positive is the, uh, the civil rights movement, second wave feminism, anti-imperialism. That's obviously all a, a net benefit for everybody. So does at least that part make sense? Okay, good. I understand if this is foggy and, and hazy and ambiguous, but that's what postmodernism is. Uh, and again, philosophy's moved all on since then because this is just faulty and full of holes and ridiculous. But uh, some people, anyone who would have been a Marxist 80 years ago, now is sort of uh, aligned with these views. Okay. Oh, I forgot to mention the uh, main. Forgot to mention the main postmodern thinkers. By the way, if you ever want to like, if you're curious if this stuff, uh, these guys actually said these things, and they did. Uh, the main guys were. Uh, Jacques Derrida, uh, Michel Foucault, all French, and Jean-Francois Lyotard. All right, and that's the uh, postmodern. And again, remember, remember the positive option of that, which is the civil rights movement, second wave feminism, uh, equality for LGBTQ community, all, all that stuff is, is solid. But the uh, just mindlessly destroying society because you think it's a social construct we know is not practical or useful. And we know we can make people's lives better with, uh, with, with uh, the scientific method. Obviously, lifespan and quality of life have improved drastically as a result of those modern techniques. Okay, um, on we go, though. So speaking of uh, the freedoms that enabled, like uh, second wave feminism, women have benefited tremendously over the last, you know, what, 70 years or so? Obviously, from the stuff we talked about before with you know appliances and birth control and things, but they've actually gotten rid of any lingering laws or protections that do limit women. So women obviously can do whatever they want now. So what we've seen uh, in the uh, late 20th century, so after the 60s and 70s, uh, you see a huge increase in uh, female literacy, uh, female education. In fact, women outnumber men. Well, first of all, in this room, any AP class I've ever seen it's like a three or four to one ratio, female to male. Uh, you go to college, I think college is roughly two thirds female, one third male. Uh, so women have benefited tremendously uh, from being uh, able to and or, and or allowed to, depending on the country, uh, to join the workforce and the uh, upper level education system. And uh, we also have uh, female business and political leaders now as well. So female uh, politicians. A couple examples, I think they were in the notes. Um, Margaret Thatcher, she was buddies with Reagan in the 80s. She's the prime minister of, uh, of Great Britain. I don't know if she still is, but I know if, at least for a while she was the only prime minister to be elected three times in a row, which is a major feat. And um, it's actually harder to be elected prime minister than it is president. And uh, you also have, uh, although she's got some heat now for her, her, her uh, policies of the EU, uh, Angela Merkel out of Germany, she's been very successful. So again, it's been, a, it's been very beneficial uh, for women since these movements. And the last thing I'll say is even the Catholic Church has uh, uh, mended its ways. It used to be one of the most uh, oppressive organizations on the planet, or at least one of the most obvious ones, with the Inquisition and you know, killing heretics and all of that, and denying science, that sort of stuff, uh, like the postmodernists are doing now. 
But since the 1960s, since a meeting, they call it Vatican II or Liberation Theology, that's what we'll call it. They basically have turned the corner, and again, they're no longer uh, opposed to science. They've actually embraced it. Uh, so they're not, they're not anti-science anymore, at least not as much as they were. Like they have their own astronomy you know, team, and they're, they're active in the scientific community. They want to be informed, not pretend it doesn't exist. Um, they're not, I should say they're not anti-science. There we go. Not anti-science, there we go. The double negative makes it positive. Um, they are also not, it's not that they accept all other religions as valid, but they are tolerant of other religions. So they're not gonna persecute you because you're Protestant or Muslim or, or whatever. Um, they will coexist with you peacefully, uh, and if you want to convert to Catholicism, that's great for them. Uh, that's kind of how they view it. So they're, I would say, tolerant of other religions. And uh, while they used to be a little bit more focused on spending the wealth on themselves and the, the churches and uh, their organization, they're much more willing to and uh, uh, attempting to help out those who are in need. So anytime there's a disaster uh, or you have you know, large amounts of poor uh, currently in, in parts of South America, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, parts of Asia, Oceania, so they're much more uh, focused on aid um, and health. Uh, for the world. All right, I think pretty much everybody can agree that's a, uh, a, a market improvement uh, from what it was. In fact, actually, like I mentioned earlier, I erased the name, they were against uh, communism, the communist states, because they were oppressive. Normally, they kind of like let governments do what they want to do, but they actually had an opinion on and fought against the, uh, uh, the Soviet Union uh, by helping fund solidarity in Poland uh, and spoke out against their, their oppressive uh, tendencies. So they're against I guess you'd say oppressive regimes, which is better than being neutral. All right, you guys got that? Sweet, now you're confused as hell about postmodernism. Take a break. Non-alignment, uh, what are my, actually before non-alignment, let's talk about Egypt. So Egypt, well, it's kind of non-alignment too. Egypt starts to, uh, back away a bit from the people that are funding them. Is that the U.S. or the Soviets? Soviets. Soviets, yeah. Um, why, why, by the way, while we're talking about this whole non-alignment movement, before we get there, uh, what motivated countries that are going to partake in this, which we'll go over here in a bit, uh, what, what's motivating them to uh, not be aligned with the U.S. or the USSR? Like, why wouldn't you want a bunch of money? Because then they would have to support the uh, U.S. or the USSR in wars and help them. Yeah, so the, the problem is if you're accepting money from them, they can at least a little bit uh, control you. Because uh, how could they control you, by the way, if they're giving you money? You gotta pay it back. You gotta pay it back? No, a lot of times it's just, just, it's just straight aid to them. Why, why, would, um, why would a country, U.S. or the Soviets, sort of get to dictate what I'm doing just because they're giving me money. Yeah, because you can take it away, right. So, um, if uh, I'm the Soviets, obviously I want you to be a communist uh, uh, economic, have a communist economic system. And if I'm the US, I want you to have a capitalist economic system, uh, or at least not communist. So if you're not doing that, they cut your money. Not that they force you like at gunpoint, but they force you at wallet point, I guess, or whatever. Right, so they, 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 they pressure you to do things um, and sort of compromise your autonomy, your self-rule, uh, in order to accept their funding. And so some countries are willing to put up with it. Some put up with it for a while, some say no right away, uh, but all those that end up defecting or choosing not to because they don't want the strings attached, uh, they're going to sort of form a third uh, uh, world, right? Because first world is US and allies, second world is USSR and allies. So this is the third world are the non-aligned countries. I mean, now we kind of know them as being poor countries, which isn't technically correct, because it's a Cold War term. And they mostly were poor. But uh, Third World's actually a, a separate third faction in, in, this, in this Cold War. If you're trying to say poor country, you'd be better off saying developing. All right, cool. It kind of starts here with some of the countries we're gonna touch on. Egypt is one of them. Uh, they're tired of taking aid from the Soviets uh, over time, for the reason we just mentioned, like they kind of lose their autonomy. Uh, so one leader in particular in the 50s uh, comes out of Egypt to start saying no to the Soviets and start reforming things internally. Yeah, Mal Nasser. 
All right, cool. So we'll, we'll put Egypt here first. So what's the uh, waterway that uh, is going from the uh, Red Sea to the Mediterranean, and, and uh, who, who built it there, and who's arguing over who gets to use it? The Suez Canal was built by the British. Yeah, okay, cool. And then uh, who wants control over that? Staying with you. Well, just think about it. Whose land is it right by? The Egyptians won. Yeah, right. And, and, and so do the British and French, by the way. I'll have to get that back to the whole Suez crisis. It's not that important in this class, though. Uh, but but Gamal, Gamal Nasser wants that, uh, to maintain that Suez uh, Canal as an Egyptian, uh, piece of Egyptian territory. All right, what else, what other forms does he uh, make to the actual state itself? It's very similar to that Muhammad Ali uh, guy about 100 years earlier. Almost, almost right on the point, point money. Yeah, so he's going to uh, um, did you say nationalize or privatize? Nationalize. Yeah, there you go. <clears throat> he's going to nationalize uh, more sectors of the economy, essentially. Um, so we don't need a specific one. I know he nationalizes land itself. Uh, you said banks. I can't remember if there are banks or not, but we can we can throw it in there either way. Um, he's going to nationalize several industries. And uh, is that capitalist or socialist? That's socialist. socialist. Good. At least you guys know that one uniformly. Okay. And um, I just want to make sure I'm not talking about anything else besides the pan Arabism. I feel like I might have skipped something. No, not really. Talked about how he kind of started back away from the Soviets and he's going to nationalize and uh, implement some socialist programs. Um, he's also big on uh, pan Arabism, which, uh, as we talked about in the reading the other day, very, very similar to uh, Pan-Africanism, right? Are they trying to form a, a, a super Arab nation, like a no, caliphate no. again? No, it's none of that. It's not like ISIS back then. Um, it's, it's more of a, we want to foster independence and affluence among the Arab community. So they're going to provide aid and, and, and uh, advice to any budding Arab nations that pop up. By the way, Egypt's gonna be the uh, backbone in the uh, Arab world for uh, assaulting a, a uh, newly reinvigorated or, or re-established country or state in the Middle East. Who are they gonna, several times by the way, who are they gonna uh, join to attack? Israel. Israel, right, but who's gonna end up joining Syria, them? Syria, Lebanon, Jordan. Yes, a bunch of Muslim slash Arab countries around there, and, and Egypt's a part of that. So you could kind of see that as sort of a pan-Arab movement because uh, they're not one country, but they're all sort of acting in each other's interest because they all, at this point, agree uh, that Israel uh, shouldn't exist and they, they wanted to push it out to the sea. All right, cool. So that's pan-Arabism. And again, we're not talking like reforming the caliphate or anything. It's, it's very much like pan-Africanism. Just help out fellow uh, Arab nations that are just newly free, right? Because most of these Arab nations were controlled directly or indirectly by the British or the French or the Italians or whoever. Uh, or the Russians, so they're just starting out uh, brand new, just like the South African or Sub-Saharan African countries. Uh, and a lot of them, especially in Africa, are gonna try socialist policies, which of course fail terribly uh, for a few decades. But by the 90s and early 2000s, most of those are gonna be gone, and they start transitioning to uh, uh, market economies, which is why, again, this region right here, well, not, not this whole region, but Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa is one of the fastest growing um, uh, economies the states of that uh, the states of that continent are the fastest growing economies in the world. That's how I try to say it. Okay, cool. So that's Kamal Nasser, uh, but he's not alone in this sort of backing away from the uh, Soviets and the Americans. Uh, there are some other major players uh, that also, at the same time, want to uh, uh, back away from both sides of the Cold War conflict. The Indonesian president, the Sukarno. Yeah, Sukarno. Uh, and he's in, this, in the newly freed area of Indonesia. If you guys remember correctly, they were under control of the Dutch for several, uh, well, I know directly under control of the Dutch for more than a century. I'm not sure how long the Dutch had a colony there, but the Dutch government I know had been running it since 1800. So likely more than a couple centuries the Dutch had uh, controlled that area. Uh, and of course, Sukarno is going to be one of the leading figures there. In fact, let's stick with him for a second because he's gonna be the major uh, initiator of this uh, uh, non-alignment movement. In fact, they're gonna meet uh, in Indonesia for this initial meeting, right? And that's called, anybody remember what that's called? Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, conference. And that's sort of the 
formal slash informal establishing of this non-aligned movement, this, this third, uh, third world set of countries that are not going to take aid from the United States or Russia. By the way, they're also going to be, um, and that's in 1955, I believe, uh, they're, uh, they're not aligned, obviously, with the uh, first or second world. And again, that means the United States and allies, or uh, Soviet Union and their allies. But they're also um, going to attempt to uh, form a sort of a sense of solidarity. Uh, they're going to work together economically. They're going to try to help each other out with advice and aid and, 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 and trade in any way that they can. Uh, so it's, uh, uh, I don't want to say that they're like necessarily allies or like an economic trade union, uh, but there is a sense of uh, solidarity uh, and aid to one another. Again, they're trying to preserve their own autonomy uh, here. All right, and a lot of this, again, is coming from uh, Sukarno. People on the internet definitely can't see that word. Sukarno. From Indonesia. And he's the first president, I believe. Not prime minister. I think he was a president. Either way, president or prime minister. He's the uh, uh, elected leader uh, of, that, of that country at the time. And they're going to uh, lead that movement. All right, and Egypt's going to join them, right? So Egypt's going to join. So we're going to have... Uh, Sukarno. And there's more than these five we're going to name here. Uh, but there's also uh, Nassar. What else? Who else? Nehru. Nehru, yeah. We'll get to him in, in a moment here. That's in India. So we'll get to him in a second. Nehru. All right. Um, I guess I could write him further over. So we'll talk about him in a second. Uh, a couple of the big ones, though. Yeah, Tito from Yugoslavia. That's a big one because that was always uh, closely tied with uh, the Russians and the, the later the Soviets uh, in Yugoslavia. So Tito, all right, and then one more uh, big one. What? He does much later. I, I want to say he waited all the way to like the late '60s uh, to, to actually do that. But yes, he will. We'll, we'll actually put him there because he eventually does sort of. In fact, actually, China is going to join up much later too. But I'm talking more so when this thing began. So actually, I'll take the name off. But you are not wrong because uh, late joiners are going to be uh, uh, China and Cuba as well. Yeah, Kwame Nkrumah from. Ghana, correct. Well done. Okay, cool. Uh, they're all going to be major uh, contributors uh, to or the origins of this movement. All right, this non-alignment movement. All right, Nehru. Uh, there's not a whole lot we have to talk about with him regarding the actual AP test. He does make some economic reforms. Um, he does. Uh, he does go a little bit into both, into socialist and into a uh, private practice. Uh, which side does he go more into? Socialist. Yeah, more into the socialist. So he does do a fair amount of nationalizing slash forming social programs. Uh, was his focus, and there's going to be a light amount of privatization. So some industries will have a small amount of privatization, like maybe you go over your quota, you get to keep it or, or whatever. All right, so that's better than nothing. Okay. Um, is he all about, I, I want to mention this too, by the way, he at no point, kind of like Indonesia, I, can't, I can, actually I can't say if Indonesia ever took any aid from either side, but India, as far as I know, did not take any aid from the US or uh, the USSR. They wanted to do it entirely on their own. Uh, so they were, they were pretty much non-aligned right from the beginning, uh, even though there wasn't that movement yet. Um, so I'll say they're the non-aligned OGs. And, um, what sort of economy, we're at the nationalizing and the privatizing, but what I wanna know is, were they really engaged in world trade or were they more about uh, having a, a domestic focused economy? Domestic. Yeah, they're much more focused on domestic economy. All right, cool. And that's, by the way, we know that for sure. First, certainly implementing this ratio of socialist programs and uh, trying to keep your uh, uh, economy self-sufficient, we know that's not a recipe for growth. All right, so domestic economy. Nowadays, you have to go free market and you have to go global, uh, global economy if you're gonna try to grow in any way, any significant way. Okay, uh, do they grow? Yeah. They do, but how do we know that it's like, it likely wasn't an effective program? Because like, what well, way, they grew a little bit. Because other countries uh, in uh, relative were going much more 
Yes. So this is a, the, a point when we sort of had a, an economic miracle in uh, Europe, the United States, Japan, uh, Japan's a little later, but uh, they all sort of have these booms economically. So everybody, everyone's economy in the West that's using, utilizing free market uh, practices, their economies are growing wildly uh, until the 70s. Uh, but while this economy does grow, it grows much, much, much less uh, than the uh, Europeans, the United States, uh, and the Japanese, uh, and a couple others. Uh, but that's a, a pretty good indicator that it's probably not the best economic system, although it beat its predecessors in China and the Soviet Union by not going backwards, so yay, yay them. So small economic growth, uh, likely ineffective system. And they're gonna try several five-year programs uh, later on. But uh, yeah, so any questions about non-alignment? Because we've talked about all the main, except for Tito, we've talked about all the main contributors to that. Because uh, again, they want us to focus outside of Europe as, as much as we can. So we got uh, Paul Nkrumah from Africa, uh, from Asia you've got, uh, and Egypt, and from Asia you've got uh, Nehru, and Indonesia you've got Sukarno. So definitely know those guys, just sort of generally how they contributed to their countries and this non-aligned movement and what it was. You guys got that? Yeah. All right, sweet. So let's then talk about let's go into stagflation before we do civil rights. No, let's do civil rights first. Let's do uh, at least peaceful protest because that it helps make sense of why stagflation occurred. All right, cool. So let's read that. All right, so starting in the, well, actually starting in India as early as the 1920s and 30s, uh, you sort of have this uh, uh, new strategy for trying to obtain freedom, because uh, doing it by force has repeatedly not worked in history, uh, especially pr prior to World War I. Uh, so briefly tell me who and, and how. Gandhi and mass civil disobedience. Yeah, what was that? So Gandhi would try to make everyone not listen to the government or like laws, and if enough people don't listen to it, then it shows that yeah. Do, do you know an example of uh, him using mass civil, civil disobedience? Um, later on, there's sit-ins where he would sit down. Yeah. Uh, one of his first major ones, this is before World War II, I think it was 1930, it was really early. Um, it was the Salt March. Uh, it was illegal for Indians to collect salt uh, in this certain stretch of land because the British government, one of their companies, had the rights to it. Uh, and he thought that that was, um, it was public land and it was therefore an injustice to say that people could not use the salt that they depended on. So he just took a whole bunch of uh, marchers, peaceful marchers, went down and literally just all they did was pick up the salt, which was illegal. Uh, and he got arrested, many others got arrested, but it did a good job of showing because there was too many to all of them, to arrest all of them. Uh, so he got arrested among some of the other leaders and then they, of course, started using hunger strikes uh, later on as well when they did get arrested. But it's a great example of when you, in a nonviolent manner, Find a law you feel is unjust, and it usually is, obviously, like, oh, Indians can't gather salt here, like, that's clearly uh, discriminating against race. Um, they just go and disobey the law peacefully in large numbers to the point that you can't actually, you know, arrest all these people. So the, the police try to break it up, generally speaking, uh, especially in the United States, by using things like fire hoses, tear gas, uh, police batons. And when that stuff gets on TV later, obviously there's no real TV yet in the, in the 30s in this case, but, or even the 40s. But once TV uh, enters the scene and people can see this stuff happening, it has a much bigger uh, uh, emotional impact on the opinions of uh, people around. So, massive disobedience, all right? And this is uh, gonna pick up, I would say, self-determination. Uh, they're gonna use this to try to, of course, chase out some of the imperial powers. This originates in India. I'm sure the, the tactic itself has been used somewhere else in the world at some point in time by a different name. Uh, but Gandhi's the one uh, to make that really widely known. And one person, by the way, uh, and this is what I was actually trying to talk about with this whole peaceful protest movement, one person in the United States really uh, liked this idea and really utilized it well to uh, affect change in the United States. So I want to know, obviously, who it is. I'm sure you all know who it is, but uh, give me a couple examples of how they do it. Yeah, Martin Luther King Jr. Um, he is, of course, from the United States, and uh, he starts his journey, as far as I know, like the, the, the 
the event that propelled him into popularity uh, was in the uh, 50s when uh, he and Rosa Parks and others, including uh, a bunch of blacks, uh, sympathetic whites, and, and Jews in the area, they uh, began to protest the segregation in the busing system. All right, and they do it peacefully. Uh, and they don't do, use a sit-in in this case. They use something that's uh, very powerful if you're trying to get a company uh, or someplace that's dependent on your money to, uh, to change their ways, their laws, their policies. Boycott. Yeah, boycott. What's a boycott? <clears throat> Basically, you refuse to uh, buy or engage in business activities with that particular whatever it is. Yeah. Okay, cool. So mass civil disobedience is going to use it. The boycott's not an example of mass civil disobedience, but it is peaceful protest. All right, so one of them is going to be boycott. In fact, the Montgomery uh, bus boycott works very well. Basically, uh, anyone who agreed with what they were doing, uh, which was most blacks in the area, uh, a large number of uh, sympathetic whites and Jews, etc., they just don't use the busing system. So that busing system is going to lose a ton of money, uh, and they do. Uh, so they have to change their policy uh, to uh, be functional and profitable. And, and it's, it's a success. Yay, so Montgomery bus boycott, that's going to work in the 50s. Uh, I'm sure you guys all know the story about Rosa Parks and, and, and all that, all right? Uh, also, too, we have some, and I'll, I'll talk more about this in a bit, but at the same time, we have some uh, uh, court decisions in the United States that also are beginning to recognize how Enlightenment ideals should be applied to uh, everybody. Brown versus Board. Yeah, so originally in the United States in 1896, uh, it was a, a case called Plessy versus Ferguson. They actually found... Uh, segregation to be okay, legal, constitutional, as long as uh, blacks had, or colored people, however they phrased it, um, had a separate but equal facility. So like, oh, you can say no blacks on this rail car, but there has to be a rail car for blacks, essentially, is what it, what it meant. Or, oh, they can't use this bathroom, but, but there has to be a, a bathroom for blacks or colored people, or, or whatever they referred it to back then in the South. So. Um, that goes on for a few decades, but uh, Thurgood Marshall and, and several other lawyers are going to uh, bring it down and show that uh, not only were they not following up with the equal facility part, but also that if you're splitting people up and not giving them the opportunity to use these facilities, or in the case of schools, uh, the best teachers, then that is uh, uh, inherently unequal, so they had to uh, end it, end segregation. And the case that does that is in 1954 and 55. Uh, is uh, Brown versus Board of Education. In particular, it, it was several cases, but in particular it was this girl that had to like go like six or seven miles across town to go to the black school, and it was, it was very difficult for her to do when the white school was just you know, very close to her actual house and neighborhood. All right, uh, and that's overturned, and that's going to make uh, segregation in schools illegal in the United States. Uh, and that's when um, a lot of uh, people like Martin Luther King Jr begin to say, oh, the United States just officially, the Supreme Court uh, just officially made a decision that said segregation is unconstitutional in schools, so now let's try to apply it to all things. And that's what they're going to be doing over the next 10, 15, maybe even 20 years uh, in the United States. <clears throat> and it's going to work. And one of the strategies we mentioned, boycotts, very effective. Someone mentioned a sit-in. What's a sit-in? When you, like, like um, go to a place that is, you're not supposed to be in, like, let's say, like, yeah, okay, well, I can't sit on a water fountain, but I could sit in front of one, yeah. Uh, the example they used was, this is the SNCC, which I forgot what it stood for, by the way, but um, what they would do is they would go to, like, restaurants where uh, colored people couldn't sit or, or whatever, and uh, however it was labeled, and they would just go sit there uh, and intentionally break the law, or in the case of whites that obviously weren't breaking the law, they would just not get up. Uh, until those seats were open to everybody. Uh, and they'd get harassed and have stuff thrown on them and punched and spit on and you know, had cigarette butts burnt on them and all that. Uh, but they were able to uh, really show, certainly the locals, and even more so when TV gets involved, the entire nation, just how racist and backwards and uh, terrible the conditions were in uh, the segregated South. So sit-ins are very effective. And again, the key here kind of is uh, people actually seeing what's happening. Because if you don't know what's going on there, it's like, who cares? Like if there's some stuff going on up in Alaska that's really bad, like we don't know, like whatever. But if we start seeing it on the news, the TV, it's like, oh, then it becomes a big deal and things end up happening. All right, so TV is a big part of this whole civil rights movement. Okay, what else? Someone mentioned marches. What marches? Selma's one of them, right? Another one? 
Washington. That was the big one to get the Civil Rights Act passed, and Selma was more about uh, opportunity for voting rights. Okay, um, so marches are effective. Uh, examples, of course, the March on Washington, we'll use that. Uh, what that does, eh, we'll put Selma in there too. What that does is it shows, again, with the TV, uh, just how many people support these measures. Um, I can't remember if it was 100,000 or 200,000, either way it's a ridiculous amount. I showed up to the uh, March on Washington where uh, blacks had a bunch of speeches, and of course there's sympathetic whites and other ethnic groups there too. Um, and they were pressuring Congress to uh, pass a piece of legislation that uh, made illegal, basically, discriminating based on race and, and gender and, and whatnot. Um, and they're successful in doing that. And that, um, is it in the notes? I think it's in the notes, right? What's the name of that act? Civil, Civil Rights, Rights Act, 1964. Exactly. All right, and that's going to, at least in the United States, make it uh, illegal to discriminate based on race and all those other categories. All right, uh, Selma worked out too. That one got the Voting Rights Act passed, uh, as far as I know, unless I'm mixing the stories up, uh, shortly after. Um, it basically made it illegal for you to intimidate people from voting, uh, which was happening in some select locations. And they marched on Selma uh, to do this, a city in the south. And um, the mayor or the chief of police, can't remember his name, or which, which position he held, but he was, he was pretty damn racist. And so he used the uh, police force uh, in the area to try to stop the marchers, who are totally peaceful, by the way, from coming in. And uh, of course, it's all caught on TV, so people got to see how these people were being treated. Uh, the blacks were, uh, the, the leaders of these marches did a great job in not letting them lash out in anger, which is really hard not to do if somebody's pummeling you with whatever they're pummeling you with. Uh, but they did a good job of not fighting back, which is important if it's on TV, because on TV, if you just see a bunch of people fighting the police, then you just, you know, you're not really sympathetic towards them, or you might not be. Uh, but you're definitely sympathetic towards them if they're clearly not causing any trouble, and then they're being hit by fire hoses, bit by dogs, hit by batons, and arrested, and you know, uh, hit with tear gas and all that stuff. So this, uh, these two events, but especially that one, really showed just how bad it could be in certain areas of the South uh, to get these changes implemented. All right, um, we'll do. Uh, we'll bounce back to this uh, era here in a second, uh, and I do want to fast forward again to more. No, actually, no way. We'll stay in the United States and, and Europe in the 60s uh, because there's another group that's going to advocate for uh, equality of opportunity and uh, ending discrimination. So I want to know what's the name of that movement and what that means. Counterculture. Okay, that's that's the general anti-oppression sort of narrative when postmodernism pops up, but uh, let, let's stick with the specific one about a specific movement that is very much like this movement. Second wave feminism. There you go. And what is second wave feminism? What distinguishes it from first? Um, first was more about suffrage. Well, this is just like um, civil laws. Yeah, um, it's about um, yeah laws of society and economic economic opportunity. But you could probably I think the best way to summarize it is wanting to have equal opportunity for women. So no 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 barriers just because they are a woman a woman they are a woman just because they're a woman, right? So uh, equal opportunity. Meaning, oh, I can apply for any job or leadership position or whatever, and I can't be denied simply on the grounds that I am a female, right? I think we, should, we can all agree is agreeable. Okay, uh, and beneficial, too, because there's, uh, when uh, it becomes illegal to discriminate by race, and we have the second wave feminist movement, uh, we're, of course, going to uh, get into the economy and the universities and the government and all the uh, various branches. Uh, we're gonna get uh, the best and motivated and smartest uh, of these groups that were previously perhaps uh, limited. Certainly these were, and, and these were to an extent too. But before we even have this movement, and um, uh, it joins with the um, uh, civil rights movement and, and, and attempts to enact some change, what are some technological changes, medical changes, that are going to uh, allow women the opportunity to themselves uh, join the workforce and, and sort of raise this issue? Okay, so appliances, right. So household appliances. And I'm sure people in there are like, what? Birth control. Birth control, too. Yeah, I'll leave a little space here. So anybody want to tell me why household appliances are going to be, uh, well, and birth control, we'll do household appliances first. Why are uh, these two, specifically appliances, why is it so, because uh, no one talks about this, why is that so, what's the word I'm looking for? significant when we're talking about the second wave feminist movement and, and its origins. Um, 
think of um, with household appliances, it would um, dr drastically cut down the amount of time it would take to um, do all the housework. Mm -hmm. So instead of taking a full day, it will take part of the day and then women can go outside and try to pursue an education for career. Yeah, whatever it is they're interested in. Exactly. So uh, uh, prior to the, the conventional narrative, is, it's not that like men kept women caged in the house for all of eternity and this is the first time they were uh, strong enough to pop out uh, or willing to. That wasn't quite it. Um, as you guys know, uh, both men and women were pretty damn oppressed throughout all of history uh, against their social uh, systems. I mean, we just got suffrage for even uh, propertying males uh, just a, like 100 years earlier, maybe a little earlier than that, 150 years earlier. Um, so the fact that men and women had to essentially work together throughout all of history to try to overcome life's difficulties and, like I said, the social constraints that they had at the time, uh, depending on what era they lived in. Um, the household uh, work was not a joke. Like, that took the entire day uh, prior to the 1950s and, and the 1940s. Like, uh, to wash dishes or clothes or, or, or prepare food or, or any of that stuff, uh, it's going to take a, a significant amount of time. It, it's a full-time job. Like, somebody had to do it. Uh, and the way it played out was because there was no birth control pill, women were, uh, you know, pregnant more often than they wanted to be. Uh, so they generally uh, had and took care of the kids, and then they were the ones that were home uh, as the men had to go off and, and earn money uh, or farm or whatever they were doing. Uh, and then they would, of course, uh, be the ones that were uh, generally uh, had the household chores uh, partitioned to them. Right now, nowadays it's a lot more even because household work doesn't take that long because of these appliances. But back then, it took the whole day. It would take six, seven, eight, nine hours to do all that stuff. Uh, appliances, though, are going to make it much quicker. You can get all the housework done in, in two, three hours, maybe even less if you're on top of it every day. Uh, so that left women with a whole bunch of time, and people get bored, obviously. Uh, so they would go out and pursue other interests, whether it's education or a part-time job or return to full-time work. Um, or get involved in their kids' lives at, at the schools or whatever. Uh, so there was a lot of, uh, or, or write books, whatever they were doing. Uh, there was a lot of women in the 50s and 60s that had previously been unable to do so, not necessarily because they weren't allowed to, but because there wasn't the actual time to do it. Now they can go out and pursue those interests, get the education and all of that, right? So uh, basically housework goes from uh, uh, roughly eight to uh, two hours a day. And that is, a significant amount of time saved to the point that women can actually go out and do things that they want to do uh, even before everybody gets home or, or whatever. All right, cool. Um, why did the birth control pill, and I kind of mentioned it already. So um, they get to control like how many kids they want and when they want them. So they could have time to do, like, like get an education or get a career before they start having kids. Exactly. So we have the pill. Uh, you have other contraceptions too, and you have abortion as well. Uh, that's not as dangerous and later legal in the United States and Europe, but uh, shortly after. But um, the issue there is throughout, again, all of time, women were sort of biologically uh, bound to this. If they were going to be sexually active, and almost every human being is, especially in adulthood, um, or, or married or whatever, like, it's just going to happen. Like, you're going to get pregnant more often than you want to, uh, unfortunately. So this is the first time in history, any history we know, certainly human history, where uh, uh, females have, well, both genders, but, but females have the ability to uh, control their fertility, all right? So most women want to, when they get out of high school, like not have kids for a while, right? Most women end up wanting kids just on their own uh, in the late 20s, early 30s range. Uh, so most tend to uh, wait and go to college, uh, go do whatever trips or whatever they want for fun, uh, start a career, etc., uh, and then have kids later uh, when they're older, which is why now uh, people have kids at such a, such a later age. Um, so this, again, allows women to, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, escape the, the uh, bondage of, I don't want to say involuntary, but of uh, unpredictable, uh, fertility. There we go. So now uh, it's much less likely that I will become pregnant. If I can, I might be able to undo it. Uh, so that allows women to, of course, go out, get educated if they want to first, go out and uh, be adventurous if they want to first, uh, go get a career started uh, and have a kid later in life and have less kids, right? It's not like I'm having kids all the way through my 40s now. Uh, it's like, oh, I want one or two or three and that's it. Uh, so they have less kids. 
Uh, they have them when they want to, so they can establish their careers, get their education, accomplish their goals. Uh, and then when they have the kids and the kids are in school or whatever, or if they have somebody else watch them, whatever arrangement they have, uh, they're able to go back to uh, school or part-time work or full-time work or whatever it is that they want to. So that, that's going to free up a lot of women. Uh, and that was a, these two alone were by far, probably this one a little bit more, but certainly both of them were the biggest contributors to this. Because in the 50s and 60s, I've got a ton of women uh, flooding into the uh, workforce in the health industries and, and school and, and other industries too, education. Um, but uh, that's when people start noticing like, hey, what the heck? Like. Uh, some men that had, uh, you know, sort of had this vision in their minds of uh, like men do the work and women, you know, stay home and have kids or whatever. It's different now because they're doing those things a lot less thanks to appliances and uh, controlling their fertility. Uh, so now they're voluntarily joining the workforce. There wasn't necessarily a whole lot of like laws that forbade women from taking jobs, as far as I know anyway. Uh, but certainly there was like a social resistance to it uh, from uh, some of the more traditional uh, male colleagues. But there were some males that were cool with it too, uh, obviously. However, uh, we are going to have uh, some feminist, second wave feminist intellectuals who bring up some points. They were, they were pretty far off on some, but they, were, they nailed some right on the head. Uh, what, are, uh, what are the two that we focused on in this class? Betty Friedman and yeah. And uh, Simone de Beauvoir. All right. Uh, they write a couple books. Fernand writes um, uh, Feminine Mystique. And uh, Simone de Beauvoir writes The Second Sex. And again, uh, they weren't exactly 100% right on all of the assertions they're making, especially Beauvoir, but um, they're going to be right on, on several. Uh, Fernand had a great point about how uh, a lot of women feel like uh, being stuck in this these roles without the opportunity to do what they want, feel imprisoned, and oh, hell, anybody would if they didn't intrinsically want to do those things their entire life uh, or at all. So they should definitely, and this is why this movement's so important, they should definitely be able to choose uh, not to do those things if they do not want to, right? And, and now they can, right? If I don't want to have kids, like let's say I'm, I'm one of the females that decides I don't want any kids at all, I just want a career all the way through uh, to my grave, you can now, right? You can because you can uh, take birth control and, you know, a, get an abortion maybe if, if, if something happens that you weren't prepared for um, and then even if you're not even if you're a, you are a, somebody who wants to have kids you're not like bound to doing that for all the day for years right you can do it when you want to and you're gonna have some free time uh, even after um, pregnancy and, and, and the kids have grown up and, and whatnot all right so that that's a that's huge uh, and she made a great point by that that women shouldn't be pigeonholed in that into that role it, it should be a choice uh, between certainly by her uh, and then, of course, if she's married, it's a partnership. You've, you've always got to sort of divide all of the tasks that have to be done with uh, between the, the, the two spouses. All right. <clears throat> so Simone de Beauvoir was uh, a bit more a bit more with the patriarchy narrative, um, but I mean, she had some points uh, certainly because there were definitely some males that were pretty resistant to the idea of women joining the workforce, and she appropriately pointed out how that was inappropriate and how women should be able to uh, do as they please. Uh, and then women had been treated as the second sex, the second class citizens uh, throughout history. And uh, there are definitely examples of that occurring. Uh, there's also examples, of course, of them running countries as queens and whatnot, but um, certainly the ones that stick out are the ones that uh, are uh, more uh, oppressive or harsh. All right, so we understand second wave feminism. All right, there's a bunch of things. In fact, there, if I remember the wording correctly, which I might not, uh, the, the, the gender verbiage is in the, um, Civil Rights Act, but they do have an act that's going to cause, prevent, or at least make illegal companies from discriminating against women based on pay. So that's going to be as much be easy. Equal Pay Act of Yeah, exactly. Equal Pay Act. All right. So again, if the United States and somebody's uh, and you're a woman and someone's paying you less because you are a woman, I mean that's illegal. They'll be they'll be punished for that. All right. Uh, we have that whole gender pay gap issue. Which uh, doesn't really look into the issue much and like consider uh, how many hours are worked by both groups and and uh, which fields but um, it, it is totally illegal and it should be uh, to uh, not pay women the same just because they're a woman or anyone for any immutable characteristic so uh, that is that movement next we go to that's oh sticking with the peaceful protest let's do a little bit more uh, anti-racism uh, counterculture uh, this one's much later though 
This is the, it goes all the way to the early 90s. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Wait, is it Tenement Square? Nope, good guess though. Yeah, apartheid, right. The origins here are much earlier, back with the Dutch and the British, uh, the Dutch in particular, uh, and then the British continued it. Uh, apartheid, which is just really a segregation of neighborhoods, jobs, etc., in South Africa uh, by the white minority. So there's a, a majority of uh, black Africans, uh, different ethnic groups in there, um, in South Africa, and there's minority whites that are uh, have been in control since the Dutch uh, colonized the area, and then the British took over after the Boer Wars. So uh, apartheid, is uh, going to end here after a multi-decade uh, fight. The, 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 what was the word I'm looking for? The efforts to bring down apartheid had origins with the counterculture movement that they had, like the civil rights movement and second wave feminist movement in the West, uh, but they were not as successful, well, this is the West technically, culturally, but um, uh, they, uh, they don't have as much success. So it's got its origins in the 60s, and in fact, that's where uh, one of the main opponents of this uh, policy got arrested. I think it was 67. Don't quote me in the year, though, when he actually got arrested. Nelson Mandela, yeah. So he was a bit more radical uh, when he was younger, as are almost any people, because you're younger. Uh, your brain's not as developed as it's going to be uh, after your mid-20s and 30s and, and onward. So, and then of course you get your 70s and start going backwards. Well, you go backwards before that, but that's when you start really going backwards. In the 80s, you're way backwards. Then you're worried about, like, are you gonna remember people and, and all of that? So, have I told you, by the way, how to avoid, how to best avoid those situations? Yeah. <laughs> Exercise, yeah, and low calorie diet, um, for whatever reason. We don't know why, but we just know it works. So, uh, Nelson Mandela, there might be one L, I forget. There we go. I was like, that looked wrong. Uh, Nelson Mandela, uh, he's in prison uh, for most of this, but uh, they are going to get out. And it's not just the South Africans that are fighting against this uh, segregation, racist policy in South Africa. Uh, the world is largely united against this government, uh, and they're going to implement some nonviolent practices to get the uh, South African government to uh, change its policies. Does anybody remember what they uh, end up doing? And yeah, embargoes. Yep. So we're going to have economic sanctions by other countries in the world. Uh, to pressure South Africa into um, uh, changing this policy. Uh, was it the African National Congress was the name of the party? I forget. Uh, yeah. I'm just double checking. I think it is, but I don't want to put the wrong one up there. I don't even see where I wrote it. I don't even know if I did write it. But we're going to put African National Congress because I think that's what it's called. Yeah, yeah. yeah I'm pretty sure that's what it's called. Uh, that's the uh, party. Uh, that's really moving against us in South Africa. And by the way, they've won every election since apartheid ended, I think, in 94. Uh, so yeah, the uh, African National Congress is the political party that's uh, wholly against apartheid, and it is going to uh, end in the early 90s. Uh, I, can't, I don't know if it was 93 or 94, but I know that they have been elected every year since 1994. Uh, so that's gonna end. And that, that's a cool one, because the uh, world sort of pressured the government into changing its policy, uh, and it largely worked. Uh, so yay. All right, now let's do, what else do we have? Is it just stagflation and free market, and free market policies? I think we can, I think we can do it. Yeah. The quiz is really short. It's only like, I think it's 40 questions or something like that. So it's like half what you guys are used to. All right, so starting the 70s though, so 50s and 60s, economic booms in the West. Great time to uh, be working and alive and all that. You also have a lot of positive social change, uh, you know, uh, ending a lot of gender, gender discrimination, racial discrimination, uh, things like that in the West. Uh, but you also, in the 70s, have some unanticipated short-term uh, negative effects uh, for some of those changes. So we have um, an era referred to as stagflation in the uh, 1970s. Why did it get that name? Prices go up, but the wages stay the same. Yeah, exactly. So you have inflation of prices, which is normal, but you also normally have wages going up with it, uh, not as fast generally, but still going up. But the only problem was you had stagnant uh, wages, meaning they did not, they did not, they stayed flat. They didn't, they didn't grow. So why didn't they grow then? So, yeah, we'll start with that. We'll start with why are the wages not growing. We'll talk about why the prices increased. Because um, people like minorities would. Um, would work in places and they would they wouldn't um they wouldn't um, be paid as much because they'll pretty much just work for anything. 
Okay, <clears throat> that's one group that's going to join the workforce in large number. Um, and uh, I, you're, you're kind of more describing immigrants in that case, but you would certainly have uh, one of the groups correct. All right, and I, again, I don't want you guys to confuse this. I certainly don't want the internet to confuse this. Uh, this doesn't mean that these groups that joined the economy was bad that they joined. It was just an unanticipated consequence uh, when they all joined at once. There was also a large amount of women joining the workforce. Yeah, okay, so uh, with these stagnant wages, uh, it's largely because there's other factors too, but one, one major and obvious one is the entrance of many, many, many workers to the workforce in the West, all, all kind of at once or in a short period. Uh, and there was already like kind of an even amount of jobs and people that wanted jobs, and all of a sudden, whoo, a huge chunk of people are joining the workforce. It's gonna take like a decade for new jobs to pop up uh, to uh, facilitate that. So again, uh, no, we're not saying this is a bad thing, but we are saying it's an unintended short-term consequence of this flood of workers to the workforce. So uh, you said women, of course, after the civil rights movement. Um, and then uh, Andre mentioned we have minorities too, not barred by uh, their uh, race. Who else? California. Huh? The oil prices. That's the price thing. We're talking about why, what's the third uh, group of workers coming over that are going to, in Europe and the United States, sort of make it more difficult for uh, negotiating wages? Yeah, immigrants. So there's two reasons, by the way, because it's not just like they magically appeared. Uh, in the 60s, I think it was 64, the uh, United States changed its immigration policy and opened up the amount of people it was accepting by a lot. And um, when all of these colonies start gaining their freedom in Africa, uh, in Asia, in Southeast Asia, in the Philippines, and things like that, a lot of those newly freed nations, uh, peoples in those nations, are going to voluntarily migrate back to the old mother countries because they know that's where the education and the jobs are. So like if I was in British-controlled India or US-controlled Philippines or uh, you know, French-controlled like, Algeria or wherever, um, once they leave, the economies there aren't very strong, especially when they engage in socialist policies. So the people that are like, this is a bad idea, they just leave. They just go to the United States. They're from the Philippines. That's why we have such a large Filipino population, especially here on the West Coast. Uh, a, a lot of Indians uh, go uh, to the UK. A lot of Algerians uh, go to France. So in the 50s and 60s and 70s, we have a, a huge immigration spike to Europe and the United States because the United States changes uh, immigration policy. So again, just to sum up, these three groups, you know, within a couple decades or one decade, all join the workforce. Uh, it vastly increases the amount of people that want jobs, uh, and the amount of jobs doesn't really change for a while. It takes a while to catch up. Uh, why does that keep wages the same? Exactly. It's hard to negotiate for an increase of wages for workers or individual workers or promotions or whatever because if you're trying to get your employer to pay you more, they don't have to. There's plenty of people waiting to take your job, right? So uh, it does create, like I said, a temporary uh, decade or so where it's really hard to increase wages uh, for people. Uh, which would have been okay if prices weren't going up, but they were. We had prices going up a lot too. So uh, give me three factors for that. The U.S. funding Israel. Yep. Since the United States funded Israel during the Yom Kippur War against the Arabs, that was in 73. So basically, um, what was it? Egypt, Jordan, and a couple others invade Israel during Yom Kippur, their holy holiday. The United States provides aid to them, uh, and the Arabs, of course, are upset by this. So, uh, and at the time, most oil that was being taken out of the earth came from Arab countries in the region. So the Arab members of OPEC, of OPEC, of OPEC uh, decided to cut off oil to the United States and Great Britain. And that, of course, what does that do to our prices? Uh, makes prices go up because we need oil for transportation. Exactly. So because they cut off the majority of our oil supply, that left us with very little, which of course, if you have a small amount of something, everybody needs it, the price goes way up. Uh, and that's going to affect all prices because it doesn't matter what you're buying, to get it there or make it, somebody had to use uh, oil or petroleum. So it made all prices go up a lot after 73. Oh, yeah. So the oil embargo caused prices to uh, skyrocket. What else? Uh, company regulation. What do you mean? Um, it's like paying for safety. So like if I have radiation in my company, I can't just dump it out into it. Okay. Yeah, we have a lot more uh, government policies that restrict companies from uh, uh, damaging practices. So for example, uh, environmentally, we require a lot more companies to cut their emissions and dispose of their waste uh, 
properly, which is more expensive. Like instead of dumping it into the river, which is terrible, they had to, you know, of course, haul it all out to some company to uh, properly dispose of it, which makes it more expensive to make things. So you do have uh, government regulations are going to be part of it, right? And that could be environmental, could be, you know, uh, a program from a from a from a welfare state program that's that needs funding. Uh, by the way, oh yeah, tell me the next one. Oh, um, increasing taxes because of social services. Exactly. Like Exactly, that was what I was already getting into. So we have a lot more uh, welfare uh, policies going on in Europe and the United States uh, that are going to uh, cause rises in uh, uh, taxation, which of course makes everything more expensive because you gotta charge more for taxes. Um, military too, Cold War's still going on, although I wouldn't say in the 70s, as far as I know, there was a big spike in military spending, but we do spend a lot on the military. So social programs and uh, military. All right, and it's very troubling. In fact, people have uh, no idea how to uh, solve it. They try Keynesian spending by creating government jobs, but that doesn't do anything because the problem isn't there's no money flowing to the economy. The problem is there's literally just not enough jobs uh, out there. So they, their theory was, oh, if we create more jobs, maybe we can help things out. So uh, does anybody know all three of the major leaders that are going to try this strategy? We talked about one already uh, yesterday. Uh, Margaret Thatcher. Okay. From? Reagan. Oh, from Reagan, wow. No, no. I'm just kidding. And then... What else went wrong with The Ronald? third one was from China, right? Yep, Deng Xiaoping, I'll just give that. Okay. China, US, and... Great UK. Britain. UK, yeah. It's actually UK at this point. Ireland broke away in 1922, I think it was. So, uh, and what, what, what sort of practices are they going to have here in general? Like, what, what kind of, what's kind of a general label we can put? Not Reagan's specific plan about, you know, making cuts at the top, which we'll get to. Free yeah, they want to uh, have free market policies. So the idea here, and it, 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 it's effective. Again, there's, there's a lot of debate about how effective it actually was in improving the economy uh, individually uh, as they assessed it over the decades. But um, nonetheless, it's going to become a popular strategy in the 80s and 90s, especially the 90s are going to be very uh, profitable times for the United States and for China, and less so the UK, but, but them too. Okay, cool. So uh, what's their uh, goal here then with these free market policies? Like, what are they trying to achieve? What's their strategy, and, and how is that theoretically going to make it better? Uh, uh, have less regulations on companies and less taxes for them. Oh, cool. So they can engage in more business, so they will increase production, and thus they will have more money. Right, so it's, it's uh, in fact, uh, the, coin, the term is coined by Reagan and his administration, that, that whole trickle-down economics. So the idea is that uh, if we cut some government regulations, we cut some taxes, although Reagan doesn't cut military spending, he actually amps it up and sort of cancels out his strategy uh, for the Cold War, but whatever. Uh, trickle down economics, you're supposed to make cuts for uh, the wealthy and for, 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 uh, for corporations. And uh, wait, that sounds evil, or at least a lot of people would say it sounds evil. Uh, what's the uh, idea here? You kind of described it already, but I want someone else to take a, a whack at it. So I make it cost less money for uh, the rich, mostly company owners, uh, to make things, right, by cutting regulations and taxes. So what, what is that supposed to do? How does that supposed to help this problem? Companies would then buy more companies, create more jobs. Okay, well they wouldn't necessarily buy other companies, they could. But yeah, most companies and, 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 and billionaires at least the ones that are self-made, uh, they don't just like sit on their money like, like Scrooge McDuck and like I said, swing around their gold coins in their vault. Uh, they, they, they reinvest it into other companies or to their company for the most part. Um, and again, I'm not saying they're all like moral, wonderful human beings. A lot of them are not. But um, most like Elon Musk and, and Jeff Bezos, guys like that, they're not just sitting on a mountain of money. They're, they're putting it back in uh, to other companies or to their company uh, or whatever. So the idea here is, like we'll use Elon Musk as an example. If he made like a, an extra billion dollars Tesla, he's not just gonna sit on that money. That's gonna a lot, it's gonna go back into Tesla or SpaceX or whatever company he wants to stick it into, right? And they're gonna try to expand operations by you know, in, enlarging their factories or building whole new factories. And by doing that, enlarging factories or building new factories, or whatever they're doing, what does that achieve? More jobs. more jobs, right? Which is kind of what they're, they're trying to, to fix here, more or less, with this whole lack of jobs and, influx of workers. Uh, so the idea is uh, you make cuts at the top, reinvested, and the idea is it creates uh, middle class and working class jobs. 
Uh, and, he, and he gets both. So if I, if I open a new factory, there'll be middle class and working class people there. Middle class being like, uh, well, that's more income based. But let's say white collar and blue collar. White collar meaning I need a degree in education to do this job, uh, and blue collar meaning I can just learn it on the on the job training sort of deal, right? So I'm going to need managers and business managers and, and things like that 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 require educations, but I also need the ground workers themselves uh, that actually run the factory. Uh, and so uh, it, it is a possible strategy. And again, the question is how much did it work? We don't really know, especially since Reagan also ha hiked taxes at the same time to uh, pay for more military spending for the Cold War. Uh, but nonetheless, that was the strategy tried by uh, many of Western and even China at the time to uh, deal with this problem. All right, so you guys understand what stagflation was, how it was caused, its impact, and then what the world tried to do to fix it? Yes. All right, cool. Uh, end of the Cold War. Okay, so the Cold War goes roughly 47 to 91. Um, and we'll talk a lot more detail about the events of the Cold War. But uh, for the world, it's a little more simplified. So we do know about the uh, Eastern and Western Bloc, the first and second world, and how they're running around the world trying to spread communism or stop it, either directly or indirectly. Um, but there's one thing that the uh, United States has an advantage uh, over, and that's uh, economically, their, their economy is a major advantage. So, as the decades go on, just put it on my desk, as the decades progress, it becomes more and more evident to the Soviets, keep in mind they're not letting the Americans know this, uh, they're keeping it a secret, but it becomes more and more evident to the uh, Soviets that they can't keep up with the United States. All right, what do you think I mean by that? Population, like what do I mean? Okay, they, but, and they have ridiculous weapons and intercontinental Continental ballistic missiles there in space, technically before we got there. I mean, you're right, our technology is going to be better, but that's not quite what I, I mean. They're economically behind because they're not making as much money as America is. Oh, yeah, by a mile, right? They have a centrally planned economy, uh, a communist economy, which is far inferior as far as growth and, uh, and output uh, to a uh, capitalist system or a market based system. So, uh, as the decades go along, like I said, the Soviets becomes more and more obvious they, they can't keep up this, uh, this effort to spread money and weapons all around the entire world uh, and hold on to all the countries that they've sort of got locked in their grip. All right. Uh, by the way, what happens, this actually happens twice. In 1954, not 1994, 1954 uh, in Hungary and in 1968 in Czechoslovakia. Uh, in both of these cases, one not as peaceful as the other, but in both cases, uh, protesters end up chasing out the communist governments from Hungary in 54 and Czechoslovakia in 68. Uh, I, I may have told you this, but what is the, uh, I may not have told you this, but what do the Soviets do when these communist governments get chased out in Hungary and Czechoslovakia? They send their army. Yeah, they send the army and, and, and force it back, essentially. All right, that happened twice. Uh, that was later known as the Brezhnev Doctrine. We won't worry about that right now because that's the Soviet leader who officially established that policy and said, hey, we have the right to uh, send our army to enforce socialism across the world. It's kind of like a Truman Doctrine statement, but for the Soviets. I'll, I'll put it up there. Why not? His name was Brezhnev. I might spell his name wrong. I'm going to spell it wrong. That's not it. Brezhnev Doctrine. Just like the Truman Doctrine, he said that uh, the Soviets have a right to, in, in both of these instances, to use force to keep uh, socialist governments up in the world, to prop them up. Okay, uh, so it goes on for several decades, but uh, 1980s roll around, and uh, there is a new sheriff in town in the United States. He's starting to uh, apply a lot of free market policies, uh, and he's not a big fan of the Soviet Union. In the 70s, they actually got a little bit friendlier with the United States, uh, but uh, in the 80s, this guy is going to amp it back up again with this whole calling them the evil empire and uh, rearming the United States. Reagan? Yeah, Reagan. Okay, cool. Um, Reagan's going to uh, uh, heat up the, the Cold War intentionally. Right? We don't know if his strategy was to exhaust them and cause them to collapse, which is what happened. Uh, but nonetheless, he wanted to amp this back up. Uh, so Ronald Reagan is going to uh, uh, reinitiate or reinvigorate the arms race. What's a, what's an arms race? Yeah, exactly. If one 
country produces uh, more military goods or grows their military, the other country has to respond. That's the arms race, all right? Uh, why is this an advantage for the United States? Or, or why is the United States more likely, more able to do this? Because they, uh, they have more economic uh, ability to afford to. Yeah, they can afford to do it, whereas the Soviets can't. Now, again, we're not really sure if Reagan and his administration knew this would effectively work, but it did. So, in the 1980s, uh, Brezhnev was out. It was a new guy. His name was uh, Mikhail Gorbachev. He had a, a huge birthmark on his forehead, and he was bald. So, like every political cartoon and movie, like made fun of his birthmark. Uh, they have they like wipe it off and stuff. You know, he couldn't. Um, but it, he was uh, different than previous Soviet leaders. He was much more willing to admit that the Soviets weren't doing so well. In fact, he was the first leader to openly admit to the world that the Soviet economic system, uh, the, the centrally planned communist uh, economy, was failing, that they were losing money, and in the long run, they were not going to last. And he announced that to the world. I think it was in 85, don't quote me. Uh, uh, he's going to announce uh, some reforms. You raising your hand for some reason? Okay. Uh, his two reforms are going to be, um, they're, they're, they're Russian, uh, perestroika and glasnost. All right, and they're actually they're actually quite complicated, but I'm going to take the most simplified version of these uh, to try to get across to you. Perestroika is uh, mostly it's political and economic, but uh, we're going to reduce it to economic reforms. So, what do you think he's going to transition his economy in the Soviet Union to? Capitalist. Yeah, he's going to make some uh, uh, more capitalist market reforms, right? So they're going to start privatizing farms and certain industries, just like Lenin did back in 1921 with the new economic policy. All right, so they're going to start to reform the economy, so they're no longer uh, specifically or solely a centrally planned communist state. And uh, here's the one that really gets them in the, in the behind as far as any of the Cold War. Uh, that's glasnost, which means openness, political openness. So if I'm in the Soviet Union, right, which is comprised of uh, Russia itself uh, and other, all the Istans, Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, etc., uh, I've got, you know, the Ukraine, uh, Belarus, these uh, Baltic states, part of Finland. Or I'm part of this Eastern Bloc here, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Bulgaria, Romania, East Germany. Um, am I allowed to not be a member of the Communist Party? No, it's a one-party state. So if I'm running against or I displace a communist, like that's actually illegal, I will be punished for that. So, so I can't do it. Glasnost, though, is different. It's going to allow some liberalization of the political system, meaning if I want to run for uh, office as a non-communist, I can. If I want to criticize the communist government, I can. Both of those, prior to the mid-1980s, uh, were, uh, were, for the most part, illegal under the Soviet Union. Like, you couldn't do it. But now I'm going to be able to. All right, so if I've got decades of people that have been, you know, forced to participate in this communist system that they don't like, that doesn't work. Uh, what do you think is going to happen when they're allowed to run against the communists and criticize the communists? Criticize it heavily? Yeah, but not, not just criticize it. What do you think they're going to do in the elections? Um, uh, give out the idea that they should liberate themselves from the Soviets. Okay. I mean, um, you got to remember that at least these countries, you're, you're correct about these ones, but at least these countries, they don't think they're part of the Soviet Union. The Soviets definitely pulled the strings, but they are technically their own country. They would, uh, people would vote for the opposite party. There you go. They'd run for, uh, run against the communists, and uh, they're going to overwhelmingly win when they do. The first party that was brave enough to try it, because they weren't quite sure, because you could have interpreted it differently, and if you interpret it incorrectly and run for office, and then the Soviets didn't mean that you could run for office, they just meant you could be more critical, then uh, you'd be in trouble. But the first major party to really push against the communists and run against them was a uh, labor union in Poland called Solidarity. They're also pretty uh, religious, Catholic. Uh, in fact, they got a lot of funding and encouragement from the Catholic Church through a guy named John Paul II, I think it was. We'll come back to him, though. But Solidarity is the political party. And in Poland, they run against the communists, and they just blow them out of the water, obviously, with the elections. Uh, because nobody actually wanted those communist uh, government officials to be in charge. 
they were just waiting for an excuse to get rid of them or, or an opportunity to, and they got that with these glasnost reforms. So this is when the whole world was sort of watching. Keep in mind, we all had network television too. Uh, yeah, I could say we because I was technically alive uh, by 1988, 1989 when they're running these elections. Um, and uh, solidarity wins. They chase out the communists, and the world sort of waits to see whether or not the Soviet tanks are going to roll in and prop that communist government back in. But to the surprise of the world, they do not. All right, so Poland successfully kicks out the communist government uh, relatively peacefully. What is that term for economic reform? Uh, that was perestroika, P-E-R-E-S-T-R-O-I-K-A. -E spell that name. Gorbachev, I could be spelling some of these names. I'm definitely spelling Brezhnev wrong. Oh, that's right. Yeah. No, that's not spell. Can somebody look that up for me? I always screw up the Z's and the H's and forget if there's an S or not. I think there is an S, but let me know when you know. Okay, uh, and then uh, Gorbachev. That one I think I am spelling correctly. Gorbachev. Okay, where was I? Oh, salary kicks him out. So once other countries start seeing Poland kick out the communists, they all, it, it sort of starts a domino effect in Eastern Europe. How do we spell it? Uh, Thanks. There it is. Brezhnev. Uh, that's the Brezhnev Doctrine. So, uh, oh, following suit very quickly is going to be uh, Hungary, as well as uh, Czechoslovakia, uh, later Romania. Uh, but two countries kind of hold on temporarily. The East German government, thus communist, doesn't want to give up control. Um, but they realize something. They realize that once Czechoslovakia and Hungary and Poland had all um, become non-communists, uh, they'd, they'd voted them, the Communist Party out, that Germans that wanted to go to West Germany, where they were much more free and had opportunity and weren't under communist control, they just went, all right, well, there's no border or wall uh, between these countries and us, so we'll just go through Poland and Czechoslovakia or Hungary and just go to the West that way. So literally, <laughs> even though East Germany tried to keep the Germans in, uh, they didn't have any protections on the Eastern border, obviously, because those were previously communist countries. So everybody just went around. They just literally started leaving Germany in thousands, uh, East Germany, uh, to go to the West. So East Germany, seeing that they were just going to lose their whole population, uh, they also stepped down and opened <coughs> up. The only one that, as far as I know, ended violently was Bulgaria. Uh, he tried to uh, hold on uh, by force, uh, but the crowds just overwhelmed his uh, state building, and he tried to get away in a helicopter on top, but he did not make it, uh, and he was killed by the mob. I imagine that was not a very fun death for him. Um, but this all happened within just, I mean, within a year. Uh, and in fact, the, this movement, this instant loss of all of this territory uh, by communism uh, to a democratic and later capitalist society, these were known as the uh, revolutions of 1989. And again, that's where Poland, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, <coughs> Germany, Romania, and Bulgaria all uh, swap out of communism. So is communism dead and done? No. Now, what do we still have left? We still got the Soviet Union. We still got you know Cuba and Korea too. But yeah, North Korea too. But yeah, the big one is of course the Soviet Union. But uh, that's not unified either. And uh, with these revolutions of 1989 uh, occurring and having occurred, a lot of the uh, ethnicities and states inside the Soviet Union, this voluntarily unified um, entity they're going to uh, speak up as well. And because of these reforms and some political pressure, uh, in 1991, they're going to vote on whether or not they want to stay linked up with Russia. And surprise, surprise, uh, they all decide not to. So in 1991, uh, the USSR breaks. Uh, and uh, all of these countries become the countries that you can see back there now. Uh, Mongolia, Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, all these Istans, um, Georgia, Ukraine, Moldova, Belarus, uh, the Baltic states exist again. Uh, Finland uh, becomes what it is now. So uh, this all happens very, very quickly, all in the span of just a few years. So we go from in 1985 being these arch rivals 
uh, on the brink of nuclear war uh, with uh, the Soviet Union to all of a sudden, six years later, it's just, it doesn't exist anymore. Like communism is done. There are still a few communist states in the world, but there's no Cold War anymore uh, because there's no, they, the communists lost essentially. Their economic system could not stand the test of time and the uh, free market economies of the uh, first world uh, ended up winning out. So that is uh, the Cold War and how it came to a, an abrupt end before you were alive and probably just before I was really aware I existed in the world. I mean, I was walking around eating and talking, but I don't really know how aware of myself I was at age two or three. But uh, nonetheless, uh, that's when the uh, Cold War is going to uh, end. Any questions about that? All right. All right. So we got some population growth in the um, 20th century, a huge one. What is that movement called where we figure out really how to cultivate agriculture and make it uh, much more efficient than we had before? Yeah, Green Revolution. Kind of starts in the 60s-ish. So what's the uh, thing that allows me to keep more plants alive by killing bugs? Pesticides. Yeah, so pesticides, absolutely. Those have their own problems though because they can actually Maybe uh, poison people or animals, but uh, okay. What about making plants more resistant to drought or breaking, things like that? Genetic yeah, genetic engineering, right? They start splicing um, plants, like mixing tree types and things like that. Engineering. All right. What about the ability to use the same land over and over and over and over and over? What allows me to do that? Fertilizers. Chemical fertilizers, right. So no more fallow uh, fields or slow uh, manure-based uh, fertilizing. Okay, uh, I also have better machinery and irrigation. Machinery and, irrigation. Uh, and we, uh, we greatly increase the amount of food we produce. Uh, which, so what's gonna happen to the population when we do that? It's huge, it's like a hockey stick. If you look at a graph, um, if you go like from the year zero to now, uh, 2019, that's where we're at. Uh, the population graph, like if this is billions, it, it's a hockey stick. Same with economic growth and, what's the other one? Well, it's with, well economic growth and a population go like this. It's like nothing, 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 nothing. A little bit bump up, a little bump. And it's, it's gonna do that. It's the classic hockey stick graph, like starting in the you know mid 1900s. Uh, Industrial Revolution, see a nice uh, knock up too, but really kicks off the Green Revolution. All right, cool. Uh, we're also keeping people alive better. Uh, so they have more food available. We're also keeping them alive better uh, medically. So what are some factors medically that uh, keep us alive? Vaccines. Okay, vaccines, cool. So population growth, obviously the food here. All right, uh, vaccines, yeah. Makes you resistant to uh, deadly, common deadly viruses. Antibiotics. Antibiotics, right? Those are the uh, agents that Kill bacterial cells, but not human cells. So that's that's a nice one. No advances like the artificial heart. Attack. Yep, those will keep your heart pumping during surgery and whatnot. What else will help? What also helps for surgery? Anesthetics. Anesthetics, right? So people can be unconscious and not moving, so the surgery doesn't get screwed up. We also have machines doing surgery now, so it's pretty pretty crazy. What did, what did you just say? Anesthetics. Okay, that's good enough for that. How about? Um, New diseases that are, or at least diseases that existed before but are now much more popular. Tuberculosis. No, in certain areas, yeah. In, in, in impoverished areas. We'll get to that in a minute. I'm talking about in countries where life expectancy has greatly gone up for these, because of these factors. Oh, we forgot one, by the way. Better prenatal care, which is basically like uh, they, they, once someone becomes pregnant, they really monitor the baby and uh, make sure that the baby's okay. And when they come out, they help keep him alive. For example, my nephew uh, might have uh, not made it immediately when he came to work because he wasn't breathing because they had to use a bunch of machines to get him to breathe and then he was all right. He might have passed away if this was 100 years ago. Uh, malaria? Malaria uh, is not part of the uh, new world stuff. You guys are stuck in that. Cancer. Cancer. Why is it popping up all of a sudden? Yeah. And that's generally speaking an, an older age disease. So uh, before the 20th century, most people didn't live on average into their 60s, 70s, and 80s. So it wasn't a common uh, form of, or a commonly known uh, disease or factor. But now since people on average make it to their 70s, 
you see things like cancer a lot more. Uh, what's another one? Alzheimer's, right? The breakdown of the uh, neurons in the brain and make you start forgetting you know, your memories and things like that. So old age diseases, all right? So we mentioned Alzheimer's. Uh, what else did we mention? Cancer. Cancer, yeah. Cool, what's another one? HIV Yep, that's a new one too. And that's more so because of our uh, uh, use of uh, our increased promiscuity and our use of uh, uh, drugs and needles and things like that. Uh, irresponsible use. Okay, that's how it's spread anyway. What about some, uh, you guys already mentioned too, tuberculosis and malaria, but why are they uh, so prominent in poorer areas and not, because they're virtually eradicated um, in, in developed countries. Why are they doing so much damage in non-developed countries? What are they lacking? That wasn't in the notes. Let's just see if you guys know it. What? Yeah, it's mostly based on hygiene. So the fact that they don't have, uh, well, any of these, or they don't have as many of these available, uh, or their sanitation and irrigation is not well managed or cleaned or refined, so uh, a lot of these diseases get caught up uh, in those cities and regions. Okay, cool, so yeah, tuberculosis, malaria, uh, dysentery, things like that. Things that are generally preventable, but if you don't have money and medical facilities readily, readily available or knowledge, uh, then you're likely to be caught up in them. So uh, that's getting better though over time, a lot better actually. Okay, I'm jumping around a little bit, but one of the organizations that has really, really, really helped uh, make these uh, developments in uh, the poorer countries, improve them, uh, and helped fight starvation, things like that, there's a new organization formed in 1945 that was peacekeeping, but also uh, well-being enhancing. The UN. Yeah, the UN, right. They have a lot of um, projects dedicated to helping the developing world continue to develop and provide them aid. United Nations. So this is the League of Nations 2.0. This is 1945. It still exists now. And um, its mission was to, you know, foster world peace, you know, prevent conflict, remediation, economic sanction, and all that. So that sticks. There's a couple differences, though. Number one, it has a military. So all nations that are part of it contribute to uh, its joint military. Uh, instead of, like, League of Nations had no military. So if you just defied it, it's like, oh, well. But now there's a military backup to it. So it's got a military. Uh, but also, like we mentioned, it's, it's not just focused on preserving peace, but also uh, uh, preserving equality, <coughs> human rights, and aid when necessary. So that's another focus of it. So human rights, in fact, has the Declaration of the Universal Human Rights that went along with it, as well as aid. Uh, so if there's disasters, hurricanes, earthquakes, outbreaks, Ebola outbreaks, things like that, uh, they're, they're on the scene pretty quick. Uh, with whatever aid that they can provide. Okay, cool. Uh, speaking of the UN, what is the, uh, this is a tough one, this is, I don't think this is this week, was it? I think it was last week. Um, what is the voting body in which all member states, which is like almost 200, uh, can vote for? <coughs> yeah. Do bigger countries have a bigger vote? No. No, it's a, it's a not a proportional vote, it's a, it's a, what's we're looking for? Static vote? Representative vote, what? Yeah, that's what I'm getting to. But what, regarding this military operation, these military operations, it's difficult to do because you have to get the Security Council uh, to agree to it, which is actually the question I was going to ask. Whoops. But yes, the Security Council, it's made up of nine members. Five are permanent members. These permanent members can at any time veto a decision. If one person vetoes, it's done. This is why you have almost nothing done by the UN military. Very, very little anyway. They've, there's like hundreds of vetoes. Uh, anybody know all five countries? The United States, China, Russia, France, Britain. Yep. Russia. The Soviet Union before, but yes, Russia now. Uh, the UK and France, right. And the other four, they rotate every couple years. They, they vote in uh, different countries. All right, so that's, that's roughly how that works, and it, it's going pretty well for us. Okay, there's also kind of a shift. So we've got, of course, some uh, new disease problems, uh, improved uh, lifespan and population growth, uh, and that's helped out by the United Nations, uh, and also reducing you know, uh, crime and human rights violations across the world. Um, where was I going with this? I was going somewhere with this. Oh, they also have radically uh, improved world production of food and availability of this stuff because the global economy is way more connected now. 
Uh, and that goes back also to 1945 when they started trying to reduce trade barriers. So they want to make it really, really easy for countries to trade with one another. So there's not a lot of paperwork in the way or tariffs to make it too expensive. Uh, the U.S. was very, very big on pushing this. Uh, can anybody think of some new organizations that are predicated on making trade between countries, even companies moving between them, much, much more easy? NATO. NATO is a military organization. NAFTA. What? NAFTA. Oh, NAFTA. I thought you said NASA. I like, no. <laughs> yeah, NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement. Excellent. So that is composed of U.S., Canada, and Mexico. Somebody tell me what it basically is in the night. I can't remember what you're exactly in the 90s. Um, 94, maybe? Uh, when, uh, how did this change the relationship between these three countries? It abolished all trade barriers between those countries. Right. So, if, you go, keep going. Oh, I love for more free trade. Okay, cool. So, what happened to many companies in the United States and Canada then? Like where? Like Mexico. Okay, why are they going to Mexico? Because they have cheaper labor. They do, right. So that's going to be a benefit, right? Now there's jobs and money flowing into Mexico from the U.S. and Canada. That's good. Uh, but also, they're able to operate there much more cheaply, so they can produce things more cheaply, and uh, we can buy it at, at lower prices. Okay, cool. Uh, it, it's more complex than that, but that's generally a, a positive development. Okay, other ones that, that, that function on the same principles. Asia? Yeah, the uh, Southeast Asian one, exactly. Um, that's another one, just like NAFTA. Excellent. Is there, were there any more in the notes? I thought there was at least one more. What? Oh, yeah, EU. Okay, that's a good one to actually highlight here because that's a little more complex than just a trade uh, organization. Okay, European Union. It doesn't actually start out like that, though. It starts in the 1950s, as anybody remember? It yeah, was European Coal and Steel Community. You often know that for Europe, not for this one so much. The thing I want to mention though is in the nineteen fifties, uh, France really wanted to punish Germany, but obviously the United States and Great and the UK were like, uh, no, that's a bad idea for many reasons. Uh, so instead. And I think the French actually came up with this, or mostly came up with it. They decided that, well, they want to benefit economically from Germany because they're a, they're a production powerhouse, in West Germany anyway. So they uh, formed a trade union uh, for the two commodities they lacked. They lack iron and they lack uh, coal in, the, uh, in France for the most part, at least compared to Germany. So they wanted uh, to be able to trade freely with them, uh, and they started doing that. And it wasn't just Germany. It was uh, France, Italy, Germany. Uh, and then the Benelux that confused you all, which is Belgium, the Netherlands, Netherlands and Luxembourg all tied into one. Uh, they all form this trade union where they can move jobs uh, and products that are related to coal and steel without any sort of uh, trade barriers or tariffs. And then what happened? Was that beneficial? Was it the same? It was highly beneficial, right, uh, for all of their economies. So they kept building on this. And since it was working so well between them, other European states uh, kept wanting to join, include the UK in, I think, 1973. So by the time you get to the 1990s, uh, this group is huge. It's many, many countries. Uh, and all at once, when the Cold War ends, all these countries want to also join this group. So they sort of rename it and change its purpose, uh, expand it beyond just economics uh, to the European Union. Now, it is true that there is free trade between states there. It's almost like, economically at least, it's one country. Uh, meaning that if I, well, tell me, what, what does that mean? If I'm in the EU, economically, what's different about being a member state than somebody in a country that's not part of the EU? What? Yeah, that's actually optional, but most of them take, yeah. So we've got a, a common currency, the euro. That makes it way easier to engage in uh, trade across those countries, absolutely. Yes, uh, common European citizenship, which means uh, that's the freedom of movement, meaning even if I'm born in Germany, I could at any point in time uh, move to another one of these countries, France, the UK, whatever, uh, not the UK now, they're pulling out actually, uh, but any other member of the uh, EU, and uh, I can work anywhere in there, in that state. So it's kind of like a borderless Europe, at least the ones that are in member states, which is, which is pretty, pretty awesome. 
right? It's a freedom of movement. It's actually more complex than that, which we'll talk about in uh, Euro. Like there's a, a European parliament where each country sends representatives to make laws for all of them. And uh, there's a European bank, which controls the <laughs> currency. There's a justice uh, entity, I can't remember what it's called, this European Court of Justice, something like that, uh, where they, they try to assess if countries or governments are doing stuff wrong. So some don't like that because they're being told by other countries what to do and what not to do, which is why uh, the UK is on its way out because they don't like the immigration policy. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's the uh, general, that's the basics of the European Union. Okay, cool. Um, all of this though, was fostered so that the increase in food production, the increase in uh, world trade, the increase in these uh, trade uh, unions, uh, the you know providing of aid uh, and things like that to the world, all that's made much easier by a significant amount of um, technological innovations in the 20th and 21st century. So what are some highly impactful technologies invented in the 20th and 21st century that made communication, uh, transactions, and uh, transportation much cheaper and quicker. Okay, cool, yeah, commercial airplane. Commercial airplane. And again, this is highlighting, uh, for the most part, transportation uh, and communication, which again makes goods and people and information very easy to uh, disperse and spread and uh, uh, have dialogue. Okay, and you said commercial airlines. Absolutely. Now you can just fly somewhere. You can go anywhere in a day. I don't think any flight takes more than 24 hours. It might. But if you're just doing a direct flight, then you should fly right to anywhere within 24 hours, I think. Don't quote me, though. Telephone. Yeah, phones. Right. And, and, you, and besides just phones, more advanced phones that allow you to talk to anybody instantly, access information on the internet. Automobiles. What? Automobiles. Yes, that's what allows me to talk instantly to anybody. But yeah, uh, smartphones is what I was going for. But yes. Uh, as far as trans, oh, we're in the wrong spot. My bad. Airlines, communication, smartphones. Uh, but you're right, automobiles. Well, they already had them, but they're much more developed now. Yeah. Okay. What else we got for communication and information? Internet. Internet. That's huge. Yeah. We'll do a couple more. Computers? Yeah, computers, absolutely, to run all this stuff. All right, and then TV. I had to run TV, too. Uh, large ships. Like those super freighters that can, they're like cities, floating cities that can just travel all over the place and haul a ridiculous amount of uh, uh, materials and people. Okay. And try to remember what's next, then. Oh, how do all these new developments, particularly the, uh, the, uh, the, the trade organizations that allow people to move uh, companies between countries very easily. How does that change, and this technology, how does that change the way our economy functions? Like how most people make money uh, in, these, uh, in the world? So there's kind of like two different strategies you could use. You don't have to be at that physical place. That's true, yeah. That, that, that makes these transactions globally uh, viable. But I mean like, what type of economy has developed in countries like the United States, Finland, Japan, as opposed to economies in places like Malaysia or uh, Honduras or Mexico. Uh, the U.S. has developed more of a knowledge economy. Yeah. And then what's the more traditional one that's going on in developed countries? Industrial. Yeah, industrial manufacturing, right. We still have some manufacturing here, and there's still some knowledge economy there. but. Um, so again, this is primarily developed countries, industrialized countries like uh, US, Japan, Finland, there's a bunch. And then the uh, developing countries, ones that are not, of course, completely industrialized, countries like Mexico, Honduras, uh, Malaysia, there's a bunch of those as well. All right, why did my manufacturing move from here to here uh, after these trade agreements? Make your yeah, it's the same exact concept as NAFTA, right? Um, it's now cheaper to pay workers in these countries because they have s such a low money supply that just a few dollars is worth a ton there. I think I've told you guys this story before, but I remember I paid for a piece of art from a lady, for a lady from a lady who lived in Malaysia. She's in, in Malaysia actually, and it was like a, it was like sixty or seventy bucks. And I was like, well, that's like nothing, because it takes her at least a, like a whole day to make it, uh, at least. 
And so I was like, oh, but I know money's worth way more in Malaysia, American dollars. So I, I like converted it. And I might be wrong in the conversion. But um, it was like, it, ca- it came out to somewhere close to like four or 500 bucks. I was like, well, that's a good day though uh, for her to, to, uh, to make that. So it was cool. I got it cheap for me. Uh, and because the money supply there is so low, a small amount of American dollars or euros or whatever are, are worth quite a bit there. All right, cool. So yeah, they can actually afford to pay workers a lot less. Also too, these countries have generally less developed governments, so there are a lot of environmental regulations and protections for workers. No, right, so that makes it a much cheaper process. Right, so you have a lot of companies move uh, to these countries for cheap uh, production. A lot of people say that's bad, and then there, and it can be right because there's you have child labor and things like that. But um, I think it's important to note that it's not quite as black and white as that. It's like yes, these people uh, don't have protections or a lot of protections. You have some child labor, uh, you have low wages. But what's the alternative for those people? Anybody know? Like, why are they doing that? Is somebody forcing them, putting a gun to their head, and telling them to work at these places? No. no. Why are they choosing that option? There's nothing else. Like that's their only and best option. Uh, and we know this process because we've seen it happen before. We saw it happen in Japan and South Korea who were in the exact same situation, or at least South Korea, in the exact same situation. And we brought these industries over and it started out rocky like this. Uh, but as more money gets into the economy, it starts changing and you start getting those uh, protections for the environment and protections for workers. Uh, and things like that. And then their lives get better because they have more money, they can buy more food, they have more medical stuff available. Uh, so their lives improve very rapidly uh, with this strategy. But in the short term, it looks pretty bad though with the child labor and the worker abuse, the environmental damages and things like that. So it's kind of a short term cost for a long term you know, profit or gain uh, in well-being. Okay, and uh, what's going on over here then in the developed world that uh, we're all a part of for the most part? This is the one you guys had a hard time with. What's a knowledge economy? It's like where jobs need a lot of knowledge and experience for you to be able to do that. Yeah, jobs need um, uh, knowledge, experience, uh, high level training. Right, so I, I can't, well you could technically I guess learn program by yourself, but it's gonna be hella slow. Uh, and it's hard to get hired and like I taught myself, uh, you better off being just an entrepreneur. But if I wanna do anything like computer programming, uh, if I wanna be a doctor, a lawyer, uh, these are all jobs that require tons of knowledge and tons of training. Like, I can't just roll in and start doing it. I mean, I guess I could, but you would just be terrible for a very long time. Um, so these are jobs that generally are not based on, like, you know, I can walk in and start working at a factory or whatever. These are jobs that require a significant amount of education and experience, uh, but they're generally higher paying because they're much more difficult. Like, uh, that's the reason why, if you guys haven't figured it out, the reason why you can be over there in Silicon Valley working at Google for 300K is because not very many people can do that stuff. Not many people uh, have the creativity or the knowledge of computers uh, or programming to do that. Whereas anybody, for the most part, can walk into a factory in a line and learn how to pull levers and stuff like that in one spot. All right, that's why that job pays a lot less because anyone can do it. And those jobs pay a lot more because almost nobody can do that. All right, <clears throat> so that's the knowledge economy. It's more based on higher paying jobs that are more complex, but that requires a lot of uh, education and experience. All right, yeah, so that's basically the difference between the two. So we've shifted to this. Again, we still have manufacturing here, but we've primarily shifted to this, uh, and this is uh, developing in parts of uh, South and Southeast Asia, in Latin America, and Sub-Saharan Africa too. Okay, Uh, what else is there? Oh, so so several businesses now operate on multiple continents. Uh, and in fact, have combined companies from uh, either, what am I looking for, what am I trying to say? Combined companies from other countries to form one. Um, what are those? Here, give me some examples at least. Nissan. What? Nissan. Nissan, yeah. How are they phrased on the notes? Was it transcontinental businesses? Multinational. Multinational, that's what it was. Right, so Nissan is an example. Uh, and again, these are countries, or uh, not countries, companies that operate uh, across multiple countries. Toyota. Toyota. Yeah, that one is. Uh, I don't. I think it's just Japanese, but it is spread. And and Coca Cola too. Uh, so you got Coca Cola, Toyota. Those again are. That's just an American company. That's just a Japanese company. But 
Uh, you are correct that they're across many, many nations and economies. Uh, Nestle? Nestle, yeah. Cool. Yep, that's Swiss. There was one more. I think it was. Yeah, it was the motorcycle one, the M&M. Cool. Not M&M's. It's like, uh, I might be remembering this incorrectly. Is it a French and South Korean? Or is it Indian? Indian, yeah. Uh, a motorcycle company, or motor companies that, that merged. All right, cool. Uh, we also have sort of a global, more tilting towards American uh, consumer culture that's spread because we can now talk to each other much more easily. So what are some of those social media platforms that have allowed this uh, spending and culture to spread? What? Okay, cool, yeah. So spreading of culture socially, obviously on social media. Some examples, uh, you guys know Facebook, uh, Twitter. I, I realize very few people in your generation, even in mine, use Facebook now. Uh, but you could even lump in things like uh, Snapchat, Instagram, things like that as well. Maybe even TikTok now. Even eBay, yeah, for the consumer culture, right. So uh, being able to buy things all over the place and send them everywhere uh, and want you to do that for cheap, that's part of consumer culture. eBay was a, an early front runner. This is where I, I was a little confused as to why they made the um, uh, curriculum like this because some of these companies are old, man. Like, I guess there's a significant amount of older generation people on Facebook and Twitter's kind of there still. But uh, uh, th those are a lot less influential than they were before. Um, you also had, uh, was it Weibo? Was the uh, Chinese one? Because they don't allow uh, their citizens to interact with other people because they don't want them to know what the world's like outside of China. Alibaba? Yeah, Alibaba. That's another uh, auction base. Um, I don't know why they didn't keep Amazon in this, on this list because that's number one world by a large margin right now. Uh, and they just made this list this year. It's like, do you guys not know what's whatever? Uh, Amazon. My, my only thought is the people that made this curriculum are uh, maybe Gen X and older. Because I know my dad still uses eBay a lot. But it's like, well, he has an Amazon too, but I don't know. Amazon has a much wider uh, reach. Yeah, there you go. British Broadcasting Corporation. <coughs> that's, a, that's TV. Uh, but that's that's a way to, to to pump out news and influence culture. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah. Uh, how about um, ways that we can uh, compete with in a friendly manner uh, other countries? And we'll just we'll stick with that for right now. Uh, just sports like the World Cup. Yeah, international competition, but friendly, right? So we don't have to go to war now to show who's better. We can just play games, right? So uh, what did you say, by the way? World Cup. World Cup. Yeah. What's the other one? Just say it. Just say it. Olympics. Olympics. Yeah, that's been going on for a long time. All right. Um, what about? Because it's really easy for these big companies and cultures to spread and almost kind of push out the smaller cultures. But what are some smaller cultures that have been allowed to uh, develop and spread because of this connection? Yeah, you had reggae out of uh, Jamaica, and what was the, uh, the filmmaking industry? Bollywood, Bollywood out of uh, India, right? Which is cool because. We used to make fun of Bollywood because their films were so low budget that um, they would just be hilarious. Like there's this famous clip of this, uh, this one movie that came out of Bollywood. It was this guy who's on a horse chasing somebody. You may have seen this. And a, and a, and a semi truck comes by. And you know sometimes in movies, like action movies or whatever, like the semi truck will by and they'll drive their car under perfectly and, and not get hit. <laughs> they do it with a horse. <laughs> but it's so terrible. You have to look this up later. The, the guy, instead of like jumping it or going under, they have him like super, in a super fake way, jump off the horse and over the, no, he didn't jump off the horse. The horse went on its side and slid under the uh, <laughs> semi, but it's very obviously just a plastic horse. So it's just like this being thrown <laughs> underneath the, uh, it's one of the more famous ones. But I mean, obviously there was a, a lack of capital there and uh, over the years, the, the quality has gotten much, much higher. They can't compete with Hollywood because that's where almost all of the world money goes for, for filmmaking, but uh, it's gotten a lot better uh, and it's really allowed them to uh, not spread their culture. I guess they spread their culture. Okay, cool. Uh, what are we forgetting now? Is it just environmentalism? I think. Yeah. <laughs> so some of the concerns of globalization are, of course, um, 
global warming or climate change, um, as well as environmental disaster. Uh, like we've wiped out almost all the fish in the in the oceans. Like what was it like? So like ninety five percent of ninety five percent have been wiped out in the last hundred years, or something like that. Something ridiculous. Um, You've got pollution, deforestation, all sorts of uh, nasty features of industrialization. That, again, once countries get rich enough, they start taking care of on their own, because they can. They're not worried about their families dying. Then now they're worried about future generations dying, so they start to fix this stuff. But a lot of countries aren't there yet, so there's still a lot of this going on in China, India, and other countries. Uh, but what are some organizations that were started uh, as a part of this whole green movement to preserve uh, the environment? Yeah, the Green Belt Movement, right? That's coming out of Kenya. Good, good. Um, and that one's based on ecotourism, too. Are they, they try to, uh, and I'm not saying like they're evil profit, you know, goers or something ridiculous, but they're trying to get your money uh, for this ecotourism and preserving things and then putting it back into, hopefully, uh, environmentally oriented organizations. Anti yeah, anti-nuclear movement. What are they opposed to? Obviously nuclear weapons, but what about it? Um, the dangers of nuclear energy. Yeah, exactly. It's not just the weapons and the, the possibility of ending the entire world. It's uh, when these things go bad, which, they, which has happened at least twice, uh, when you have um, a radioactive leak, it is incredibly damaging. We had one in Fukushima, Japan in 2011. That was disastrous. And that one wasn't even as bad as the worst one, which happened in Ukraine at Chernobyl, which, by the way, I would highly suggest watching that, uh, that Hulu special or whatever it was, the miniseries, like five episodes. Damn, I couldn't stop watching that. I had no idea how crazy that whole situation was. This tiny little plant could have, like, wiped out all of Eastern Europe. And it's, it's just, it's, it's absurd, and maybe even more. And it just cost them billions and billions and billions and billions of dollars to fix this. It was ridiculous. Really good movie, though. Really well made and pretty damn accurate. Uh, so yeah, they're against those things. And I think that's it for globalization. Now we'll just do the two examples of violence and the two examples of separation movements. And then we're done. All right. So we do have some, uh, obviously, war and violence have drastically decreased across the 20th century, but we still have some. Uh, obviously, that, that's going on. So 20th century violence examples. Um, we had the uh, one in, that was a part of the uh, British Isles. Anybody remember that one? Maybe it wasn't on there. Was there anything about the IRA, the Irish Republican Army? Oh, it didn't include that? No, no. That was for the project. That was for the project? Yeah. Okay, so then a quarter of you should have known what that was. Uh, but yeah, the IRA, the Irish Republican Army. I gotta zoom in on Britain for this one. So if I zoom in on uh, Great Britain, which by the way is the name of all the islands, um, well, I can tell this story pretty quickly. So, Great Britain, exactly like that. It's not all English people, if you didn't know that. Um, centuries ago, some Germanic tribes and, and Vikings had invaded, and they, they really shifted the demographics here, like uh, as far as what people or what ethnicity. So you have what today you know as like Celtic tribes. So the people who are pushed to the corner here are, are yeah, exactly Welsh from Wales. Oh, from Wales. So that, that's a Celtic language, Celtic people, Celtic culture, totally different. Up in the north here, you've got Scottish. Scotland, yeah. Uh, and over here in Ireland, you obviously have the Irish. All right, and then this, this is the English. So when we say the United Kingdom, it's these, a combination of these four voluntarily coming together as one organization. All right. Uh, so when it was called Great Britain, that's when England had conquered all of them and owned the whole thing. Uh, when we talk about just England, we're talking about just that little state. And it's called the UK now because this whole set of islands of Great Britain is not united after 1922, I think, uh, because Ireland has separated. And now we have a North Ireland and an Ireland. And these are all part of the UK. The Republic of Ireland is separate uh, from the UK. So you're like, why the hell would they split like that? Here's why, super, super brief history. Um, this goes way back to like the 1200s, by the way. So like 800 years ago, England invaded Ireland and conquered parts of it and eventually all of it. So that's in 1200. And they were pretty salty about it. But it wasn't that bad because they were both Catholic. However, after the Protestant Reformation in the 1500s, 
England, not Catholic anymore. They're Anglican. All right. So Ireland remains Catholic. England is going to uh, now be Protestant. We'll just say Protestant to keep it simple. Scotland also goes Protestant. Ireland remains Catholic. You with me so far? Okay. So there's kind of a religious division there. Uh, 1600s, the Irish, uh, this is just after the Reformation, or recently after the Reformation, uh, the Irish are getting more and more upset about the English ruling them. So the English had this brilliant plan, it's not brilliant, um, to take their Protestant Scottish and Protestant English settlers and uh, kind of breed the Irish out. It's, it's kind of a weird ploy, or at least parts of it so they could have some control. So you'll never guess where most of those settlers settled. Northern Ireland, Northern Ireland right. Uh, so what you have is uh, a few decades or 100 years of Protestant, English, and Scottish people settling up here in Northern Ireland. All right, still with me? Yeah. Okay. Now we're gonna fast forward to uh, the early 1920s, just after World War I, when Ireland is increasingly moving for separation because they're the only Catholics in that region and they don't want to be a part of this system where everybody sort of cooperates in parliament and all that. All right, so Ireland wants to separate, but it's not that simple because not all the Irish or all of the people on Ireland want to separate. They're not one identity. Northern Ireland, they're not even Irish. They're Scottish and English, maybe some Irish, uh, and they're Protestant. And the Irish down here are still Catholic for the most part. So these ones want the whole island to be separate. These ones say, no, we want to remain part of the uh, United Kingdom. And that's where you get this issue of uh, should Ireland get the entire island or should it be separated into North uh, and, and regular Ireland? And that's where the fighting originates, especially in the capital city up here. Belfast, which is where there's a bunch of Protestants and Catholics all in one spot. All right, that's where you get a lot of domestic terrorism. So the IRA, the Irish Republican Army, is a paramilitary. Again, that means that they're not officially a part of a government, but they're still operating, you know, with guns as a military unit. Uh, this is where the IRA tried to essentially get these Protestants to uh, either die or leave the area uh, out, out of sheer terror. And of course, uh, the English and Scottish and, and Welsh and Northern Ireland, Irish people are gonna fight back militaristically. So you have this sort of back and forth fighting uh, between the two uh, in the 1920s. But it kind of goes away for a while. And then it comes back in the 1980s um, for whatever reason. And this is where the IRA gets pretty popular uh, or famous for their car bombings, their, their terrorist uh, uh, car bombings. They even named a drink after it, uh, an Irish car bomb. Um, but that's where it picks up. So the, the highest points for violence like terrorism, where they couldn't fight the army directly, so they targeted civilians. That's the 1920s, 30s, and 80s. Uh, it is relatively peaceful now, though. Like, I was just there a few years ago. You can go around anywhere, and there's no, like, border patrol. It's not heightened police or anything. <coughs> you can't even tell you're going to Northern Ireland, by the way. I didn't even know. Only reason I knew is because the, the speed uh, uh, limits changed. I was driving along, it was kilometers an hour, and then all of a sudden I look over, and it was miles per hour. Because uh, that's what the, uh, the <coughs> UK uses, and they use the metric system in Ireland. Uh, but it used to be pretty bad. <clears throat> in fact, if you guys have uh, Mr. Pangburn next year, he was there in the 80s when it was really bad, and he has some stories uh, from that. Uh, but I wasn't there. So. That's the IRA, that's the 20th century violence. You guys got that? Yeah. All right, cool. Al Qaeda. That is a terrorist group originating from. Afghanistan, which is on my very inaccurate map somewhere in this region. That's the Caspian Sea. Um, and we actually helped start them, or at least fund them. Does anybody, does anybody read about why we were giving them weapons and things like that in the 1980s? Because it was a proxy war between the Soviets and the Exactly. So the uh, Afghan people were anti communist, or at least opposed to the Soviets, and the Soviet Union invaded them. So in the 1980s, that was still the Cold War. We're like, all right, they're automatically our friends. So here's a bunch of weapons and training and support. So we do that, we provide them during the Cold War uh, with a lot of that. One of those people, of course, is Osama bin Laden, uh, who's going to switch allegiances once this war is over. So uh, did you guys read about why Al-Qaeda dislikes the United States and the West so much? Because they have a, uh, they have a presence in the Muslim state. 
Exactly. It's, it's, well, it's two things, actually. Al-Qaeda, after, after they chase out the Soviets, <clears throat> Al-Qaeda is going to focus on a more, uh, well, it's definitely radical Islam. This is not most Muslim people. Uh, but they find several radical uh, Muslims across the uh, Arab and uh, Muslim world. And they're going to organize to try to harass the West out of the Middle East. Because uh, you have a British and American presence in the uh, Middle East, military bases-wise. You've also got the support of Israel. Uh, so they're very much opposed to both of those things. Uh, and again, since they can't form an army to you know, uh, fight directly, they are going to use uh, terrorist tactics. So the bombing of civilians, obviously 9-11 was a big one. <clears throat> uh, but most of that terrorism centered around uh, the Middle East and uh, Europe because they're, they're geographically close. But yeah, that's Al-Qaeda. <clears throat> and uh, we kind of virtually eliminated them uh, through the war on terror, but they're, I mean, they still had members that just joined other groups uh, and, it, and it's not like a, a done problem or anything like that. You guys got that? Or at least enough? All right, cool. So just know like where they originated and why they're engaging in terrorist activity. Last two topics. Well, it's like one topic, but two examples. Um, border issues where certain ethnic groups, large ethnic groups, want to split from the country because they're different linguistically or culturally, uh, but they have not been able to. So we have two movements for sovereignty uh, or autonomy. Where was the one where the French wanted to break away from an English culture majority country? Quebec. Yeah, the Quebec sovereignty movement, right? This used to be a French colony, uh, so they are culturally, linguistically French. They're, they require to be educated in that. The signs are all uh, laid out that way, uh, and they very much want their uh, autonomy. So that's called the Quebec sovereignty movement. That originated in the 1960s. Also in the 60s and 70s, there was a movement somewhere else in the world. Yeah, and that one's in Nigeria. So the Igbo people, uh, that was the Biafran sovereignty movement, 1960s and 70s. And these are both ongoing, by the way. Not successful, but, but ongoing. And uh, actually, the Igbo people here, which is the ethnic group that's trying to split, uh, they were actually uh, pretty heavily persecuted uh, by the Nigerian government. Uh, but in, in both cases, they have a different language and different culture. They want to split, but the uh, country they are in is not allowing them to do that. And sometimes using uh, force to, uh, to keep them in as a part of their union. All right, take your break. <clears throat>